Hey, this is Andrew Brown, your Cloud Instructor at Exam Pro, and I'm bringing you another complete study course, and this time it's the Kubernetes and Cloud Native Associate, made available to you here on FreeCodeCamp. So this course is designed to help you pass and achieve CNCF issued certification, and the way we're going to do that is by going through lecture content, doing follow-alongs in our own account, we got a full free practice exam so you can simulate the real exam. And we got cheat sheets on the day exam that you can go and print out and cram that last minute knowledge so that you can pass that exam and prove on your resume and LinkedIn you have that Kubernetes knowledge and get that cloud job or that promotion you've been looking for. So I'm your instructor, Andrew Brown. I was previously the CTO of multiple ed tech companies, 15 years experience with five years specializing in cloud. I'm an AWS community hero and I've published many, many free cloud courses just like this one. And if you ever want to be, buy me a drink, coconut water is what I like. So I just want to take a moment to thank you, the viewers, for making this free course possible because it's you who buy our additional study materials that allows us to produce these large free courses. And if you want to support more courses like this one, the best way is to sign up on exampro.co forward slash KCNA to get that additional study notes, flashcards, quizlets, downloadable lecture slides, downloadable cheat sheets, practice exams, ask questions, get learning support and more. And just by signing up for free, you're gonna get that free practice exam and cheat sheets with no credit card required and no trial limit. So uh, if there are updates of this course, the best way is to look on the YouTube and to see if there has been an update. If you click that, that's where you're gonna see things like corrections, additions, modifications, to make sure you are using the latest version of this course and to keep up to date for upcoming courses, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at Andrew Brown. And if you do pass the exam or you'd like to know uh, or would like to suggest what course uh, to be produced next, you can go tell me that on Twitter and it's time to jump into the course. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we were asking the most important question first, which is what is the KCNA? So the KCNA stands for Kubernetes and Cloud Native Associate, and it's the entry level uh, CNCF certification. So CNCF is the organization that is issuing this certification. Um, and so this certification is gonna teach you the landscape of cloud native technologies, a close look at the core Kubernetes components, a quick look at the vast amount of CNCF projects and cloud native tooling, a general overview of security deployment and monitoring, the structure and governance of CNCF and the community around cloud native. So the course code here is the KCNA. Um, and it doesn't have like versioning like other certifications like AWS or Azure, where Azure would be something like the AZ 300 and then go 301, 302 for the next versions. Um, and AWS would have like CO1, CO2, CO3 on the end. And so they just don't do this. The only way you'd know what version you're on is you'd have to go to an obscure GitHub page and see the curriculum version there. But we are on version one uh, for this. So consider this version one KCNA. Um, and Kubernetes is one of the hottest technologies being adopted in the world. It's in the top four there with AWS, Azure, then Kubernetes and Terraform. So definitely worth it to add to your journey. So uh, who is a certification for? Well, considering taking the KCNA, if you are new to cloud native and Kubernetes and need to learn the fundamentals, you are an executive management or sales level and need to acquire strategic information about cloud native for adoption or migration, you are a senior cloud engineer or solutions architect looking to quickly add Kubernetes and cloud native to your skill set. And so notice that we have um, three asterisks up here. And the reason why is that um, unlike other fundamental certifications, this one feels like it was made by engineers, people that want to use Kubernetes as opposed to people that um, are from the business perspective. And so it's missing things like uh, adoption frameworks, uh, cost, like total cost of ownership, shared responsibility model, um, uh, migration paths. So for that, I, you know, I kind of fill in the gaps the best I can, but it's not on the exam and it's kind of a misstep of a fundamental certification in my sense. Uh, so if you are in the executive management sales level and expecting to have a lot of that stuff, you're gonna be a bit disappointed to find out it's a lot more code than you'd like. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take it. it just means that uh, you might not want to sit the exam because it might not be worth it because you'll fail because you're not really trying to become someone who can code in Kubernetes as opposed to just understanding it from a managerial perspective. But uh, for anyone that is like, wants to be an engineer, uh, like a Kubernetes engineer, this is the right course for you. So the uh, KCNA is a difficult uh, exam for entry level. And you're gonna need both hands-on and broad conceptual knowledge 
of the Kubernetes Cloud Native uh, projects. And I really stress hands-on. Now this certification is multiple choice, so technically you could do without hands-on, but uh, to contextualize a lot of the questions or even to go to the next step of certifications, you're gonna be in bad shape if you don't do hands-on. So for technical implementation roles like Kubernetes engineer or Cloud Native engineer, uh, this might not be enough uh, to get you that role. Um, if you already have prior experience, like you work a tech job, then yes, it is a good addition uh, and it can get you a role as a Kubernetes engineer. But if you're just like from starting from zero, then you might need a bit more work or go further down the, uh, road, uh, the roadmap there. So when you complete the certification, you'll be able to deploy a simple application into a Kubernetes cluster, understand uh, various Kubernetes components, but not enough to deploy a production ready application. So really missing those complex production setups, like for deployment, uh, security, uh, like working with a lot of different microservices and things like that. So let's take a look at our roadmap here. So we have suggested prerequis uh, prerequisites and Kubernetes track. Now, the thing is, I never, ever, ever, ever at a fundamental have to recommend suggested prerequisites. So this should tell you something about the difficulty of this exam. Normally I just say, I have everything inclusive. You can go ahead from uh, uh, day zero and, and get into the cloud, right? But this one, uh, you're going to need some Linux knowledge. You're going to need some uh, ne uh, Linux networking knowledge, IT networking, cloud networking, whatever, uh, or a associate level cloud certification. If you can pass one of these, then you probably have the knowledge for the ones above there. I'm not saying go sit all of these. I'm just making suggestions of one of those categories here. Um, and then from there, I, then I would recommend to proceed to the KCNA. You can do the KCNA without doing all this prerequisite stuff. You just uh, might be a bit more confused than expected, okay? Um, and so after that, I would generally recommend the CKD because once you are done the, the fundamental knowledge of being able to work with clusters, uh, usually people want to deploy them. And so, uh, you know, there is the KCA, which I recommend next, but that one, the KCA administrator, is more about like managing nodes and self-deployment of clusters where the KCAD feels more practical. And it says application developer, but it's really not, uh, you're not building out apps per se. It's more like stuff around them. Uh, and so since a lot of providers are managed, this feels like a better fit um, for, for most people. After that, you can go with the CKS. Uh, but if you really wanna call yourself a Kubernetes engineer, you're gonna have to at least make it to this stage right, either one or the other, uh, depending on, or both, uh, depending on what you do. Um, but generally, like, once you once you go beyond the KCNA, all these things are pretty much like the KCAD, C CKS, and CKA. They're all the same kind of difficulty, just in different kind of areas. And honestly, I feel like they should have just been like a pro cert. You should have just studied them all together um, because it's like not that much work to do the extra ones. The key difference here is that this here is multiple choice. These are all hands-on. And so that's why I say that I have to spend extra time with you doing hands-on because I'm preparing you for the next level. If you don't do those, you're going to really struggle the next step. So doing those hands-on is very important. How long should you study to pass? Well, um, for this beginner, I have 50 hours at one end. So if you've never done Linux networking or cloud, uh, you're going to be doing it outside of this course, but trying to find to fill that knowledge. If you've never written uh, code or held a technical role, it's just going to be a lot of work. For the experienced, if you have worked with a CSP like AWS Azure GCP, Linux and Linux networking, you're looking at 20 hours. Um, that's still a little bit long. Normally, I would suggest like 14 hours. And the course is like the video content is not even, um, uh, you know, like 20 hours. But... The thing is, is that you're going to have to spend a lot of time doing hands-on labs and you have to factor in the time that you're going to be doing practice exams. So it is, of course, longer there. The average time, I would say, is 30 hours. Um, so 50% le le lectures and labs, 50% practice exams. And we're recommending uh, a couple hours a day for three weeks out. Uh, normally, like I would say two weeks for fundamentals, sometimes even a week. Like in the old, my old CLF CO1, uh, it was certified cloud practitioner. Uh, we would recommend like, literally like book it the next week. Um, but the, this one is really hard. So you're going to need a bit more uh, time to get there. Okay. What does it take to pass the exam? Well, watch the uh, video lectures, memorize key information, do hands-on lab. This one is especially important. We call them follow alongs, but um, uh, strongly, 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 strongly recommend doing these within your own account. And when I say that, like we're going to be doing it all in AWS on cloud nine, 
And uh, there are sandboxes out there and they are an option if you do not have money and, and you do not have a credit card. But um, if you can, please do them in Cloud9 and follow along it uh, because if you do sandboxes, they're abstracting away a lot of things that you that could go wrong. And that's the parts that you, you need to actually uh, become a, a Kubernetes engineer, uh, dealing with those hard bits. So you are cheating yourself if you use sandboxes, but I understand why people want to use them because they're just, they want to uh, kind of have that, okay? So do paid online practice exams, the same with the real exam. The great thing is that um, uh, if you sign up an exam pro today, no credit card require KCNA, I got a full free practice exam for you. Extremely generous. Uh, and if you want, you can definitely sign up with a credit card to get access to the rest of the practice exams, all the rest of the Larry content, cheat sheets and more. We'd greatly appreciate it so we can produce more free video content. Our content outline is out of five domains. So each has its own weighting. And that's gonna determine how many questions. So we have fundamentals, uh, container orchestration, container native architecture, cloud native observability, cloud native application delivery. You'll notice some say like between X, uh, like 27, 20 questions. It's because if you do the math, you end up with like a decimal point for how many questions there are. So that means that you could have one additional or one less on certain ones there. Um, and most of it's fundamentals. So fundamentals is strongly focused on Kubernetes components. So where do you take this exam? Well, either in person at a test center or online for the convenience of your own home. Um, uh, for these, which is through the Linux Foundation, uh, I know it's CNCF, but like CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. And so you'll go to Linux Foundation to sign up for this. And this uses the PSI network of test centers and online proctor exam systems. So it'll look like Linux Foundation has their own thing, but then you'll end up on PSI. Um, and if you can, please take it in person because uh, online it's so stressful, you know, like your dog could bark, your kid could cough, someone could knock on the door, um, you know, the internet could go out and the check-in process is always painful. It's not PSI, it's any of them. And, uh, you know, if you want to just be less stressed, I would uh, suggest in person if that is an option for you. If it's not, then you have to do online. Um, I think PSI, they're the more strict ones. So Pearson View, uh, I prefer Pearson View, um, but PSI, like you can't even have anything on the desk. So like for me, I like to have a, a box on the desk in the middle of the room to prop up my laptop. They don't even let you have that box to prop up it up. So uh, just make sure you're really comfortable and you have a table that's a good eye level for that. If you don't know what a proctor is, it's a supervisor or person who monitors students during an examination. So let's take a look here at grading. So the passing score would be about 75%. I say about or around because it might use scaled scoring. Usually the uh, uh, exam takers will point out that out. That just means that um, the system isn't exact. And so it's possible to fail with a 75%. Um, and since it's P on PSI, I just assume that it's following like what all the other providers are doing. So always aim for, you know, more at least 1% above there, but you probably can pass at 75% always aim 10% above. There are 60 questions. And as far as I can tell, there are no unscored questions. Unscored questions happen on exams for many reasons. Uh, so like AWS has like 15, I think it's like 15 or 10. No, it's 10. I think it's 10 unscored questions. And, um, you know, they're just oddball questions to help detect cheaters to see if they want to introduce new questions, things like that. They don't do this here with the KCNA. So every question is scored. And there are some oddball ones in there. So that's why I thought there would have been some, but there's not. You have about 15 questions you can get wrong. Um, there is no penalty for wrong questions. The format of the questions is a multiple choice, multiple answer. When I take exams, I remember the number that I get wrong and I actually count in my head. Like, okay, I'm, I think I got this one wrong. I'm okay. You know what I mean? Um, for the duration, you got 1.5 hours. So that means 1.5 minutes. That's 90 minutes. Uh, your seat time would be 120 minutes. Seat time refers to the amount of time you should allocate, not the time that you're sitting in the exam. This includes time to review the instructions, show online proctor your workspace, read and accept NDA, complete the exam, provide feedback at the end. Um, and really check in online is super, super, super stressful because every time I've done it, something's gone wrong. You know what I mean? Like they don't like my card. They make me check the whole room again. There's a lighting issue or I'm taking, I'm trying to take a photo, but it's saying like it's blurry, but it's not. So, you know, just make sure you have ample time there. And uh, uh, and even if you do do that, like sometimes they start the exam early just cause you're ready. Um, so it might not be exactly the time that you take it, but um, 
And it's similar to in-person as well. If you sometimes show up early, they'll just say, hey, you can go. Um, and so this exam is valid for three years or 36 months before recertification. I don't think you can sit an exam uh, if you have one active. That's usually the, the thing there. You get two attempts to pass. So if you fail, you get another try by rescheduling a future date. I actually failed my first attempt because when I went in, I just I knew I had two attempts. And so I, I sat it without a single lick of study and I got 74%, which is pretty good to show like how much cloud knowledge carries over. Um, but I, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, you're paying for two, you should take two. So, uh, you know, if you want to uh, fail it and go sit it, that's totally fine because then you kind of get a sense of like, okay, I need to brush up on some areas that I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's up to you, but there you go. All right, let's take a look here at the KCNA. So I just typed in KCNA into uh, Google and it made it our way here. And so there's a register for the exam here at the, at the current cost, at least for me, it says $250 and we can see the five domains, but that doesn't really tell us a lot. So there's a handbook down below. If you click that, it gives you way too much information on uh, how like taking the exam works. So they have a lot of information here. To me, it's a bit overkill, but um, if you need to know anything, it's, it's in this handbook. And this is generalized for any of the Linux certifications. And you're thinking, well, isn't this the CNCF? Well, yeah, but the certification is through the Linux Foundation because CNCF is a uh, sub-organization of the Linux Foundation. So you can enroll this way. Notice they have a bundle for a course for 50 bucks more. I can't really speak to the quality of the course. Um, so I'm not sure. It, it kind of looks like it's pieced together with other content. So, I mean, that's going to be your decision if you want to do that. Um, there always is a way to get kind of a discount. $250 is pretty steep. Um, and so if you try to reach out to like, maybe like a CNCF, um, community ambassador, maybe they'll know where a coupon code is, but try not to pay full price because I didn't, I got a, uh, code somewhere, but here you can see the breakdown again for, uh, the different kinds of categories here. We'll just expand it here. And another place to look is the curriculum. And I wouldn't call these curriculums. I call them exam guides because curriculums are very detailed, but this is what I'm talking about where we see the versioning, right? And so here they say KCNA and they might have some resources here. And I'm sure that they will add my resources here soon enough because I just have yet to publish my course, but I could see mine being on the top there uh, very soon. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is the curriculum here. So we'll open it up and, and give it a moment. And we scroll on down, here are our categories. So not very detailed compared to other other ones, but let's just take a look here. So under Kubernetes Fundamentals, we have resources, architecture, API, containers, scheduling. And really this is knowing the components of Kubernetes, okay? There's a lot of different components and we'll go through that. Um, then we have container orchestration. So this is understanding uh, run times. What is an orchestration system? The basics of security, like the four C's of security, networking and cluster networking. Uh, very little knowledge. We need a little bit of knowledge on service mesh. How does storage persistent volumes uh, uh, go into play? Then under cloud native architecture, we have uh, the fundamentals, auto scaling, serverless, community and governance, personas. Now personas is weird because it doesn't really show up on the exam. Like there's a page about personas and that talks about all the different kinds of customers that could use it. But really the only personas you really see are SREs. And there might be like one or two questions. So if you do see something asking like, what kind of roles, whatever, it's probably gonna be SRE. So that was kind of a weird one. Open standards, like all the types of uh, interfaces that can be used, telemetry and observability. So um, things like open telemetry, Prometheus, Grafana, cost management, that's another squishy one where uh, they don't really have a good definition of cost anywhere. Maybe it's in that paid course by them, but it's definitely nowhere else online. So I had to kind of piece that together. And they only ask you like one pricing question. And it's such a bizarre question that, uh, you know, there's just what it is. Uh, then underneath we have application delivery. So like uh, GitOps, CICD, things like that. You should just know generally the different types of deployment tools uh, for GitOps, but you don't really have to know how to deploy. I mean, you technically do, but not like with a, like not with like Flux or not with Argo, nothing super complicated, but you do need to know the different types of deployment strategies. So hopefully that gives you kind of idea um, uh, of what uh, you're gonna be dealing with here, uh, but there you go.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and what I want to show you here is just where you can access that practice exam on the Exam Pro platform. So once you sign up for your uh, account there, if you scroll on down, uh, this is where the practice exams will be. You generally should not attempt your practice exam until you've gone through all the lecture content and done the follow alongs because, uh, you know, once you see those questions once, you're, you might prime your mind in order to uh, remember them. And so, uh, you know, I always say try to take it like a serious attempt. Now, right now at the time of, I only have one and two in here on the publication of this course, we should have all three in and there will be a free one. So if you're on the free tier, you'll see that shown up at the top there. But really what I wanna do is just show you what some questions look like. So here you can see I have one uh, running uh, prior. So I'll just go there and resume. And so I just kind of want to, you know, click through a few questions and just talk about how these questions are maybe different from other exams or how they're formatted. So one thing I noticed for the uh, official exams is the questions are very short at the top. They get right to the point um, and you may or may not like that, but uh, that just means that usually um, the choices are a lot more complex. And as you can see in this example, it is actually asking uh, little code things like cube CTL commands. And for the exam, they absolutely will ask you technical things. Um, even though this is a fundamental course, they made it, it's written by engineers. So they're really testing your knowledge. And so you can expect to see those kind of questions there. Sometimes questions are as simple as choosing the right service or product or tool. So here, uh, you know, it's just a list of things. And so you'd have to know uh, which thing to choose there as well. Uh, and then you will see conceptual questions where uh, there's not a lot of these. Usually everything is tied to something technical, uh, practical, but uh, you will see conceptual questions like here where they say, what architecture automatically optimizes for cost in Kubernetes? And so for that one, I would choose serverless because serverless can scale to zero. But that generally gives you an idea that the questions aren't um, hard to parse, but they can be tricky based on the choices. And um, uh, there was ones where, you know, if you knew too much about Kubernetes and you were doing this, uh, you might know that there is a more right answer, but always go with the answer that seems the most obvious, even if you know of those technicalities and you will do very well on the exam. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what those questions look like. Again, don't tempt these until you go through the whole uh, course material first and, and, and practice your uh, flashcards and things like that. But uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of what to expect. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are asking the most important question first, which is what is cloud native? So cloud native describes an architectural approach that emphasizes application workloads that are portable, modular, and isolate between different cloud deployment models and cloud service providers. So that's my own definition because when I looked up cloud native and as I understood it, it was a little bit more complicated than that. And the context seemed to change depending on who was using the term. So one example is with cloud service providers. And so a cloud service provider would be something like AWS, Azure, or GCP. And when they would use the term cloud native, and this is my first introduction to cloud native when I was using AWS, uh, was it meant everything built on top of the cloud service provider. Uh, and so what I learned was that this is more uh, meaning cloud first. So where, um, you know, you could start on premise like in your own data center, but if you choose to build all in the cloud service provider, that is a cloud first approach. And so that's where that term kind of got a bit muddy. And so that's why I redefined it up here to say something that you can take, you can build and you can move it to AWS, Azure, GCP uh, in theory. Uh, there's also uh, kind of these like diagrams online that talk about the components that go into cloud native. And so the idea here is that they'll say modern design, automation, microservices, containers, and backing services. So the idea when they say modern design, modern design would be using a modern architecture, which below is microservices and containers uh, or serverless architecture. And then automation, which is just a component of it. And then backing services, meaning like, okay, most of it uh, is gonna be probably portable, modular, isolate, but you might leverage uh, backing services like cloud service providers uh, services or other cloud native services that run anywhere. So some describe uh, cloud native being four key principles. So you can just see there's variations on this. Microservices, containerization, continuous delivery, and DevOps. 
So it really depends in the context. And so the context of this course, cloud native will mean technologies like Kubernetes and the CNCF projects, which we'll talk about in this course, that are both uh, distributed and are agnostic to any cloud service provider. And just to really uh, be very specific, I found um, this definition by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It was in one of their documents um, uh, somewhere, so I don't know who wrote it, but it is by them. And their definition was cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds, containers, services, meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, declarative APIs uh, for that approach. These techniques enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, observable, combined with robust automation. They allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toll. The Cloud Native Foundation seeks to drive adoption of this paradigm by fostering and sustaining an ecosystem of open source uh, vendor neutral projects. We de uh, democratize the state of the art patterns to make these innovations accessible for everyone. And so what I get from that when I read it is that the CNCF approach is that it's democratized, right? So if you are using a cloud provider like AWS, Azure, GCP, you're really uh, buying into that whole system. But the idea is that you buy into cloud native, you have more uh, portability. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of people that are involved to make sure that uh, you aren't, uh, you know, being sucked into a gravity well of a particular managed provider. So, you know, hopefully that gives some context. It is, again, a squishy term, but, uh, you know, we have to kind of define it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at cloud native versus cloud service providers because sometimes people get these really mixed up. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to spell it out here. So a cloud service provider, also known as a CSP, is a collection of cloud services with strong application integration and there's synergy between those services. Uh, they utilize metered billing and they're under a single unified API. So examples would be AWS, um, GCP, Azure, IBM Cloud, and there's uh, a few others there. And so this is my definition because you know you kind of have to piece it together and just know over the years what it means. Uh, but really the important thing to know is a cloud service provider is useful because of those synergies between services. So they don't always have uh, the best in class service. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the idea is that by utilizing a collection of them uh, and the synergies between them, it, it outweighs anything like a, a single cloud platform with a single cloud service that's trying to have the best one specific service. Metered billing means like you pay on the hour, on the minute, on the second. Single unified API means that it's just very easy to work with all the services programmatically in the same way. Okay, so on the other side, we have cloud native, and this is a workload application or system that is designed to run on cloud services and take advantage of cloud offering. And when I say cloud services, really we're just talking about compute, right? Because that's all you really need is um, a place to run your virtual machines, your containers, your Kubernetes cluster, and then cloud native can integrate with uh, some uh, cloud service provider application or uh, services very common like for databases or their load balancer but you know they're not necessarily taking advantage of the cloud service provider they're taking advantage of cloud offerings like cloud computing and that's a, a key thing to point out is that cloud native workloads cannot take advantage of all or the full advantages of a cloud service provider because a cloud service provider intentionally has proprietary technology to encourage you to use their managed services that have exclusive integrations with other services. And so, um, you know, that's just the nature of it. I mean, you know, if, if you're a cloud service provider, you'd obviously prefer them to use your services over the cloud native solution, but both of these exist in the same ecosystem and all cloud service providers, um, you know, offer support for cloud native. And so, you know, hopefully that is clear. <laughs> So no fundamental uh, cloud certification would be complete without a shared responsibility model. And for the KCNA, they don't actually ask you any questions about a shared responsibility model, which to me is a bit disappointing, but uh, for your own benefit, I thought it was very important that we go find one. And so the cloud native shared responsibility model is a little bit hard to define because uh, you don't have like a large organization defining it and the CNCF isn't defining it. 
Um, and so what I had to do is find a community members one and then look at it and say, is this good? And I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. And I want to show it to you. So this is the uh, shared responsibility model that I found. It's made by uh, Lachlan uh, White. And I did ask them and say, hey, can I use this model to show off in the course? And they were very happy to say, yes, go for it. And so the idea is a shared responsibility model is the responsibility of the customer or of the team or of the organization for the types of workloads. And so the comparison here is we have traditional IT, hybrid IT, and then cloud native IT. And I know it's really small, but if you look down the list here, we have applications, data, runtime, middleware, OS, virtualization, server, storage, networking, pretty common for shared responsibility models. Uh, but what's interesting here is who is responsible on the team? And there's a big word here that you'll see that says GitOps. And GitOps can be a little bit hard to define. I have a very practical definition to GitOps, which we'll get into the course. But I just want to emphasize that um, when you're working with cloud native, there is a larger emphasis on GitOps. And so you are seeing things like network engineers, security engineers, solutions architect, SREs, platform engineers, data engineers, and developers. Whereas in the traditional sphere, you used to have like your infrastructure team, your, your middleware team, and then some specialized things. So there's not really much to say here other than I just wanted to point out that there's GitOps uh, and that it is uh, core to uh, cloud native. And so that is really all there is to share here, okay? <music> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And before we can talk about the CNCF, we need to talk about the LF, uh, which stands for the Linux Foundation. So this is a nonprofit technology consortium founded in 2000 as a merger between the Open Source Development Labs and the Free Standards Group to standardize Linux, support its growth, and promote its commercial adoption. And so the Linux Foundation is supported by a variety of technology companies. So there's a lot of big names here, and this isn't the full list. This is just uh, a, a handful of them, like AWS should be there and all sorts of things. But the idea behind the Linux Foundation is it's just a nonprofit thing to make sure Linux uh, uh, keeps running, right? And um, that, uh, that there is a community behind it that is kind of steering its future growth. And so that is the premise of the Linux Foundation. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the CNCF, also known as the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And if you ever get the initialism wrong or can't remember the name, that's okay. I mess it up all the time. But I want to tell you right now that this will be a question on the exam for the KCNA if you know what the CNCF stands for. So take a look here uh, very carefully, and it is Cloud Native Computing Foundation, okay? Uh, very, very, very easy for me to forget. I think when I took the exam, even though I've said it a hundred times, I forgot what it was. So the CNCF is a Linux Foundation project that was founded in 2015 to help advance container technology. And project is a funny word because it's not always what you think it means, uh, but it's used a lot in um, like technology stuff. And a good example would be like OWASP, where it's called the o like the uh, Open Web. A security project, and then it's an organization, but they call it a project. So the CNCF operates as an independent nonprofit organization from its parent organization, which is the Linux Foundation, and it has all this structure and stuff underneath of it. So it has uh, board members that uh, meet to decide on things like the budget and marketing. Um, the CNF, CNCF has its own global tech conferences like Cloud Native Con plus KubeCon. And you'll see this, it's always the same conference. We'll talk about that when we get to that uh, later in the course. Uh, the CNCF has its own Cloud Native certifications, which is the one you are studying for right now, the KCNA. And the CNCF has its own collection of projects. So it's funny that it's called a project, uh, but it's really an organization. But then within it, it actually has technical projects. And so projects here would be Kubernetes, which is uh, the key project that we are focused on in this um, certification course, Prometheus, uh, Etsy or ETCD, contain Container D, and a lot more. And we will go look at them all, okay? So that's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. 
All right, so I just wanted to show you uh, where these websites are. So we have the linksfoundation.org and then the CNCFIO. And if you go here, you can go to projects and you can see all sorts of um, different projects. If you scroll on down here, you can just drop on down to anything like networking and edge and you might see something uh, that you know. So there is a lot, <laughs> like a lot of projects um, for uh, the Linux Foundation, but uh, they also have their own training. So you go here and that's where you get like Linux Foundation certifications for learning Linux. Then if you go over here to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, you can learn more about it. Scroll on down here and look at the CNCF projects. And so these, we're gonna be spending a lot of time here, but not right now, we'll get to it later, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at the cloud native landscape. So this is an interactive map developed by the CNCF to showcase all the available cloud native technologies and to help identify the category to which they serve. So we just gotta to go to landscape.cncfio and you can see the projects here uh, and there's a bunch of rich filters, but just to give you kind of a preview of all the categories, I extracted them out for you. We got app definition and development, orchestration and management, runtime, provisioning. Uh, there's special ones like uh, certified service providers or training partners. Maybe one day I'll be a training partner, who knows? Um, observability and analysis. And then there's these sub landscapes. So we got members, serverless, and the CD foundation landscape. So not all of these are tech projects per se. They could be like things that um, are uh, professional services, but uh, we will take a look at it and see, you know, what the landscape looks like, okay? All right, so we're back on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation website. And if you go to projects here, um, should be projects, there will be a thing that says Cloud Native Landscape. And that will open up this interactive landscape where we have all these uh, fun little boxes. And these are all different kinds of cloud native technology. So here you can see Kubernetes, it's right here. I can click to it. I can get uh, rich information about this project. Um, we can go to card mode here. And so this is a little bit easier to consume. We can go back to landscapes here and uh, we can even filter it based on category. These filters should be working. I guess we have to choose based on the projects. We'll say CNCF projects. So these are projects by the CNCF, right? And so you kind of get the idea there. It's nothing super complicated, but there are um, some uh, landscapes within landscapes like the serverless landscape. So you go over here and that's one. This apparently is a landscape, the members, people that are partic uh, participating or um, uh, providing sponsorship. So, you know, we didn't show AWS as a logo um, in the Linux Foundation, but you can see these are all the people that are putting money into this and is utilizing cloud native technology. So there's a lot of people here. All right, so, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea. There's also this guide up here, if I just click guide, and we'll give it a moment to load. And so there is some kind of prescriptive stuff here that talks about like buzzword. This is so bizarre. They say buzzwords, infrastructure is a code, De De declarative configurations. Those aren't buzzwords. <laughs> so whoever wrote that, I don't know. But I mean, I guess they kind of define things like container registry, security compliance, key management. These are like um, uh, bare bones stuff around these categories to kind of help you understand base concepts. But uh, I'm not really worried about going through that with you. I don't think that's necessary, but I just wanted to show you the interactive landscape. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at the cloud native trail map. So the trail map is a recommended path to adopting cloud native architecture. Uh, and so it's pretty much a glorified PDF. And so the idea is that they set out a path to saying, okay, the first thing you're gonna do is you are gonna take your application and you are gonna containerize it. And then once it's containerized, then you can add CI CD uh, to automate that. And then now you have a containerized application, um, you'll want to be able to orchestrate it and deploy it to something like Kubernetes. And then you'll want observability and analysis, analysis and get data. And then you'll want to uh, put something rich on top like a service uh, mesh. Uh, because you know, if you want to build out microservices, that will be useful. You'll care about uh, security, making sure things are secure. 
then you'll need databases, storage, etc. So the idea is they just have this big old list here. And then they have like these ABCs along the side. So if you look here, I can get my pen out here, it just says help along the way. So training certification, which is me, by the way, <laughs> uh, consulting help or joining the CNCF as an end user community. And I just want to point out that the path order will vary based on your use case. They're just trying to give you something so that when you go to your team, to your stakeholders, to, uh, to the executive level, you say, look, we have a roadmap, we have a plan. But um, you know, the, the idea here is that you just do what you need to do because a lot of these later ones are just gonna be in the order that you need them, right? It's not necessarily a strict guide, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's go see where we can find that trail map. So I'm on the CNCF uh, website, I go to projects, then you go to cloud native trail map, and that will bring up a GitHub repository, and you can scroll on down until you see it, and there it is. So you can pretty much, you know, click into it probably and expand it here. I'm just waiting for it to load. It's a big old PNG, <laughs> and it's way too big. But uh, you know, the idea here is that you can read it, and uh, it will have suggestions around that stuff. And so if you want to use more than what's just listed here, that's where you go back to the landscape and you filter based on um, those categories. So nothing super fancy here. Um, and by the way, uh, if you look in the bottom left corner, okay, this is where I got my cloud native definition uh, when I was talking about the CNCF earlier in the course, it was from this document. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at virtual machines, also known as VMs, compared to containers, because the idea behind Kubernetes and cloud native stuff is that uh, there are virtual machines involved, but you're generally working uh, with containers, not virtual machines. So the idea is that we'll have a virtual machine, and the example says EC2 instance, that is just Amazon's name for virtual machines. So just think virtual machine there. And so a virtual machine will have a host operating system installed on it, could be Windows, uh, could be Linux. And then on top of that, it's gonna have a hypervisor. And that hypervisor is what allows you to run a virtual machine on a real physical machine. And so the virtual machine uh, has its own guest operating system, which is here, and that is Ubuntu as the example. And that's where you can install libraries, packages, binaries, then from there, you'd have your workload, like let's say you have a Django app, you have your database, you have your queuing. Uh, and so the thing with VMs uh, uh, is that they're great because they allow you to run multiple uh, workloads on a single machine. So you are best utilizing uh, that physical machine to the best of its ability. But the problem with virtual machines is that there's still going to be wasted space because you have to... Um, you know, provision a virtual machine to be a particular size. And so that's where you're always gonna be over provisioned. And wouldn't it be really nice if, you know, this part, if we we're only just paying for this much and anything that was not being utilized would not cost us anything or could be used, like something would be slotted in there. And so that's where um, containers come into play. So containers are very similar uh, initially. So you ha they run on a virtual machine it has a host operating system like Linux or Windows, and then it has what we call a container runtime. Now I have Docker daemon because Docker uh, is a very popular uh, container runtime. Um, it, so it could be like container D now, I suppose. Uh, but the idea is you have a container runtime. And so each container would have its own uh, guest operating system that would run on. And then in that uh, container, would be it the workload. So the Django app with its own libraries and stuff, and then each container is extremely isolate. And so the advantage here uh, about having these like isolate workloads is that, you know, you are best utilizing the space on the physical machine. And the other thing is, is that you get isolation. So when you're looking at this virtual machine over here, if the Django app does something to consume more resources, um, it could take away from MongoDB or RabbitMQ where these ones, you can just say, okay, you're only allowed to use X amount of space. And so conceptually, um, instead of thinking of this additional space as wasted, it's available because if you were to use something like Amazon uh, ECS Elastic Container Service, 
that space would be able to be used by another customer, right? Where when you launch a virtual machine, you're always over provisioning. So virtual machines do not make the best use of space. Apps are not isolated, which could cause config conflicts, security problems, resource hogging. Containers allow you to run multiple apps, which are virtually isolated from each other. Launch into containers, configure OS dependencies per container. There you go. Oh, and by the way, just think container runtime here. So I just kind of patched that graphic there for you. All right, let's talk about microservice architecture. And to understand that, we need to compare it against monolithic architecture. So monolithic architecture is one app which is responsible for everything and the functionality is tightly coupled. So imagine you have a repository that contains everything, uh, the, the database, caching, load balancing, the marketing website, the front end stuff, the API, the ORM, uh, background jobs, everything. And generally monoliths are installed on virtual machines. They don't utilize containers. Um, and the issue here is that when you have so much stuff running on a single machine, what happens when uh, your load balancer runs into a problem? It's not like you can just replace it. Uh, and so this is where microservices come into play. So the idea is you have multiple apps which are each responsible for one thing and the functionality is isolate and stateless. And so here, um, the idea is that we are using um, the cloud service provider load balancer. We're using the cloud service provider caching, the cloud service provider database, the queuing. Uh, for cloud native, you might be spinning these up in your cluster, so you might not be using cloud service provider um, uh, services as these isolate apps, but they would be an isolate on your cluster. And so the idea is that you can easily remove or add any of these components and manage them. And so that's the uh, key part about microservices. Now the trade-off here is that when you have microservices, you end up with a lot more uh, effort uh, between communicating between all these different little apps. Whereas in a monolith, they're all in the same place. And so that is one of the key advantages, but that's just something we have to overcome when we are using microservice architecture. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Kubernetes. This is the reason why we're here for this technology. So it is an open source container orchestration system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containers. Originally developed by Google and now maintained by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF, as a CNCF project. And we are going to touch on Google Cloud. I'm gonna show you how to deploy uh, your cluster there. And you're gonna find that Google Cloud is actually the easiest of, out, out of all the managed providers because I use them all in this course. Uh, Kubernetes is commonly called K8S or K8s. And the eight represents the uh, letters between the K and the S. Uh, generally, if you see K8S, you can say K8s or Kubernetes. And the advantage of Kubernetes over Docker, because Docker is what people always think when they think of containers, is the ability to run container apps uh, distributed across multiple virtual machines, or as we'll call them in the course, nodes. Now, uh, I have a double asterisk there, and that's just to remind me to tell you that uh, this is a gross, 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 gross simplification. Docker is not as simple as uh, like an apples to, or it's like an apples to oranges comparison. Docker is a suite of things. It's a runtime. It can have Docker Swarm, which is an orchestration tool. So technically a better comparison would be between Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, but I'm just trying to keep it simple here for you. All right, um, a unique, component of Kubernetes are pods. And a pod is a group of one or more containers with shared storage, network resources, and other shared settings. So the idea here, I'm just getting my pen out here, is we have a node, which is a virtual machine, and another one here, and you got pods running across them. Now, and pods contain containers in them. That's where the containers are. Now, uh, as we look at uh, pods throughout this course, you're gonna find out that basically most components that we run in Kubernetes are pods. So that's why pods are so uh, uh, front and center because basically everything is a pod. Kubernetes is ideal for microservice architecture where a company has tens to hundreds of services they need to manage. And so a service um, would be something like a, a containerized application and 
the thing is, is that when you have a containerized application, you're very likely going to be running more than one of them. All right, even like redundant ones. So here we have pods and a pod would run a specific application. So let's say it's a Ruby on Rails application. Um, and I mean, you could count this all as one service or you could count each of these as redundant services. And so it's very quick uh, or easy to get into the tens. So Kubernetes can be used uh, quite early on, but it's gonna be really dependent on your use case. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the Kubernetes component overview. So what I'm gonna do is give you a top level simplification on a lot, but not all of them, but a lot of the Kubernetes components because there's just too many. It'd be uh, uh, too much to go through all of them, but these are all the ones that we are gonna be spending a lot of time with, uh, and you definitely will need to know them all. And you will know them all because we deep dive on a lot of these and you'll get to see them again and again and again in the course. So at the top of our list is the cluster. And this is a logical grouping of all the components within a cluster. So mostly everything that follows after this is generally inside of a cluster. There are some exceptions. Uh, the next is a namespace. So this is a named logical grouping of Kubernetes components within a cluster and it's used to isolate different workloads on the same cluster. I like to think of it as a slice of pie. So when you look at the icon, and I made all these icons, by the way, because I do not like the ones uh, that are uh, provided right now in the community. So I just made my own, but I made it look like a slice coming out of that cluster. So you can remember what that is. Uh, then you have nodes. So this is a virtual machine, or it could be a serverless container because some providers like Google and AWS lets you run it on their serverless container platform. But either way, it's just the underlying compute, the underlying server. And there are two types of nodes. We have control plane and worker nodes. So worker nodes is where your application or workloads run, and the control plane node manages worker nodes. So it does a lot of stuff like that. Then you have pods, and pods are the smallest unit in K8s. It's an abstraction over containers. It generally defines an application workload, but basically lots of these components are just pods. And I will see that again and again when we list out pods, because I list them all the time to show you under kubectl namespace uh, what is running. They're always pods. So the next is service. So a service is something that we use with a pod to give it a static I, I, uh, IP address or a DNS name uh, for a set of pods. So the idea here is that if a pod dies, because pods get um, dynamic IPs, but we want them to have static IPs. And so that's the purpose of a service, but the service is also utilized as a load balancer. And I'm gonna point out that them calling this a service is really confusing because a lot of times a service, when we're talking about containers, means a workload or application that is continuously running. Right? So if you've ever used AWS uh, uh, ECS, uh, you have the option to run a task or a service, which are just containers and based on how long they run. But for whatever reason, that's what they wanted to name it. Uh, the, the CNCF decided to name it or Kubernetes Project uh, named it. I don't think it's a great name, but that's what it is. Ingress is also not a great name, but that's a name they gave it. But Ingress is used to translate HTTPS rules to point to services. Uh, but what we'll really see is that it's commonly used, and this is the hardest component that we are going to learn throughout this course, but it's used for getting a load balancer, uh, like an external load balancer on AWS, GCP, Azure, to a uh, route traffic to our pods, okay? Then you have the API server. The API server allows users to interact with Kubernetes components using the kubectl, or by sending HTTP or S requests, probably put an S on there because probably everything uh, is encrypted in transit. Uh, transit. I really doubt that they would have it so that it's just HTTP. And I like to think of the API server as the backbone of communication for Kubernetes. And you will see that uh, in a future diagram where it looks literally like, uh, like, um, like the backbone, okay? Uh, then there's kubelet. So kubelet is an agent installed on the nodes. Kubelet allows users to interact with a node via the API server and kubectl. And again, that is a simplification. It actually does more than that, but we will dig deeper into that. We have kubectl. It's a command line interface that allows users to interact 
with the cluster and components via the API server. So the CTL stands for, uh, I think, controller. And CTL is very, very common to put after a name for some kind of tool that's used for controlling things via a CLI. And we spend so much time, tons and tons of time uh, with the kubectl. So you will know kubectl inside and out by the end of this course. You have Cloud Controller Manager. This allows you to link a CSP like AWS, Azure, GCP to leverage cloud services. I uh, never had to provision one in throughout this course. I never even noticed one. I think like when you launch uh, a managed service, it's already there for you. And it replaces, I believe, the controller manager. Uh, but I'm just saying it's there, but we don't really ever have to think about it. So we have the controller manager, and this is a control loop that watches the state of the cluster and will change the current state back to the desired state. So it's basically state management, but it's also, uh, you could think of it as the brain of Kubernetes because it's doing all the controlling. Uh, we have a scheduler, so it determines where to place pods on nodes and places them in a scheduling queue. So that's why we have this little crane here because it's picking them up and putting them where they need to be. You have Kube Proxy, so an application on worker nodes that provides routing and filtering rules for ingress or incoming traffic uh, to pods. You have a network policy. These act as a virtual firewall. Uh, it, it says as, but at, <laughs> sorry, at the namespace level or the pod level. So it just um, uh, puts restrictions around how pods or namespaces, stuff in namespaces can communicate with each other because by default, everything it just can talk to everything in, it, within a cluster. Uh, you have config map. So this allows you to decouple environments uh, specific configuration from your container images so that your applications are easily portable. It's used to store non-confidential data in a key value pair. So this is just application uh, configuration uh, details, okay? Uh, then you have, I'm not sure why it's not showing up, there we go. Then you have a secret. So this is a small amount of sensitive data such as a password, a token, or key. It's basically config map uh, with the option to encrypt it. Uh, then you have volumes. So volumes um, are basically, uh, well, there's some variations here, but uh, they're basically mounting storage. So locally on a node uh, or remote to cloud storage. Then you have stateful sets. We do not do stateful sets in this course because they are just too hard to do, uh, but we definitely talk about them in great detail. So these provide guarantees about the ordering and uniqueness of uh, the pods. So think of databases where you have to determine reads and writes in order or limit the amount of containers. Stateful sets are hard when you can host, use a, a database externally from the Kubernetes cluster. So like if you have a relational database, put it on RDS, right? Or put it on cloud, Google Cloud Spanner. Uh, but uh, stateful sets just basically give you a guarantee that you're gonna send traffic to a very particular pod. You have replica sets. So maintain a stable set of replica pods running at a given time, uh, can provide a guarantee of availability. Uh, so this is just saying like take a pod and run copies of it so that we have redundancy there. Uh, and we generally do, do not launch replica sets directly. We do them through a deployment. And this is also how pods are deployed. So deployments, deploy a replica set and the replica set deploys pods. So a deployment is a blueprint of a pod. So think like an EC2 launch template or something that just templates up um, what should be launched. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are talking about manifest files in Kubernetes. So uh, when I was studying for the KCNA and I sat it, I was just seeing uh, conflicting terms about what they call their configuration files because I couldn't understand if there were variants, if they meant different things. But then I kind of settled on the knowledge that they're actually all manifest files, and that's why uh, this slide is here for you, or slides, I should say. So let's describe what a manifest is using non-technical terms. So a manifest file is a document that is commonly used for customs. So like going over the border from Canada to US to list the contents of cargo or passengers. It's an itemized list of things. So what is that in the context of Kubernetes? Well, a manifest file is a generalized name for any Kubernetes configuration file that defines the configuration of various 
Kubernetes components. And the name will change. Sometimes they'll call it a pod spec file. Sometimes they'll call it a Kubernetes configuration file, but they're all manifest files, right? If you're listing these, this YAML stuff in a, uh, uh, with Kubernetes components, they're all manifest files. And these are all manifest files with specific purposes. Like I was just saying, deployment file, pod spec file, network policy file, and manifest files can be written either in YAML or JSON. Now I've never seen a JSON manifest file, but taking my Terraform knowledge, I bet the reason why there's JSON is if you are pragmatically creating them. Same thing with AWS, with CloudFormation templates, with their YAML and JSON. Um, you probably would never write a JSON file by hand, but it can take it and it probably it's being generated by another app. So here's an example of it in YAML and here's an example of it in JSON. So a manifest file can contain multiple Kubernetes components, which makes sense because we said manifest is an itemized list of things. So it can have definitions, configurations. So here is an example of one. And in YAML, they have the syntax, which is the three hyphens, which allows you to define uh, basically an array. So like we have two different things here. And once we have all of our, um, oh, how wh whichever amount of, um, Kubernetes components we wanted to find in a manifest file, we're going to be using kubectl and writing apply. And this is something that we use a lot in this course. We're doing kubectl, apply hyphen F, et cetera. You will absolutely know this by the end of the course, inside and out. Uh, and resource configuration files is sometimes used to describe multiple resources in a manifest file, which is confusing because manifest by definition means an itemized list, multiple things. Um, but that's just the terminology throughout the documents, throughout uh, the ecosystem there. I just wanted to clear that up for you, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at control plane nodes versus worker nodes. So control plane nodes were formerly known as master node, and the only reason I'm mentioning this is because um, a lot of documentation out there, like tutorials and stuff, are completely out of date and they're not using the new inclusive term. So I'm sorry for mentioning uh, this term here, but I just have to because you need to know what it is when you are looking up information out there. Even the Kubernetes.io website still has some outdated stuff, mostly in the graphics, not so much uh, in the text. So they seem to fix that. So, you know, a few years out and I think we'll all be moved over to the new terminology there. And then you have worker nodes. So control plane node manages processes like scheduling, restarting nodes, and then the worker node does the work as the name implies. It runs your apps, it runs your jobs, and it's running pods and containers. They're both running pods and containers, but when we think of pods and containers, we're thinking about more of the worker nodes because the other ones, uh, even though they are pods, we're thinking of them as distinct uh, components, okay? And so let's take a look at the, the components that are involved here. So the first thing, is the API server. And notice how I, I said it was the backbone of commu communication. Well, look at it. It looks like a big long line here and everything communicates along it. So that's what I mean by backbone of communication. And the way you are talking to stuff is generally gonna be through the cube CTL, okay? Or there's the API. I guess I don't have a graphic for the API. I guess it is the API server. So that would be you sending um, like HTTPS requests uh, directly to it. So I imagine that's like how um, managed cloud service providers are talking to it. Um, but anyway, so that's the API server. Then we'll have the scheduler. So this determines where to start a pod on worker nodes. We have the control manager. So the detect states change it. So like if the pod crashes it, it tells it to restart. You have etcd or etcd, however you want to call it. This is a key value store that stores the state of the cluster. So Controller Manager highly relies on uh, Etsy, and you have Kubelet. So this allows users to interact with the node via the Kube CTL because Kubelet, no matter if it's a worker node or a control plane node, it's on both of them. And so, you know, generally all of these are in the Kube system. I really should have wrote this in the course, but they're in the Kube system namespace. And uh, the components that can be in the control plane node slightly vary. So maybe instead of the control controller manager, you'd have the cloud controller manager. If you're using something like K3S, they probably have slightly different control plane um, uh, components inside of them. 
but you generally need to know for the exam what is in a control plane. So know, know what these all are and know that they are in the control plane and not in the worker nodes. All right, so now onto the worker nodes. The worker nodes will have kubelet. So all, all nodes will have a kubelet for communication. And that's the way it will talk to container runtime. We'll talk about the second, and then you'll have a proxy. And so we'll have container runtimes, pods and containers. So just kind of an illustration there. So why is there a proxy and why is there a kubelet? Well, the proxy, actually, you know what? I don't think I have it here, but um, what's missing over here is core DNS, okay? So generally we'd also have, <laughs> I can't believe I have it missing but you'd have core DNS. I have it in another slide, so it's not a big deal. So we should really have that here as well. But I suppose it doesn't talk directly to the API server, but um, proxy is what is used when you have incoming traffic, right? So I'm a user, I use your website, and how am I reaching that pod? Well, it's gonna be through the DNS service, core DNS or uh, cube DNS, and then that's gonna go through the proxy. The proxy is gonna go through IP tables, which we'll talk about in this course, and it'll reach the application running the container. If we're trying to interact with our container programmatically through kubectl, it's gonna go through kubelet, and that's gonna go through the container runtime into the container. Uh, so again, if it doesn't click right now, it's okay. We're gonna cover this in different variations here, and you will know it, but there you go. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at probably the most important component, pods. So pods are the smallest unit in Kubernetes, and pods abstract away the container layer so you can directly interact with the Kubernetes layer. In my mind, the smallest unit really is containers, but I guess they're talking about like newly defined uh, components that are part of Kubernetes, okay? Uh, and so here is that graphic there. Uh, and so a pod is intended to run one application in multiple containers. So notice down below that we have one, two, three, four containers. They're all running the same app, like the same app over and over again. Now, uh, so that the idea here is a pod would be a database pod, a job pod, a front app pod, a backend pod. pod. Um, and what we could say is, is if we use the term service like the way we're supposed to, a service would define a continuously running type of application. So you could say database service, job service, front end service, which I'm about microservices, that's how we describe it, but that's the idea there. You can run multiple apps in a pod, but those containers will be tightly dependent. I don't even know how to do that, but the idea is if you wanted these all to be slightly different, you could, but I, I again, I have no idea how to do that. I don't know why you would do that. Um, so each pod gets its own private IP address. So look up here, there's an IP address and containers will run on different ports. So notice here, 3000, 3001, 8080, 81. Containers can talk to each other via local host. So if you have a container, I will just clear on out this uh, eraser stuff. If container one wants to talk to container two, all it has to do is talk to it on its port number on its own local host. And that is how simple communication is from container to container communication, which we'll talk about because we have a whole section on um, uh, different types of cluster communication. Each pod can have a shared storage volume attached. All containers will share the same volume. So the idea here is you see this line here drawn to the pod to a persistent volume, a PV. And we talk about persistent volumes and uh, persistent volume claims. We'll get to that later. When the last remaining container dies or maybe crashes in a pod, so does the pod. Uh, but when replacement pods is created, the pod will have a new IP address that will be assigned. So IP addresses are ephemeral. I never can say that right, ephemeral, <laughs> or temporary for pods. So they don't uh, uh, by default persist. And that's why we're going to need Kubernetes services, which we will talk about in this course. So to get pods and show their IP addresses, it's very common, you'll type in get pod, get pods, and then doing this hyphen O wide, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're taking a look at the API server. Now we saw a graphic of it uh, when we were looking at the control plane versus worker nodes. So we don't need another graphic here. And I think a lot of this text I grabbed direct from Kubernetes.io because I'm just trying to get you through the key points of it. 
Um, so this part's a little bit boring, but let's get to it. So the core of Kubernetes control plane is the API server. The API server exposes HTTP API that lets end users, different parts of your cluster, external components communicate with one another. Kube API lets you query and manipulate the state of API objects in Kubernetes, like pods, namespaces, config maps, events. The API server is a component of Kubernetes control plane that exposes the Kubernetes API. The API server is the front end of the Kubernetes control plane. The main implementation of Kubernetes API is Kube API server. Kube API server is designed to scale horizontally. That is, it scales by deploying more instances. You can run several instances in Kube API server and balance traffic between those instances. Everything has to go through the API server. You can interact in the, uh, with the API server in three ways. So the UI, API, and a CLI like kubectl. Now I put an asterisk on UI because I don't know what they're talking about there. The only thing you have is the Kubernetes dashboard, which is something that is optional to launch. And um, I mean, you, you can't really launch resources in the uh, Kubernetes dashboard. So I don't know what they're trying to say there, but technically if you are interacting with Kubernetes uh, via the API server, it's gonna go to the API. So I guess in that sense it is. Um, in terms of like how it scales and stuff, I don't really know. I don't know how to observe that directly in there, but apparently it just does it. Uh, and hopefully that gives you an idea, a little bit more information about the API server. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at deployments in Kubernetes. So a deployment provides declarative updates for pods and replica sets. So a deployment controller changes the actual state to the desired state of, at a controlled rate, and the default deployment controller can be swapped out for other deployment tools like Argo CD, Flux, and Jenkins X. So what I'm saying there is that uh, deployment is built in to Kubernetes. So you don't have to install a third-party tool, but generally you want to because the, uh, the tool there is very limited. It doesn't do Git ops. And so that's why you'll want things like Argo, Flux, and Jenkins X, which we will talk about more when we get to our deployment section of this course. Uh, notice at the top here, I say pods and replica sets, but in reality, a deployment is always deploying a replica set. And so even if you're just deploying one pod, it's gonna be a replica set of one. So here is the actual um, manifest file of doing a deployment. You're gonna be seeing a lot of these manifest files through the course. It's gonna be kind and then the type, right? So deployment, and then generally, I think usually, yeah, then, no, I guess spec is, is just for um, deployments, but, uh, and pods and things like that. And so here spec is our pod spec file, which we'll talk about later. Here it says replicas. So it's going to create a replica set with three pods in it. Uh, and then down below here, you can see uh, the container that we are going to be deploying um, uh, for these three pods. So we'll end up with three containers. So here is a graphical example uh, or architectural diagram of the deployment uh, controller. And so um, this one in particular is using Flux. Okay, and so the idea here is you have deployment, it goes to the deployment controller, the default one, or whichever one you install, deploys your replica set, uh, and that's how you get your pods. So a deployment uh, defines the desired state of replica sets and pods. A deployment will create and manage your replica set. A replica set will manage replicas of pods. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at replica sets. So a replica set is a way to maintain a desired amount of redundant pods, replicas, to provide a guarantee of availability. So here's a replica set, and inside of it, we have multiple pods, or you could say replica pods. One could be the main pod, uh, just who knows, right? Because when you distribute traffic to them, like with a service, it's just random where it goes. So they're basically all replica pods. Here is the manifest file. Notice that it's called a replica set and it looks just like a deployment. You specify the replicas, you're specifying the containers, okay? Um, the pod field metadata owner references determines the link from a pod to a replica set. Uh, so that we would have to observe that on the pod itself. So if we went using the kubectl and we said kubectl describe pod in the pod name, we would see that metadata there and that's how we would know that it's linked to that replica set. 
it is not recommended to directly create replica sets. So you can, but instead a deployment can create and manage replica sets for you. The idea here is that if you launch a replica set and then you delete it, it's gone. Now, if you delete a replica set, I believe that a deployment will say, hey, your replica set's gone. It will spin up another one, okay? Same thing, like if you have a replica set and you have three pods in it, you delete your pods, then your pods might reappear, okay? So horizontal pod autoscaler can be used to autoscale replica sets. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to HPA, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. We're comparing stateless versus stateful. Very important concept we need to know in Kubernetes, but also just when building applications, when we're running them in more than a single uh, virtual machine or compute because we might want to uh, have a version of our application in multiple um, data centers uh, across multiple regions. Uh, and so how do you handle that when a user goes to the website but then it goes to a, 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 another server. How does it know it's the same uh, same person or does that matter? So we're talking about stateless. The idea here is that every request, so like a web request to the server does not care. It forgets about the previous or current state. That's what we mean by stateless. So think of a goldfish that you know has poor memory. Then uh, the idea of a stateful is every request relies on state data to remember uh, so very uh, a good example would be a database. A database, you have to know who it is every time. Uh, like if you were to have 10 requests in a row accessing data, uh, it has to go to the same um, database, the same place so that we know who it is. So think of an elephant, okay? So for web applications, it's not that they don't have a state, it's just that the state is stored outside the context of the web app running on the virtual machine. And so that state will be pushed to something like a database or cookies, which are uh, are stateful, but the web apps themselves are stateless. So those HTTP requests come to the servers. Uh, the server does not uh, know if it's from the same person this time around or other, it just does not matter. Um, now that's not to say that um, web apps can't be stateful. Um, they are if they are on a single machine. And so the problem with a lot of people with monoliths is that when they build them, they do store the state on a single machine. They might store it in memory. Uh, and that's where we run into problems because then it makes it really hard to scale out to multiple machines. So that's a pattern that we generally want to break so that we can move into a microservice architecture or at least uh, an architecture where we can run our monolith on more than one machine. So uh, when we're talking about stateful, imagine you have a database, so you have a primary database, and then you have a second version of your database, but it's only for read replicas. The state here has to remember who can do write, writes and reads and who can do reads, right? Because in the primary database, you can always do writes, but the read can only do reads, and so it has to remember that state data. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. But anyway, the way it ties to Kubernetes is stateless is where we will use replica sets. So that's where you would launch your applications with. And stateful sets is where you would use things for like a database if you wanted to run it in cluster, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at stateful sets. Now, this is one of the few things uh, in this course that I'm not doing uh, a follow along with. I'm not showing you it hands on because it's so hard to do, and it's out of the scope of the KCNA. And generally, it's recommended not to run your databases uh, in cluster, but using managed service. So for those reasons, I'll just provide the information here. So you generally have uh, uh, the know-how. Now, that doesn't mean that you will never have to do it. There might be some cases, uh, but again, it's just out of the scope of this course. So stateful sets are used when you need traffic to be sent to specific pods. And the thing with stateful sets is they will always have a unique and predictable name and address, ordinal index numbers assigned to each pod, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, a persistent volume attached with a persistent link from pod to storage, if a pod is rescheduled, the original persistent volume will be mounted to ensure data integrity and consistency because that's how you uh, ensure state. Uh, stateful set pods will always start in the same order and terminate in reverse order. Uh, so that's really important. Now, in order to implement stateful sets, it will require to use a headless service uh, to manage identities. Headless services 
were really, really, really confusing. I can't tell you how much time I spent to try to make sense of them, uh, but what I figured out is that uh, headless services um, are generally uh, used because of stateful sets. So there is a headless server uh, service used to maintain the network identity of the pods and another service that provides read access to the pods. And I have an architectural diagram, we'll walk through it. So here's an example of a stateful set. I'm getting my pen out here. You can see there's a lot going on here, but we have stateful set at the top. Okay. And then there, it kind of looks like a deploy. So you have a match selectors to uh, match to something. The replicas, like how many do you want to run? Um, and where it kind of varies is that it has a mounted volume. So it's not like you can't mount a volume to a, um, you know, a deployment replica set, what have you, but stateful sets would have a volume because they're usually for databases. So you definitely would want uh, to have a volume attached there. So that here is my big fancy um, diagram. And so I have some accompanying text here that is from the documentation. Uh, and so what I'll do is read it out to you and then try to figure out how it matches up to the diagram. So the first thing is when we're looking about stateful sets, we have a DNS host name for rights. So rights will be, oh, sorry, I got to set up the uh, scenario here. If you look here, what we have is a stateful set and it's a Postgres database um, being deployed in cluster. Okay. So the first thing is for our uh, stateful set of a Postgres database is that rights will be directed to the main pod by its DNS host name, which is identified by the headless service. So, uh, you know, you have in your web application, someone wants to write to the database. So the idea is that in order for us to know where this main pod is, we need this headless service so that we get a DNS record. And so here's, it says main.psq because uh, we can't rely on IP address. We need to rely on that domain name or that uh, DNS record. So that's what it will do to help it get there. Uh, then the idea is we have cluster IP for read. So for read traffic, it can be redistributed or sorry, distributed to all the reading pods using the cluster IP service. Now this part of the course, we haven't covered all the different service types. So when you, uh, if you find this confusing, what you should do is watch the whole services section when you get to it and then come back to this and look at this because it is pretty darn complicated to be honest. Um, but anyway, so the idea here is that we, we want to do a read we use a um, a regular service like we would, the cluster IP, that's the default one. And that by default uh, does load balancing at random. So here it doesn't matter because both the pods uh, can read. And so it'll either go to the main pod or the read replica. Then you have the headless service. So the headless service is a service with cluster IP set to none. Uh, and it does not provide load balancing. It does, it does not provide a static IP address. A headless service is used to identify specific pods by assigning them DNS records. That's all it does. It gives a nice DNS record so that we can identify uh, what pod to send to, okay? Uh, a headless service is required in order to uh, for a stateful uh, set to work. And I've said that a few times here. Then we have our PVC and our PV. So. Um, persistent volume claim and persistent volume. Again, we haven't reached that section yet of the course, uh, but we will. But the idea is that um, we do need to have some kind of storage because it is a database. Um, and we said earlier in the previous slide that uh, you'd want to retain that information. So if this main pod was destroyed and then a one was to take its place, this same volume here would get matched up. It wouldn't match up to some other random volume. It would ensure that this one matches with the main pod. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes namespaces. So a namespace is a way to logically isolate resources within a Kubernetes cluster. And so namespaces can be organized based on project, department, or any user defining group. And so if we're using kubectl, it's kubectl get namespace or ns uh, for short, but you generally get the idea with these get commands. It's always get whatever you want. Uh, Kubernetes starts with four initial namespaces. There's the default one. So this is just where your stuff is gonna end up. Uh, if you create anything without specifying a namespace, you have kube public, 
These are for resources that are publicly visible and readable. Uh, you have Cube System. This is a namespace that stores objects, uh, uh, stores objects created by the Kubernetes systems. Or we say objects, it's pretty much pods, okay? And so engineers deploying applications are not supposed to touch this namespace. We say not supposed to. Um, let's say we're using uh, AWS EKS to deploy our managed Kubernetes cluster over there. Uh, they might uh, tell you to, um, if you want to have uh, an ingress controller and use uh, uh, the load balancer with AWS, you would then, uh, for that one case, uh, create a controller ingress or uh, ingress controller for uh, AWS in that namespace. So it's not that it's, it never happens, but it rarely should it be done. And the cube system namespace is one we'll see throughout this course because every opportunity when we uh, use a new managed uh, a Kubernetes provider or a different um, lightweight distribution, I will always look at all the stuff and show you what's in cube system so you have an idea of what's running on the cluster. Then you have cube node lease. So this holds lease objects associated with each node. It's used to detect node failures by sending heartbeats. And so you can create your own namespaces by doing kubectl, create namespace, and the namespace here would be, we're calling it production. Uh, so in clusters with a small amount of resources, namespaces aren't necessary, but it's up to you. If you want to use them, you can use them. Um, but the great thing about namespaces is that you can apply um, like network policies and other kind of uh, permissions. So if you have role-based access controls, you can say only give access to stuff in this namespace. So um, for me, I would probably always just create a namespace, but they say you don't have to. It might complicate things. So names of resources need to be unique with a uh, namespace, but not across namespaces. Um, they're talking about objects themselves. So like if you have a pod it, um, and you call it my app, it can be my app in a bunch of them, right? Namespace-based scoping is applicable only for namespace objects. So deployment services, things like that. Uh, but not for cluster-wide objects, storage class nodes, persistent volumes. So what we're talking about is there's um, certain objects, and we're saying objects, we're talking about components. I don't know, sometimes the docs say components, sometimes the docs say objects. But the idea is that certain uh, Kubernetes components uh, can be namespace and some of them can't be. So that's something that we need to know. So there are um, objects or components, Kubernetes components, that can only reside in a single namespace. There's ones that are um, multi-namespace, then there's ones that are cluster-wide, so they can never live in a namespace. So example of single namespace objects are config maps and secrets. They cannot be shared across namespaces. They exist in one, okay? So uh, config maps and secrets. Then you have uh, services and pods, which can belong to multiple namespaces. Um, and then for cluster-wide, we have volumes and nodes. They do not exist in namespaces. They are just in the cluster. Now, I don't know what the exhaustive list of all the objects are. There's probably some way to look it up. I never did, but these are the ones that uh, you need to remember and just realize that there are three different kinds of buckets, okay? So you can uh, apply a system quota restrictions on namespaces to avoid overusage, like memory and compute. So that's an example of uh, leveraging namespaces to put limitations, uh, like security restrictions, things like that. If you don't provide a namespace for a component, it will end up in the default namespace, as we already said, but there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're gonna talk about in-tree versus out-tree. So these were terms that I kept on seeing when I was looking up different um, CNCF projects. And uh, the term varied. So there was no consistency with the way this term was used. And so I'm kind of imposing my own terminology to help us understand what it is. Uh, and I can tell you right away, like I was talking to some Kubernetes folks and they were dead set that it meant one particular thing, but I just couldn't reconcile it because I was just seeing it used in different ways. So just understand that this is my own personal opinion. It's a way to help you just kind of contextualize it, even if it's not perfectly accurate. So in cloud native projects, you'll hear the term in tree and out tree. So uh, here's a little uh, forest here to, I don't know, have a visual, but in tree, the way I describe it is plugins, components, or functionality that are provided by default or, or, doesn't mean they have to, but or they reside in the main repository. So think of entry as internal plugins, things that come by default with the project. Then you have out of tree. So plugins, components, or functionality 
that must be installed manually and extends or replaces the default behavior. So think of out of tree as external plugins. And again, this is my own definition that some people are not gonna agree with me on, um, but this is the best way I understand it. Um, but yeah, we'll maybe we'll take a look at something where, you know, I see this in tree out tree stuff, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are just trying to find the example of in-tree versus out-tree. And so I remember seeing this under Core DNS. It's for a variety of projects, but if you go to Core DNS, which uh, we cover in this course, it's a, the DNS server that comes by default with Kubernetes, which replaced uh, Cube DNS, uh, I believe. And so if you were click to if you were to click through to the website, you'll notice at the top it says plugins and then external plugins. Okay, and if we go to GitHub, and it's not always the case, but sometimes when you are in a GitHub repository, and this is where I consider the repository to be a tree because um, it's a nest of folders, or you could say it's a directory tree, a folder tree. So within our folder tree here, we have plugin, and here is a bunch of plugins that would be considered in tree for this project. So if we go back to Core DNS, things that are out of tree are external plugins, which to me, those are just plugins. But, um, you know, these are all plugins that are not part of the repository. Again, in tree doesn't mean it has to be in the repository. It just means that it ships with it by default. And these do not ship by default. You have to do extra things to get them in. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that helps you with that definition or where I'm coming with that. Again, we could find tons of examples of this, but... This is the one I'm just showing you, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at endpoints and endpoint slices. So endpoints track the IP addresses of the pods assigned to a Kubernetes service. If that's confusing, just give us a moment. We got a graphic, okay? So when a service selector matches a pod label, the pod IP address is added to the pool of endpoints so pods expose themselves to services via endpoints. Okay, so uh, here's the graphic that I'm talking about. So the idea here is that we have a service, right? And we learned that services are used to load balance to multiple pods. Um, but the question is, how does a service link to a pod? And the answer is endpoints, all right? So remember, each pod has a dynamic IP address. So the idea is that you are storing the dynamic IP address in endpoints, okay? And they exist in like this endpoint pool, all right? So it's the connection between services and pods. And rarely, rarely do you ever have to manipulate these or do anything with the endpoints, okay? But if you want, you can do kubectl and get those endpoints. Now, there's this concept of endpoint slices. So endpoint slices break up endpoints into smaller manageable segments and each endpoint slice has a limit of 100 pods. So why? Like, why do we care about endpoints and endpoint slices? Well, uh, according to the documentation, it, it's when you're scaling out, uh, there is a cap on endpoints, like the amount of endpoints you can have in a service. And so that's where you run into scaling issues. And then that's why you need endpoint slices. And also, the term endpoint just comes up in the documentation all the time, and endpoints is a general term, uh, meaning uh, like when we talk about APIs, an endpoint would be like you point your request, your HTTP request to an address or an IP address, and that could be called an endpoint. I just kind of wanted to clear that up so that you knew that endpoint was a very particular thing in Kubernetes, and we're not just saying the general word endpoint, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at jobs and cron jobs. And before we can describe that, we need to describe what is a background job. So a background job is a one-off task that is used to run a piece of code or a function, and they're commonly used to perform maintenance or to trigger a computational workload. So an example could be to back up the database every X minutes, so like every 30 minutes, delete all users who not, have not confirmed their email. Basically, you could tr trigger any kind of code, um, but the idea is that, uh, you know, they're in jobs, right? So a job creates one or more pods that will continue to retry execution of the pods until a specified number of them successfully terminate. So an example here would do kubectl, create job. We're saying the job's named hello. 
and we are using BusyBox, which is something we will talk about in this course, to just do an echo hello. A cron job is just like a job, but it executes based on a repeating schedule. And so a cron job uses um, this uh, cron tab expression or cron expression. So this, I'm not sure what it says, maybe every minute uh, this will run or every hour. I'm terrible at cron expressions, cron, cron expressions. Um, but a very, very common um, use case for jobs is that you want it for long running tasks uh, so it doesn't hang up your main application. And a very common use case is sending off emails. So uh, you wouldn't hang the main thread of your main app, you would run it in an isolate job uh, there, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I just wanna talk about the Kubernetes dashboard. So the Kubernetes dashboard is an open source application you can deploy to your cluster to provide a UI to view Kubernetes components. And so it looks like this. So when I was first using Kubernetes, I was doing it on AWS and I launched up um, a cluster on Amazon EKS or AWS EKS, whatever they wanna call it. And uh, there, I couldn't see anything. I was just like, where's all the stuff? Where's the UI? Um, and so I was kind of disappointed. I thought maybe AWS's offering wasn't very good or maybe Kubernetes just doesn't have an interface. But then I realized um, that they just have this UI thing and you can launch it on any provider that you want. Uh, and it's very easy. It's like a one liner, but even with um, lightweight distributions like um, Minikube or Micro K8S, you can literally just write like enable dashboard and you'll get one. Uh, and so you can click around and you can see um, all the Kubernetes components that are running in your cluster. And I just noticed that there's like this create button here at the top. Cause I was, when I'm going through the fall longs, I can't seem to find a way to create resources. So there, it's possible that you can create stuff there. And also when we were talking about earlier, um, about API server, it says interacting with the UI. And I, and I was saying like Kubernetes bat dashboard doesn't let you create stuff. So maybe I just haven't noticed this button here. So maybe it is. Uh, able to create resources there, but I wanted you to, to know about it and it's part uh, of the Kubernetes project. So it's not like it's a third party, it's totally safe to install um, and use, uh, but there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro and we are taking a look at selectors. So selectors are a way of selecting one or more Kubernetes objects. Remember objects could be pods, uh, objects is also uh, could be generalized as meaning Kubernetes components. So in Kubernetes, there are three types of selectors. So we have label selectors. So selects Kubernetes objects based on the applied label. And so this is the example or um, the type of selector we're gonna heavily focus on uh, in this course. But the idea here is that you have your selector and we're saying match on uh, all pods that have uh, the key environment with the, with the value um, production, and so then it selects only those pods. You have field selectors, so select Kubernetes objects based on the object data, like metadata or status. We have node selectors, so select nodes for very specific plot placement. Let's take a look at what we do when we apply uh, labels. So label, select, label selectors define labels as key value pairs, probably should have a slash there, under metadata in the manifest file. So notice here, it says metadata, and then there is our label. This is the key, this is the value. As you can see, we can have multiple um, multiple um, uh, uh, labels, okay? So on the worker node here, we have, for example, this one says env prod, and then it says app nginx web, just to kind of match up what that means there. So you can use the hyphen show labels to see all labels. So here's an example for pods, and this will work for a variety of different uh, Kubernetes objects. You can apply labels with the label command. So you can do kubectl label pods, Apache web owner equals DevOps. So you can do it here in the manifest file, or you can do it here on the fly. I always do it in the manifest file. I never do it on the fly. Um, but you know, I just wanna make sure you are aware of all those options, okay? Let's take a look at recommended labels. So these are recommended labels that should be applied to every single resource or uh, resource object. And so I say should in parentheses because in practicality, most people aren't doing this. 
So let's take a look at what is recommended. So we have name, instance, version, component, part of, managed by, created by. They're self-explanatory. Um, and so just note that the prefix of the, the key here has this app.kubernetes.io and then name. So this is the key, right? So remember there's a key and a value for labels. And so labels can have forward slashes in them. They can have dots in them. So just be aware uh, that they can get kind of funky there. Um, but if you had a label without a prefix, like the app.kubernetes.io, um, uh, then these are considered private to users, okay? So just understand uh, that one caveat. So here is what it would look like if you applied all of those labels. And again, I've never seen that uh, happen. Um, I mean, I'm sure it happens that people are like packaging things for like Helm and stuff like that uh, because people are going to be ingesting them and people are, uh, usually are a bit better about that. But when you're building your own stuff, you might not be doing that at all, okay? But one I definitely do set is the name. So that's something that I will do quite often. So we looked at applying labels, but how do we actually select labels? So Kubernetes objects like uh, services or replica sets can target pods based on label selectors. You have to use them, otherwise it doesn't know, uh, like a service will not know what pod to associate with. Same with replica sets. And so here we have an example where we're doing selector and then it's the key and the value on a service. And then this one is for a replica set. Notice that the selector syntax varies for different templates, or we could say different kinds of Kubernetes objects. So this one says match labels, and this one doesn't have it, just has a selector like that. Um, you can use the selector in the kubectl as well. So you just do hyphen hyphen selector or use its alias hyphen L. So here's an example where you are uh, selecting all the pods or things like that. So it's not necessarily that it has to be for a service or replica set. You can even do it uh, that way if you're just trying to grab resources that have labels and, and see them, okay? Let's talk about annotations, which seem very similar to labels, but they're not, they're something else. So Kubernetes annotations allow you to attach arbitrary non-identifying metadata to objects. So clients like tools or libraries can and may require this annotation in order to work. A good example here is ingress. So this often uses annotation to communicate ingress controllers. So here we have um, an ingress, uh, Kubernetes ingress. And so it needs to communicate to an ingress controller. And this one is specifically for Nginx. And so it always expects this rewrite target thing in here. Um, when you look at different ingress controllers like AWS, they have some different ones um, and it just varies. So that's the only use case I've seen for annotations. I'm sure they show up somewhere else, but that's all I've seen, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we are taking a look at a pod spec file. So pod spec is a configuration file that describes a pod. So that seems pretty clear. Um, remember, all files are manifest files, especially if they look like YAML for Kubernetes. Um, but here is an example of us um, defining a pod, but notice that it says spec down here below. So the spec section is what we care about, and that's what makes it a pod spec file. And I want you to know that this spec thing can show up in a service, or sorry, a component that is a kind of pod or deployment or a replica set, uh, probably also a stateful set. So just realize that's what I mean when I say pod spec file, we're talking about this section here. So uh, the idea is you can define multiple containers and you'll have the name of the container, the image here, which is Nginx, um, the command to run on startup could be an option. It's not shown here. Uh, the port the container will operate on, the restart policy, which again, we don't have it displayed here, uh, and a variety of other things. So you can directly deploy a pod with kubectl apply command as we see here. So it's showing a pod, but in practice, you won't directly deploy pods. Instead, you'll use deployments or job as the kind. So 
in some um, uh, follow alongs, you will see people deploy pods just because they just don't want to deal with deployment because they want to be able to delete the pod and the pod not to spin back up again. Um, but yeah, you rarely ever would, never would ever make sense to deploy a pod without a deployment, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at gRPC. Uh, before we understand what gRPC is, we need to know what RPC is. So that stands for Remote uh, Procedure Call. And this is a framework of communication in distributed systems. It allows one program on a machine to communicate uh, with a program on a remote machine without knowing that it's remote. And the concept of RPC has been around since the 1970s, so gRPC is uh, much newer. It's a modern open source high performance RPC framework that can run in any environment and gRPC was initially created by Google. So you can kind of think of gRPC as an alternate method of communication instead of REST or GraphQL. Uh, and it can connect services in and across data centers with pluggable support for load balancing, tracing, health checking, authentication, uh, and probably more. So let's try to take a look at how this actually works. So the idea is you'll be installing a gRPC library uh, for your program. You'll be defining a protobuf file that describes the data structure. And those files usually have a dot uh, proto extension. You'll be writing code that works with gRPC. So distributed systems like Kubernetes uses gRPC for pod communication. And so that's kind of the example. And honestly, I was a bit lazy here with gRPC because I probably could have showed you code examples and stuff like that. But with Kubernetes, you're never really touching gRPC. It's just there. Um, and my experience with gRPC is I used it when I was using something called NATS, N-A-T-S, not to be confused with NAT, Network Address Translation. NATS is a, um, an event bus that re requ uh, requires gRPC, these protobuf files. But, you know, even though I don't have it here, the idea is that you would have a file, it's, it has its own syntax, but it's a file that defines the structure of communication, and then you implement in your chosen language, like Ruby or Android, how to, um, uh, like, you'd load that structure into a, like, using your standard library so you can read it. So it basically, you define the payload in a structure and then you have files that uh, read it. Um, but anyway, if you ever use an event bus, you come across these things um, and there's something kind of similar to it. It might be, you might be using protobuffer, but uh, it is like an AWS, um, an AWS event bus with, um, I'm trying to remember what's called event bridge. So that's something that's similar there, but you know, for this, I'm not gonna get into those examples and show you because you're not ever gonna touch it at least uh, I've never seen anyone have to touch it unless you're developing something for um, a project, but there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Kubelet. So Kubelet is responsible for pod internal API communication via the API server. And Kubelet is a node agent that runs on every single node. Uh, that includes both control plane and worker nodes. Uh, and I know this because I took extra care to know because I wasn't sure for quite a while if it actually ran on uh, the control plane, but it does. So what is an agent? Well, an agent is a program installed on a server to obscure what occurs for specific programs and to communicate information externally or trigger actions to be performed. Sounds kind of uh, <laughs> very interesting. Um, so uh, here's an example of a uh, cube, uh, where is it, kubelet? So here's our kubelet and notice that it's on inside of our worker node. Um, so kubelet performs the following tasks. It watches for pod changes, uh, configures container runtimes to pull images, create namespaces and run containers. And kubelet uses pod spec files to determine what images to pull and containers to run. So notice we have this pod spec file there and then it knows uh, to deploy that container into that container runtime but we are gonna go even a bit deeper so we can see this because I have another uh, diagram that I created here uh, to try to make it even more clear and interesting. And now you'll see why we covered gRPC. So here's gRPC in a few different places uh, to show that that's where that communication is happening. So for pods, Kubelet will continuously monitor pods for any kind of changes. Okay, that's how we know 
something's happened in the pods is because of kubelet. Kubelet will send back HTTPS requests to the API server uh, containers, uh, sorry, container logs and execution requests. So the logging information from your pods, uh, Kubelet's the one that sends that stuff along. Um, for storage, Kubelet can interact with storage through the container storage interface, CSI, using gRPC. Uh, very few diagrams where I actually show off um, cloud storage interface, cloud runtime interface, and cloud networking interface. So this is the this is the very important diagram showing you those integrations between all that stuff. And notice it's communicating using gRPC. Kubelet uh, can interact with the container runtime interface also using gRPC. Um, and so remember we said that a pod spec file uh, is deployed to um, a container and has to go through the container runtime. And the reason I show uh, the container networking interface over here is just to show you that it's not Kubelet, this is just another route into the container runtime. Okay, so there we go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at kubectl, probably the most important thing when we're learning Kubernetes because we use it so much. So kubectl is a command line interface tool that lets you control Kubernetes clusters. So the idea is kubectl uh, is a program where you run, uh, you write in commands into your uh, uh, bash, uh, bash terminal, and it will send HTTP requests to the API server onto the uh, Kubernetes components or objects, if you prefer to call them that. And kubectl looks for a file named config in the home directory. So notice it says dollar sign home. So that's usually the same thing as writing a tilde in Linux. If you write a like cd tilde, it usually goes to home, okay? Um, and that will be in the dot cube directory. And then even though it doesn't show here, it'd be like forward slash config. And we cover config in very uh, granular detail in this course, uh, but that's during follow alongs. I don't know if I actually make a slide on it. So kubectl has the following syntax. Uh, the idea is we have kubectl, then we have command, type, name, and flags. So let's cover all of these uh, parts, okay? So the first is command. So command is the operation you want to perform. And so here you can see example where we're doing copy. So the available commands we have is annotation. So key value data that can be applied to resources. Apply, so executes manifest files to create and modify Kubernetes resources. This one we use a lot. <laughs> we have auth, so inspect uh, if you are authorized to perform an action. And we do show you this one in the course when we're doing role-based access controls to say, am I allowed to perform these actions under a particular user when we're setting up their permissions? Autoscale, so it creates an autoscaler that automatically chooses the set number of pods that run in a cluster. We definitely cover that in this course. CP, copy files, directories to and from containers. Actually, we didn't do that in this course in the, in the labs, but it's not too hard to figure out how to do that. Create, so create specific uh, Kubernetes cluster level resources. Most times we're using apply because it creates and modify, but in some cases you just never modify particular objects. So I guess in some cases we use create, but a lot of times you can use, just use the word apply instead. Delete, so delete resource files, uh, file names, ST, uh, STDNs, resources and names by resources and label selects. We use delete all the time. Describe, show details of specific resources. We use that one a lot as well. Diff, um, the online configuration with local configs. I don't think, I've never ran that once, but uh, yeah, so there you go for the commands. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> we got edit. So edit resource from the default editor. Uh, execute, so execute command with a container. We definitely use that one a lot. Expose, expose a resource as a Kubernetes service. That one we use a lot too. Get, so generally used to get the status of an existing Kubernetes resource. Similar to describe, but not as detailed. Customize, so print a set of API resources generated from instructions to customization YAML. We don't do that in this course, but we uh, we do co uh, cover what customize is. Label, so update labels on a resource. Logs, so print the logs of a container in a pod or a specific resource. Patch, so update fields of a resource using strategic merge patch, a JSON merge patch or JSON patch. Um, and I mean, you can do this. I just never patch. I would just update a file and then do an apply. 
port forward. We definitely use that quite a few times in this course. So forward one or more local ports to a pod. Proxy creates a proxy server between local hosts and the Kubernetes API server. Uh, I'm just going to wipe a bit of this away here. Run. So create and run uh, a container image in a pod. Scale. So set a new size of a deployment replica set, replication controller staple set. We cover scale when we do auto scale. Then we have our type. So type is the resource type you want to command. So this could be deployments. Uh, resource types can have abbreviations. So you might type in deployments or you might just type in deploy. Same thing with persistent volumes might be PV, pods might be PO. Uh, and I think it will also take pod as well. So a lot of times I'll just forget to write it with the S on pod and it still seems to work. So here is the same example, this and this is identical. And I'm pointing this out because when I was doing the exam for the KCNA, I would see code and you do see kubectl commands where you have to pick the right one. And I got mixed up because I thought maybe like deploy wasn't an actual command because I just kept seeing deployment when I watched tutorials and I learned stuff. So just realize that if you see a word and you know that there's an object like a persistent volume, you see PV, uh, you know, you can pretty much guess that it is, it, it exists. And I don't think in the exam they would just make up a term, like try to trick you up by taking a name and like dropping the S and having to guess, okay? There are over 50 plus resource types. So here you can see them all. Uh, they don't all have abbre uh, abbreviations, uh, but you pretty much learn the ones that you need to learn. So like ING is a common one, SC, storage class, PV, PVC. I never write pod, I just write the full thing there. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of them, but you just learn the ones you need to learn, okay? Then you have the name. So the name specifies the name of the resource. So here we have pod and notice we can actually provide not just one, but two. So sometimes they take multiples. These are case sensitive. So just be aware of that. Um, if the name is omitted, details for all the resources are displayed. And in very common, um, it's very common. Like if I only have uh, a single resource. So if I create a single pod, I know a single pod, a lot of times I'll just write kubectl get pods or describe pods because for describe because I know it's only gonna show the one. And I do that a lot in this uh, course, but often um, when you have a lot more, you'll be specifying the name. Uh, flags uh, specify optional flags. Um, a flag is a concept for com like command line interfaces. You see them all the time. It's this double hyphen followed by something here. Now, you don't have to provide an equals between um, the flag and its value, um, but sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. When I do and don't, it's just random, but you'll see me do that throughout the course. Some command line interfaces are sensitive. Kubectl is not. You can either have the equals or not. Flags generally start with two hyphens, um, and I know you can't see, but there are two hyphens here. It's just the font uh, group them together. Uh, sometimes flags have abbreviations with a single hyphen. So double, double, or sorry, a hyphen, hyphen server is the same as hyphen S. And so, you know, some people just don't want to type as much, so they use the abbreviated ones. Available flags will vary based on commands. Uh, sometimes flags can be assigned values uh, or do not expect a value at all. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, there you go. Oh, just one more thing for kubectl. There is really good documentation. It isn't uh, straightforward how to find it. So I just had to point it out that you go to uh, Kubernetes IO forward slash docs, forward slash reference, forward slash generated, forward slash kubectl, kubectl commands. Uh, if you Google kubectl uh, Kubernetes, uh, it's usually the second link. And so what I do when I'm looking at Google is I just like carefully look for this one underneath because if you get here, it has so many examples. It's really, really useful, okay? <laughs> All right, just because it's so tricky to find the kubectl documentation, I just wanted to show you. So I typed in kubectl commands, and if you were to click the first one, you would end up at the cheat sheets. And the cheat sheets are kind of okay, but what's a lot better are the commands. And that, if I go to this one, I don't know if it goes, oh, it does, right there. But usually I'll click on this one here to get to it. Okay, but for whatever reason, the cheat sheets are above the commands, and the commands show you 
everything. So if I want to um, apply something, we could click apply, it might have some uh, sub ones there. And you can go and see a bunch of different examples here. So that will help you out quite a bit when figuring out how to use kubectl. All right, let's take a look here at Minikube. So it sets up a local single node Kubernetes cluster on Mac OS, Linux, Windows for learning purposes. And in particular, Minikube is actually setting up a virtual machine and then running a control plane and worker processes uh, within Docker as the container layer. So um, that's one key thing is that it runs in a virtual machine where we'll see other ones, they uh, operate a little bit differently. But Minikube is very popular because it's just super, super easy to use. It's not my favorite, I like Micro K8S, but let's talk about some of the benefits. So it supports the latest Kubernetes release, cross-platform, deploys as a VM, a container, or on bare metal, multiple container runtimes, a Docker API endpoint for blazing fast image pushes, advanced features such as load balancer, file system mounts, uh, feature gates, add-ons for easily installed Kubernetes applications, supports common CI environments, so continuous integration. And so that's kind of an example of starting up uh, Minikube and you can see it's kind of pretty, so it gives you an idea how easy it is to use. All right, let's talk about another lightweight distribution, uh, K3S and K3D. So K3S is a lightweight tool designed to run production level Kubernetes workloads for low uh, resource and remotely located IoT and edge devices and bare metal. Uh, it was originally created by Rancher. It is a sandbox CNCF project. Um, so, you know, like you can use it for testing if you want, there's no reason uh, you can't, um, but it is a little bit more work uh, to utilize, um, but it's just considered a lightweight distribution, right? So a few differences is that, um, K3s does not use Kubelet, but it runs Kubelet on the host machine and uses the host scheduling mechanism to run containers. K3s uses Kube proxy to proxy the network connection to nodes, as opposed to K uh, Kubernetes, which uh, uses Kube proxy to proxy the network connections of an individual container. Uh, K3s has a tighter security deployment than uh, Kubernetes because of their small attack plane surface. Um, and also at one point, the only way you'd have a backing store was with um, SQLite, but now apparently you can use a, like a miniaturized version of etcd. Um, so the idea is that um, K3S has some advantages, but comes with some limitations, and you'll need to investigate uh, for yourself whether it makes sense to use K3S for your use case. We're talking about production use case, uh, but for testing and development, uh, you can use it, but just understand that you are developing on uh, a, a different distribution, okay? It's not it's not gonna be similar uh, to um, full-blown Kubernetes. Okay, so then there's K3D. And so this is a platform agnostic lightweight wrapper that runs uh, K3S in a Docker container because the one above runs in virtual machines. And so if you wanna run this in a Docker container, you use K3D. It helps run scale, uh, run and scale single or multi-node K3S clusters quickly without further setup while maintaining a high availability mode, right? I guess I said virtual machines above, but really the above one is actually bare metal, I suppose. You're like right on a machine, not necessarily even with a virtual machine. So I really should have said that instead, straight onto hardware, but that is K3S and um, uh, K3D. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Kind. And so Kind is uh, another lightweight distribution, uh, but it's primarily designed to test Kubernetes, uh, and it helps you run Kubernetes clusters locally in a CIC, uh, CI pipeline using Docker's container as nodes. So it looks very similar uh, to Minikube, but uh, you know the key difference here is that it's using uh, Docker containers. So it is an open source CNCF certified Kubernetes uh, installer that supports highly available multi-node clusters and builds Kubernetes release build from its source. Um, and so, you know, some people like Minikube, some people like Kind. I personally like micro uh, Kubernetes, but it's just another tool and we will uh, give it a go and you'll see uh, it in action um, in the fall longs, okay? <laughs> 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at micro Kubernetes or micro K8s, uh, depending on how you like to say it. So um, before we talk about that, let's talk about a few other things like Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is a Linux distribution based on Debian. I'm gonna explain why this makes sense here in a moment. Uh, it seems like a deter, but it's not. So Ubuntu is known for lots of Linux programs pre-installed, uh, one of the easiest Linux dis distributions to use, more frequent updates, more progressive on new Linux programs and systems. And so here's an example of um, uh, Ubuntu, the desktop edition. Uh, but of course, you know, we would probably be using server or core because we would be utilizing it for running uh, uh, servers, right? And if you do not know, Ubuntu is produced by Canonical, and this is the company behind Ubuntu. And another project that Canonical makes is called Snap. So Snap is a package manager by Canonical that can be installed on many different distributions of Linux. And so here's an example of installing Ruby. And a lot of times you'll see this classic flag. Um, and so this allows access to your system's resources in much the same way a traditional package. So without the flag, Snaps runs in complete isolation. It just depends on the state of your uh, environment. But um, sometimes you have to use the flag, sometimes you don't. So let's talk about micro uh, Kubernetes. So micro Kubernetes or micro K8s, as I say, mostly throughout this course, is created by Canonical and is installed using Snap. That's why we're talking about those two things. So you do like a pseudo Snap install micro K8s. Um, and I think this is the major reason why we haven't seen as major adoption like Minikube as micro Kubernetes because of Snap. And Snap is actually really great, but just the idea of having to install a package man manager, people go, ah, I don't want to do it. You know what I mean? So, um, and also it's like the only time people do it is if they spin up Ubuntu, but Ubuntu is very popular on all cloud service providers. So it's pretty easy to get a uh, hold of. So it is a Kubernetes distribution designed to run fast, self-healing and highly available Kubernetes clusters. It is optimized for quick and easy installation of single node, multi-node clusters on, uh, mul on multiple operating systems, including Mac OS, Linux, and Windows, as long as you have Snap. Uh, it is ideal for running Kubernetes in the cloud, local development environments, and edge and IoT devices. Uh, you could devices you could use it for production use cases, but you probably would want to use a managed service for that. Uh, and if you did use it, you'd be using it for um, you know a self-hosted, right? Uh, so micro Kubernetes is a modular in design. Uh, you start with nothing and uh, you can enable add-ons to quickly use exactly what you need and nothing more. Uh, so I feel like this is like the best way of learning. And so we do end up uh, gravitating towards this lightweight distribution when we are doing our fall longs, but there you go. Okay, so we looked at a few different lightweight uh, Kubernetes distributions, and I just want to do a quick comparison here so you can kind of understand the differences of, of these things. So the first is Minikube, which runs in a virtual machine. It's intended just for development purposes, very easy to use, very, very popular, uh, probably the easiest one to uh, utilize, okay? Uh, then there's Kind, it's designed to run anywhere, containers run, so anywhere uh, uh, you, if Docker is running, you can run Kind in. It's intended just for development purposes. It has faster startup times than Minikube since it's not spinning up a virtual machine. So you have one that runs in a virtual machine, you have one that runs in containers. Then we have uh, K3S, and K3D, which are Kubernetes distributions by Rancher. Uh, they're slightly different in terms of what they start out with, like how they work. Uh, they are still CNCF certified. All these are CNCF certified Kubernetes, but these ones can be used for production use case. The difference between uh, K3S and K3D is this one is uh, basically installed on in bare metal uh, or embedded systems, and then K3D runs wherever Docker runs, anywhere that is similar to what Kind does. It's designed for embedded edge devices or limited resources. And we did cover that there are uh, some uh, design choices that make uh, these things limited compared to other uh, things for production use case. And you have to make a trade on that. Then we have a micro Kubernetes or micro K8s. Uh, this is created by a Canonical, the same company that um, publishes Ubuntu, you need Snap to install it. If there is another way, it's probably pretty hard to do. Uh, it's a modular, starts with uh, nothing installed, restarts everything if there's a crash. 
uh, well suited for uh, self-hosted production use cases. So uh, everything here is great for production. Everything here is great for development. But technically, you can use all of these for development. And even myself, I prefer to use micro Kubernetes um, for development. And I think it's great because then, you know, if, if you do do self-host, it would better reflect that production environment, but it's up to you what you wanna use. Um, and it's gonna be dependent on what resources you can find. So uh, there you go, okay? All right, let's take a look here at managed Kubernetes providers. And so these could be something like a cloud service provider or a cloud platform that abstracts away the effort of setting up, maintaining, like such as updating and patching a cluster, and they can easily uh, perform auto scaling as well. So, um, I mean, that's gonna vary the auto scaling part, but um, you know, mostly this is how people are setting up their Kubernetes. They're gonna be using a managed provider, very common to use a public cloud, um, but we'll talk about the ones that I know about. I'm sure there's ones outside of this, but these are probably the most uh, popular ones, especially if you are used to using CSPs. So the first is Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE. And in my experience, this was the easiest to use with the richest amount of features built into the UI, right? So when I wanted to set up an ingress controller, uh, and we did this in the course or, or, or set up a service that goes ingress, it was so easy to do. Um, and uh, it just had a really great experience out of all the, the big CSPs. Um, next, I would probably put uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. Um, it does have a very difficult uh, uh, UI. So um, AWS is like, you know, sometimes you'll be setting something up and it'll be like, you need this thing. And so you have to go to this other place and create it first and then go back. And so there is a bit of uh, running around. However, they do have a, um, a CLI uh, called um, EKS uh, CTL, I believe. And it really does make it a lot easier. So, uh, you know, it's not really recommended to use the UI. And a lot of people doing Kubernetes, you get used to using CLIs because of kubectl. But the real reason I think that Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, I put it second, is just because it's worth it for the integrations with other AWS services. Because, uh, you know, maybe uh, EKS is a bit clunky, but all the stuff around AWS, and that's what you want to be integrating with, like your uh, managed database and, and your persistent storage and things like that. It's just such a great ecosystem that that's why I put it second. But Google's really, really good. Uh, for uh, cloud native, you have Azure Kubernetes Service. This was fairly easy to use. Um, you know, it, like its interface wasn't as good as GKE, but you could uh, basically accomplish things. It has some unique offerings, like I've seen, like debugging live containers, which is really cool. Um, and they have good tutorials. So, like the thing is, is that you know, even though they're clunky, um, their instructions are uh, a lot better than AWS's, and so um, you know, it works a little bit better. But this is like if you are bought into that Microsoft ecosystem. So, you know, all three are, are pretty decent. I put these at the top three. Next is IBM uh, Cloud Kubernetes Service, also known as IKS. It's easy to use, um, beautiful, beautiful UI out of all the UIs that I saw. Um, it wasn't as feature rich as I was expecting to be, and it was very, very expensive. Um, and so like IBM likes to say it is cost effective because they actually do allow you to spin up a free Kubernetes tier. So technically, um, you know, for 30 days or, or what have you, you can actually have a, a free cluster. And this is actually a great way to test out a managed service. But the only problem is that the nodes are so darn expensive. And so you don't play for the control plane on uh, ICAS or IBM, uh, uh, IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service but the cost gets so expensive so fast. It's like using Heroku where it's like, it's free entry. Uh, the small SAP is, um, uh, you know, like very inexpensive, but then it gets super expensive, super fast. So I generally probably wouldn't recommend unless you are already using IBM and you like using bare metal and you're used to paying those kind of costs, okay? You have Oracle Container Engine for Kubernetes. Um, Oracle's known for being highly cost-effective out of all these other providers. Um, I don't think they charge you for the control plane, but honestly, their UI is really, really bad. And they even default it to bare metal when you start to spin it up. And if you do that, it'll cost you like thousands of dollars. So it's easy to make a mistake when setting it up and costing a lot of money. And, um, you know, support on Oracle is not very good. 
So if you do have a problem and there's a high chance you will, you know, just being cost effective is not going to help you. One thing I'll, I remember about IBM Cloud was that when I set it up, it was really good at estimating the costs and making it very clear what things cost. So kudos to IBM for that, but even still, like, it's still really expensive. You have DigitalOcean Kubernetes, so D-O-K-S. Very easy to use, predictable spend, um, beautiful UI. Um, and I mean, the only thing was that it was a bit like, everything was beautiful, but it was a bit clunky to use where I was like, like, you know what the experience is, like the UI is so good, but then like the technology kind of fails to deliver the same kind of reliability. And so it kind of feels like there's this beautiful UI and then things are a bit clunky behind the scenes. That's how DigitalOcean felt to me. But it, but it was very simple to use. You're not going to get that whole ecosystem that a cloud service provider is going to provide you, but it is very simple and easy to manage. If you're a startup, this is a very safe bet for you to do is use DigitalOcean Kubernetes. So it's not terrible, but um, uh, DigitalOcean is very, 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 very good with uh, tutorials. Um, and they had some stuff there, but for di Kubernetes, I'd say it's probably the weakest I've ever seen them for instructional content. They even had a dead link that I had to point out and be like, hey, this goes nowhere. So I think it's more of a newer service for them. And, uh, you know, as they continue to build out the resources around it, it'll be good. Then you have Sivo. Uh, it's the most cost effective. They don't charge for the control plane. Um, I wouldn't say the UI is beautiful, but it's extremely simple. So if you don't know what you're doing when you enter there, you might be a little bit frustrated at the start. Um, but uh, like if you use DigitalOcean, then you'll know how to use Sivos. Um, and they do have a nice like labs, like instructional content within Sivo. Um, but it really is just a cloud platform, but different from DigitalOcean, it is specialized just for Kubernetes, right? So they technically do have VMs and other stuff on there. But it's just it, it's more focused on Kubernetes than any other cloud platform, um, and so you know there's a lot of trade-offs there. You just got to decide what you'd want to use. For me, I'd be going with uh, EKS just because my primary workloads are already there. But I really did enjoy uh, Google Kubernetes Engine for sure. But there you go. All right, let's take a look here at management layers. There's a lot of management layers for Kubernetes, and some of these might kind of be their own distributions with a platform on top of them. Uh, so it's really hard to kind of um, put them in a box, but I try to group them separate from distributions as best I could that were pure distributions. So uh, management layers are for running Kubernetes on other platforms or allows you to extend your control plane to multiple platform. And when I say other platforms, I mean like, um, you know, like AWS has EKS, and that is their Kubernetes as a service offering. But I'm saying like, there is no as a service, you're just like setting it up on maybe their virtual machines or things like that. So let's go walk through them. The first is Weave Kubernetes Platform, WKP. Now, if you go to the website right now, you can't find this exactly. It's kind of weird. They might've rebranded this as like Weave uh, Core or something like that. But um, um, I just stuck with this name because I preferred it. So all of Weave's open sources tools packaged as a platform so you can build out a GitOps enabled cluster. And so what it looked like to me was that they had a lot of CI CD stuff. And um, the idea is like you could set up a cluster relatively easy uh, most places and have good governance over them, good way of being very uh, agile and just start to get to work. So that was kind of interesting. Then there is Rafe. No idea if that's the correct pronunciation, but uh, similar to OpenShift, and we'll talk about OpenShift in a moment, but with a larger focus on governance and GitOps-based uh, management for any Kubernetes clusters running on anything, including OpenShift. So when you go to the Rafe website, uh, they'll have this picture of like showing that they can manage anything from anywhere. And so the idea is if you buy into their system, um, you know, you just need to learn one interface as opposed to a bunch of them. And so that could be very attractive. Then there's VMware Tanzu. So wherever vSphere runs, you can manage, you, uh, you can manage uh, and deploy and monitor Kubernetes cluster. Um, my knowledge of VMware is not that strong. Uh, like I kind of know what v <laughs> vSphere is. Like it's a thing that you install on your virtual machines and it has to do with virtualization. So uh, think of it like, um, you go on AWS and I would assume that you install this on bare metal. Probably that's what you do. So imagine you have like bare metal, like machines that don't have virtualization installed on it. And so you install vSphere, you press a button that sets up vSphere and you install your license. But anywhere there's vSphere is anywhere you could install Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, and then you can manage it from Tanzu. So like it makes it, it's like a management layer uh, anywhere. So kind of similar to Rayfei, but Rayfei is actually prop, uh, leveraging um, the actual as a service um, offerings. So like it'll actually leverage EKS. It's not like uh, it's a VM, you know what I mean? Like it's a custom install. So there's kind of a difference there. Then you have these things that are um, multi-cluster management. So first is Azure Arc. And so this allows you to govern compute such as Kubernetes, like, and also virtual machines or SQL servers across more than a single cloud service provider on premise or on the edge. So it's not Kubernetes specific, but it is very often used for Kubernetes. And the idea is we are uh, extending our control plane. So we have one interface uh, to govern uh, compute other places, right? Um, and uh, that's really useful, I feel like, from a compliance standpoint. So like, let's say you want to run stuff on a uh, AWS or somewhere else, um, but, uh, you know, like it just becomes a lot more complicated if, if, uh, you know, from a governance standpoint, so it's really nice to have a single tool, uh, for that. Okay. We have Google Anthos. So this is also multi-cluster management. This one in specific is just Kubernetes. And I, as far as I understand, it's GKE. So Google Kubernetes, uh, en um, engine, but it's extending the, uh, the cluster to be, uh, managed on other, uh, cloud service providers, so like I believe AWS. I don't think they have Azure for some reason or on premise. But basically, um, it takes over VMs, as far as I understand, and then installs uh, whatever it installs on that, and then allows you to manage everything from Anthos. Um, and so, you know, from a Kubernetes perspective, I think it has an edge over Azure Arc, um, but it doesn't talk about like governance and stuff like that. So maybe for like a security or, or like compliance standpoint, Azure Arc might be better, but not as nice to use. Then you have Platform 9. So this is similar to Rayfe, but uh, relies more on third-party tooling, whatever that means. But as far as I understand, it doesn't leverage native functionality from cloud service providers. So it's not using GKE or it's not using EKS. Uh, it is using some other thing that might be installed in virtual machines to kind of like uh, simulate maybe what Google Anthos is doing, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's the idea there. So this is this stuff. And then there's two that I kind of want to give a, a little bit more attention to because they're bigger deals like Rancher and OpenShift. So Red Hat has OpenShift and it's a platform as a service for Kubernetes. And so K OpenShift is just Kubernetes. Like it's not, it's a distribution, but the idea is that it is just a commercial platform with Kubernetes installed on it. And then they've extended like uh, a platform around it to make it really easy to use. Um, and what's interesting, like when I saw an IBM cloud, you could actually launch OpenShift in IBM cloud and you can probably do it in other cloud service providers. Um, so the idea here is that they, uh, they extend kubectl. So they have their own called OC, which stands for open shift. I think it'd be OS, but it's OC CLI. And so it has some additional functionality that makes conveniences easier, like RBAC, which is kind of a pain to set up and they make that a lot easier and things like that. You can quickly deploy local code to a remote OpenShift cluster via Odo. So that's another uh, uh, CLI tool they have that makes things easier. Um, they have quality assurance pipeline built into the platform. So that saves you some time there. Fixing critical bugs earlier instead of waiting for our next Kubernetes release that Red Hat is known for uh, being very, 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 very good in the enterprise for um, rolling out bugs fixes very quickly, right? Because they're used to managing their Red Hat distribution um, and so, you know, that's really the reason people pay for it is just to make sure that everything's patched and good. Uh, their platform utilizes Red Hat Core OS. Um, and this is an operate, operating system optimized for running containers. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Operators Hub is an automated installation tool for one-click marketplace. Other providers like GKE is a one-click marketplace. So I'm assuming that's even more integrated because it, it's so opinionated about even like the operating system that it must be really easy uh, to set up. Um, it has a graphical UI for developer consoles. So that's really nice. Code ready workspace. This was really interesting. So like developer environments, uh, and we use one in the course, Cloud9, and we look at uh, Google's for a bit, but um, this one is specific for Kubernetes, right? The only thing is like, I didn't use it because um, Red Hat is such a pain to sign up for. Like I tried signing up for OpenShift and it couldn't take my Canadian postal code and it broke and I waited like a week for them to fix it. And they're asking for so much information. It was, I was not happy about it, but like they do have like a 30 day trial, but I don't know, I thought it was better to use cloud nine in that case, but it's just very impressive to see that there's a cloud developer environment for Kubernetes because like I, you can't do it on Gitpod. 
And uh, on AWS, we do it because we're running a virtual machine, but I mean, this one's more optimized for it. We have Rancher Kubernetes Engine, RKE, and uh, I don't know why the logo's not there, probably shows up at the end here, but it runs entirely within Docker containers. Um, Rancher is the one that bit, uh, built K3S. I don't think it's K3S in particular. It's their own. Dis it's another distribution because I would imagine that you'd want the full power of Kubernetes. It works on bare metal and virtualized servers. RKE solves the problem of installation complexity, a common issue in the Kubernetes community. Installation operation of Kubernetes is both simplified, easily automated. It's entirely independent of the operating system and platform you're running. As long as you can run a supported version of Docker, you can deploy and run Kubernetes with RKE. So as far as I understand, you can bring RKE anywhere you want. So it's like, oh, you want to run on AWS? Great, make sure you have something like a VM that runs Docker, right? Go to Google, checkbox Docker and uh, use that thing. And so that gives you a bit more ability there. But you know, these are the two big ones, I would say. Um, and that's why I gave them a lot more detail, but there you go. So something you're gonna keep hearing is a term that is CNCF, Certified Kubernetes. What does it mean when a distribution has been certified by the CNCF? Well, they have this page called Software Conformance. Uh, and the idea is that uh, they have this kind of test that you can run that gives a guarantee that your Kubernetes does what it says it does, that it meets um, a very specific requirements in order to uh, conform uh, to uh, what is expected with the open source um, Kubernetes. And so here you can see that there is a lot of distributions, like even here it says like 60 something. I think they say like there's 80 plus, um, over 90, <laughs> over 90 certified Kubernetes offerings. But the idea is that if they all are certified, then more or less they will work uh, pretty much the same um, with the expectation of what they are asking. And uh, there is like a landscape for it here. So like I, I clicked the link somewhere here and it's just another way of opening up and seeing pretty much the same stuff in the cloud native landscape. Uh, and the way it works is um, they have a bunch of instructions here to run the conformance tests. And it looks like um, it uses this tool called Sano uh, Boi. And so this is a diagnostic tool that makes it easier to understand the state of a Kubernetes cluster. So this checks for the state and then you actually have the tests which probably reside uh, somewhere in here. They probably explain that there. So just kind of giving you an idea of what we mean when we say CNCF uh, certified distribution, okay? All right, let's take a look here at container runtime interfaces. And to understand that, we need to understand uh, what's um, on top of it and what's below it. So the first thing uh, when we think about um, uh, this kind of this kind of layered approach is orchestration. So you would have something like either Docker or Kubernetes. And so these orchestration systems will use a container runtime interface. Now at one point in time, Docker just meant containers, right? Um, but uh, there was work to be had where they started separating out all these components. And this is basically where we see container runtime interfaces and container runtimes underneath, which are the actual containers. And so the idea here is that, um, you know, Kubernetes would be utilizing something like either container D um, or it would be using something like CRIO. So when we talk about container runtime interface, you'll notice that's why I never had an icon uh, earlier in the course when we were talking about container runtime interface because the runtime interface is one of these two, okay? So container runtime interface allows you to run a variety of different container runtimes and so the CRI actually is doing things like pushing and pulling images and supervising containers. It's not the thing that creates and runs the containers. What does that is the container runtimes. And the containers that we care about are OCI compliant, so from the Open Container Initiative. And we have two types, native runtimes and sandbox slash virtualized runtimes. And the major difference between these two types of runtimes between native and virtual is isolation. So for virtualized, it can provide security benefits through isolation because it's virtual. So you can have more controls around it. Um, so, you know, hopefully that helps make sense that you have an orchestration and that's gonna choose a container runtime. And then from there, it's going to choose um, a, a interface. And then from there, it's gonna choose a runtime. 
But I think by default, when we use Kubernetes, most times what it's going to be using, it's going to be Kubernetes, it's going to be container D, and then it's going to be run C. And there used to be a lot more container run times, but I had to look at each one and I found so many were like no longer maintained. And so I think that this is like the new list that you'll mostly see is like run C, Nabla, and uh, uh, Kata, okay? <laughs> All right, let's talk about container D. And with these container runtime interfaces, um, they don't really tell you a lot about how they work internally. Um, I tried so hard to find some kind of visual and I just couldn't find anything. And so, you know, if I can't find it, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. So container D is an industry standard uh, container runtime with an emphasis on simplicity, robustness, and portability. And the way it started was it was part of Docker and they extracted out their container runtime into the project we know now as container D and then uh, gave it to the CNCF. So this includes Docker functionality for executing containers, handling low level storage, managing uh, image transfers, and container D makes it easier for projects like Kubernetes to access low level Docker elements they need instead of actually using Docker. So when you're building images, you, uh, you aren't actually building uh, Docker images, you're uh, building open container initiatives, which has been standardized um, for the container industry. Okay. Well, let's take a look at CRIO. So CIRO is an implementation of the Kubernetes CRI interface to enable OCI um, uh, compatible runtime. So the CRI stands for Container Runtime Interface, and the O stands for OCI, okay? So that's the logic there, and it's just an alternative to Containerd. So it's a lightweight alternative to using Docker Containerd as a runtime for Kubernetes. It allows Kubernetes to use OCI-compliant runtime as the container runtime for running pods. Today, it supports Run C and Kata containers. I didn't look at what Containerd supports for runtimes underneath, but that's where you know, if you need particular runtimes, you might have to choose a runtime interface that you can use. And when you use managed providers, they might lock you into very particular container runtime interfaces that you cannot swap out. So that is something that might matter to you, but it really is more like a security and performance thing uh, and not so much like functionality wise because things don't seem to be much different. Um, so that's the idea there. But uh, yeah, so CRIO is just an alternative to container D. And you know, I wish there was more to say about these container runtime interfaces, but that's all I have to find, okay? So let's talk about container runtimes. And again, there's not a lot to get into detail about container runtimes, but a key thing to understand is the difference between virtualized and uh, ones that are native runtimes that are utilizing uh, the machine directly. And so um, from Kata containers, they have this nice graphic that makes it very clear um, visually what the difference is. So virtualized runtimes uses lightweight VMs for isolation. Uh, and then native runtimes are on the machine and they're using C groups, shared kernels and other things for uh, isolation. So, you know, in that sense, when everything is in a lightweight VM, you can put a lot more restrictions around it. Um, and so that is something that makes it uh, a lot better from a security perspective. It confuses me because like, I would imagine that, um, you know, like you can run, can you run a lightweight VM inside of a VM? I don't know. Um, so I don't know if like you just re replace the hypervisor with something like LXC, which is something we actually do talk about um, in the section of this course is like um, Linux containers. Um, where it's not full virtualization, it's lightweight virtualization. So I imagine that's probably the difference, but I just couldn't find definitively if that was the truth. Um, so let's just talk about run C, which is a native container runtime. So it's a low level container runtime that creates and runs containers, and it would be used alongside container D or CRIO. And that's all I could really tell you about it. Um, so imagine you have container D, and remember uh, container D or CRI, they're basically similar. It's a daemon process that manages and runs containers, pushes and pulls images, managing storage and networking, supervises the running of containers. And then you have your container runtime, like let's say run C, which creates and runs containers. So just reiterating that, I know we said it like three times, but just make sure you know the difference between a container runtime interface and a container runtime, okay? <laughs> 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at C groups. So, what is a C group? Well, we have to answer what is a process first. So, a process is an instance of a running program on Linux. So, then what is a C group? Well, C group stands for control groups and allows you to group processes to apply different kinds of limitations. So, limitations could be things like resource limiting. So, groups can be set to not exceed a configured memory limit which also includes file system cache, prioritization, so some groups may get a larger share of CPU utilization or disk input output throughput, accounting, so measures a group's resources usage, which may be used for example, like billing purposes, control, so freezing groups of processes, uh, uh, so they're checkpointing and restarting. So think of C groups as a way to limit programs on Linux from overusing CPU memory storage. Um, and the reason we're learning about C groups is because of Linux containers. So the primary goal, uh, design goal of C groups was to provide a unified interface to manage processes or whole operating system level virtualizations, including Linux containers. And, um, you know, I came across C groups even recently when I was using Git pods because I wanted to run Kubernetes on Git pods, but I found out that uh, at the time, and probably still, that uh, they're using Docker with a version that is using C groups version one. And so to support uh, Kubernetes, the run within Docker, which is kind of weird running Docker inside Kubernetes to run Docker, um, uh, it needed version two. So C groups is something you definitely will come across. Uh, and so that's why uh, I mention it to you here. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are talking about Linux containers. So Linux containers is an OS level virtualization technology that allows creation and running of multiple isolated Linux virtual environments on a single control host. And so the idea is that Linux containers or uh, virtual environments in particular are paired against virtual machines quite often because um, I mean, the idea is virtual environments are more lightweight, so why would you use one over another? So virtual environments, there is no preloaded emulation manager software as a virtual machine. In a virtual environment, the application or OS is spawned in a container and runs with no added overhead except for uh, a usually minuscule uh, virtual environment initialization process. There is no hardware emulation, which means that aside from the small memory uh, uh, small software penalty. LXC, so Linux containers, will boost bare metal performance characters because it only packages the needed application. And uh, VEs, I didn't capitalize Z on that, cannot be easily managed via neat GUI management consoles. And they don't offer some neat features of virtual machines such as infrastructure as a service setup and live migration. So uh, I definitely didn't rework this text wherever I got it from. Uh, that's what it is plain, but I just wanted to mention Linux containers because, you know, uh, it is a type of virtualization for containers. Um, uh, it's quite popular there and I came across it somewhere in the course. And so I just had to figure out what it was. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from exam pro, and we are taking a look at container storage interface, also known as CSI. And what CSI does is it standardizes how container orchestrator systems, so COS, access to various storage providers. Now, I don't find that this is a very common initialism, but um, I found it, so I just put it in there. So a container orchestrator system is on one side, and on the other side, we have our storage providers, and in between, we have our cloud storage interface. So Container orchestrator systems could be things like Mesos, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm. So we know what Kubernetes is. Mesos was like um, a very early orchestrator system, very modular and things like that. I think it's still kind of in use, um, but I don't know if it'll stay around for long because a lot of people moved over to Kubernetes. And then Docker Swarm is kind of like a competing thing for Kubernetes because Docker didn't really do orchestration the same way that Kubernetes did, but now it can with Docker Swarm. So storage providers would be things like Azure Disk, AWS Elastic uh, Block Storage, NetApp, Trident, uh, OpenStack, uh, Cinder, 
Google Cloud Storage. There's over a hundred plus storage and plugin drivers. And so, um, you know, the CSI is uh, essentially what we're using when we are per using persistent volumes, okay? Because persistent volumes are pretty much dealing with block storage. And, um, you know, most of these plugins are block storage. I'm sure there's object storage in there as well. Um, and the cloud storage interface is not something you really have to worry about because it's kind of abstracted away. But if you were to develop a uh, your own storage provider, then you would have to know how the container storage interface worked because you have to make it compatible with it in order to provide your, um, your volume, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes backing store and etcd. So components of Kubernetes clusters, including pods, nodes, control planes, volumes, all sorts of things need a level protection in case of disaster. We need to store the state of what our stuff is in case we need to recover it. So what Kubernetes does is it uses or it uh, stores the state data inside something called uh, etcd, which is a key value store, wall, which we'll talk in a moment. But it is possible to uh, back uh, or use a different backing storage like MariaDB. I have no idea how, but I know that it's possible. And so application data is stored in persistent volumes for applications running on clusters. Um, but understand that the, the resources um, are like the state of those are stored in a key value store. So etcd is a strongly consistent distributed key value store that provides a reliable way to store data that needs to be accessed by a distributed system or clusters of machines. And etcd resides in the control plane node and you need to know that's where it is. So, uh, etcd is not just used uh, for the backing storage, it's used by um, some uh, other projects. So obviously the Kubernetes cluster uses it because of the control plane, Core DNS uses it, Rook uses it, um, but you don't see it used for other things. It's a key value store and it serves its purpose like in these cases, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at MinIO and Rook. And the reason I want to look at them is because uh, you might see them as options on the exam. And if you know what they are, it's going to really help you determine what the right answer is. Rook and MinIO are two things that we do not cover in the follow alongs because they're a little bit too complex to set up. Um, and they're interesting because, like, they are basically, um, I would say, like, special types of storage. Um, but we'll talk about what they are so you kind of understand. So Rook turns distributed storage systems into self-managing, self-scaling, self-healing storage services. It automates the task of a storage administrator, so deployment, bootstrapping, configuration, provisioning, scaling, upgrading, mitigation, disaster recovery, monitoring, and resource management. And it can use things like Cepher FS, I believe, and things like that. But basically, as it says, it's distributed storage systems. Okay, so when you think of pods, pods are generally backed by block storage. But uh, this kind of stuff is not attached to a specific pod. It's just distributed storage that you use. Um, maybe this would be for like data pipeline workloads or things like that. I don't know. I didn't. I haven't deployed Rook but I just know that I've seen the word on the exam, and so I wanted to point out kind of what it was. MinIO is a lot more clear to me, its use case. So it offers high performance S3 compatible object storage. So it's essentially object storage, um, and it has a, um, it says S3 compatible, it basically works just like S3. So it's native Kubernetes, so MinIO is the only object storage suite available in every public cloud. Uh, I, I, I mean, Anywhere that you can deploy Kubernetes, basically, uh, you can use it. So MinIO is software-defined and 100% open source under uh, new APGL version 3. So I really like the idea of MinIO. It's, I really like S3, so uh, MinIO is an easy sell for me. Um, but yeah, that's all those two things are, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at volumes. So Kubernetes supports many types of volumes, and a pod can use any number of uh, volume types simultaneously. So let's talk about the different types. We've got persistent volumes. So these, this is when you're attaching external storage to a pod, and the data will persist even if the pod is terminated. We have uh, ephemeral, 
I I have looked this up before, but I just can't remember how to say it. Epheromal volumes. So a volume that only exists as long as the pod exists, intended for temporary data storage. So I mentioned it here, but we don't actually use it in the KCNA um, as an example. Projected volume, so maps several existing volume sources into the same directory. And volume snapshot, so archiving uh, a volume configuration and its data for rollbacks or backups. So uh, yeah, in the KCNA, I don't show fall long on doing volume snapshots, but they're not that complicated. They're not covered in the exam. Um, and one thing that's not here is PVC. We cover it in the course. I just not mentioning it here because it's not a volume. It's a way of claiming a volume. Now, these are types of volumes, but there's also types of volumes that are supported that you can uh, be backed by, right? So the idea is persistent volume attaches to a storage class and um, you know it has to be something, right? So here we have Elastic Block Store, Azure Disk, Azure File, Cepher, I think that's how you pronounce it, Cepher, Cinder, Config Maps, um, maybe Local Storage, NFS, Secrets. Uh, we have the persistent volume claim. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff there and you don't need to remember the whole list, but you will in practicality understand when we use um, a storage class and we have a persistent volume and we have it attached to something, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at persistent volumes. So uh, a persistent volume or PV is a piece of storage in the cluster that has been provisioned by an administrator or dynamically provisioned using storage classes. So here is my diagram. And so a PV is similar to a node in that it's a cluster resource, okay? So um, when I say that, uh, a persistent volume does not reside within a node or a pod. Um, and I want to point out that this diagram here is technically not accurate. I just had it as a simple vocation. And also while I was learning Kubernetes, um, it wasn't clear to me that you had to have a persistent volume claim. Uh, and only when I did the follow along did I realize that you always 100% have to have one. Um, but there are diagrams out there that don't show the PVC. So um, I thought this was accurate at the time that I made it, but I still left this in just so I could say that this was technically not accurate and that sometimes you'll see um, diagrams that do not have a PVC, okay? And we'll talk about PVC in the next slide. So don't worry if it doesn't make sense right now or future slides here. So uh, persistent volumes are volume plugins like volumes, but have a life cycle independent of any individual pod that uses the persistent volume. So the idea is if the pod goes down, the persistent, persistent volume uh, can still remain. It really depends on your reclaim type or uh, yeah, how you wanna reclaim it. So the API objects captures the details of the implementation of the storage, be that NFS, iSCSI, or a cloud provider specific storage system. Mounting persistent volumes directly to a pod is not allowed and is against the Kubernetes design principles. It would cause tight coupling below the pod volume and the underlying storage. That's why we need a persistent volume claim to ensure decoupling. So there you go. All right, let's take a look at storage classes. So a storage class is a way of defining a class of storage that is backed by a provisioner. And so here is an example diagram uh, that we have here. And just notice that I don't have PVC in here because again, some diagrams online do not show the PVC, but they are always, always there. Um, and we will address that when we get to the PVC, which probably is the next slide. Um, and so to set up a storage class, the idea here is um, we need to define a few things. So we need to define the provisioner. So who is this from? Uh, so this is from AWS, so it's going to Elastic Block Store. Uh, parameters, what type of storage so uh, to use? So in this case, we are saying use the GPU type of Elastic Block Store on AWS. You have the reclaim policy. So um, you know if the pod is deleted, it should retain the persistent volume. It should not vanish. Notice that the storage class is just like, uh, defined and then it's um, associated with a persistent volume. 
So it can be uh, that way there. But notice that a storage class doesn't define one volume, but it's just saying like, okay, persistent volume, you're gonna be using elastic block and you're gonna be using elastic block, but they have their own um, uh, block storage for each of those, okay? Okay, so we kept on mentioning persistent volume claims and here we are, PVCs. So a persistent volume claim is used to decouple persistent volumes from pods and a PVC uh, will ask for a type of storage and if a persistent volume meets that criteria, it is matched and the persistent volume uh, is then claimed and bound, okay? So what does that mean? Well, if we go down below here, the idea is we have our persistent volume claim and we're saying, I want, um, I want a elastic block store and it has to be at least uh, 500 megabytes. And then the persistent volume says, oh, well, I have a 30 gigabyte one here. So match up to me. That's the idea there. So PVCs are similar to a pod requesting resources from a node. So pods consume node resources. So a persistent volume claim consumes persistent volume resources. Pods can request specific levels of resources like compute and memory, as I was describing here. And a persistent volume claim can request specific sizes and access modes. Uh, and here's an example of a persistent volume claim. Uh, notice that the storage class is mentioned. Sometimes I see it there, sometimes I don't. Um, and sometimes I see it with like uh, double quotation. So, you know, just be aware there are some variants there, not something super important to understand right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that should be clear. Uh, yeah, there's also the storage type. So this one would match on the storage type and the access mode to uh, find it. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at config maps. So config maps is an API object used to store non-confidential data in key value pairs for pods. Pods can consume config maps as environment variables, command line arguments, configuration files in a volume. And so here is an example of one, and we do use this one in the follow along uh, but the idea here is that you have a section, I mean, you define the config map, you define your data, uh, and notice that you can have a key and a value. And then for some, uh, there's ones that are multi-line that get interpreted a particular way when you parse them. So here's an example of a config map. And just notice that you can use a config map uh, for more than a single pod. Um, a config map allows you to decouple environment-specific configuration from your container images so that your applications are easily portable. So yeah, you are passing along basically environment variables or things to uh, provide application configuration. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Kubernetes services. So Kubernetes services allow you to attach a static IP address and a DNS name for a set of pods. And a Kubernetes service allows you to persist an address for a pod, even if it dies. And the service also acts as a load balancer. And I kind of regret not having like something that looked a little bit more like a load balancer by like having a second uh, line to drag there to show load balancing. But um, I mean, that's the way I designed the icon. But here you can see we have a service. We have endpoints, so that's basically um, the storing of the public IP address uh, so that we can map the service to the pod. Um, and you can see that this will have, I mean, I didn't write it in here, but this would actually have a static IP address that never changed, and then it would randomly distribute to the ones there. A pod without a service will have a dynamic IP address, so when the pod dies, so does the IP address. So that is the reason we want a service, so that doesn't happen. Kubernetes services have the following service types. We have cluster IP. This is the default. If you don't specify a type, it will be a cluster IP. It randomly forwards traffic to any pod uh, set with the target port. You have headless, sends traffic to a very specific pod when you have stateful uh, uh, pods like a database. And we covered headless um, in the stateful set section there where it doesn't assign a static IP address. It doesn't do load balancing. It just gives you um, like a DNS hostname resolution, so you can specify the pod that way. Uh, we have node ports, so external service that allows you to use 
uh, a worker node IP address. So it's a way of exposing um, the node, like with like opening a port on the node, because generally a cluster IP, you know, it's internal, so you have to access it within the cluster. But we'll talk about that when we get to um, that slide there. We have load balancer, similar to node port, accepts leverages cloud service providers load balancers. And then we have external names. So a special service that does not have selectors and uses DNS names instead. And this is uh, used when, let's say you, ha you have a, a database, um, like a managed database, like from AWS RDS or Google Cloud Span or something like that. And uh, you can't point to an IP address and you need to point to a DNS name. So use an external name to point to external resources. <laughs> All right, let's talk about traffic policies for services. So a service allows you to set a traffic policy to determine how ingress traffic is routed. There are two types of traffic policies, external traffic policies, so how traffic from external sources is routed and has two valid values, cluster, so route traffic to all the ready endpoints, local, so only route uh, to ready node local endpoints. We have internal traffic policy, so how traffic from internal sources is routed and has the same values above cluster and local. So if the traffic policy is local, then there are no node local endpoints, then then Kube proxy uh, does not forward any traffic for rel uh, relative servants, uh, relative, uh, relevant services. We do not cover this in the fall long traffic policies. We do not need to create one, um, but I just wanted to point it out because I think I saw the term on the exam and I, it wasn't an answer, but I just saw it and I just wanted to include that so you knew what it was. Let's take a look at the cluster IP service type. So cluster IP is the default service type. So if you don't specify one, this is what you're gonna get. It is used for internal traffic. External traffic will not reach the service. So traffic will be randomly distributed to any targeted pod. So here's an example where we have internal traffic. It goes to proxy, um, which goes to our cluster IP to your pods. So traffic originating from within the cluster will pass through the nodes Kubernetes proxy, and then onto the Kubernetes service. That's where it's using something like uh, IP tables or stuff to do um, the load balancing, but we can use that or IPVS, which we do cover in this course. Um, if you omit the, uh, omit the type, it will be cluster IP, but here I am explicitly specifying it. A service can span multiple worker nodes for cross node pods. Uh, and that is not just specific to, um, Cluster IP, that's all of them, which I should have mentioned in the service section there. But just taking a look here over on the right-hand side, we have our port and our target port. So our target port is the port that we want to target on the pod. So if we're running a web application on port 8080, that would be the target pod. And if we wanted to um, uh, send traffic uh, to a particular port, like port 80, it would forward over to the 8080 port. Okay, so hopefully uh, that is pretty clear. So when would you use the cluster IP? Well, for debugging, testing, internal traffic, internal dashboards. But honestly, like when I was doing the follow-alongs, there were cases where there were there were ways of um, uh, there were there was lots of use cases for a cluster IP. But this is what uh, Kubernetes tells us that it's used for. So that's what I wrote there. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look at node port service. So node port allows you to expose a port for a virtual machine, a node running pods that the service is managing. And so the idea is this is what, a way we can get external traffic in. It's the easiest way to get a, a, a traffic in, but not necessarily the recommended way for production use cases. Uh, and over here, this looks a lot similar to our, clus our cluster IP manifest file, but here we're specifying node port and now it has um, this target port. So there is no external load balancer. So node port is intended for a single Kubernetes service and for non-production workloads. Um, and since I have the diagram here, I'm just gonna quickly explain how these three ports work and then we'll go and look at a more verbose text description so that we just are, we're very familiar with these three numbers. So node port is the port that you're exposing the node on, the machine, so that the traffic can reach it to. 
port is the service port, so the port that you have to hit internally to reach the pods, and the target port is the port here that uh, is our application is listening on. So I wrote 8080, but this one says 80, okay? So just to reiterate, because it is kind of confusing and I just want to give it some extra attention, port. Port exposes the Kubernetes service on the specified port within the cluster. Other pods within the cluster can communicate with the service on the specified port. Target port is the port on which the service will send requests to uh, that the pod will be listening on. Your application uh, in the container will need to be listening on this port also. Node port. Node port exposes a service externally to the cluster by means of the target, uh, uh, target node's IP address and node port. Node port is the default setting if the port field is not specified. So there you go. All right, let's take a look at the load balancer service type. This allows you to use an external load balancer and the external load balancer handles the routing and traffic distribution logic. So the idea an external load balancer could be something like the AWS network load balancer, uh, which would be managed by a third party cloud service. Um, and so the example here is we are specifying type load balancer. And then the status here, the load balancer is we're specifying the ingress. So like the IP address, I suppose of the load balancer. And then sometimes we have to specify the cluster IP. Um, I'm a bit confused about this because uh, in the follow alongs, we generally use ingress instead of load balancer and ingress seems to utilize um, the load balancers of a like a cloud service provider. So probably people don't use load balancer often or at all. Uh, and then when I do see them in the documentation, they're describing uh, level three or four load balancers. So uh, this isn't at the application layer. So maybe there is a case for it. Maybe ingress came later and then this just became kind of mute, but it is a type of service. So we do learn how to do it. Um, load balancer type is well suited for production workloads. Generally it's recommended to use the Kubernetes ingress as I just said here. Let's take a look at the headless service type. And we've already had exposure to this a couple times, but let's talk about it one more time. A headless service is a service uh, with no cluster IP address. A headless service does not provide load balancing or proxy proxying. Uh, so the idea is you have a cluster, um, you have a kind, which is cluster. So even though we don't specify, it is still a cluster IP kind, but uh, we are specifying cluster IP none. Okay, so that's what makes it headless. So headless are useful when you are dealing with a stateful application, so like reads and writes, and you need the writes to go to a specific pod. So here is a diagram that is different from the one that we saw uh, earlier, but makes the point clear, where you have the headless service, it's pointing to a pod, and the way it works is the naming is based off of um, the pod and the service. So if you have pod one, it's called that, and then uh, the, the headless service called hserve, that's gonna be the DNS record that you use. Headless services need to manage network identity for, uh, uh, for or of the st uh, stateful pods by assigning a DNS record to each pod so you can route traffic to a DNS host name. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the external name service type. So external name services is the same as a cluster IP service with the exception of instead of returning a static IP, it returns a CNAME record. So what is a CNAME record? Well, it stands for uh, canonical name record and it's a DNS record that maps one domain name, an alias, to another one, a canonical name. Um, and so an idea here would be, a CNAME would be like mydatabase.example.com, which would point to like if you had um, a pod that was trying to call out to that um, uh, domain name, the C name would route it to the external service uh, and that's how that would work. Though here I'm showing pods. So um, I mean, maybe it would make more sense if the arrows went this way. But anyway, the point is, is that it's used for um, routing things to external services. So 
I don't show it here, but imagine you have RDS. Okay, RDS, you cannot sign an IP address. It has like a, a fancy DNS host name. So you would put RDS's host name here. And so when the pod um, in your application code would hit this address, it would go to the external service and that's how it would know where to go, all right? So really this should be pointing to this, I suppose, okay? But you know, hopefully that is clear. It is very clear in the follow-alongs because we talk about it a few times, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and I wanna point out a very particular command for kubectl that has strong relationships to deployments, to services, and this is the expose command. So expose is used to quickly create Kubernetes services for deployment, so here it is. And uh, we do it uh, quite a few times where we'll type kubectl expose, then the deployment, uh, then the app. Sometimes the documentation will show it like this, where it'll say deployment forward slash my app. And again, that's just a um, alternative syntax that you can use. You can definitely use spaces. You could say deploy and then the app probably works with replica sets as well, but honestly you should always be using deploys anyway. Uh, but the idea here is that it just allows you to quickly create a service and attach it um, so that it points to the pods of a particular deployment. So here what you can see is that we are setting up one that is a node port service. We're setting the name, the port, the target port, the node port. I'm assuming I got that right and I wasn't supposed to put a hyphen in between there or something. Um, and there is another command where it's like kubectl create service. And so those can have kind of a bit of an overlap, but the idea there is that if you create a service, um, it still has to link to something. So most cases, it doesn't make sense to do that. There's probably some edge cases. And I feel like kubectl expose does a little bit more. Like I thought maybe like it added a proxy or did something, but I just could not find that documentation. And I found it somewhere online, it wasn't the official docs. So there, it definitely does a little bit more, but I don't fully understand that extra bit to explain it to you. But I just know that uh, we will use it and uh, if you always can, use manifest files to create your services, um, but this is just really good for a quick way to expose um, Kubernetes or uh, like a Kubernetes uh, pods, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and let's talk about BusyBox. So BusyBox combines tiny versions of many common Unix utilities in a single small executable. It's basically the Swiss army knife of embedded Linux as the single executable replaces basic functions of more than 300 common commands. And so BusyBox can be used to interactively debug services to ensure they are working. Um, I'm pretty sure on the uh, the CK, CKD, you will use BusyBox um, for things. And in this course, we use BusyBox. Uh, so that is something that we can do there. Usually it's gonna be something like kubectl run, dot it so interactive t i don't know what the it stands for but i remember doing it many times but this is an example of running busy box that um is continuously running and you can sh into it and then use its many commands one command it does not have which is very frustrating is curl because i really prefer curl over wget so even though it has 300 it doesn't have curl but uh, i guess you can't have all the commands you want but it is still very useful <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes Ingress, probably the hardest service to deal with, not because Ingress is super hard to write, but you have to deal with Ingress controllers and configuring those can be kind of difficult. And in the follow alongs, we definitely uh, have a bit of a struggle there, but we do get through it uh, and we do it multiple times, but let's talk about Ingress. So Ingress exposes HTTP and HTTPS routes from outside the cluster to the service within the cluster and traffic routing is controlled by rules defined on the ingress resource. So here is our diagram here. The reason we use Kubernetes ingress is so we can translate a custom domain on an SSL to a service running within our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, in order for ingress to work, you need to have an ingress controller, something like AWS GCE's uh, load balancer, uh, or I guess ingress controller, they're called ingress controllers or Nginx ingress controller. Generally, those are coupled to um, uh, particular load balancers, right? So uh, for those providers, which you'll see. So Ingress enables you to consolidate the traffic routing rules into a single resource and run as a part of the Kubernetes cluster. So getting out my pen tool here, 
Um, just making sure we're on the same place. We have our traffic. It reaches our ingress controller. This one is Nginx. And from there, it goes to our ingress service, which um, defines the routes. And then it goes to, it routes to the service and then the service will reach our pods. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at DNS. So DNS stands for Domain Name Systems. And uh, I mean, the way I'm conceptualizing it is that it's a service that is responsible for translating or resolving a service name to its IP address. So this is in the context of Kubernetes because DNS stuff is um, complicated, uh, uh, so to say. Um, and we could spend, I don't know, like a micro course just talking about DNS, but I just want to focus on that last part, translating or resolving a service, so a Kubernetes service name to an IP address. And so for um, a domain name system, it's not uncommon to have like a table of things that point to things. So we would have a service registry. And so in the context of Kubernetes, this would be the service name, and this would be uh, the static IP address that is assigned to it. So um, you know, the idea is that if you were to uh, use that service name or registry, like with an HTTP request, um, or just use a, a tool that allows you to uh, look up DNS records, like if you were trying to resolve where front name would go, that it should resolve to that IP address. So now we need to know about core DNS. So core DNS is the default DNS server for Kubernetes. In the documentation, you might see something that's called cube DNS, and that was the default prior to that. Uh, and it was replaced because it wasn't that modular or had great plugin support. And so core DNS is the current default. You can swap it out, but this is the one you'll want to use because it's pretty good. And it ensures that pods and services have fully qualified domain names, FQDNs, and without core DNS, the cluster communication would cease to work because it just would not know how to resolve things to things. And uh, you might ask, what is a fully qualified domain name? So it's a domain name that specifies its exact location in the tree hierarchy, also known as an absolute domain. Probably a visual would help there, but you know it's not that important. What's important to remember is that uh, we have this table of service registry and there's a way to look up uh, DNS. And of course there is DNS, like let's say you're using an AWS and you had Route 53, which is um, a DNS service um, that uh, allows you to register a domain and then forward that domain making record sets to point to stuff. And so, you know, that is like, again, another level of DNS and it can integrate into core DNS and things like that. But um, this DNS is just for stuff within the cluster, okay? So uh, let's look at the functionality that is provided by Core DNS because there are in-tree plugins, internal plugins, and then um, out-of-tree plugins, so things you can add on. And so this will give me an idea of the things that uh, Core DNS can do other than just resolving uh, you know, a domain name to an IP address. So we have ACL, so enforce access control policies on source IP and prevents unauthorized access to DNS servers. Any, so uh, any given minimal response uh, to uh, this anything. Azure, so enable uh, server zoning data from Microsoft Azure DNS. That's what I'm talking about, those integrations with those cloud service providers. Cache enables a front end cache. Health enables a, a health check endpoint, something that you'd be very common with if you were, uh, again, Route 53, they have health checks built in. So now this is at the um, cluster level. Logs, so enable uh, query logging to standard output. And many more, such as like, I think AWS would be in there, like Web53 and things like that. So out of tree plugins, Git, Alias, uh, RE Disk. So enabled cache uh, using Redis, uh, Kubernetes, <laughs> serve multiple uh, Kubernetes uh, within a server, and many more. So, you know, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of how robust this thing is and how modular it is. Now let's just talk about some tooling that uh, we should know, especially if we're debugging this stuff. Not something that we really need to do at, in the KCNA level, but uh, it's just practically very good to know. So core DNS pods are abstracted by a service object called cube DNS. Remember everything in Kubernetes is pods. So core DNS are pods that run in the cube system. And um, I don't know if I wrote this anywhere, but it's very important to remember that core DNS or whatever DNS thing that you want to use lives in the control plane node. When we were looking at a diagram, that was the one thing I forgot to put in there. I didn't have to get, update the graphics. I'm just reiterating on that again. Each pod, uh, and not just 
any pod, uh, uh, like, sorry, when I say each pod, we don't just mean core DNS pods. We mean any single pod has this resolve.com file to help with DNS resolving. Now, this isn't uh, a Kubernetes specific thing. This is just a Linux thing where um, you will have this file uh, on your, I don't know if it's in virtual machines, but it's definitely in containers. But if you were to cat it out, like print the con uh, contents of it. So here we're logging into that pod, that container, sorry. And uh, we do that, it's gonna show the name server. So what we are in terms of the IP address and then um, you know the domain names that would resolve to this um, pod, okay? So notice it says default SVS, cluster local, things like that. And another really useful tool is using NS lookup. So NS lookup, name server lookup is a way that we can discover uh, or see where things resolve. So like, remember I said, there's a service registry that contains a service name and a, um, and a uh, IP addresses. So we could dump an IP address in here and then it would hit the core DNS and be like, what'd you find? And this is what I found, right? Or you could supply the service name or the full service name because this is just like a part of the name, right? The real name would be like really long like this, okay? Um, so just notice like how long it is and like how short that is. Um, but again, you know, a little bit outside the scope of the KCNA, but good to know, um, uh, you know, in general, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I want to talk about load balancing because we see load balancing in a variety of different ways in Kubernetes, and it can get kind of confusing. So I just wanted to describe the different types of load balancing that we'll come across, but let's define what load balancing is first. Load balancing is a networking component where traffic flows through the load balancer and the load balancer decides how to distribute traffic to the multiple targets, such as compute nodes or other different kinds of targets based on a set of rules. So examples of this would be ingress and uh, the service, Kubernetes service, both have load balancing, but there's more than that. So we have external load balancers, uh, we have ingress, we have service, and then we have internal load balancing like IP tables and IPVS, which technically is what service is using. So for external load balancers, um, the load balancing is controlled by third-party service. Think of uh, Elastic. Um, <laughs> uh, it's weird, like I, uh, I know application load balancer, Elastic load balancer by AWS or Nginx or things like that. Then you have um, Ingress. So that is the actual service itself. Um, so the idea is you have load balancing algorithm, backend wait schemes, you have service, which will persist sessions, uh, will have dynamic weights. And then in the eternal, uh, eternal load balancing, the load balancing to the containers with the pods, which is ran randomly distributed. So just understand that there's more than one level of load balancing, uh, and don't get too overwhelmed with that. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at probes. So probes are used to detect the state of a container, and we have three types, uh, liveness probe, readiness probe, and startup probe. Um, and in the KCA, I think you need to know how to set up probes. And we do actually use um, a type of probe, I think uh, readiness probe. Yeah, we use a readiness probe. Um, in this course, but we, you know, we don't go super deep into the probes, but we do get some exposure to them. So let's talk about the liveness probe. So liveness probe is used to know when to restart a container. Okay. And so for example, liveness probes could be, uh, could catch a deadlock where an application is running, but unable to make progress. So restarting a container in such a state can help to make the applications more available despite bugs. Okay. Then we have um, the readiness probe to know when a container is ready to start accepting traffic. So pod is considered ready when all of its containers are ready. And once uh, one use of this uh, one use of this signal is to control which pods are used as backends for services. So when a pod is not ready, it is removed from the services load balancer. Then we have start probe. So this is where we know when a container application is started. So if such a probe is configured, it disables liveness and readiness checks until it succeeds, making sure those probes don't interfere with the application startup. This can be used to adopt liveness checks on slow starting containers, avoiding them getting killed by kubelet before they are up and running. So there you go. <laughs> Hey, 
this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. We are looking at NetFilter. So NetFilter uh, is a project that enables packet filtering, network address translation, and port translation. So NAT or NAPT, so NAPT. Uh, not to be confused with NATS, which is an event bus uh, that uses gRPC. Uh, it can be used in microservices. Uh, translation packet logging, user space packet queuing, other packet mangling. And the net fil uh, NetFilter hooks are a framework inside the Linux kernel that allows kernel modules to register callback functions at different locations of the Linux network stack. The registry callbacks functions is used when called back from every packet that traverses the respective hook within the Linux network stack. So projects that build on top of NetFilter, uh, that's why we're talking about it, is IP tables. This is a generic firewall uh, software that allows you to define rule sets. NF tables, so this is the successor to IP tables, IPVS. So this is specifically designed for load balancing and uses hash mapping as its means. So um, when we are using a service, it can be, or sorry, proxy, I suppose, it can be backed by either IP tables or IPVS. And NF tables is just not in the mix for whatever reason. Um, and probably in the future, Kubernetes will default to IPVS and just not use IP tables. But right now, at least when I'm making this uh, course and video, IP tables is still the default. But we'll talk about that and we'll talk about IP tables in greater detail. All right, let's take a look here at IP tables. But before we do, let's define what a user space is. So a user space um, for modern computing operating systems segregates virtual memory into kernel space and user space. So kernel space is reserved for running a privileged operating system kernel, kernel extensions, and device drivers. User space is the memory area where application software and some drivers execute. So now what is IP tables? So IP tables is a user space utility program that allows a system administrator to configure the IP packet filter rules for the Linux kernel firewall. So we have IP tables, which is for IPv4, and IP6 tables, which is for IPv6, but generally it's just IP tables here. And IP tables is simply a virtual firewall on Linux. And it's very common, uh, like on Linux, to have to experience IP tables. So it is a common skill and really worth to know. Um, so Example would be like, let's say you wanted to restrict access based on ports and protocols. You could uh, add or update to the IP tables saying like, okay, the destination port is 80, the protocol is TCP, and we will accept traffic, open that up. If we list them out hyphen L, we can see what is open, what is not, what is blocked and things like that. Um, uh, and again, IP tables is, at least when I'm making this the default for um, cube proxy, and you can change it out to IPVS, which we'll talk about next. All right, let's talk about IPVS, which stands for IP Virtual Server, which uses the NetFilter framework. It also incorporates Virtual Linux Server, LVS. So the reason we use IPVS is because when using IP tables, it can struggle to scale to tens of thousands of services as IP tables is bottlenecked at 5,000 nodes per cluster. IPVS is uh, specifically designed for load balancing and uses more efficient data structures, so hash tables. I think I might have called it hash mapping earlier, but it was, I was supposed to say hash tables on the right-hand side here, allowing for uh, almost unlimited scale under the hood. If you've never heard of hash tables, um, we describe it in crypto, uh, cryptographical stuff, like I, my SC900 course, we talk about it there. Uh, in the future, kubeproxy will default to IPVS. I really wanted to get like a nice diagram to show how it works, but I really just couldn't find anything. And the point is, is that you're just gonna end up using it in the future and it's used because of the limitations of IP tables. And that's really all you need to know, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I want to talk about the various proxies that we will encounter in Kubernetes because there's more than just one, and it can get confusing if you just don't know that there's more than one. So what is a proxy? Well, it's a server application that acts as an intermediary between a client requesting a resource and the server providing that resource. So here's an example. I got this nice little graphic from a Wikipedia, but the idea is that once it asks them the current time, it goes to the proxy. The proxy says, hey, what's the current time? It says the time. 
it sends it back to the other person. So the idea is that they are in the middle um, uh, uh, between the communication of two resources, uh, many or more. So there are many uh, kinds of proxies you'll encounter in Kubernetes. And so we'll talk about all the kinds here. So the first we have is kubectl proxy. So proxies from a local address to the Kubernetes API server. Then you have an API server proxy. So a bastion built into the API server connects a user outside of the cluster to cluster IPs, which otherwise not might not be reachable. Cube proxy, so runs on each node and used to reach services. Proxy load balancer in front of API server, so acts as a load balancer if there are several APIs. Cloud load balancers, so for external cluster traffic to reach pods. And in particular, the ones that we will notice will be cube proxy and kubectl proxy. I know when I was learning uh, Kubernetes, I was getting mixed up because I thought maybe this proxy and this proxy were the same thing, and they absolutely weren't because they weren't um, prefacing it with kubectl. Uh, but just understand there's a lot of different proxies. And just to give more general information about proxies, there's the concept of a forward and a reverse proxy. So forward proxy, which is the default proxy, when we just say the word proxy, is a bunch of servers egressing traffic to uh, have to pass through the proxy first. So imagine, uh, I'm gonna just draw little uh, boxes here. You have three servers and in front of it, there is a proxy. And the idea is that they're gonna all go through this proxy, all right? And that kind of acts as a way of filtering or doing things with their requests. Then you have a reverse proxy. So this is ingress traffic trying to reach a collection of servers. And this is what we will see quite often, uh, especially with web applications. Um, is the idea is that you have, let's say, three versions of your web app running, and in front of it, you have a proxy, and the proxy is going to uh, 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 send the traffic to those. And in a sense, you basically have load balancing. So hopefully that makes it very clear. Uh, and there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes Proxy. So Kubernetes Proxy, also known as just as Kube Proxy, is a network proxy that runs on each node in your cluster, and it's designed to load balance. Uh, notice I have the word load balance there, traffic to pods. So down below, this is the diagram from the docs. Uh, I probably should have made one here. But I also kind of wanted to show it to you because often they have permutations of this or it can be really confusing. I just want to kind of clarify it up that you have Kube Proxy here, uh, and uh, you have a cluster IP and then you have the I IP tables, but they'll put it, like they always put IP tables somewhere else, but where it goes is it, it's a program running on the virtual machine, the node. So it's really over here, okay? And the idea is that cluster IP and Kube proxy uh, can be both using it, all right? Um, and so that to me is a lot more clear because that is the thing that is driving the rules to say, okay, how do we load balance? How do we how do we filter traffic and stuff like that? And these things leverage it. And this is a program running on the node. Um, so Kube Proxy maintains network rules. So that's going to be in this case IP tables. Uh, these network rules allow network communication to your pods for network sessions inside or outside of your cluster. Kube Proxy uses the operating system packeting uh, packet filter laying if there is one and it's available. Otherwise, Kube Proxy forwards the traffic itself. Kubeproxy runs in three modes. We've got IP tables, which is the default, uh, suited for most uh, use cases. IPBS, probably going to be the future default because it's so good, uh, suited for thousands of plus services, but it's fine for simple use cases as well. And then user space, this is legacy and not recommended for use. So hopefully that gives you an idea of Kubeproxy. It is installed on all nodes, not just the worker nodes, because you need a proxy to uh, move that traffic around. But, um, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea there. And there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Container Networking Interfaces CNI. So CNI is a specification or open standard for writing plugins to configure networking interfaces for Linux containers. And so down below here, uh, imagine this is the uh, Container Networking Interface, which again is a specification for writing plugins. And then there are our plugins. There are built-in plugins that ship with it, and there are third-party plugins. I would imagine. I would imagine this is where we say in tree and out of tree, uh, but maybe not. Um, but you know that's the way I'm thinking about it. And so you might recognize some things here like bridge and flannel. And then on the side, we have Calico, Cilium, and Weave, which are all very popular third party uh, things to install. Uh, and definitely you'll need these. You'll need one of these in order to uh, do network policies, okay? so. But this is just the interface that um, is used so that containers can leverage 
these uh, plugins, right? It goes through the container networking interface, just a standard way to do it. So it will run through the container runtime to reach the containers. Uh, and so that's the idea is like, if you want to inter uh, interact with Calico, right? It's gonna have to go through this path, right? Same thing with any of these things. Like if it's a bridge, it's gonna be going through here. So hopefully that uh, helps make sense, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are talking about service meshes. So a service mesh manages service to service communication for microservice architectures, a service meaning an application, not a Kubernetes service component. So this is where, um, you know, I said how service is a confusing name. This is where we get that confusion. So a service mesh is an infrastructure layer that can provide the following reliability, traffic management, retries, load balancing, observability, so metrics and traces, security, so TLS cert uh, certifications and identity. Um, and so the idea is that you'd have a service control, uh, service mesh control plane. So the installation of the proxies into pods as well as the proxies capabilities is managed by the service mesh control plane. And a service mesh uses a sidecar pattern. Carefully listen to this because this is super important and it will probably show up in the exam but a sidecar pattern um, basically is a proxy container that is installed on each pod and uh, the apps container must pass to the proxy before leaving uh, the egressing pod. So the idea is that um, you, when you install a service mesh, this proxy or sidecar, as it will, as it will say, will, will sit beside it. And so the idea is the container will pass through it and the proxy can do all, all sorts of stuff, all these things here above. There is a lot of different service mesh implementations. You don't have to run a service mesh, but in most production use cases, there's no reason not to. And I forgot the E there, maybe it turned into a, a hyphen for some reason. Um, but available service meshes for Kubernetes are Istio. So this is currently the most popular service mesh, but some people might debate me here for Kubernetes due to its highly configurable nature. Istio uses Envoy as its proxy. Istio is not a CNSF project. So when we talk about the sidecar, um, you know, like, like there's the control plane and then there's the actual proxy, the sidecar that you install. And so Istio says it uses Envoy for that. Istio is not a CNCF project, but Envoy is. And so Envoy is an open source edge and service proxy. Multiple service meshes use Envoy as its proxy. Envoy is a graduated CNCF project. Uh, you have Kuma. This is also a CNCF project, but it's in sandbox mode that uses Envoy as its proxy. I'm not sure if it's competing with Istio, since it's not a CNCF project. Sometimes that's what you see. You see projects that are competing, like they're not, for whatever reason, they're not a um, CNCF project. And so then a CNCF project spins up to kind of compete with it or fill some kind of edge cases. And it can get kind of confusing because there's some sometimes a lot of overlap on certain stuff. You have Linkerd, which is actually what we use in, or we attempt to use in the fall longs. It's a graduated project known for having strong security and it just works. Linkerd does not use Envoy. Instead, it uses a simple and ultra, ultra lightweight micro proxy called Linkerd to proxy. And then if we're talking about like a third party service like uh, HashiCorp console, so console is an open source service mesh by HashiCorp. It's not a CNCF project. Console is offered by HashiCorp as a managed cloud service mesh. So there you go. All right, let's take a closer look at Envoy, which is a self-contained process that is designed to run alongside every application server. Uh, Envoy can be installed on a virtual machine or as a container. So you don't have to have a control plane with Envoy, but um, that's generally what you'd want. So you'd want something like Istio or something to uh, communicate or gather the information that passes along through your sidecar which is the Envoy proxy. Envoy supports a wide range of functionality. So L3, L4 filter architecture, L7 filter architecture. So L7 is the application layer, three and four is like packets, like TCP, UDP, things like that. First class, HTTP2 support and HTTP3 support. Uh, it has um, layer seven, so that's the application layer routing. GRPC support, service discovery and dynamic configuration, health checking, advanced load balancing, front edge proxy support, best in class observability. And in practice, you will likely not install and manage and configure Envoy. You would allow a service mesh control plane to install into your pods. A service mesh 
will or may cont uh, come with a UI or configuration files to configure your Envoy. So there you go. All right, let's talk about network address translation, not to be confused with NATS, uh, which is a event bus service that is used with microservices and G gRPC, but is not the same thing. Um, so what is network address translation? Well, it's a method of mapping an IP address space into another by modifying network address information in the IP header of packets while they're in transit across a traffic routing device. Okay, but what does that mean? Um, well, it's practical use case is imagine that you have a server, um, it's a public server, right? publicly accessible via the internet, and you need to communicate uh, with a private network. And so we have two different private networks, private network one, private network two, and uh, they have their own address spaces. So this is in the 10.0.0.0, and this one also has it, right? So if these are the same and they were to talk to each other, that wouldn't make any sense, right? Because they have overlapping addresses. So a NAT can translate one and another by mapping or translating, uh, there's just like a NAT table that will um, uh, store, uh, like it will say like, okay, 10.0.0.1 goes over here, but we will then give it a new IP address and we'll remember that so that if anybody uh, talks to us, we'll know to send things back through that path, okay? Because uh, two, uh, two private networks that have conflicting address spaces are gonna have an issue there. And um, when you send a packet over here, if you send 10.0.0.1 to the server and it sends it back, it has no idea what 10.0.01 is. So it really needs to be mapped to something else. And so that is the idea behind network address translation, okay? Let's talk about Ethernet zero and network namespace. So first we need to know what an Ethernet device is. So an Ethernet device is a software or hardware technology that allows a server to communicate on a computer network. So a network interface card, a NIC, are commonly used to establish a wired connection to a network. It's the thing you plug the internet into. Uh, a cloud service provider, um, such as AWS or Azure or GCP, have virtual NICs for your virtual machines, uh, and you can actually manage them too. A lot of times they're created for you to connect to your virtual network. So what is a network namespace? Well, um, Ethernet zero represents the first Ethernet interface, an Ethernet device, attached to your virtual machine. And a network interface is an abstraction on top of the Ethernet interface to provide a logical networking stack with its own routes, firewalls, rules, and network devices. Linux by default has one network namespace called root. Uh, uh, and network namespace, and this is what programs will use by default. So the idea is you have your Linux virtual machine, you have your root uh, network space, and then you have uh, Ethernet zero. So the these the first, there is Ethernet zero and there's Ethernet one, but one is the second device if you have one, but Ethernet zero is primarily how things are getting outside that virtual machine, okay? <laughs> So now the question is, how would you observe these things? Uh, so if you were to log into your virtual machine, and I actually did this on AWS, what you can do is you can observe uh, the type of devices that are attached to your virtual machine by typing in ifconfig. I don't know what ifconfig stands for, but I know that it'll list out things like um, eth0. So there, that's the way that you can see it. Um, and there's other things. So I guess down below we have LO. I can't remember what that stands for but you might see other things like bridge as well. So all sorts of uh, networking devices and you can um, create and modify your own network namespace. So we said there's a root namespace, but you can create your own um, here. So are we showing? Yeah, so here this goes sudo IP net NS, which stands for network namespace, add namespace one. So I created a, cu a custom one there. You type in IP net NES and there is that namespace. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're on to cluster networking, which is an extremely important section uh, for Kubernetes, because if you don't understand the networking for it, 
um, it can be really hard to use and it will kind of show up on the exam uh, indirectly, not directly, but you will have questions which will be like, hey, if you talk this way to that thing, what can talk? Um, and this is where I say as a prerequisite why you need to know Linux and why you need to know uh, cloud networking or sorry, Linux networking because this stuff is tricky. But um, Kubernetes has the following opinions about cluster networking. All pods can communicate with all other pods without using a NAP network address translation. All nodes can communicate with all pods without using a NAT. The IP that a pod sees itself as is the same IP as it sees it as. And even though I'm saying, uh, you know, without using a NAT, without using a NAT, NATs are and can be used in Kubernetes even though uh, the bub is a contradiction. There are four broad types of network communication for clusters. We have container to container, pod to pod, pod to service, external to service. And um, beyond what I'll show you, if you really want to go deep on this stuff, there's like a long form medium article, but there's also a really good talk. And it's a CNCF tech talk called A Life of a Packet by Michael Rubin. For, uh, so if you want very detailed cluster networking knowledge, uh, if the stuff is just not clicking or you just want to get more, that's on YouTube. And I strongly recommend watching that as an additional thing if it interests you. All right, let's take a look here at container to container networking. So containers all in the same pod have the same IP address and the port space. And containers can communicate with each other via the local host via different ports. So to help this make a little bit more sense, uh, I have a visualization here. So here we have a worker node and pods run in worker nodes or nodes in general. Uh, and here you can see that we have an IP address. And so that is a dynamic IP address, meaning that if this pod is destroyed um, and it spins up a new one, then there'll be a new IP address. And so down below we have multiple containers here and all these containers are communicating on a local host. So if you log into this container here and you were to local host on port 3000, you would reach this container. Uh, and that's kind of the story there. So it's not too complicated in terms of the configuration. So here's a deployment file. And in the pod spec part of it, the spec part, uh, if we go down below to the template and then into the containers, here you can see we are setting the container port. So see where it says port 80 here? That would pretty much be the same thing where we are setting it here on uh, the container in the graphic. Obviously not the same port number, but that's the idea there. So hopefully that is pretty clear. Um, pods can, um, all the containers in a pod communicate on a local host and uh, you just access them via the ports. All right, before we go any further into more cluster networking, we need to understand what is a virtual ethernet device, also known as VETH. So these devices, um, they can act as a tunnel between network namespaces to create a bridge to a physical network device in another namespace, but can also be used as a standalone network device. Uh, packets on one device in the pair are immediately received on the other device. So here is our visual where we have two different network namespaces. Notice where it says net NS, that's just kind of like the short form uh, you could write to say network namespace, but of course you can name your network namespaces whatever you want. And so VETH devices are always created in interconnected pairs. So it, I know it's a bit gray, I don't know why I made it so dark or so light there, but it says VETH pair and the idea is that these um, uh, two parts of it uh, include the pair. And I'm just going to wipe a little bit away here. Uh, so you can use the IP link command to create VETH pairs. So here you type in IP link add and uh, net NS. Uh, and in practicality, of course, you're never doing this, but I just wanted to show you uh, in case you had never, uh, <laughs> if you're just wondering how those links are established in Linux. So there you go. <laughs> Let's take a look here at pod to pod communication because we just saw how simple um, containers can communicate with other containers within a pod, just on the local host. Pod to pod's a bit different. And also it can be a little bit more tricky because you have pods that can be on the same node or you can have pods that are across nodes on different nodes. And so it's kind of the same, but a little bit different. 
Um, so I have this big fancy diagram that we'll use as a reference as we talk through our information here. So for pod to pod communication on the same uh, uh, node, uh, virtual ethernet devices is used to communicate from the pod network namespace to the root network namespace. That's why we were talking about uh, virtual ethernet devices to connect two namespaces together. Notice I named it here like EF0, EF1. It's still virtual. It's just that you can name them whatever you want. And so some people just do that to simplify it where they'll just call this one uh, F0 and F0 here. But this could have been one and two. We could name them whatever we want. Um, but I mean, this is done for you, right? So you don't you don't set this up manually. It's just happening. Um, but I was just talking about if you were to uh, set up um, a VETH pair yourself, you can name whatever you want. Um, so in the root uh, network namespace, a bridge is used to allow all pod network namespaces to talk to other pods. So that's a networking component uh, that is set up for you here. The BR0 represents the bridge. Pods can see all of their pods and communicate using their IP addresses. So notice that they both have two distinct IP addresses in the same uh, network namespace or address namespace. Uh, and so if you were logged into a container here, and you were to uh, ping this IP address, you would reach that pod. Um, and you could then also hit the uh, port number and hit a very specific container if you wanted to. I just wanted to distinguish between uh, routing and bridging because um, a lot of people might be thinking, you know, isn't a bridge just a router, but they're not. So routing allows multiple networks to communicate independently and yet remain separate using a router. So bridging connects two separate networks as if they were a single network using a bridge. So just understand a bridge is a bit simpler and treats everything on the same network, which is what it does, right? Because um, they have the same address space at the top there at the 10.0.0 uh, idea there. Now let's take a look at a cross node. So here's our diagram, looks pretty similar. And just so you know, there is a thing that's missing here that, uh, that goes in between. And I just don't have it there because we're gonna be talking about it uh, when we look at services, so just be aware that this is an incomplete diagram on purpose. But um, so pods can communicate to other pods running on other worker nodes. How pods can communicate uh, uh, pods on other nodes is network specific. Okay, okay. so it's going to be specific to the scenario and will vary based on your provider. So in the case of AWS, they have their own implementation of the container networking interface, CNI. And uh, it's called Amazon VPC Container Network Interface Plugin for Kubernetes, uh, which allows you uh, to have node-to-node -node communication uh, via the AWS Virtual Private Cloud. So if you've used AWS, which is a virtual private cloud, basically it's gonna communicate on there. So uh, your VPC, like it's pretty straightforward, right? So the idea is like, I can't really show you that in gr uh, granular detail because we'd be really digging into AWS specifics or any cloud service specifics but the point that you need to know is that every provider has some kind of solution. And when you set up on a managed provider, it's gonna already be installed there. And so it's just gonna work and you're gonna have to do the research uh, for each of those, but it's always probably gonna be happening with uh, the container networking interface. It's always gonna be some kind of plugin uh, for that, okay? All right, let's now take a look at pod to service networking. So here's our diagram, it looks very similar but the, uh, the key difference here is we have this element called IP tables, and this is being uh, linked via a service. Now, the way we can represent this um, as an architectural diagram varies, and you're gonna see in the next slide when we're talking about ingress, egress, that I've uh, done it slightly different, and it's because I looked at so many architectural diagrams and there's just no consistency. So I figured I'd do some variation here just so that you can conceptually still understand what is going on and the placement of things. So when a pod dies, its IP address changes, and this uh, can make communication hard if you're uh, relaying, relying on the IP address for communication, right? So if uh, you know this pod dies, the IP address is gonna change, right? So a service creates a virtualized IP, a static IP, so over here, um, and then uses IP tables, so IP tables is over here, uh, which is installed on the node, right? So lives on the node, not in a pod, uh, to do NAT, so network address translation and load balancing to other pods. And that's pretty much all there really is to it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's all there is, okay? All right, let's take a look here at ingress and egress from an internet cluster. And here uh, we are reaching the pinnacle of very complex diagrams. 
And notice I told you that um, the uh, the representation of service is slightly different here. So notice that service is having a dotted line that goes around IP tables. Now I didn't double check, but I'm not sure, and this could be a, a fault on my diagram, but I'm not sure if the service lives in the control plane or the worker node. Uh, they, it could live on the worker node. I just didn't double check to be honest. Um, but anyway, what is clear, and the reason I put it over here is because it has to talk to the um, the cloud controller manager. So to me, that made a little bit more sense. But I did tell you that it represent service slightly different, uh, like from the prior diagram here. So let's talk about egress. So egress is how uh, pod traffic exit to the internet. So the idea is you have a pod up here, a container, and it's flowing out this way. It's leaving the pod. And even though I don't have the diagram, what it would do is it would go through the container networking interface. Um, and the container networking interface, it, uh, it can, we have a diagram with kubelet. And so kubelet shows that um, it talks to the container runtime. And so the idea is that you would have uh, the, the plugin. So in AWS's case, it's their Amazon VPC container networking interface. So that would let you talk to uh, VPC. And from VPC, you could then go talk to AWS's internet gateway. And that's how you'd get out to the internet. And so, you know, I, I'm just running out of space on this diagram. And that's why I didn't kind of do that variation for egress. For ingress, and I swear, I, I, I remember to, to put a double S on there, but I guess I forgot. But it's two S's and I digress uh, that I made a mistake spelling ingress. Uh, it's for traffic to reach a pod. So it's going in this way, okay? And so the idea is it has to travel to a service. So from a service, it could be using a Kubernetes service with a type load balancer. This will work with a uh, cloud controller manager to implement a solution that works with a T4 load balancer, something that does UDP, TCP. Um, but the other option is ingress, uh, Kubernetes ingress. And so it will use an ingress controller to work with a cloud service provider load balancer. Uh, and I believe it, it's specifically for um, T7, because anytime we use ingress, it's always using um, like Kubernetes ingress, it's using application load balancer. Can you use it with a T4? I'm not sure that might be inaccurate. So I would probably say it's just T7. But um, you know, uh, the key thing is, is that you can either use one or the other, okay? Um, but you know, hopefully that makes it clear. This stuff is probably the hardest stuff to understand in Kubernetes. They're not going to push you too hard on the exam to know this stuff for the KCNA. Uh, there's a lot of videos out there that go into super technical detail, but honestly, it's very hard to remember it all. And uh, you'll be okay if you just generally understand that uh, for ingress, we have a type load balancer of the service or Kubernetes ingress. And then for egress, it's going to use the container network interface plugin to uh, get to access stuff. And they, might, they probably won't even ask that, the egress one. But there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the four C's of cloud native security, which is cloud clusters, containers, and code. And that order does matter because each layer of cloud native security models builds upon the next outmost layer. And so we could describe uh, this generally just as depth and defense. So, you know, the four C's is just kind of a, um, a framework or a mental model uh, to think about a cloud native security, but it just really is the general idea of de depth and defense, which you might see if you're looking at the security of data centers, but it is a series of defensive mechanisms that are layered in order to protect valuable data and information. So the idea is that you have a malicious actor and they're trying to make it to your data. So what layers are they gonna be going through? So first we have the cloud layer. So that would be something like AWS. You have your cluster layer like something like Kubernetes, uh, Mesos, Docker Swarm, containers. So maybe your runtime is container D, or you could just say Docker in that sense. Uh, and then your, your code, and, and there, there could be your code and your data or information. I probably should have made a nice little like uh, uh, data file there to indicate what they were looking for, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, those are the four layers and you absolutely need to know the order. Now, how much do you need to know about the interior or how they actually, like what uh, defensive mechanisms, right, uh, that you need to implement, which would be here at the border of uh, passing into it. Um, not too sure for KCNA, I didn't see too much stuff, but we are gonna walk through each layer and look at what it takes to secure them so that uh, we just round out our security knowledge for um, Kubernetes and cloud native workloads, okay? 
All right, let's take a look at the first layer, which is the cloud layer. And this is also known as the base layer because it's the basis for all the other layers. You have to uh, pass through the cloud layer before you can go to any of the other layers. So security at this layer is going to vary based on managed or self-managed infrastructure. So the idea here is we have the managed infrastructure. So infrastructure as a service, as we would know uh, from our cloud service provider knowledge, uh, or self-managed. So for managed infrastructure, you can think of any cloud service provider, AWS, Azure, GCP, Oracle, Oracle, IBM Cloud, or a cloud platform. So think something like Sivo. And so the main difference between a CSP and a cloud platform is a cloud platform is kind of like a precursor to a cloud service uh, provider. Same thing as like a virtual private server. It's just that um, they might not have all the elements of it. Maybe they don't have a lot of services um, or they're just uh, 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 um, highly focused on just a very specific uh, thing, just like just giving you Kubernetes and just a load balancer and things like that. So security is going to greatly vary based on the provider and you'll have to do independent research uh, to determine what you'll need to do. So if you're on AWS and you're, uh, and you're deploying to EKS, which is what you'd use, Elastic Kubernetes Service, you're gonna have to research what the best security practices for EKS because when you're using managed infrastructure, the responsibility of the infrastructure is the cloud provider. So um, maybe all of it is taking care of you, and but there might be some things you still have to worry about. But let's take a look at self-managed. So self-managed would be um, uh, co-located servers. So think of Equinix. Uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it properly. I've never said it out loud before. Uh, or corporate data centers. So basically you have the machines, you have the office space, or you're renting out an office space and you're directly working with the machines and you don't, you don't have a cloud layer or you're installing your own cloud layer onto um, uh, those, uh, those servers. So security is going to be based on the infrastructure security, such as network access to API servers, so control plane, network access to nodes, Kubernetes access to cloud provider APIs, access to etcd, etcd encryption. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of uh, infrastructure uh, security there. Of course, if you can go with managed, it's gonna be a lot easier, but Kubernetes is flexible, so you can use it anywhere you want. Uh, it just depends on how much responsibility you wanna have. All right, let's take a look here at the cluster layer. And there are two parts of cluster layer security. You have components of the cluster and components in the cluster. And remember, a cluster could be, um, and I mean, we're talking about Kubernetes in particular. So you think they would just say this is uh, Kubernetes uh, security, but um, no matter if you're using Kubernetes, Mesos, or a Docker Swarm, which are orchestration tools that set up clusters, um, this stuff kind of applies, but everything in the context here is Kubernetes. So for co components of the cluster, we're securing configurable cluster components. For components in the cluster, we're securing applications running within the cluster. So one is focused on the components and one is focused on the applications. So on the component side, there's a lot of things you can do. So let's go through this list and it is huge, but we will uh, do it anyway. So. We have controlling access to Kube API, using TLS for API traffic, API authentication, API authorization, controlling access to Kubelet, controlling capabilities of a workload or user runtime, limiting resources uh, usage on a cluster, controlling what privileges uh, containers run with, preventing containers from uh, loading unwanted kernel modules, restricting network access, restricting cloud metadata API access, controlling which nodes pods may access, protecting cluster components from compromise, restrict access to etcd, enable audit logging, restrict access to alpha or beta features, rotate infrastructure credentials frequently, review third-party integrations before enabling them, encrypt secrets at rest, re uh, receiving alerts for uh, security updates and reporting vulnerabilities. So that is a big old list, um, but it gives you an idea that there's a lot of work on the cluster side. And I would think, and I don't know, but I would think that using something like Knative, which uh, basically takes a strong opinion on how to set everything up for you, might reduce some of that burden. Um, but I mean, this is what you get when you use Kubernetes, you have uh, full access of all the components underneath. So, so you have more of an obligation to secure those. Let's talk about in the cluster, securing the applications running within the cluster. So RBAC authorization, 
authentication, application secrets management, ensuring the pods meet the pod security standards, quality of assurance, network policies, TLS for Kubernetes ingress. So you can see there's a huge difference of responsibilities here between uh, the cluster and in the cluster. All right, let's take a look at the container and code layer. Now these are separate layers, but there wasn't a lot for me to say about each one without going super deep on particular ways of implementing them. So I just grouped them together here. Um, so we have container layer and the code layer. So the container layer, uh, things that we can do at this layer to protect the container would be container vulnerability scanning or OS dependency securities, image signing and enforcement, disallowing privileged users, using the container runtime with stronger isolation. Okay, and that could be choosing um, like virtualized container runtimes, which we talked about in our runtime section, right? Um, for the code layer, the application code is one of the primary attack services over which you have the most control. So, um, I mean, you know, you have a lot of options here, but we don't list a whole lot here. So access over TLS only. So make sure you use HTTPS for your application, limiting port ranges of communication. So like if it's a database, maybe don't make it public facing or limit it to only your IP address third party dependency security. So like if you're stalling like um, uh, Node.js modules, make sure that they are up to date and safe or use um, a tool like Sneak that will detect and tell you whether there's a problem with it or not. Static code analysis, um, which you know is kind of similar to third party. It actually looks, it's not just saying like, hey, we know that there's a history of problems with these things, but we'll actually look at the code and tell you if we find a problem. I think like AWS DevOps Guru does that, but you have to use particular languages like Python or Java. Dynamic probing attacks, so, you know, pen testing basically for your application. Um, you know, and then for the code layer, you know, you follow all the good OWASP rules. So OWASP has like a top 10 for application defense. It's gonna be the same here, but there you go. All right, let's talk about infrastructure security. We actually did kind of cover this in uh, brief uh, earlier when we were talking about managed cloud service providers because they take care of all this stuff uh, for you. But um, these are the suggestions for securing infrastructure in a Kubernetes cluster. The first is network access to the API server, which is your control plane. So all access to the Kubernetes control plane is not allowed publicly on the internet and is controlled by network access control lists restricted to the set IP addresses needed to administer the cluster. So pretty clear. Don't make it publicly available. Network access to nodes. Nodes should be configured to only accept connections from the control plane on the specified ports and accept connections for services and Kubernetes to, uh, of a type node port or load balancer. And, you know, just put a load balancer in front of that and you should be A-OK. -okay. Uh, like, you know, like a cloud one or something like that. Uh, Kubernetes access to a cloud provider API. So each cloud provider grants a different set of permissions. So now we're talking about cloud providers to Kubernetes control plane and nodes. It's best uh, to provide the cluster with cloud provider access that follows the principle of least privilege. So P-O-L-P, uh, that's the initialism for that, for the resources it needs to administer. So this is just like imagine you're on AWS and you make a, um, a role, just make sure that role is given to somebody that sh should have it or you know just limit that kind of stuff there. Access to etcd, so access to etcd, the database store for Kubernetes uh, should be limited to control plane only. Depending on your configuration, you should attempt to use etcd over TLS. More information can be found in the etcd documentation. Etcd encryption, so whenever possible, it's a good practice to encrypt all storage at rest. And since etcd holds the state of the entire cluster, including secrets, it disk should especially be encrypted at rest. Again, if you're using cloud service providers, they'll usually integrate with um, the providers, so like on AWS, we'd use KMS for Azure, I'd use um, Vault Store, and sometimes it's like just a checkbox during the setup. So, you know, it makes that things a lot easier for you. So there you go. All right, let's talk about the concept of the three A's, authentication, authorization, and counting framework for identity management systems. So it's just a, uh, a uh, security concept that is good to know. Um, and so let's talk about the first one, authentication. This uh, deals with your identity. So this is how do we know who you are? And so this could be utilizing a static password. You enter a password in, therefore it must be you. A one-time password. So we send you, um, maybe we do the password, but we also send you a one-time password to your phone. You enter it in to make sure, double check that you are who you say you are. Uh, we, we know this is multi-factor authentication, UFA. 
Digital certificates would be another way. So remember, the identity is in the certificate. Um, and so if it's self-signed, I don't know if we can trust it, but if it is signed by uh, some kind of certificate authority, then they say, yes, we attest that this person is who we are and we because we issued it to them, right? Basic auth could be something um, like trying to get access to um, an application. So we apply basic auth um, uh, there as well. We have authorization, so to get permission. So we know who you are, but what do you get to access? And in Kubernetes, this is gonna be role-based access controls, RBAC. For other things like Azure, uh, you know, they and it's still role-based access controls, but they might have risk adaptive-based policies. So they might factor in a bunch of smart information about your location, the time of day, the device, things like that to determine what you get access to. But for Kubernetes, it's just RBAC, okay? Then we have accounting or auditing to audit, to log and audit trails. So in Kubernetes, there's something called audit policies. So I suppose that's just like, uh, I can't remember, but, but they have audit policies and they have audit backends. So that's where the logs will be stored. Um, so, you know, it's not super important for the exam, but the concept of the AAA is something that uh, you should know uh, in terms of security, because sometimes they mention it, especially in the Kubernetes space. So I just wanted to make sure you knew the three A's, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at role-based access controls, also known as RBAC, or some people like to say RBAC. And, and role-based access controls is not a concept just limited to Kubernetes, um, but it is something that Kubernetes can do and is very popular among cloud service providers. It is a way of defining permissions for identities based on a organizational role. So RBAC authorizations use the RBAC authorizations k 8 uh, IO API group uh, at, to drive authorization decisions, allowing you to dynamically configure policies through the Kubernetes API. And when I show you things like this, it's because I want you to remember them just in case you see them on the exam when I point out these random things, but I don't always describe them in detail because I just don't think it matters. Um, but to enable RBAC, start the API server with the authorization mode flag. So if you're starting one up, you'd use Kube API um, server. I try to remember what the one, like in the CKD or CK, that use CK, they do like cube add ADM or whatever to start up clusters, but you do have to specify the mode. If you are using a, a lightweight distribution like micro K8, so you can just enable it uh, by adding the add-on uh, RBAC and it would basically be doing this underneath. If you're using managed services like AWS, Azure, GCP, it might be turned on by default. You might just have to hit a checkbox because you're not the one uh, starting up the cluster, but uh, you need to know this. Um, it might show up on the exam, so that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, not that we would ever have to provision our own server uh, in the KCNA, but you might want to need to uh, know that flag. So with Kubernetes RBAC, there are only allow rules and everything is denied by default. So if you were to create a new user, they would have access to nothing. You'd have to uh, give them a role with permissions uh, to be able to do something, okay? <laughs> All right, so the RBAC API declares four kinds of Kubernetes objects. We have roles, role binding, cluster role, cluster role binding. So here is the diagram uh, uh, that we see here. And so we have roles, which is a set of permissions for a particular namespace. And then a cluster role, which is a set of permission across all namespaces. There are some uh, Kubernetes components that cannot be namespace. So I would imagine that if you had to uh, give them permissions, they'd have to be in cluster role or there are, um, components that can be uh, in more than one namespace at the same time. So again, maybe that's where cluster role might play a part. So that's the reason for the two different ones. In order for um, uh, uh, roles or cluster roles to uh, be bound to a subject, that's where you're going to need um, a binding. And so for a role, you have a role binding. For a cluster role, you have a cluster role binding. And so, uh, those are going to attach to subjects, which are just essentially identities, like a user account, which would be a single user, a service account, which represents a machine user to be used by an application service, a group, which is a group of users or services, service accounts. And just notice here that for both, we do have this, this binding in between each one. Um, and the thing is, is that when you're using cloud service providers or other things with RBAC, you usually don't have to worry about that component. But in the world of Kubernetes, where everything is de uh, decoupled and you can see all the components underneath, 
um, you know, we have to manage that component. Uh, so it's not too hard to use. And just to kind of tell you a little bit about machine user, just because this one, it's a service kind of threw me off, but then when I realized it was a machine user, it made sense. But if you don't even know what a machine user is, um, that's like, let's say you are on GitHub and, um, or like you have a project that you want to deploy to a server, but you need to have access to GitHub. So you go and you can use your main uh, GitHub account, but that might have access to all your repositories and that's just too much per, uh, permission. So what you do is you create a new user with the intent to be just to be used for deployment. So it only has access to the repo and permissions to read and things like that. And so that's the idea behind a machine user. It's for the usage of service. It's not tied to a specific person, okay? All right, let's take a look at the role configuration example. And so, um, I mean, there is the role and cluster role, but they're very similar. Uh, but the key thing is that uh, the role sets a namespace. So here it says namespace default, where with a cluster role, you're not worried about namespaces. So here, if you change the kind to role or cluster role, then you have your rules or permissions of actions this role is allowed to perform. So we have API groups. And uh, we do this in the uh, kubectl extras where I list out the API resources, which is a command that you definitely will need to know for the exam that shows you all the possible groups. So if you just leave it blank there like that, then it's going to consider all core API groups. Um, and I imagine that you can do a comma and just say, say the exact groups that you want, then the resources of that group. Um, and then you have verbs. So get, watch, list. Things would be other things like patch, delete, update, uh, create things like that. But the exam doesn't really test you on that kind of stuff, but this is just practical knowledge you should know. Um, of course, you'd have to create a rule binding. We do all that stuff in the follow along. So even though we're not seeing a lot here, uh, we will do a practical example, but we're not gonna do a cluster rule just because it's a lot of work and outside the scope of the case CNA. But this gives you kind of an idea of what you'd have to do. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at secrets management. So a secret is similar to a config map with the exception that they can be encrypted. So here's an example. Um, I mean, it's very simple, but uh, just imagine instead of having config map, now we have secret. Um, and the configuration is pretty similar, but uh, what you're gonna have is a type of secret. So this one says basic auth. And then the idea is we have string data. So based on the type is gonna be uh, different on what you ingest here. Um, so basic, basic auth is a way of gaining access to a, a website so, and it will prompt you with a very ugly box saying, enter your username and password. So it makes sense that that's what that does there. So by default, secrets are unencrypted in etcd score, uh, a store and anyone with access to the etcd store has access to the secrets. So anyone who has access to pods within namespaces uh, will have access to the secrets used by that pods. So it's very important to understand by default, they're unencrypted, okay? And you have to do a bit of work um, to uh, uh, make them encrypted or make sure that they are secured. And so those steps would be to enable encryption at rest for secrets, enable or configure RBAC rules that restrict reading data and secrets, use mechanisms such as RBAC to limit which principles are allowed to create new secrets or replace existing ones. And you know, for the exam, you just need to know what a secret is. Uh, I just thought it was important that you understand that they're unencrypted um, and they're pretty much just like config map, but just slightly different and they have a bunch of different types, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro and we are looking at network policies. So network policies acts as virtual firewalls for pod communication and pod communication can be restricted based on the following scopes, pod to pod, namespaces, or specific IPs. So just to kind of visualize it, if you have a network policy, the idea is that you can control the ingress and you can control uh, the egress. Um, is that the right thing? Is that, sorry, you know what, one second here. I think the thing is, <laughs> I mean like they both are pointing ingress actually. So this, these are both going in, right? But you could also say what's going out. And so I guess this graphic could have been a little bit better, but you get the idea. There's ingress and there are egress, but we actually do set up a network policy. So you'll see in the follow along. Now selectors are used to determine to select resources with matching labels for the network policies to be applied to, except with the exception of specific IPs. 
Um, and the network plugin you are using must support network policies. So if you don't have a network pl plugin installed like Calico, WeaveNet, Cilium, and I have no idea if that's how you say it, um, it's just not gonna work, right? So you can create a network policy, but if you test it out without having one uh, a, a plugin installed, it just won't do anything. It'll be like the policy doesn't exist. And we do actually cover that edge case in the fall long, so you can see. Uh, but Calico and WeaveNet are pretty popular, uh, but there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Calico. So Calico is an open source network and network security solution for containers, VMs, native host space, workloads, and something we absolutely need if we're gonna be working with network policies. So Calico supports a broad range of platforms, including Kubernetes, OpenShift, Morantis Kubernetes Engine, no idea what that is, but sounds cool, OpenStack, bare metal services, um, and Calico gives you a choice of data planes. So you can use um, Berkeley packets, that's what EBPFs are, um, standard Linux, uh, HNS on Windows. So there's a few different data planes for that. And data planes is just like the, mo the means of communication, okay? Uh, Calico network policies extend the base functionality of network policies. So I say in the network policy section that if we do not install something, uh, our network policies will either work or do very little, okay? So um, Calico network policies um, do a few things. It will make policies that could be applied to any object. Uh, the rules, it's not he, <laughs> it's just the, the T is missing there. So the rules can contain um, uh, the specific action. You can use ports, port ranges, protocols, IP subnets, selectors on the rules. You can control traffic flows via DNAT. Um, I think that's destination network address translation. I think those are the D's for settings and policies for traffic forwarding. So really without it, you're not gonna like, without it, you're just not gonna have good network policies. Uh, Calico can perform better than alternatives like Flannel, uh, there should be a comma here, Cilium and WeaveNet. So, cause I was looking up like, what what does Calico do? You know what I mean? Like, why would you use it other, over other ones? And basically it's just performance, uh, like in terms of resources it's using and, and its flavor of network policies. That's the major reason why. And uh, Calico is what we use uh, in the course, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the autonomy of a network policy file. So these are the files that uh, we would create because um, once we install Calico and we're using them. Um, and I think that when you install different ones, it might change the syntax slightly of this, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but anyway, so the idea is, I'm just trying to get my pen tool out here, um, is that, you know, in this network policy, you're either gonna specify a pod selector or a namespace selector because Network policies are either scoped on the namespace or the pod, or you're selecting very specific IP addresses. And there's two policy types, ingress and egress, and you can have them both in the same file. So ingress defines traffic that's permitted uh, uh, to enter the pod. And then you have uh, traffic that egress that can exit the pod. And you even say like ingress is allowed specifically from this namespace, specifically from these pods and block these IP addresses, right? And the traffic has to be on this port. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of it, um, but we are gonna write a network policy, so uh, we'll get hands on there and that's where we will really learn what we're doing, okay? All right, let's talk about in transit uh, versus at rest encryption. So in transit is data that is secure when moving between locations like algorithms, TLS and SL SSL. And then encryption at rest is data that is secure when residing on storage within a database or um, even something like block store, like a volume. So you see algorithms like AES, RAS. And so uh, two protocols or um, algorithms we should really talk about is TLS and SSL because they are very popular and they can be easy to mix up. So TLS is an encryption protocol for data integrity between two or more communication uh, computer applications. So TLS 1.0 and 1.1 are uh, deprecated, and I usually say that wrong a lot of times, but I'm pretty sure it's deprecated. And so now the current practice is uh, 1.2 or 1.3 is the current best practice. But at one point it was SSL, you know? So, um, you know, an encryption protocol for data integrity between two or more communications, uh, computer application like 1.0, 2 and 3. So it goes back and forth. Um, I think we're on TLS now, but you'll still 
see us talking about SSL as if we're using it, but probably we're using TLS. Um, you know, in the context of Kubernetes, when you are communicating uh, traffic inbound, you want to be uh, using HTTPS, which would underneath be using that encryption transit like TLS, and then your volumes, which are gonna be on uh, most likely managed providers like Elastic Block Store or uh, Azure Disk, and you're gonna be using whatever encryption method they use uh, for that. But that generally gives you the idea, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're looking at certificates in TLS. So Kubernetes provides an API called Certificates K uh, Kubernetes IO, which lets you provision uh, TLS certificates signed by certificate authorities, CAs, that you control. These CAs and certificates can be used by your workloads to establish trust. Uh, and even though like in my 15 year career, I just never can remember <laughs> what these things are. Like I know what they are, but I just mean like the specification and all the settings underneath. So if you find them like a little bit uh, daunting or confusing, just understand that I've been doing it for a long time and even I don't remember. So uh, what is public key infrastructure? So PKI, so PKI is a set of rules, policies, hardware, software procedures needed to create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates and manage public key encryption. So it sounds like a very fancy system for managing public keys. What is X509 certificate? Because we hear this a lot in the web. Um, it's a standard defined by the International Telecommission uh, Union, ITU for public key certifications. If you've ever had to open up like an SSL certificate, I believe it follows the 509 um, uh, standard here. So these certificates are used in many internet protocols. So as I said, SSL, TLS, and HTTPS, that's where you most commonly see it, or the, probably the first time you ever saw it if, if you've been in the, uh, in the cloud or web development for uh, quite a few years. Signed and encrypted emails, code signing or document signing. So like when you submit code, to your repo, you can sign it to be like, yes, this code came from me. Um, a certificate contains an identity, like a host name, organizational individual. So like who is the certificate we're signing on the behalf of a public key. So these are algorithms like RSA, DSA, ECDA, and you can use a variety of different ones. So Kubernetes requires PK, PK, PKI for the following operations, client, or client certificates for the kubelet to authenticate to the API server, server cert a certificate for the API server endpoint, client certificates for administrators for the cluster to authenticate to the API server, client certificates for the API server to talk to kubelets, client certificates for the API server to talk to etcd, client certificates cube config for the controller manager to talk to the API server. It's always talking to somebody here. Client certificate cube uh, config for the scheduler to talk to the API server, client and server certificates for front proxies, most of these are going to be stored in uh, uh, etc forward slash Kubernetes PKI. It's going to vary for lightweight distributions like micro Kubernetes will place them somewhere else, Minikube will place them somewhere else. And when you create a cluster, generally it creates one for you, like a key, but there's actually a bunch of keys for a bunch of different things. We will come across this when we need to um, uh, do our back role, uh, role based uh, access controls because we will want to have a user and we'll have to generate a self-signing key like we are the authority for it and we'll have to sign it against uh, keys uh, from the cluster. And so that's gonna be our exposure uh, to this stuff. And I always find it kind of hard, but you know what, we do have to learn it and it's not too bad, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes security best practices. And I got these from Aqua Security. So it's just a, a summary of what Aqua has on one of their websites. And if you don't know Aqua Security, they are a really well-known security company that has products and services. Um, and so the recommendations here is enable Kubernetes role-based access controls, uh, because as soon as they're enabled, that means that all users by default uh, do not have access and then you have to give them permission and that's a great idea. Uh, use third-party authentication for API server. So um, authentication could be um, uh, Okta, uh, maybe Cognito, um, any kind of decentralized authentication system, Azure Active Directory. Again, I don't know how those would integrate, but using a third-party authentication is just generally a good idea. Protect etcd with TLS, firewall, and encryption. So that sounds like a good idea. I thought TLS was just on by default, so I'm not exactly sure 
um, about that. But uh, I mean, it sounds like a good suggestion. It did come up uh, when we were talking about um, infrastructure security in the or uh, cloud cloud layer of security and infrastructure security. So isolate Kubernetes nodes. So maybe isolation or sorry nodes. So yeah, uh, I mean, if you want to isolate workloads, that's uh, using namespaces. But I suppose isolating nodes is a uh, different story. Monitor network traffic to limit uh, communication. So maybe that's installing a service mesh, uh, just ha like holding on to Kubernetes logs. I'm not sure uh, there, but I mean, monitoring is always a good idea. Use process whitelisting. So you know, if you have a machine like a Linux machine and it's running particular processes, only allow certain processes and, and everything else should be denied. Turn on audit logging, sounds like a good idea. Uh, audit logging, the idea is that if you have logs, make sure that no one is tampering with your logs. Keep Kubernetes versions up to date. Uh, with managed Kubernetes providers, a lot of them will do that for you. So that's one advantage of using something like uh, Google Cloud's um, Google Kubernetes engine. And we have a lockdown kubelet. So, you know, some of this advice we saw in uh, the layers section, but it's generally good advice here. I just wanted to share it again. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at auto scaling. So, what is auto scaling? Well, in computing, auto scaling is when systems without manual intervention adjust capacity, the amount of CPU and RAM to meet the demand, uh, traffic from users by adding or removing resources commonly triggered by events. Uh, so for pod-based scaling, uh, we have two things. We have the horizontal pod sca uh, scaling. So that's the horizontal pod auto scaler, which is what we'll create when we create a manifest file, which adds more pods to meet the demands. And then we have vertical pod scaling. So the vertical pod auto scaler, which right size pods for optimal CPU and memory resources. Then there is node-based or cluster-based uh, scaling, depending on the way you want to call it. And so this is where we have the cluster auto scaling. And so its implementation, because this is more reliant on um, uh, managed providers or things like that, the solution is uh, uh, kind of like third-party or integrated. So we have cluster auto scaler, and then we have carpenter. And this will add or remove nodes uh, based on the demand. Um, and then there's the cluster API. So this is a declarative API and tooling to uh, simplify provisioning, upgrading, and operating multiple Kubernetes clusters. The cluster API can be extended to support any infrastructure and bootstrap or control plane uh, provider. So I don't know for sure if Cluster Autoscaler is using cluster API. I think it is, I just can't remember. Um, but uh, you know, my guess would be, you know, maybe Carpenter and Autoscaler leverages Cluster API, but these are all kind of components that are involved here for the KCNA. Uh, we're not gonna even uh, notice Cluster Autoscaling, it's just really complicated. And vertical pod scaling, no, but horizontal pod autoscaler is easy to learn and use, and so we will do that one, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at scale versus auto scale. So the scale command is used to update the amount of replicas in the state of a deployment object and perform a deploy. So here uh, we have a uh, scale. We specify the amount of replicas and um, what that will do is just update the amount of replicas in the state of the deployment object and perform a deploy. It's almost like opening up the manifest file of your deployment file and just changing the number and redeploying. The only difference is that um, that obviously won't persist in the manifest file. So you're doing it on the fly um, to those components there. Uh, then there's auto scale. So this command is used to create a horizontal pod auto scaler. Of course, you can create a manifest file and that's what I recommend. But if you are making one really quickly there, uh, that's all you gotta do. So this one's doing a replication controller, which is really old. We don't do those anymore, but I guess I just didn't swap that out in time. Um, but here, this could be, I suppose, a replica set, a deployment. It would be a deployment. And you'd specify the min, the max, the CPU percent. That's not the only fields you can provide, but just understand this one is actually just changing the uh, current capacity. And this one will actually set up rules to auto scale, okay? So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And let's talk about KEDA. So KEDA stands for Kubernetes Event Driven Auto Scaling. And it's a project that allows you to scale based on event data. Uh, it's not gonna show up on the exam, but it's just important to know because it is another um, component to scaling. 
It allows you to access a wide range of scalars that you normally would not have access to. So you might recognize some of these things if you're using cloud service providers so or particular types of open source um, uh, tools or projects. So like we have Kafka, ActiveMQ, AWS services like Kinesis, SQS, tons for Azure, tons, blob storage, event hub, log analytics, monitor, pipelines, application insights, service bus, storage queue, Cassandra, which is um, a, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a column wide database, all sorts of things, Datadog, Elasticsearch, uh, uh, Google Clouds, PubSub, IBM MQ, MongoDB, MySQL, New Relic, PostSQL, Prometheus, um, uh, Redis and a whole bunch more. So, uh, you know, it is a very powerful tool to have if you need event driven auto scaling. Uh, and I just didn't know what it was. And I just felt like we should know in general, uh, that this thing exists. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from exam pro, and we are looking at open standards for cloud native or in particular Kubernetes. So what is open standard or open standards? This is when multiple organizations or technologies adopt a specific technical standard, and a standard is considered open when a public facing community can participate on the development, maintenance and future changes to that standard. And so we have a lot in our cloud native Kubernetes uh, sphere. So let's take a look at it. The first one is the open container initiative. So this defines industry standards around container image formats and runtimes to make sure that all container runtimes could run images produced by any build tool. And so the Container Open Initiative, commonly initialized as uh, OCI or OCI compliant images, was created by Docker because um, you know we needed a way to just kind of standardize container image formats. Then there's CNI, Container Networking Interface, uh, so this is a specification and libraries for writing plugins to configure network interface in Linux containers. So we're going to see a lot of these like container X interface, like container networking interface, runtime interface. And Kubernetes ha has a lot of these because, um, and it's not just Kubernetes, it's just these are designed for any kind of orchestration system that wants to adopt it, adopt it. because if you buy into these uh, container interfaces, um, then... Uh, you know, anyone that's building out these products that are compatible with these plugins uh, can be utilized for any orchestration system, okay? So it's kind of like a middle layer uh, and it really just makes our ecosystem a lot more rich. You have container runtime interface. So this plugin interface, which enables Kubelet to use a, a wide variety of container runtimes without the need to recompile. Uh, so CRIO is an implementation of Kubernetes CRI to enable uh, using OCI compliant runtimes as an example. Um, and I just list that one there just because this is CRI and this is CRIO. And there's no graphic um, beside it. You notice there's no icon. It's because it's going to really be temp dependent on the runtime that you install. Uh, so they just don't have a general graphic for that. You have the container storage interface, so a standard for exposing arbitrary block files and storage systems to containerize uh, workloads on container orchestration systems, COS. Sometimes the, I guess I should have capitalized the S there, but that's fine, like Kubernetes. And then there's OpenTelemetry, a collection of tools, APIs, and SDKs to instrument, generate, collect, and export tele telemetry data like metrics, logs, and traces. So these are all the open standards. There could be more that I'm not aware of, but these are the ones that we care about. Um, and hopefully that gives you kind of an idea there, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the CNCF governance structure. So uh, it's important to know this because um, it does kind of show up in the exam. And also just to understand uh, uh, the whole body of the CNCF and how they operate so that you can really trust um, the cloud native uh, projects and the ecosystem in general. So the CNCF is composed of three main bodies. We have the governing board, uh, initialized as GB, and they're responsible for the marketing and other business oversights and budget decisions. And so the GB has the marketing committee as uh, one component in the governing board. Then there's the technical oversight committee, uh, known as TOC, and they're responsible for defining and maintaining technical vision for the variety of projects under the CNCF. 
And in that, they have special interest groups, SIGs or SIGs. Then we have end users, so EUC, which I don't really see people ever using um, the initialism very often, but end user community. And they're to provide feedback from companies and startups to improve cloud native ecosystems. They actually are the companies and startups. And so they have their own SIGs and then they have user groups. A user group would be like a, um, a meetup, you know, like maybe in Toronto, there's a cloud native meetup. And so they're considered end users and memberships are composed of different tiers, platinum, gold, silver, end user, academic, nonprofit members. And we will talk about how membership plays a role in terms of what positions you can have and uh, what money is involved uh, in this uh, structure for the CNCF. All right, let's take a look here at memberships. So the top tier for the CNCF memberships is Platinum Members. And this gives you the ability to appoint one representative to the CNCF Governing Board. Um, you can appoint one representative as a, a voting member in any subcommittees or activities of the Governing Board. Enjoy most prominent placement in displays of memberships, including on the website. Most of these tiers, it's all about the governing board. And again, um, the real power is really being held by the TOC because they're making technical decisions on the projects. At least that's the way I feel about it. Because um, as you, as you uh, we read about there, the governing board is doing things like marketing and things like that. Um, but you know, we got to get people to pay. So that's just how it works. We have the gold members. So appoint one representative to the CNCF governing board per every five gold members, up to three maximum gold representatives. For the silver members, appoint one representative to the CNCF governing board per 10 silver members, up to three maximum silver representatives. We have end user members. So participate in end user advisory community as described. So nominate one representative to the end user technical advisory board. Um, and I should state that all the tiers above, I just didn't want to cram this slide together, but if you are an uh, end user and you're in one of the other tiers, you get both benefits. Uh, for academic and nonprofit members, participate in limited to academic and nonprofit institutions, respectively, and requires approval by the governing board entitled to identify their organization as members supporting the mission of the CNCF to any other rights or benefits as determined by the governing board. So we got a bunch of tiers here, but where's the money? What are people paying to uh, get these memberships? And uh, it's expensive. You'll see here in a moment. So for the platinum members, 370,000 USD at three year minimum contracts. So companies like AWS, Grafana, New Relic, Apple. So, and there might be more. I don't know if I grabbed all the graphics here because we're just limited on space. But you get the idea of like, what's the spend here for gold members, 120,000 annually. So we got Salesforce, American Express, Equinix, HCL. Uh, for silver members, it's kind of like on this sliding scale, depending on how many employees you have. Uh, the more you have, the more you pay. So here we just see a bunch of recognizable names, HashiCorp, MasterCard, Accenture, DigitalOcean. I thought uh, HashiCorp would have been a little bit more up there just because they focus on multi-cloud and cloud native is uh, pretty keen on that, but that's just where they are. Uh, then for academic and nonprofit members, $1,000. So MITRE, Wiki Wikimedia, Cloud Foundry, Internet2, and then end user members, there is no cost. So um, really the question is, what kind of powers does the governing board have? And so we'll look at that next. <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at the governing board and see what kind of powers they do have. So governing board is responsible for marketing and other business oversights and budget decisions for the CNCF. And so here's um, the graphic I pulled from uh, the website. So you can see some of the members there. And the governing board does not make technical decisions for the CNCF other than working with the TOC to set the overall scope of the CNCF. So what can they do? Well, they can approve a budget. And that's a lot of power. Uh, so they're not making technical decisions, but uh, you know, if you want, if you need money for it, you're gonna have to go through them in order for it to get approved. So directing the use of funds raised from all sources of revenue to be used for technical, marketing, or community investment that advance the mission of the CNCF. They can elect a chair of the governing board to preside over meetings, 
authorize expenditures approved by the budget, and manage any day-to-day -day operations. And there's about 30 governing board members, and they meet about three to five times a year. Uh, so just to kind of expand, it's we covered the most important ones, but let's just go through them all so that we can see what they do. So approve a budget, which we just said. Uh, elect a chair of the governing board to preside over meetings. Authorize expenditure approved by the budget. So when they say like preside over meetings, I'm assuming like any kind of meeting, not just ones on the governing board. Uh, vote on decisions or matters before the governing board. Define and enforce policies regarding intellectual property. Uh, direct marketing evangelism efforts through events, press, analyst outreach, web, social, and other marketing efforts. Oversee operations and qualification efforts. Establish and oversee any committees created to drive the mission of CNCF. Establish and execute a brand compliance program if any, based on the CNCF requirements, which may include a certification test to use the brand marks established by the TOC, adopt guidelines or policy for use of trademark, provide financial governance overall. So, you know, they approve a budget, right? Like that's what I'm going to remember from it. Um, and they, they can preside over meetings. But of course, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, but you just have to generally remember that they're, they're not making technical decisions and they're approving budgets, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at the Technical Oversight Committee, also known as the TOC, and they provide technical leadership to the cloud native community, and they're not a really big team. This is the representatives here, even though they're cut off, it's really a small team, and there's lots of contributions, but this is the main team, and their responsibilities include things like um, defining and maintaining the technical vision of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, approving new projects and creating a conceptual architecture for the projects, aligning projects and removing or archiving projects, accepting feedback from end user committee and mapping to projects, aligning interfaces, uh, yeah, interfaces to components under management, so code references, implementations before standardizing and defining common practices to be implemented across the CNCF projects. So there you go. <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at special interest groups, SIGs, because we did see them in the overall uh, organizational structure. So special interest groups are specialized committees that work under or report to the TOC. And there can be like end user uh, SIGs, but we're talking about the ones that are in the scope of the TOC right now. So SIGs include things around traffic, observability, governance, app delivery, core applied architecture, security. And when I say around, I mean like literally there's a SIG for each one. Right, it's not like they cover all these things, they're specialized. And even at the time this is being drafted, so this list might change, but this is generally what they're thinking, right? And SIGs um, are long-lived groups, so they're not just temporary groups that spin up for a particular use case and then spin down, they are sticking around. Uh, and they're led by uh, recognized and relevant experts. So, you know, if it's like observability, it's gonna be something like people that specialize in service mesh or something like that. Um, and so things that are going on here that, uh, you know, they're supposed to be doing is strengthening the project ecosystem to meet the needs of end users and project contributors, identify gaps in the CNCF project portfolio, find and attract projects to fill these gaps, educate and inform users with unbiased, effective, practical, use, useful information, focus attention and resources on helping foster project maturity systematically across CNCF projects, Clarify relationships between projects, CNCF project staff, and community volunteers. Engage more communities and create an on-ramp to effective TOC contribution recognition. Reduce some project workload on TOC while retaining executive control and, and tonal integrity with elected body. Avoiding creating a platform for politics between vendors. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what SIGs can do. And yes, there are end user SIGs. We're not really covering them here, but this is the SIG that I want you to know is the, the technical ones, okay? Hey, let's take a look here at end user community, also known as EUC, or if you want to attempt to say EUC, but I'm just going to say end users. So end users in the CNCF are individuals or organizations that use cloud native technologies, but they do not sell cloud native services. So examples of not end users would be vendors, consultancies, training partners, telecos, but I kind of feel like the line's a bit uh, uh, blurred there because when you read the charter and how some end users can be promoted to 
rolls outside the end user stuff, I just get really mixed up, okay? So um, I think that uh, it's it's kind of a soft line, okay? Um, the UC acts as a feedback loop between those using cloud native and those maintaining and building cloud native solutions, um, but not just being a feedback loop, you know, uh, you're not just there to, to give them answers uh, as a customer, but the idea is that uh, the end user community is an ecosystem of finding cloud native talent, finding local user groups, uh, meeting project maintainers, contribute to the CNCF technology radar. Um, there is a cost to be, uh, like, there. it's free to be an end user, but then there's membership tiers, but it's confusing because, like, if eight of us is a, uh, like, a Platinum member, are they an end user? Because they have a service. But um, I think this is just kind of a mistake in terms of the marketing pages where um, you have end users and then things beyond that and... It gets confusing. But anyway, end users, if you are paying uh, a particular membership, you don't have to, then you get access to things like educational resources and um, either cheaper or free uh, tickets uh, to the Cloud Native Conference. So that will vary there. But uh, there you go. All right, let's take a look at the end user technology radar. So technology radar is an opinionated guide to set a, uh, a, of a set of emerging technologies. And it basically looks like this. Um, and so the CNCF end user technology radar is intended for a technical audience who want to understand what solutions end users use in cloud native and which they recommend. So basically they do a survey and they ask, what are you using? What do you trust? And then they kind of have this little radar diagram. And this is an original idea from uh, CNCF, and they admit that too, that this is something that a lot of companies like to do, like a technology radar or a radar-like thing. Uh, and they do also have uh, sub-radars, uh, like technology radars um, for like maybe security, serverless, things like that. But this is just the general one there. But let's take a look at these three categories and what they should mean to you when you are adopting uh, technology. So the first is uh, assess. So the CNCF and user community has tried it out. Uh, they find it's promising and recommend having a look at these items when you face a specific need for technology in your project. Okay, then there's trial. So the end user community has used it with success and we recommend you have a closer look at technology, adopt. So clearly recommend this technology um, uh, that have been used for a long period of time in many teams and has proven to be stable and useful. So it's interesting because you have projects and those are like if they're graduated you think that's like a guarantee that you should use them but this is more um less of like what status a project is of like maturity in terms of adoption because that's just a signal to say like enterprises you can use graduated projects you should trust them but this is more practicality saying what works as a combination of technologies um yeah so it's nice to have that kind of balance and have that driven by uh the end users as opposed to just taking the word of the cncf for their projects right because like um, yeah, things like that, okay? Let's take a look here at the CNCF Charter. So the CNCF Charter is a public document that contains the organization structure of the CNCF, the mission and values of the CNCF, the description of membership tiers, the definition of CNCF projects, uh, governing policies, references to code of conduct, general definitions in relation. So like, what does a organization uh, uh, related to the charter, like how, well, how would we describe that? General rules. So it's basically a big document to help define and guide the CNCF. And um, in this section, I used quite a bit of information from it. So you didn't have to read the charter. And then I used the marketing pages to fill it out. Um, so, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea of the contents of the charter, okay? <laughs> So no organization is complete without some values like things or uh, a list of things that they uh, believe in um, and that we're supposed to uh, go along with. So um, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek there because to me, it's just all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, it's like no different than the it was leadership principles or whatever Microsoft or Google does. But let's read it and see what we have here. So the CNCF strives to adhere to the following principles. Fast is better than slow. So enable projects to progress at high velocity to support aggressive adoption by users. Fast is better than slow. Hmm. Open, open, accessible, and operates independently of specific partisan intersects. That seems fair. Uh, accepts all contributors based on the merit of their contributions. I like that. That sounds good too. Technology must be available to all according to the open source values. Fair, uh, sorry, the technical community and its decisions shall be transparent. 
So fair, avoid undue influence, bad behavior, or pay to play decision making. We have strong technical identity. So achieve and maintain a high degree of its own technical identity shared across the projects. Clear boundaries. So establish clear goals and what the non-goals to allow projects to effectively coexist. Help the ecosystem understand where to focus for new innovation. Scalable. Support all scales of deployment from startups to service providers and enterprises. Platform agnostic. The specifications developed will not be platform specific such that they can be implemented on a variety of architectures operating system. So, I mean, it's pretty much aligned with, um, uh, you know, Kubernetes and stuff because it's platform agnostic uh, from from small to large. But I mean, really, Kubernetes is not easy for <laughs> small startups. But I mean, you know, it's cloud native. So we, we can't just look at just Kubernetes. There's a whole scope of projects there. But yeah, I guess that generally aligns with the CNCF. <laughs> All right, so we've been talking about, um, you know, governance stuff. And I just kind of want to show you where this stuff is coming from. Uh, so if you ever want to look it up yourself. So I typed in CNCF uh, Charter, and it uh, brought me here to the Charter page. And so basically, a lot of the stuff we covered is from here, where I've summarized it, or just kind of made it a little bit more digestible. If you're kind of curious uh, what this stuff looks like. And if we go up to Foundation, I wonder if there's more stuff in here. So there's um, all sorts of stuff. Not a whole lot um, that we were looking here. This was pretty much uh, the main thing there. But uh, if we go over here and we go to uh, here, we can see the governing board. Here we can see uh, oversight committee. I don't think I checked what staff was, but it wouldn't hurt to take a look. If we go to who we are, that's probably where I got the values from. Um, so yeah, they link to the charter on the GitHub here on the About Us page. Um, they talk about their cloud native definition, which again, I, I'm not a big fan of it. We did it in the beginning of the course. Um, it's there, okay? Uh, if we go ahead and close that on off, uh, we can see the governing board. So here you can see all the members, you can view their profiles. Um, so nothing super exciting. What's interesting is like, uh, you can read their past minutes because everything's in the open, right? So you can go here, see they meet three to five times a year, click and do it, and it shows you who showed up. Uh, very formal. Um, and also sometimes what they'll do is show like on GitHub, maybe more for... Um, the TOC, but if we go into the TOC, the Technical Oversight Committee, right? Um, they show their activity here. They have a mailing list, so I guess you could start uh, talking to them there. Mailing list is such an old school thing, but hey, they still work. Um, if you go to the TOC, they have their their own page here. The Technical Oversight Committee explains who and when and why they got there, the projects, their meeting times, where the Zoom call is, the passcode to get in. I don't know if you can just like kind of like show up and. Uh, uh, bomb the uh, meeting or something like that, or, or people can listen in. I guess you can come in, they could just mute you or kick you. Uh, then there's uh, technical advisory groups, which we never talked about um, the tags. And these look like SIGs. So I'm a little bit confused because SIGs and tags um, basically have the same thing. So maybe they renamed it. Maybe tags are the same thing. I'm not really sure. Oh, look at that. Yeah, look at that same thing. So maybe this is SIGs or tags. I don't know now. <laughs> so that's cool. Okay, so tags and SIGs, I guess, are the same thing. All right. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty much it. I just, oh, maybe the radar thing. We should take a look at the radar. So if we go to uh, end user radar, okay. Um, here, this says DevSecOps. That's the one I had in the actual um, presentation, the, the slides. If you go down below, uh, you can see like who end users are. They kind of have a presentation. It doesn't tell you much. But this is what's interesting, where you see uh, the data. So like this is how you understand how it's happening, where they're going, OK, let's vote on Terraform. I assume it's just links to the Terraform website. Oh, no, it pops up. Right? And so they gather metrics to see adoption. So that doesn't necessarily mean that that means that you should use it. Just understand that's what the de data is. So we have 21 companies. That's not a lot of companies, <laughs> but maybe they're larger companies. I'm not sure if it shows us um, uh, the information there. Like, how do we know what kind of company they are? And here, I guess we can see the size of them. So, you know, it would be nice if you could like filter based on your company size, because that could really help you understand or even industry help you understand that. But down below, we have different radars. So we have multi-cluster management, secret management, database observability. I said serverless. I guess there isn't one. Um, but that's totally fine there as well. 
And so here you can read all sorts of stuff. These things are, again, you know, take them with a grain of salt. They're, uh, they're, they are what they are. Uh, only other thing I'd like to show you is like end user stuff to show you where I was talking about confusion. So we go end user CNCF. They actually have a page right here. And if you scroll on down, this is where we start seeing uh, memberships and the language just keeps changing or varies in other places. So here they call it a supporter, uh, which is 4,500. Um, but you can join the uh, end users for free. How you do it, I have no idea, right? I guess you just hit join now and you sign up and that's you signing up for free. I don't know, like I've already signed up before because I, I when you set the certification, you need to sign up to do that. So I suppose as soon as you sign up, you technically are an end user. But here you can see kind of the benefits that you get uh, for doing that. But this matches to the memberships we saw earlier. So everyone's an end user or stuff like that. So, you know, if you feel confused, just know that I'm confused a bit too. But, um, you know, it's not really going to show up in the exam, but... Uh, there you go, okay? All right, let's take a look here at KubeCon plus CloudNativeCon. So KubeCon is a technology conference for Kubernetes, and CloudNativeCon is a technology conference for Cloud Native. Uh, why is there two, and why are they combined is another question, because uh, you always see presented as KubeCon plus CloudNativeCon. So um, as far as I understand, talking to people that have been in the industry longer than me for cloud native stuff, I believe it was KubeCon existed first, then they wanted to do cloud native stuff as well. So they tacked that on. I don't think cloud native was ever its own conference. I think it was just like uh, an adjacent conference with KubeCon, so it's essentially one conference. Um, and so that's the idea there. And it was only North America, but then they decided to add a European one uh, and so the attendance is actually very significant. So if we just take a look here on the right-hand side, in 2018, we had 8,000 in person, then 12,000 in person, uh, 22,816 attendees virtual because of COVID. Uh, then we saw kind of a split where we had 17,000 attendees and only 4K in person. And so who knows what it'll be for 2022? Um, I'm not sure. And even at these conferences, you might see adjacent conferences in North America, like IstioCon, ServiceMeshCon, GitOps, GitOpsCon. I don't know how you draw the boundaries. Like, I don't know if they have like a separate building or stuff, but uh, that's a thing. But, you know, I do hear really good things about uh, these conferences. I hear they're very inclusive and uh, welcoming. Uh, and it's uh, much more refreshing over something like AWS reInvent. Uh, so hopefully one day I'll get to go in person, but uh, I just wanted you to understand that this is a thing. All right, so I wanted to show you a bit more about KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, just because I felt my slides were a little bit lacking, but just to kind of show you how big of a deal it is. So I just typed in KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con, made it to the main website here. It's on Linux Foundation. If you scroll on down, you get some really fun screenshots to get a good idea um, you know, what it's like to be at KubeCon. So there's probably even more photos. If I click here, uh, it's not loading. Oh, there we go. So yeah, we can see uh, it's it's a big deal. It's just like going to um, like the AWS reInvent conference or Ignite. Uh, they're big, or like Azure Ignite or Microsoft Ignite. It's a big deal, right? So, you know, just consider that. Uh, you know, you can see the schedule here. Look how big that stage is, right? Uh, you can see all the sponsors. So there's a lot of money being put into it. If you cannot attend, um, I don't know if all the videos make it up on here, but a good chunk of them do. Um, and so, you know, you can go back and watch some videos that were at previous ones. Probably go to the playlist to see uh, what they are. So if you just scroll on down here, you can see there are some featured playlists, right? So. Um, you know, like that. I don't know if all really, I don't think all the videos get on there. I think it just kind of happened because of COVID and they just put some of the videos up because there's a lot, a lot of events and I'm not seeing uh, the volume of that I would think that if I, if I was at KubeCon. So, you know, there you go. And, uh, you know, hopefully it convinces you that you might want to go. Okay. All right, let's take a look here at CNCF projects. So projects are technologies uh, and they are managed by the CNCF. So many CNCF projects are developed by external tech companies and then are handed over to the CNCF for long-term support. And you can access all these projects at cncf.o forward slash projects. And projects are categorized based on their maturity level 
and I'm pretty sure you need to know that for the exam. So um, here they have this uh, diagram here that kind of shows um, some information. And this is actually based off a diagram from a book. But let's go through the different categories. So we have graduated, meaning it's production ready for enterprises. Incubating, so the this is where the APIs might be rapidly changing. And you may have incomplete, uh, they may be incomplete to be adopted by large enterprises, but they are totally fine for smaller companies. Uh, then you have sandbox, so experimental prototypes. Uh, uh, and I would not bet that these would pass the security review. So, um, you know, there are so many sandbox projects, they're just not listed on the website. And the maturity level, again, is based off of this book called Crossing the Chasm, uh, which is uh, a diagram in the book from 1991. I don't particularly care for it. I'm not really sure why they use um, this model. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's like to try to sell more of those books or somebody in particular liked it and thought, yeah, that's a good framework to use. Um, but it's fine. I mean, I would just prefer it being like stable or you know, release candidate or something like that, but that's how they name them. So there's that. But let's talk a little bit more about sandboxes. Um, uh, so if let's say you wanted to find sandbox projects, because I just said that they're not on the main website, but they are in the, the landscape. So what you can do is go to CNCF projects and then check box there. And that's the way you can see them. Now, all these projects um, go through different kinds of eco or um, uh, life cycles. And so it might be worth uh, to take a look at the different life cycles. So here I have uh, project stages, and this is from uh, the documentation for CNCF projects right from their website. So the idea is uh, we have a, a sandbox. So these are experimental neutral collaborations. And here they're suggesting like they're low barrier, low reward. Uh, and so, you know, you might not want to adopt them. Then they have the significant barrier. So this is where the majority of development happens. I think that's what they're saying there. And then from incubation, they say the obvious path, so incubation to graduation. Um, not a lot of descriptions around this stuff, but you kind of get an idea where things are flowing and that some things just completely skip over the sandbox section and go straight to incubation. Uh, and all of these have even more detailed information. So when you look at the sandbox process, the idea is that a, there is a project proposal that is in the, in the case of a GitHub issue. Um, the uh, technical committee will triage it and give it a brief request a SIG. The SIGs will make a presentation that is recorded. The presentation slides and recording completed a recommendation template. Um, and then the TOC will review recommendation and presentation. And then it will be in sandbox. So three TOC sponsors to the step forward. So that's how we get to that. Then there's the incubation process. So um, you have a project proposal and um, it goes to special interest groups again, makes a presentation whether it's recommendation, they do their due diligence with tech and governance user interviews. Um, and then here we have another review with another presentation, the TOC vote on it, and it makes it into incubation. So you can see there's a lot there. Um, I don't think there was one for graduated. There probably is a process, but I, I didn't see one because if, I, if there was, I'd have it here. Uh, but that's that there. So there is at least one graduated CNCF project generally for each uh, cloud native category. And that's just something that I observed. Um, and that kind of makes sense because like, how do these categories exist, um, you know, if they don't have it? So we're looking at things that are graduated. So like container, runtime, container D, core DNS, Envoy, uh, etcd, uh, Fluent D, Harbor, Helm, uh, Jaeger. I think it's pronounced Jaeger, like the J's, the Y, uh, Kubernetes, Linkerd, Open Policy Agent, Prometheus, um, the Update Framework, so Tough, Rook, and uh, Teak V, and Vitus, or Vitus. Lots of names I've never had to say out loud before, so hopefully I got them all right. But there there are a, real, a lot of really good uh, incubating projects that uh, I'd strongly recommend using, so I don't think that should be a discouragement, but this is really for, like, you know, if you're a large organization, like a huge enterprise, then you're probably going to gravitate towards these projects, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're looking at what is serverless. So serverless architecture generally describes fully managed cloud services 
and the classification of cloud services being serverless is not a billion answer as a yes or no, but an answer on a scale where a cloud service has a degree of serverless. So a serverless service could have all or most of the following char uh, characteristics, and you basically just have to pay, take an estimated guess to say whether it is serverless. There's a lot, a lot of debate about serverless, but you know, I've talked to uh, engineers like at AWS and stuff like that, where we saw serverless very early on, and the definition was really simple. There's a, a degree of operations that you just do not have to perform, and you can just focus on um, providing business value. But let's look at the elements that um, I've included here that I've generally been able to find out about serverless. So serverless is generally highly elastic and scalable, highly available, highly durable, secure by default. It abstracts away the underlying infrastructure and are built based on the execution of business tasks. So for business value, serverless can scale to zero, meaning when not in use, the serverless resources cost nothing. And so the idea here uh, in these two sections here is we're paying for value. You don't pay for idle servers. Uh, my friend that runs the uh, Service Toronto User Group uh, likes to describe it as uh, energy rating. So uh, the idea is that, um, you know, consumers, uh, you know, what they're going to do, like think of like if you have like a washer or dryer and you have this energy rating saying like it's out of three stars out of five of being energy efficient, right? So the idea is like some things are more serverless than others, um, you know, and that's just the idea there, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at cloud native and Kubernetes serverless. So uh, the CNCF has a landscape for just serverless um, uh, services or, or cloud native serverless things. And so what does that mean? Well, so the CNCF classifies as serverless in this landscape to be things like functions as a service. So AWS Lambda, Azure serverless functions, Google Cloud functions, serverless frameworks, such as Dapper, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced, AWS SAM, Chalice, uh, installable platforms, Kubernetes-based event-driven auto-scaling, KEDA, which we did talk about in this course, Apache OpenWhisk, OpenFOSS, KNative, Fission, Kubeless, and tools, things like uh, uh, Lumigo and Dashbird. So it's interesting that they put um, like managed providers because I guess technically, you know, they're cloud native, but they're not, they can't be moved to anywhere else. So um, I think it's kind of like those things where like AWS paid a bunch of money to be like a top tier uh, provider. And so it's like, hey, can you throw AWS Slam down there? Because to me, if it's cloud native, it has to be uh, an installable thing. It can't be a, um, a service that is uh, managed. Do you know what I mean? That uh, can't be moved to any other platform. So to me, this is where, uh, you know, like maybe these frameworks and this is where, mm, actually I'm going to just zero this out. I would just say this is what really feels to me to be um, what I call cloud native serverless. And these things are just kind of like adjacent to them, right? Um, so just bear that in mind, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and let's take a look at Knative. So Knative is Kubernetes-based platform to deploy and manage modern serverless workloads. And Knative is a project to create a standard set of building blocks. I think that's kind of an important statement right there. Standard set of building blocks for Kubernetes to enable serverless development patterns. Knative generally is composed of two parts. Uh, and I say generally because there is a third part called building, but Knative serving. So this takes containerized code and deploy it to, uh, with relative ease. It scales to zero cost. You have Knative eventing, triggers serverless functions based on Kubernetes API events, loop in other managed sources to trigger serverless functions. Without this part, the eventing, it, we might not consider it serverless because if it just had serving to make it easier to um, uh, uh, have an opinion on setting up a bunch of infrastructure for you to deploy your apps, it would just be like a managed layer. Um, so over here, you kind of get an idea of uh, what else is going on here. So Knative has building, eventing, and serving. It's on top of Kubernetes, and then there can be layers like the app on top. Like that's just Istio for service mesh, like discovery to reach those functions. Some considerations is that it's not a complete serverless framework, and it does not offer function as a service offering. Now, that doesn't mean you can't run functions on it, but function as a service is more of a fully managed 
uh, thing. And so there's just some things that are missing. This is not my words. This is K-Native. Like you watch the proper presentation, uh, like uh, for those uh, who like do it, like use it. And they even say that this is the case. So uh, that doesn't mean it's not great. It's just a degree of serverless. Remember back to the energy ratings where something can be more serverless than others, but it's still pretty darn serverless. Now, um, Knative has its own um, uh, Kubernetes objects that it defines with Kubernetes custom resource definition, CRDs. That is something that's out of the scope of this course, like talking about CRDs, but just understand that they're used to make your own components. And so Knative components is server service. So manage lifecycle of a workload, route mapping network endpoints, configuration maintains desired state, revision, so point in time snapshots of code. And so basically they're using the word service more like how we would use the word service to run a workload, except uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's continuously running. So, you know, like when you use something like AWS ECS, um, they say service and task service is something that, that continuously runs uh, and doesn't spin down and a task does, it runs and then it spins down. But just understand they call their service. And so here's kind of a diagram how they all work together. So of course the service would have a configuration. A service is basically the function. Revisions are uh, snapshots, so like backups of ones that you made and routes that point to this particular one. And you're not gonna really be doing all the rest. You're just gonna be working with service. And the way you do that with, is with the K-native CLI called KN. And you use this alongside kubectl because you, it's not like you're not gonna touch any kubectl, but uh, when you're working with your apps and stuff and deploying your functions, which are called services in uh, KN, it's gonna be like this kind of different syntax here. So think of Knative as abstracting away deployment services, autoscaling many more K components, and you just create and deploy KN or Knative services. So there you go. Let's take a look here at Knative versus OpenFast. And really all I did was grab a excerpt from an article for, on the CNCF blog from 2020 called Serverless Open Source Frameworks, OpenFast, Knative, and more. Strongly recommend to read it, even though we are a few years in the future here. Uh, I still think it rings true based on what I was looking at and just maybe will help to understand the difference between these two a little bit more. So unlike OpenFast, Knative is not a full-fledged serverless platform, but is better positioned as a platform for creating, deploying, and managing serverless workloads. However, from the point of the view of configuration maintenance, OpenFast is simpler. With OpenFast, there is no need to install all components separately as Knative, and you don't have to clear previous settings and resources for new developments if the required components have already been installed. Still, as mentioned uh, above, a significant drawback of OpenFast is the container launch time depends on the provider. While Knative is not tied to any single cloud solution, provider. Based on the pros and cons of both, organizations may also choose to use Knative OpenFOSS together to effectively achieve different goals. So one thing that was interesting is the container launch time depends on the provider. I didn't fully understand why. Do you know what I mean? So that's one thing I wasn't sure about that I really tried to research. Another interesting thing is just when you see the stacks, like the tools involved, Op or Knative feels a lot more towards um, the CNCF's projects, like like standard projects, and OpenFast is a little bit different. Um, so like Knative feels more, again, a better migration path back to full Kubernetes if you need it, and OpenFast is, really feels like serverless, like you don't have to do a lot of work there. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the pillars of observability. So before we talk about observability in Kubernetes, we should just understand uh, this general concept of pillars of observability. Um, and I don't really show them as pillars. I show them more like a Triforce because I think that that makes it for a better visualization. But let's talk about what observability is. So it's the ability to measure and understand how internal systems work in order to answer questions regarding performance, tolerance, securities, and faults with a system and application. To obtain observability, you need to use metrics, logs, and traces, and you have to use them together. Using them in isolate does not gain you observability. So just understand, they all work together. For metrics, we have a number that is measured over a period of time. So if we measured the CPU usage in aggregate, uh, and aggregate it over uh, a period of time, we would have our average CPU metrics. For logs, we have a text file where each line contains event data about what happened at a certain time. So it's a log. Uh, and then there's traces, a history of requests that it uh, travels through multiple apps and services so we can pinpoint failures or 
uh, performance or failures, and traces go along with spans. We'll talk about that. And I say it looks like uh, the Triforce of Observability than the Pillars of Observability, but uh, that's the idea there, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Open Telemetry, uh, uh, initializes OTEL, and is a collection of open source tools, APIs, SDKs to instrument, generate, collect, and export telemetry data. It standardizes the way telemetry data is uh, collected, like metrics, logs, and traces. Um, and it uses the wire protocol, which refers to a way of getting data from point to point, like SOAP MQP. So uh, the idea here is we have applications that are instrumented with the OTEL library that go to collector agents. So an agent that is on the host, and it's going to send it to the OETL collector service, uh, which essentially are backends. And uh, I mean, that's what it is. Uh, open telemetry is a big deal because it could uh, really change the way we collect information. And we're starting to see cloud service providers um, adopt it. So, you know, you have AWS CloudMet, or sorry, CloudWatch, but like, why would you use that when you can use open telemetry, which gives you a lot more richer data. So it kind of competes with um, uh, services in, in some sense, but uh, definitely is a really great tool to have. So let's talk about instrumentation. So instrumentation is the act of embedding a monitoring library into your existing application in order to capture monitoring data, such as metrics, traces, or logs. So I really like Ruby, so I grabbed the Ruby example, and the idea is that you'd have some kind of library, and you'd import that library, set some defaults, you'd run the configure, you'd create a tracer, because uh, instrumentation is the idea behind it is you are creating traces, right? Uh, and traces and spans per se, so there, uh, you have your tracer. So you're gonna have one trace that goes along a bunch of projects. And then in, in this application, it's going to create a span because the span starts within an application. You pass it a variety of attributes like data that you want. Um, and that's all there is to it. And the telemetry, uh, OTEL or open telemetry supports a variety of languages. So basically all your favorite languages. And for certain frameworks, uh, there are plug and play libraries to quickly instrument your app. So if you're using Spring, A ASP.NET, Express, Quarkus, uh, I assume that they're just kind of like built into the background. So you're not really doing instrumentation. You just say, turn it on and it just happens. I'd love it for Ruby on Rails. Maybe there's a third party for it. I don't know. Um, and let's just talk about the collector for a moment. So open telemetry collector is an agent installed on the target machine or is a uh, dedicated server and is vendor agnostic way to receive, process, and export telemetry data. It removes the need to run, operate, maintain multiple agent collectors. And this works with improved scalability and support with open source observ observability data formats like Jaeger. Again, I think it's Jaeger, not like Jagger, but Jagger sounds cool too. Prometheus Fluent Bit sending to one or more open source or commercial backends. Uh, the local collector agent is the default location to which instrumentation libraries export their telemetry data. And so here they're just kind of representing what we said. So you have OLTP, uh, Jagger, uh, Prometheus, and that's going to receivers. Um, and you can see that it's adjusting on both sides here, just as an example, right to that. But this is all what's inside of the OL, uh, the OTEL collector, okay? so. That's all I want you to know for open telemetry. Um, they don't really say much on the exam or if any, but it is a really important project to know, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look here at Prometheus, an open source system monitoring and alerting toolkit originally built at SoundCloud. Yes, the company that uh, makes um, or allows you to host sound clips. Prometheus collects and stores its metrics uh, as a time series data, and that should give you an indication that it is a time series database. And its main features are a multi-dimensional data model with time series data identified by metric name key value pairs, PromQL, a flexible query language to leverage the, uh, the, uh, the dimensionalities, no reliance on distributed storage, single server nodes are autonomous. Time series collection happens via a pull request on HTTP. Publishing time series is supported via the intermediate uh, intermediary gateway. Targets are discovered via uh, service discovery or static configuration. Multiple modes of graphing and dashboarding support. Prometheus values reliability, so you can always view what statistics are available about your system, even under 
failure conditions. If you need 100% accuracy, such as per request billing, Prometheus, Prometheus is not a good choice as the collected data will likely not be detailed uh, to be or complete enough for that use case. In such a uh, uh, case, you'd be best off using some other system to collect and analyze the data for billing and Prometheus, Prometheus for the rest of your monitoring. So let's take a look here at um, the actual system itself that it works. Um, and so the idea is that Prometheus scrapes metrics from instrumental jobs, either directly or via an uh, intermediate pushed gateway for short lived jobs. Uh, it stores all scraped samples locally and runs rules over this data set to either aggregate and record new time series from existing data or generate alerts. And Grafana or other API consumers can be used to, uh, uh, to visualize the time series data. You can see that it also has alerting and other cool stuff built in there. Um, and there's not really much to show for Prometheus. Every time I see Grafana, I always think it is Prometheus. Uh, but Grafana is only the visualization tool on top of it. But it's the next thing that we will talk about, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Grafana, which is an open source analytics and interactive visualization web application. Grafana is commonly used along with a time series database like InfluxDB, Prometheus, or Graphite. Uh, and so it looks like this. And uh, there's really not much else to talk about it uh, for the KCNA because you don't need to know that much other than it's a visualization library that works with Prometheus. Uh, but there you go. All right, let's take a look here at traces and spans because these are things that we'll come across, especially in serverless, especially in microservice architecture, like using anything with Kubernetes because you have to track things between containers or between uh, between workloads, and that can get kind of confusing. So uh, here is our graphic. Well, let's talk about what a trace is. A trace is data or execution path through the system and can be thought of as a directed acrylic graph of spans. And so we're talking about a DAG. This is that thing over here. So the idea is that you have um, a unique ID that's going to be tracked through uh, all these um, uh, spans, and then this makes up the trace. This is the trace, right? Uh, and then the spans are the individual services, the individual containers or, or whatever that's tracking saying, this is what happened uh, in my little app. This is what happened in my little app. And then there's the context in between them, like the latency and stuff in between them, or did it fail? How many times did it try? So a span represents a logical unit of work in Jaeger. So I actually pulled this from the Jaeger documentation. This graphic is from Jaeger uh, or Jaeger. I'm not sure how to pronounce it because it's used for... Um, tracking this stuff that has an operation name, the start time of the operation the duration spans may be nested and ordered to model casual relationships. So uh, hopefully that gives you an idea what traces and spans are, uh, but there you go. All right, let's talk about cost management. Now on the KCNA exam, I only had one question about cost management. It was absurdly hard and obscure. Um, and it had to do with like, if you, like it was actually scenario based, like, oh, if you had these many things running, if you scaled it down, would it be better to scale up or scale down or whatever? It just didn't make any sense for a KCNA question. So my brain, I go, that must've been an unscored question or just a bizarre one. And there aren't a lot of good resources out there for cost management, even though it's part of the exam, I had to like scrounge for information um, and try to make it kind of relevant so let's just go through what I could find. And uh, I mean, it's just gonna be general knowledge, but you know, just understand that, uh, you know, it's just the best I can do here, okay? So first thing is like labeling resources. If you label your resources um, with like metadata, then you can use a visualization tool like Prometheus or Grafana, well, and Grafana to then kind of figure out costs, all right? How you get dollar amounts in that, I do not know, but I do know that that is a suggestion there. You can find idle and unallocated resources because if they're idle or unallocated, you're paying for them. The idea here would be to visualize idle CPU, memory, storage, and Prometheus and Grafana and say like, hey, where do we see zero CPUs being used but something's running? Um, horizontal, uh, sorry, uh, workload right sizing would uh, help a lot. So um, with that, we can use a vertical pod autoscaler to adjust the CPU memory of pods, a horizontal pod autoscaler to add or remove to meet the demand. So one is right sizing uh, the, the pods usage itself. Another one could be right sizing um, 
uh, the cluster, so to speak, but uh, at a pod level. Then there's cluster downsizing opportunities, which is, again, I guess, right-sizing, um, where you're using cluster autoscaler. There's a double S there. There should only be one, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, but it will add or remove nodes to meet the demand. Um, you can leverage uh, free trials of Kubernetes cost tools like KubeCost. You know who's recommend that was? KubeCost. <laughs> so I think they're just trying to use the tool. But I mean, it's good advice. It's not going to be an answer on the exam, but it's true. Uh, you can estimate future costs. And so here, this is where you'd use like load testing using something like SpeedScale, K6, JMeter, Gatling. And so you'd say, well, what would it cost if I had this kind of traffic or these kind of nodes and stuff like that? Um, so not wasting uh, space. This is pretty similar to finding idle and unallocated stuff. Um, but to just kind of add to that, it's like you could adopt serverless architecture that scales to zero. So when no traffic is received for a period of time, it just shuts it off, okay? Um, and technical debt. So maybe you can re-architect to reduce the amount of pods, or maybe you should be using more pods and breaking up your app into smaller workloads. So you can then isolate what things are cost effect, like, like costly and what aren't, right? Uh, and also just continually evaluate cloud native technologies. And this is the best I can do for cost management. But uh, yeah, for the exam, probably just it's going to be around right sizing, like vertical pod autoscaler, horizontal pod autoscaler, uh, and then making the best guess you can, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Kubernetes system logs and K logs. So, system logs um, is system component logs uh, that record events happening in a cluster which can be very useful for debugging. And you can configure log verbosity to see more or less detail. So logs can be as coarse grained as showing errors with the component or as fine grained as showing step-by-step -step traces of events, such as HTTP access logs, pod state changes, controller actions, scheduled decisions. And as easy as they make it sound and detailed information, I couldn't find a whole lot here. I think I would have to probably jump into a uh, follow along and make a practical example to really extract that information out. But really, they just, it was like cost management. It's just like I could not find good examples readily available to digest in a slide here. But uh, there is the kubectl command logs. And so here we're providing the pod name or deployment name, whatever it is, probably pod name. And so that would get you log information. There is a library called klog, it's the Kubernetes logging library. It's based off of glog, which is Golang's logging library, and it generates log messages for the Kubernetes system components. And I think we did talk about Kubelet being able to, uh, in the Kubelet section, uh, you know, uh, taking log data and sending it back uh, where, wherever uh, there. So, you know, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea uh, there about logs, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at chaos testing and testing. So what is testing? Well, this is the assertion uh, that we have an expectation of inputs and outputs of functions. That's the most basic thing in programming. So the idea is we have a ver uh, variable uh, called hello right here, and we assign it a string called world, and then we assert using our testing framework to say, does the variable hello equal world? And if it does, uh, pass. If it doesn't, fail, okay? So that's the basic concept. Now, it's not gonna be the same for um, uh, uh, Kubernetes, but we don't really have to dig that deep because it's not on the exam, okay? So let, let's talk about chaos testing. So this is building a system to withstand and tolerate any kind of failure by purposely introducing random failures into production system. So it's just like, imagine if you uh, had a junior developer that was just doing whatever they wanted, you know? Um, and uh, you're just making sure that your application is resilient to any kind of problems. So there's a few different frameworks out there. So for chaos testing, we have Chaos Cube. For a just a testing framework, we have Test Cube. And then there's the generalized Chaos Monkey, which is a chaos testing framework. So I just wanted you to know that there was a Chaos Cube and Test Cube frameworks. And the exam is not really going to ask you about this stuff, but you should know it. So that's why I'm showing it to you, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Helm. So before we answer that, we asked to ask ourselves, what is a package manager? So a package manager is a collection of software tools that automate the process of installing, upgrading, configuring, and removing computer programs for a computer in a consistent manner. 
So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. And Helm is broadly composed of three components. We have charts. So these contain all the resources, definitions necessary to run applications, tools, services inside Kubernetes clusters. Repositories, so this is the place where charts can be controlled and shared, and releases an instance of a chart running in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so I just want to show you the Helm chart directory structure. So if you were to create a package, this is an example I found online where it's a WordPress um, Helm chart. And so here you can see there's the chart YAML file, license, readme, uh, things like that. One thing is that uh, you always have this chart YAML file, but um, there's also this values YAML, which defines um, the variables and the default values and the values you can pass into this uh, to configure the Helm package. Okay, so Helm reserves the use of charts direct, uh, directory CRDs. So I, I assume that's custom resource definitions, uh, template directories, and uh, of the listed file names. Other files will be left as they are. Okay, I'm just pointing out that uh, chart YAML is important and values YAML is important, or at least I thought it was because when I opened up the chart um, uh, chart.yaml file, I was expecting to kind of see something interesting but it's just kind of very boring. It's like package.json. It's like, okay, these are the dependencies, the API versions, the description, the home page, the maintainers, nothing super exciting, but basically if you want to um, package this and put this on their, uh, the place where they host them, which uh, is somewhere listed in this section here, um, you know, that's something you're gonna need. So let's talk about packaging and installing. So to package a chart directory in a version chart archive, the Helm package command is used. So there we do Helm package hyphen hyphen sign. I guess you have to sign it, provide its directory um, uh, there. So version charts archives are used by Helm package repositories. And I was saying that there's a place where you can find all these and they're on Artifact Hub. So you go to artifacthub.io uh, and there's all sorts of um, Helm packages you can uh, access. So I just typed in, um, uh, something like Postgres or something like this. And I found this one. And often what you're doing is you add the repo so you know where um, where to go get this package. Then you do an update, then you do an install. And that's pretty much the procedure that you're gonna run. Of course, if you have configuration, you'll provide values uh, via flags and things like that. Uh, but that's Helm in a nutshell, but we do cover it in this course. So you will at least know how to install something from Helm, not necessarily make a Helm package because it's a lot of work, but there you go. Well, let's talk about Customize. So Customize provides more flexibility when writing Kubernetes configuration files by allowing you to overlay or override to patch configurations. And Customize is built in the kubectl, at least a version of it. Um, and so Customize kind of is put up against Helm and being like an easier, simpler version of Helm. Um, we do not, do a follow along on Customize just because Helm, I think it's just, I, I mean, like if we were to do showing you how to package a Helm, which we don't, we show you how to install a Helm package. I'd rather do Helm than Customize because I think that it's just um, has better utility for uh, organizations. But uh, the way Customize works is that you define your base architecture in a folder called base. So you have deployment service, anything you want in here. And then you have Customization YAML, which contains how things should get patched. And so, then you have down below uh, patches, overlays, whatever you want to call it, because it doesn't matter what the folder name is, you can call it whatever you want, because you're just going to be using an apply. And so it will have a customization YAML, and that file will say in that thing, it's like a YAML file that says, um, patch with these other files. And these files look very similar to the other ones, it just literally replaces components, like almost overlaying them. Um, wasn't easy to find anything that would show me how to do this really quickly. I probably would have had to spend like a couple hours just to get a simple example for you. Not that it's hard, but just hard to find available examples for customize that easily translate it over for you. But it's not gonna really be heavy on the exam. I just wanted you to know that it's an alternative to Helm and that it's uh, supposedly easier to use, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at infrastructures of code. And so first we have to kind of outline the problems with manual configuration. So there is an advantage to manual configuration. Uh, it allows your cloud infrastructure, your cloud native infrastructure, uh, to easily start using new service offerings, new APIs, versions, to quickly prototype architect architectures. However, it comes with a lot of downsides. So it's easy to misconfigure a service through human error, 
or uh, Kubernetes components. So this is just a general slide. That's why I'm keep on adapting it to Kubernetes terms here. It's hard to manage the expected state of a configuration for compliance. It's hard to transfer configuration knowledge to other team members. So infrastructure as a code allows you to write a configuration script to automate creating, updating, or destroying cloud infrastructure. And uh, the idea is an IAC is a blueprint for your infrastructure. Um, IAC allows you to easily share version or inventory your cloud infrastructure. And so the idea is that you'd have uh, your script or collections of scripts or whatever tool you use. And then by running it once, you can do it. And so kind of in a sense, when you write manifest files in Kubernetes, you technically are doing infrastructure as a code, but you generally get uh, some extra benefits there like um, state management. So uh, things like that. So we're doing infrastructure as a code, but like there's just other benefits around there. And so we could just kind of have to understand um, the difference there because it's a bit fuzzy with Kubernetes, okay? All right, so what I wanna do here is look at popular infrastructure as a code tools and also describe declarative versus imperative. So declarative, we'll start with that. So declarative means what you see is what you get. It's very explicit. It's also more verbose, but there's zero chance of misconfiguration. So these would use uh, scripting languages like JSON, YAML, XML, or uh, kind of HCL. And so every single cloud service provider uh, generally has their own tool or they use a, a generic one um, like Terraform. But for um, Azure, we got ARM templates and blueprints. For AWS, we have CloudFormation. For Google, we have Cloud Deployment Manager. For everybody else, we have Terraform. Uh, does IBM Cloud have their own? I don't know. I think that you would have to use Terraform for that. And Oracle Cloud, you definitely use that. Um, but Terraform is this one where uh, it's, it's designed to be um, multi-cloud, right? On the imperative side, we have uh, uh, you say what you want and the rest is filled in, so it's implicit. Um, less verbose, you could end up with misconfiguration. Uh, does more than declarative because you're able to utilize full programming languages that does come with additional complexity, but it can be worth it. So things like uh, the AWS Cloud Development Kit, CDK, or Pulumi are two options there. Um, but it's interesting because when we're talking about infrastructure code, there is the managed infrastructure uh, or managing infrastructure of the cluster, but then there's managing infrastructure in the cluster or app or application infrastructure. And that's something we'll talk about here next, okay? All right, so for Kubernetes, infrastructure as a code can be a bit squishy, a bit confusing because the idea is that you have uh, infrastructure that Kubernetes has to run on like virtual machines, uh, like cloud service providers, self-hosted data centers, but then there's Kubernetes components, like things inside the cluster. And so I'm just gonna try to help you understand uh, that it's all infrastructure, but we might just have to contextualize it. So there's managing infrastructure of the cluster and there's managing infrastructure in the cluster and the tools that we use will be a slightly different because when people think of infrastructure as a code, they're gonna to default to something like CloudFormation, Terraform, but um, you know, it's not gonna solve all of our problems. And so let's just talk about some of the differences here. So if we're managing infrastructure of the cluster, this is stuff that the cluster is running on, the virtual machines or managed services like EKS, Google Cloud Engine or, or what have you. And so those can be set up with a tool, like a traditional tool, like Terraform or CloudFormation or um, Azure Blueprints or ARM templates or a deployment manager, use the provision, the cluster and managed services. So like relational databases or things that you don't want to uh, put on the responsibility of the cluster alongside the cluster um, itself. Okay, so that's the recommendation. Now for in the cluster, you can use Terraform. Okay, you can technically use Terraform because they have this manifest module. And basically you're just rewriting your manifest files like the YAML files as HCL, which is the, the base language or the, the language of Terraform files. Uh, and so the reason you might wanna use Terraform is because you benefit from the state management provided by Terraform. And that way you'll be able to kind of detect configuration drift and things like that. Kubernetes already manages state within the controller manager and etcd. So it's kind of like, well, uh, Terraform manages state, but Kubernetes already manages state. Do we need two things in managing state? And there could be other ways of doing a configuration drift, like using the uh, admissions controller. So it's debatable whether it's worth the extra complexity to manage things in the cluster using Terraform, but definitely of the cluster, 
terraform or cloud formation or what have you is totally fine. When we're talking about managing in the cluster, um, I like to put the thing in front of it, application inf infrastructure. So things like pods, services, ingress, anything that you would deploy as components. Um, and it's recommended to package these as Helm charts and use that in your CI CD. Now, you think, well, couldn't I just take all these uh, manifest files and put them in a, a GitHub directory? Sure, but there are some synergies by using Helm because it's just easier to like uh, Helm deploy than it is to put things in there. And so this is kind of where we see a separation of those two. Could you use Ansible? I guess I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but these are the two that I generally think that would be good. And I think Terraform would be good for other the cluster because if you use it once, um, it's, then it won't be too hard if you ever have to move uh, to another provider. And if you're using Kubernetes, that's one of the benefits. So, you know, why not use it? Okay, so there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're taking a look at GitOps. So GitOps is when you take infrastructure as a code and you use a Git repository to introduce a formal process to review and accept changes to infrastructure as a code once the code is accepted, it automatically triggers a deploy. So here's the general example here uh, where you have some kind of IAC tool like Terraform and you actually commit the changes to your code. And this also could be like Helm packages and things like that in the mix to your GitHub repository. Uh, so a PR would be uh, generated and it could be auto, auto approved or someone can review it and press a button. It gets merged into the main branch and then some kind of um, CI CD tool. This is GitHub Actions, but it could be uh, Argo CD. Um, it could be uh, uh, Jenkins X, Jenkins um, Flux. And then from there, it would go to the cloud service providers to affect the managed, managed services, or it could be going to Kubernetes to, uh, you know, affecting components or things like that, or rolling out a hem, uh, Helm package there to get our changes. So uh, the most important thing is that it's a formal process to review and accept changes of infrastructure code by via a Git repository. So there you go. All right, let's take a look here at CI/CD models. Um, and before we do, I just want to mention a couple terms. If you're not familiar with them, the difference between production and staging. So production, commonly abbreviated to PROD, prod, or sometimes even pro, is the live server where the real paying users are using the platform. And staging is a private server where developers do a final manual test as a customer, like doing quality assurance QA before deploying to production. And so, this is our CI CD pipeline or life cycle, whatever you want to call it, deployment life cycle. And we have code, build, integrate, test, release, deploy. Okay. And so for these, it's going to vary because there are some different terms like CI CD and, and what have you. So let's just take a look at uh, what happens here. And the first we're looking at is continuous integration. And so continuous integration means automatically reviews developers' code. So it's this part of the pipeline where you, you have code, it builds, it integrates a test, but it's not rolling out uh, for release, okay? Then you have the concept of continuous delivery. So automatically preparing developer's code for release to production. That doesn't mean it gets automatically released, but it means that it's ready. Uh, someone's got to press the button to get it out to the server. And then you have continuous deployment. So this automatically deploys code as soon as a developer pushes code, if all tests pass. So usually like, you'd have a PR and someone would look it over, but you could just have really good tests. And if your tests say it's okay, basically that's like the A-OK -okay to go roll it out. So just understand that um, there's CI CD here and that um, continuous delivery and continuous deployment share the same initialisms. And I think some of them uh, might do like a forward slash or not a forward slash to indicate the difference between them. I don't do that. They're both just CD. Um, but just understand that, um, you know, that these share the same one and continuous deployment is the one that does everything. Whereas delivery is like delivery as in here's the thing, but uh, you've got to open it up uh, to do something with it. Okay. All right. So let's take a look here at Argo versus Flex. So the CNCF have two CICD projects that serve the same purpose, but take a different approach. And both of these are in the incubating stage. So they're all uh, both safe to use unless you're super enterprise and you have some kind of concern. Um, but uh, we have Flux and Argo. So let's talk about the difference. So Flux was originally developed by Weaveworks. Uh, it takes a CLI first approach. 
It's experimental web UI as a plugin, so you can get a visual thing. It supports role-based access controls. It supports multi-tenancy in Flux 2. So if you're using Flux 1, you won't have that. It supports Helm and customization, and that's the logo for Weaveworks. Uh, and it has automation of container updates. Let's take a look at what Argo does. So it has both a CLI and web UI. So it's had a little bit more to start with. Supports role-based access controls, supports single sign-on, supports multi-tenancy, Helm, customization, case on it, uh, uh, JSON it, manual commit and sync to update containers. And so you might say, well, it looks like Argo basically has almost everything, so why not just use it? Well, generally Flux is simpler in design and CLI focused. So if you need to get off the ground real fast, Flux is very popular um, if you want a simple solution. Um, but you know, they do have a lot of overlap and you'll just have to decide for yourself uh, which one it is you wanna use. <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at Jenkins, Jenkins X, and Cloud B. So Jenkins, uh, what the fuck, you fucking piece of fucking garbage. Oh, God. All right, let's take a look here at Jenkins, Jenkins X, and Cloud Bees. So Jenkins is an open source, popular, and mature CIC tool for any kind of workloads. Jenkins can be used to deploy applications onto Kubernetes because it's for any kind of workloads. And Jenkins is written in Java and have many plugins for any use case. Now there's Jenkins, so then why is there this thing called Jenkins X? So Jenkins X is an open source CICD tool for modern cloud applications on Kubernetes. Uh, compared to Jenkins, it's supposed to be much, much easier to use. And Jenkins X may replace or merge with Jenkins one day to only have a single CICD tool for all use cases. But you have uh, two options here, Jenkins and Jenkins X. Um, and it's good to know like who makes Jenkins and it's called Cloud Bees. This is the commercial distribution of Jenkins and Jenkins X for large and compliance first organizations. Cloud Bees was acquired by InfraDNA. InfraDNA uh, uh, organization created Jenkins originally. So there you go. All right, let's take a look here at Circle CI, which is a proprietary fully managed CI CD service. Uh, to make deployments easy and seamless and can support deploying applications to Kubernetes. So the key part here is that it's proprietary, uh, but it is fully managed. So it is one of the easiest deployment solutions out there, but also, uh, you know, it's just not open source. So that's just something you'll have to consider. And I just want you to know a tiny bit about it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at deployment strategies. So a deployment strategy is a way to change or upgrade an application. And there's two terms that I think you should know uh, regarding deployments, and that is rollouts and rollbacks. So a rollout is when you replace or update servers with new versions of an application. And the word server could be just replaced with pods in this case, because the, the um, nodes is may or may not be something that is getting rolled out. It really depends on uh, what happens there. Uh, we have rollbacks, and this is when you replace or revert recently updated servers back to the previous version. And so there is a, um, uh, a rolling update, but understand that rollout is just a generalized term that applies to all of these uh, deployment strategies. So there are several different deployment strategies that can be utilized with Kubernetes. Uh, some of these um, it's a lot easier to do them if you have like Argo or um, Flux or Jenkins X, uh, but deployments are built into Kubernetes. You don't need to have an additional tool to do them, but you might be limited in your options. And some I'm gonna list here are a little bit more advanced and probably won't show up in the exam, but uh, you should know them anyway, and that's why I'll go through them. But I'll point out which ones uh, that you definitely need to know versus the ones that are nice to know. So the first is recreate. So terminate the current pods and create new pods all at once. Uh, normally, we, uh, we call this uh, in-place deployment, but they call it recreate. Then you have a rolling update. So replace one or more multiple pods at a time. Uh, then you have Canary, so add new pods and route a subset of your users to the new server. If no bugs or errors occur, rollout changes to all the pods. You have blue-green, so deploy an exact copy of your entire infrastructure. And when we say infrastructure, it might not necessarily be cluster infrastructure, but just application infrastructure, because Kubernetes is a bit different. Then you swap the traffic and then terminate the old environment or roll back to the old environment uh, in case you know the, the new environment's not working out. You uh, have A to B testing or red and black deployments. Red and black, they won't come up, but A to B might. Um, and very similar to Canary. So the idea here is that um, you aren't necessarily tearing down 
um, that alternate traffic. You're leaving it up for a subset of users to test features. Um, and so, you know, it's just the difference between temporarily or permanently. Then we have dark launches. So this is similar to A to B testing, except um, it's happening um, like the A to B is happening at the application uh, layer. So um, it's not, uh, it doesn't require uh, a rollback or anything like that. You're just flipping a switch in the code, but we will go in detail and show you a diagram of each of these so that you thoroughly understand them. But like red and black deployments, dark launches, that's not gonna come up, but everything else uh, should, and you should know them uh, pretty well, okay? All right, let's take a look here at uh, a recreate a strategy. So the idea here is that it will terminate all running instances and recreate with a new version. When I say instances, we're talking about pods. Uh, and this is also known as an in-place deploy. Uh, that is generally the term used uh, in cloud service providers and everywhere else, but here they call it a recreate. And so the way you'd specify that is in your deployment file, in your replica set, probably in your deployment file, because I can't imagine you can do it other places. Um, but in your spec area, that's where you define your containers, you can add a strategy and just specify the type as recreate. So I'm not showing the whole file there for you, but it's as simple as that. So let's just kind of visualize this so we understand. So imagine we have an app running um, and uh, I put Argo CD there, but you know, it's not like the perfect diagram, but the idea is that um, we're showing uh, Argo as the deployment tool, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Um, and so the idea is we terminate all servers and the, there's a period where the traffic is interrupted. Now recreate would work really, really fast. So the downtime would be very minimal, but it would happen. Uh, new servers are created and uh, we route traffic to these new servers. So users will experience downtime. It can be very fast, very simple, but rollback um, is not possible. I mean, it's possible to roll back to the previous version. It's just not possible to roll back to running servers. So I should, think I should just clarify that because with deployments, you have a deployment history. So there's definitely something we can roll back to, but it will mean that we have an interruption again, right? So it'll be, uh, you know, uh, roll forward, uh, interruption, roll back, interruption, and not rolling back to something that's running. So this is ideal for non-production workloads or where interruptions can be tolerated. All right, let's take a look here at rolling updates. So these slowly replace pods one by one or based on as many as you want to specify. And this is the default strategy of Kubernetes. So imagine you have um, some instances there or, or pods running and you terminate uh, an amount of pods. So in this case, we're terminating one and then we spin up a new pod to take its place. So as you can see, this is the new pod here. Um, and then we tear down the old one and then replace that one there. And so we are all done. And so again, you can do that in um, uh, chunks or sets. Um, uh, and you can you can have it so that it either terminates first or if you want, you can have it so that it spins up a new one and then tears down the other one, which we'll talk about here in a second. So with rolling updates, you have reduced availability. And I put an asterisk there because it really depends on how you configure it which might happen while each set of pods is taken uh, uh, taken terminated as the new ones are created. Rollbacks can be slow and hard. Deploys will be slow because it's doing one at a time or a few at a time. So uh, let's just talk a little bit more avail about availability because that's kind of an important thing that might get glossed over here that you need to consider. So um, avail what is availability? So the quality of being available uh, to be used or obtained. So if there's not enough capacity like memory, CPU, bandwidth to meet the demand of traffic, then users can experience degraded delayed ex experience or no access to services at all. So if you have two servers and you only have one, then you know uh, that means there's more traffic going to that single machine. There may be enough CPU, but you know it might make the machine slow uh, or the, the, the app might hang completely. So that's where you have to be careful about availability. So. Uh, there are some uh, values, I'm not sure why the graphic's not showing there, there we go, that you can set. The first is max surge, and then we have max unavailable. So max surge says the amount of pods that can be added um, added at a time. And so that means if you want to um, replace two at a time, you can do that. And then max unavailable. So if you were to set this to be two and two, that would ensure there would never be a drop in availability, um, but the deployment would have to first, because the deployment would have to first create the new pods before tearing down the old ones. 
So I don't know for sure 100% how this works. Like uh, when I say that, I just mean that uh, I haven't been deploying a ton of these in practice. I mean, this is the default behavior, but you know, we don't observe it to say, okay, was this server there? Was this server not there? But I do know that if you were set two and two or, or match it, that uh, you wouldn't lose any availability there, okay? All right, let's take a look here at Canary strategy. So the idea here is we deploy a new version of the app into a new pod and serve it to a subset of existing users. If there is no error or bug that has occurred, then the rollback changes to all users by replacing old pods with new pods. So imagine you have a bunch of pods. Let's say we're using Argo because it probably make it a lot easier. And the idea is you create a bunch of new pods. Now I show it like as if they're replacing ones. Um, but, uh, you know, originally, like when I think of Canary, usually the default behavior in other ones is that it tears down some and replaces them. So it might do an in place or add new ones um, and stuff like that. But the way it looks like uh, um, uh, Kubernetes works is it actually spins up new ones alongside them. Um, uh, so, you know, that's just kind of a bit of a difference there. But generally, the concept's the same. So we'll be fine here. But the idea is that uh, we're going to send a portion of our traffic. Um, to these new pods and if we are happy uh, with the traffic like there's no problems everything's going fine then we'll roll out uh, to all the rest meaning like tear down the other ones and replace them with pods with new versions so we got fast rollout because you know when you look at um, a rollout with a like rolling update it's just like a few at a time where this one will just like completely switch all the ones over very quickly uh, it has a slow rollback uh, it should not have a drop in availability because even though it looks like it's um, replacing these ones here, these actually just be additional to these, okay? Um, if that makes sense. Um, and so Canary will use the load balancer weighted rules to only send an amount of traffic to the Canary pods and the original pods, just so you know how they're doing that balancing there. Um, but there you go. All right, let's take a look here at blue-green deployment. So blue-green is when you completely create a new environment of all components and you send all traffic to the new, uh, new or green environment. And if it's okay, then you terminate the old blue environment. If anything goes wrong, you can roll back to blue and tear it down. So let's kind of get a visual to understand. So imagine you have uh, two pods and you define that to being the scope of your environment, right? And that's the key thing with blue-green is that... Um, you know, you could consider a set of pods to be in your environment. You could consider um, a, like a node with everything running it on a, a environment. You could consider the whole cluster um, a, a an environment. So it really depends on your scope. But the way that I was reading about blue-green for um, Kubernetes is it, we're generally talking about in-cluster components defining an application workload. But just understand that scope's going to change and the mechanism that you swap on will change um, but the idea is we have whatever it is that we that we have as our um, our application and its surrounding components. And so we spin up complete identical. So we wait till it's ready. And then when it's ready, we switch over to it. And if we like it, if everything's okay, then we tear down the old one. If we don't like it, we can just switch back to the old one. And so the idea is that you might have to wait a little bit of while for the new environment to spin up, but it's gonna be faster because it's not doing one at a time. And uh, it's a lot safer to move back to, uh, back and forth. So blue-green is very popular. Um, but again, if you need to roll things out really, really fast, uh, <laughs> the deployment time can be uh, uh, possibly slower, but it really depends like how many pods you have. So zero downtime, no reduced availability, slow to deploy, but faster than Canary. Uh, if something goes wrong, larger impact to users immediately instantly roll back to previous infrastructure. So if there is a problem, you're gonna be able to resolve it extremely quickly. So there you go. All right, let's talk about A to B testing or red and black uh, deployment. Uh, red and black, I rarely ever hear, but I mean, the concept's the same here. So the idea is that this is similar to a canary or a blue green, uh, but the method of deployment uh, is the same, but it serves the new app's experimental features to a subset of users based on a set of load balancing rules. So the idea is that uh, you might, um, you'll have 60% of your app on the old app and 40% on the new app. But the idea is that you are not tearing this thing down. It's not like, okay, this feature works, roll it out to everybody. It's let's leave it up for a good period of time. And so that's the, the context or key difference between A to B. 
versus canary and uh, red and black versus blue and green is that it's your intent to test something over a period of time and you're not necessarily rolling back on it, uh, at least not immediately, okay? <laughs>All right, let's take a look here at dark launches. This definitely will not be on the exam, but I thought it was interesting and we should include it. So similar to A to B testing, except A to B happens at the application layer, so within the app code. So let's say you want to test a feature on a subset of users. You code a feature flag in your app to turn on the new feature on and off. If the users like it, uh, the feature, you leave it switched on. If they don't, you just turn it off. And then the next deploy, you could remove the code if you wanted to. Doesn't require you to roll back uh, at the infrastructure level, so fast rollbacks. Uh, so just imagine you have your applications running on pods and you could just flip things on and off when need be. So there you go. Let's take a look at how deployment history command works. So you can check the history of the previous deploys with the following command, cube, ctl, rollout, history, and then the name of the deployment. So deploy hyphen the deployment name. Uh, you don't need to have a forward slash in the middle there. Uh, it's just an alternative syntax. I'm just pointing that out because sometimes it trips me up. And so here, if we did that, we could see uh, the previous revision. And when I did this deploy, uh, deploy, I had to do this flag here, even though this is deprecated. Uh, because I uh, otherwise it wouldn't show the uh, cause of change. So I would imagine that if you have uh, automated systems deploying stuff like that, then maybe this would be uh, good in terms of description, but this is a way to see um, your history, okay? Well, let's take a look at deployment rollout status. So you can uh, get the status of your deploy with the rollout status command. So very sim similar to history, but we're using the word status. And the idea there is you can see it as it's deploying. So it'll say waiting for deployment. And then when it is successful, it'll say that it has successfully deployed. All right, let's take a look at deployment rollback. So you can roll back to the previous deploy shown in the rollout history with a rollout undo. So you type in rollout undo, which essentially is rollback. Uh, and then here, what we'll see is um, uh, no output when we ran the command. But if we were to run a uh, status, you can see that it's uh, waiting to do that rollout and finish. And so the idea is it will roll back to that previous version, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And in this follow along, I'm gonna show you how to set up your own Kubernetes cluster for development using a lightweight uh, Kubernetes distribution. So Kubernetes uh, generally is very hard to deploy and most people uh, like in, like for general use case, do not set up their own clusters for production. What they'll do is they'll use a managed provider like AWS's EKS, which we might do uh, throughout this course. I haven't decided yet, but if it does show up, that might be something we do. Um, but that can be really expensive because you have to pay for the control plane. Almost all providers charge for the control plane. The control plane node, as we learned throughout of this course is a node specifically intended to orchestrate and coordinate all your worker nodes and the pods and everything. So it's like the brain of Kubernetes. And on AWS, at least, it's 10 cents an hour. Um, so there are providers like Sivo. And so Sivo is actually very cost effective um, pricing comparison. I wonder if they have it here. So if we go here, they might actually compare the different prices between other providers. So Sivo, the control plane is free. You, uh, they, and this is a guess, right? And this is at scale. So if you're using this for learning, like if you made a Sivo account, they'll give you $250, I think, for uh, uh, to, to start with. And for this course, you will not end up spending all of that. Uh, so if you are really strapped, you could use Sivo. I'm going to be using AWS. But we aren't going to be launching EKS right now. What we're going to be doing is launching a virtual machine so that it's only the cost of the virtual machine that we're paying. If you really have zero money, uh, another thing you can do is use Katakoda. So Katakoda is a sandbox environment by O'Reilly. And so they have this section on Kubernetes introduction. It is not sufficient enough for this course, but I'm just pointing it out. If you are very, very strapped and you want to get some hands on, this is an option for you. I would not recommend doing this as your uh, uh, as first because the problem with sandboxes is that you aren't going to experience the hard bits. And the hard bits is the experience that you are trying to obtain. If you go do these, you're gonna follow them blindly, copy paste them, 
And the problem with that is that you're just not going to absorb any information. But I want to make sure that you're aware of these resources. This would be good for drilling. So after our follow alongs, if you wanted to just uh, make make sure that you cement that knowledge, you could go back here and try Katakota. But I think we really should set up our own uh, cluster. So we have a few options. We have Minikube, Kine, K3S, and Micro K8s. And so uh, there are four different ones, and they are all a little bit different. So Minikube is known for being extremely easy to use, but it requires the most resources. Notice it requires two gigabytes of memory, 20 gigabytes of free disk space, but they all kind of require at least 10 gigabytes. Then you have uh, K3S and Kind. So K3S and Kind are essentially the same thing, but Kind is uh, it has a wrap around it so that you can deploy your cluster onto uh, Docker. And so uh, Kubernetes uh, K3s is designed to be directly on bare metal or virtual machines, as you see, Edge, IoT, whatever. This is made by Rancher. So Rancher is a, a company that provides uh, Kubernetes managed services. And the thing is, is that uh, K3s is not, uh, or like the Rancher's version of Kubernetes is not the same as Kubernetes. It's not vanilla Kubernetes. You'll see components in the control plan here, like kind and flannel. These things don't exist in um, uh, Kubernetes. So there's something slightly different here. Uh, so there's that. And then we have uh, kind, which is, again, it's like K3S. It's just wrapped in Docker. So you can see the little boat here to emphasize that. And there's micro, uh, micro K8s. So micro K8s is by Canonical. If you don't know Canonical, they're the ones that uh, create and manage Ubuntu. And so it's actually really easy to launch micro K8s on an Ubuntu machine surprisingly, because it uses Snap. But what's nice here is they actually will compare the difference between micro K8s, K3s, and Minikube. And now I said K3, K, uh, K3s is basically kind, so just substitute that with kind, because we're not going to do K3s, we're going to do kind in uh, these follow-alongs here. But let's just look at some of the comparisons. So vanilla Kubernetes. So K3S is not vanilla. As, I, as we saw in that diagram, they had things that were slightly different that made up a different kind of control plane. Uh, they mostly support the same things, but here you can see the memory requirements. Micro K8s requires the least amount of memory. Minikube requires the most amount of memory. Then we have add-on functionality. So Micro K8s is very, very uh, plug-in driven. So like it comes with nothing and you have to add everything. It's very modular. And that's probably why those memory requirements can go lower than those other ones. Minikube is kind of like that as well. Uh, K3s, you just get what you get or kind. Then there's different container runtimes that you can run on different ones. There's different networking components that work with them. Storage is a bit different. GPU acceleration is if you would want to do like something like machine learning, um, because you can run machine learning workloads on Kubernetes. There's a uh, project for that. I can't remember it off the top of my head. So you can see there's kind of a difference there, but they all generally kind of work the same. Um, and it's going to be up to you to decide which one you like to use. Um, I end up using my, uh, Minikube quite a bit, but I generally like Micro K8s when I can get it to work. <laughs> so uh, just because it starts up so fast. But yeah, Minikube takes the longest to boot. Kind is very fast because it's in Docker. And then Micro K8s is like instant, um, which should be no surprise here. But uh, what we'll do here is um, we'll make our way over to AWS. And before we can even run any of these things, we're going to have to have some kind of uh, application to deploy. And so what we'll do is we will create ourselves from scratch. I'll show you how to do it. Uh, a Docker image, and we'll host that somewhere in a container repository, and we will use that uh, as the thing that we'll run in all these different uh, lightweight containers. Um, and so that's what we're going to do now, okay? All right, so we are going to go build an application, and we're going to use AWS. So you will have to go create yourself an AWS account, attach a credit card. This isn't going to cost a lot. I'm going to be very careful about uh, spend here. It will cost something, but I really don't want the cost to go over $10 for the entire month while we're doing all these labs collectively, like throughout the entire uh, course. Um, but the thing I have to tell you is why I chose AWS. So the reason I chose AWS is because it has this a service called Cloud9, which is a, um, a cloud developer environment. A cloud de developer environment is a developer environment running on the cloud. A very popular one is Gitpod, and I would have used Gitpod because I really like them, but the problem with Gitpod is that they uh, use Docker as the way that they run their environment, and so um, they're using Docker with um, C groups version one. And in order to run Kubernetes on Docker, you need C groups version two. If you don't know what C groups is, don't worry. It's covered in this course. We do have to learn it. 
but we could not use Gitpod, so we had to use a virtual machine. And we could have just launched any virtual machine up, right? We could have uh, just went over to EC2 instances and launched one up or, or uh, Azure virtual machine. But the problem is, is that um, there is more work involved launching those clusters. Like you have to specify the drivers and the base image and just be, and you have to install Docker and it became too complicated. Um, and so uh, Cloud9 just makes it really, really easy for whatever reason, they just have all the stuff to, to, to make the cluster set up uh, super easy. Um, and so that's why we're gonna use it, okay? So what I want you to do is go type in Cloud9 at the top here, and we will uh, go over to Cloud9. We're gonna create ourselves a new environment. I'm gonna call this K8's and, uh, ENV, and we'll say uh, this environment will be used uh, to run uh, uh, Minikube uh, kind uh, and to build our Docker application, okay? And so we'll go ahead and hit next steps. And for this, we'll create a new EC2 instance uh, for direct access. That just means that when we launch this and it has a terminal, that terminal will be directly attached to the virtual machine. And so this will have a virtual machine attached to it. So we have to choose a size. Now remember, Minikube requires at least two gigabytes of memory. And just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna go to a T3 medium. Notice that it is four gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so we'll do that. And we have some options here, Amazon Linux 2, Amazon Linux AMI, Ubuntu. And so Ubuntu is fine, but sometimes I run it with like pseudo issues and other stuff. And so Amazon Linux 2, I would like to use it for everything, but we can't use it for micro K8s because it, we don't have Snap installed. So we're gonna do Amazon Linux 2 for two of them. And then for Ubuntu, we'll have to set up a, a separate one. This will turn off after 30 minutes of on use. So if you forget to turn off your environment, don't worry, it will take care of it for you. And so we'll go ahead and hit next step and we'll go and create this environment. So if you've never calculated costs in AWS, we'll just go over EC2 pricing, just so you know what you are spending when you are doing this stuff. And we'll go over to on demand and we'll look up a T3 medium. T2 probably costs the same thing, but I'm gonna look for T3 here. So we'll say T3 medium, and this is the hourly rate. And so the way I calculate anything is I take the doll, the, the cent amount, that's the hourly and we go 730 because there's 730 hours generally in a month. And so that would cost us $30 if we ran this nonstop, which we're not, right? We're just gonna use it when we need it. It's gonna shut off when we when we uh, don't need it, okay? So while that's spinning up, we're gonna see cloud nine. Uh, you might have this dark mode or light mode, I don't know, but we'll give it a moment and then we'll kind of just configure it so it's a bit nicer for us. Notice that the keyboard mode is Vim. You might be on default. I'm using Vim because I like that. Please stay on default. Vim is very difficult to use if you're not a Vim user. You can also change the look of it. So this is the classic dark theme. There's a new flat one that I kind of like. And so I want um, I want this to be dark. I just think it's nicer when it's dark. So I'm gonna go to preferences maybe, and there should be themes here. And if I drop down here, I can't seem to find it, but that's fine. So there's just one that's really, really nice that I like, and it is flat dark, <laughs> but it's not letting me choose that for some reason here today, which is totally fine. So we'll just go back to, um, or maybe it's this one here. Uh, this one, ah, we'll just stay on that. Okay, we're just fiddling too much, but we already have a virtual machine. So this is an EC2 instance. So if we go over, um, to AWS again, just make sure you're logged in there. And we'll sign in here. We're gonna go over to EC2. I just wanna show you that there is a virtual machine running. Okay, so there it is. There's our virtual machine running. And uh, the one thing that we didn't get to choose, usually when you launch an instance, a virtual machine, you'll get to choose, so we'll say like Amazon Linux 2, we'll go to storage. Uh, we gotta go next here. We just get to choose a size, but it defaulted to eight gigabytes, right? And that's not gonna be enough space for our virtual machine. And by the way, AWS has like a new layout here. So, it, so this is like another way of creating a virtual machine. Very confusing. I don't like that they did that, but um, the problem is this virtual machine does not have enough storage on it. If we try to create our cluster, we're gonna run out of space. Um, but we'll worry about that later on. So I just wanted to point that out. But right now, all we care about is creating ourselves a new uh, Docker image to work with. So what I'll do here is I'll go to the left-hand side and I'll create ourselves a new folder. And this is gonna be our app. 
okay? And in here, what we're gonna do is create a Sinatra app. So I'm gonna do Sinatra um, uh, Docker, okay? And there should be like a very easy tutorial for us to find here. Yeah, this one's fine. I just need the base code. I know how Sinatra works. If you don't know what Sinatra is, Sinatra is a very, very um, simple web server for Ruby that's like this simple. Um, and it's just gonna be really easy for us to use, okay? So what we'll do here is we'll just go and copy this code here. So this will be the Sinatra app. So we will call this um, server.rb. Oops, that's a folder. We'll go ahead and delete that. But we will create a new file here. This will be server.rb. We will need a gem file. That's how we install our plugins, gem file. And then we need a config.ru. And I think that's everything. And so we'll go back over to here and we'll just start copying. So we'll go here and we'll grab the actual server code. They call theirs hello. I'm calling mine server just because we should really call it just server, you know? And it's not copying here. We'll try this one more time. I'll right click. Sometimes pasting is kind of a pain here. So we'll paste this again. There we go. And I'm just gonna say hello world. And that's not hello RB. We'll just take that out of there. We will need our gem file. So uh, if we go back to this little project here, this is all we need. We just need to specify a source. We also need to uh, uh, choose a default web server. So we're gonna choose Webbrick for that. I know that they left that out of that tutorial that or it's just an old tutorial. Config RU, that is for um, uh, using Rack. It's a way, uh, it's like a lightweight interface for servers, it's not that important to know. You just need to know that you need it. So we'll include that as well. And that looks pretty fine. And then we just need the Docker file. So that's what we're missing here. So we'll say new file, Docker file. And then we'll just copy the contents here. Actually, I'll take the simpler one here. I don't need all the documentation. Okay, we'll paste that in there. Uh, this is using Ruby 2.7.4. Um, so the great thing about Cloud9's Amazon Linux is that it comes installed with a lot of stuff. So if I type in Ruby hyphen V, it comes with a version 2.6.3. Right now, the latest version of Ruby is probably like 3.0 or something. So I go to Ruby here and we go here. We can see the latest version is 3.1. So just to be safe, I'm gonna update to the latest one. RVM, Ruby version manager, is a way of installing multiple versions of Ruby. If I do uh, RVM list, this is the version installed. So I'm gonna go RVM install 3.1.0. This might complain. And it, the reason why is it because it doesn't know that it's up to date. So I'm gonna type in RVM update, which is not the command, but I wanted to get the actual command we have to type, which is RVM get head. And that's just gonna tell it to look at the latest versions of Ruby. So now if I do RVM install 3.1.0, it'll install that. And I just realized my text is really small, so I'm gonna bump that up for you, okay? So we'll go over here and I will try to find that font while it is installing. Maybe user settings, um, terminal. Okay, so terminal, we can bump the font here. Okay, code editor. Um, is the font okay? Yeah, it's fine, but I, I think we can make it a little bit bigger. This is terminal, uh, code editor. Here we go. Okay, that's better. All right, sorry about that. I don't think there's much I can do about these. There might be something to bump that up, but I, I'm not sure. So Ruby 3.1.0 takes a little bit of time to install. Um, so we will have to wait a little bit here, but let's just take a look at the Docker file if you've never done Docker before. Um, you really kind of need to know a bit about Docker to work with Kubernetes because a lot of times you are packaging um, uh, images to be used with Kubernetes and Docker is the most co common one here. But here we have the Ruby version. So this is referencing a um, base image from Docker Hub. So if I was to go and type in Docker Hub Ruby, okay, this is what it's referencing. It, by default, it's gonna pull from here and it's pulling from this here, this 3.1.0, okay? So if I click into here, it'll actually show you the content. So this is the uh, the way they are setting up Ruby for that image. And then notice that it extends from bullseye. So you can keep going down the rabbit hole, but basically this is just a fancy bash script for installing uh, stuff and then packaging into a container, okay? But we'll go back over to Cloud9, it is still installing. It, what it's gonna do is say, look at the working directory and take all of the code, so, um, and then it's gonna copy the code into that folder. So create a new folder 
on the Docker image called code, and then copy the contents here, all of these files into that directory. And then do a bundle install. So whatever is in the gem file, install those uh, bundles and expose on port five, four, five, six, seven. We can make this whatever port we want, three thousand. I'm going to leave it as four, five, six, seven. And then uh, when the Docker image is is invoked, like it's told to execute or run, it's going to run this command first: bundle exec rack up. So that runs rack host bind on zero point zero point zero point zero. That means to anywhere in the world, you always need to bind to zero point zero point zero point zero. Very common for web apps. And then it's going to uh, listen, or it's going to run on port 4567. So we're saying expose 4567 so that that port is open for the Docker uh, uh, instance, and then uh, being able to access that, OK? So we will have to wait for this to finish um, installing, and I'll see you back here in a moment, OK? All right, so after a short little wait there, it looks like our Ruby version is installed. So what I'm going to do is type in RVM list. That's going to show us the versions there. And notice this is the current version up here. Uh, oh, sorry, it is set to this current one, but I'm just going to say RVM use 3.1.0 just in case and say RVM uh, default. <laughs> I think it's use 3.1.0 default. I can't remember what it is. That's OK. We don't have to default it. Um, but now we have the right version of Ruby installed. So now I'm going to CD into that app directory and we're going to do um, bundle install because we want to make sure that this works before we uh, turn it into a Docker f image or file, right? So now that that is ran, we can just start it by typing bundle exec uh, Ruby server.rb. So bundle exec means do this in the context of what's installed in the Docker file, Ruby to execute the Ruby file server.rb. And we'll hit enter and we'll see what comes out. So it looks like it's running. I'm just going to close that tab there. And if we want to quickly test now, we could open up a port to see if it's working, but I'm going to open up a new terminal. And what I'm going to do is type in curl localhost 4567. And it says connection uh, refuse. So I'm just going to check to see what port it actually started up. It actually started on port 8080. OK, so if we go back here and do port 8080, there it is, hello world. And that's totally fine um, because when it actually launches, we've, we've actually told it to start on port 4567. OK, but by default, it's starting on port 80. But notice when we did a curl, we got hello world. So it's really copying the contents of what was being served, which is HTML, right? So it's just a plain text string called hello world. So that means this is ready uh, to turn into a Docker image. So Docker actually comes pre-installed on Amazon Linux 2 for Cloud9, not Amazon Linux 2 itself, but the version that is being used with Cloud9. And so I can just type in docker build hyphen T um, Sinatra sample. And I think that's how we specify the name. I don't do this every day. So uh, yeah, there we go. And that would tag it. So Sinatra sample and we'll hit enter and that should create ourselves a docker image so it's just downloading stuff and building it okay this usually doesn't take too long because we're really not making so much here but once that is done we will be able to go and do like docker images so i'm just going to type docker images for the time being see what comes up and so notice that we already actually have some pre-installed like python node.js and stuff like that and uh this finished off so fail to register layer uh, no space left on the device. Ah, so we forgot to resize our drive. So if we type in DF, um, H hyphen H stands for human. DF is like disk something. I can't remember what it stands for. DF is for report file from system disk. So I don't know the name. Uh, I don't know what DF stands for, but it's going to tell us about the disk. So if we type in DF, this shows mounted volume. So this is where our storage is. And one of these is our um, our primary um, volume. And so I can't make sense of this. So what I always do is I type in hyphen H, which means human, show it in human display. And so here we see 10 gigabytes, and then we have 9.0 uh, gigabytes used, and this is all that's available. So based on looking at this, this is the biggest volume here. We know that this came with like an 8 gigabyte or 10 gigabyte drive volume. And so this must be the one that we are using. It's already filled up because Docker can fill up uh, drives pretty darn fast. So what we'll need to do is make our way over to EC2. Okay, and if you're not there, we'll just click on AWS logo here at the top, type in EC2, we'll go over here, and we'll just close that. And we'll look for instance, if you expand the name, we should be able to see K8 cloud nine, that's the one there, we'll checkbox it, go over to storage, drag up, go over to the volume, and we can see what size it is. Uh, click into the volume again, maybe, 
and this has 10 gigabytes. So that sounds right based on what we're looking at. So this is where we're gonna go ahead and modify this. Now, if we were on the free tier of AWS, which we'd have to be using a T2 micro, which we totally can't, uh, there is a limit of like 30 gigabytes to stay in the free tier, but we're already out of the free tier, so, and we're not gonna keep this around for long, so it doesn't matter. So just make it 40 gigabytes. I know that um, uh, we need to keep said 20 gigabytes, but 40 gigabytes because we're gonna be running more than just um, uh, Minikube on it, okay? So we'll go ahead and modify that and we'll click that. Now, AWS should automatically expand it. Sometimes you have to uh, do some weird Linux commands to do it or reboot the server, but um, elastic uh, scaling should just happen, like elastic uh, st uh, volumes is something that works with uh, AWS supported images. And so we're gonna go here and just refresh until it's been modified. I'm just watching it here. This is probably the drive. Yeah, here, here's the new one, 40 gigabytes. And so I'm just waiting for it uh, to do something. So it's just optimizing. I don't know if we have to wait for it to optimize, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over back, uh, back over here. I'm gonna hit up and notice that it still says 10 gigabytes. So sometimes I'll do this and it will show up and sometimes it requires a reboot. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it has to finish optimizing. And I don't know how long it's gonna take to optimize. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back over to EC2, our instances, and we're just going to, to reboot it. You don't want to terminate it. That would lose all of our work. We can stop this instance and we will not lose our work. We can reboot this instance and we'll not lose our work, but we'll go ahead and reboot. Sometimes reboot will take down cloud nine, but if see how it's reconnecting, but because reboots are so fast, it should reconnect without us having to close this and reopen it, okay? So just give it a moment to do that. We'll go back over here. Now, if it still says reconnecting, okay, it reconnected, we're fine. Okay, so uh, sometimes if it takes too long, I'll close it and reopen it. I'm gonna close these things here. And so now if we hit up, we can see we're 40 gigabytes. So we should be fine to go and build that Docker image. So we'll go ahead here and hit that again. Unable to prepare context, unable to evaluate simulacking Docker file no such file or directory. It's because we're not in the right directory. When we restart it, it put us back to the root folder there. So we'll type that in and we'll hit up and we'll let it go again. And so these were already downloaded. So oh, I guess it downloaded again, but sometimes it doesn't have to download twice, but we'll just give it a moment here. So we'll just go over to here, type in Docker images. Notice that Ruby has been downloaded. It says 2.7.4. Um, maybe that was already there because ours is 3.1.0 up here. Did we save this file? Uh, I'm not sure if we saved it. <laughs> so if it wasn't saved, we'll just have to do this one more time. Yeah, so I think that was the problem there. So if I hit up Docker images, notice like the sizes are showing up here. So we might not want to have this image. Um, let's see, Docker remove uh, Ruby. 2.7.4. I don't use Docker on a regular basis, but I'm just trying to remember how to do it. There we go. And so if I hit up here, just because these are all taking up space, right? And so yeah, 2.0, 2.7.4 is gone. And now there's the 3.10. We'll go back here. This has been successfully tagged. And so this Docker image, if we go back over here, is right here, right? It's somewhere on the machine. Um, but we need to actually now put this into some kind of repository so we can use it. And um, there are things like Docker Hub and other things like that, but we're gonna use AWS's solution because it's very cost effective um, and we're already using AWS, so why not? So I'm gonna go back to awsamazon.com. We'll sign in here, so I just have another tab. I'm already signed in, but it's just how their homepage works. At the top here, I'm gonna type in ECR. And so ECR stands for Elastic Container Registry. That's a place that uh, is like, it's like a Git repository specifically for Docker images. We're gonna go ahead and hit getting started. We want this to be a public repository just to save us a lot of trouble. And we'll call this Sinatra, Sinatra example. And uh, notice we can upload this stuff. So we'll say this is for Linux. Now this will be public facing, so people will know where this is. Generally don't share that out because you don't want to be paying for uh, uh, um, traffic going out of AWS because that's something AWS will charge you for. But for uh, for our purposes, no one's going to know what our URL is, so it's totally fine. And we're going to go ahead and create ourselves a new repository. 
and it creates it pretty quick, almost instant. And then we click into the Sinatra example. And up here we have the view push command. So these are the things that we will have to run in order to push it. Now, when we use Cloud9, this already has our AWS credentials built in. If you're doing this on your own machine, you'd have to install the AWS CLI and it's a big pain in the butt. But with Cloud9, it's already directly integrated with AWS uh, credentials. So it's gonna be super easy. So I just copy this line here. Okay, and what that does is it gets our login password and stores some uh, information for ECR, okay? So we'll go ahead and hit enter. So it has stored credentials. So notice here it says your password will be stored unencrypted in this config.json. So it's storing temporary credentials here uh, for us to use ECR. I don't think they're long lived. Well, I guess they're long lived because they're li living on the machine. Then we do our Docker build. That's what we already did. And then here after the build complete, tag your image so you can push the repository. So we copy that. We go back here and paste it. Um, no such image Sinatra example. So maybe I did not spell it the same way here. So if we go back and type Docker images and we'll just scroll up here. So is this spelled the same way? That's all I can think of that's wrong. Sinatra example. So Sinatra sample. Oh, okay. So what I'm gonna do, <laughs> cause that's a bit silly. I'm gonna just go ahead and delete this one. We'll say Docker remove image, Sinatra sample, or sorry, it's image remove, I think. Okay, and we go back to Docker images and we can see it's been removed and we'll go back over here and this time we'll do example. And actually just to do a sanity uh, check, we'll actually just copy what's over here to save us some trouble. Okay, we'll paste that in there. And this will be a lot faster because it already has the Ruby 3.10 image, so it built a lot faster. We'll go back over here. We'll hit up to Docker images. You can see that it's there with the proper name and we'll just hit up until we get back to this tag. So we're gonna tag it. Great, and we'll go back over to ECR and we will go grab our next line and this will push it. All right, and so what it's doing is it's actually pushing it over here. So if we go back and refresh, we're gonna wait till it shows up here, go back here and watch it as well. It shouldn't take too long. And it's pushing all, I think the layers. So like every, each one of these lines runs as a layer. So that's all the layers that it's pushing. And there's obviously layers within layers when we look in the base image there as well, but it's almost done. You can see it's a little bit bigger than I'd like it to be, but that's what it has to be. And uh, it's pushed. So we go back here, we give it a refresh. There it is, so it's 361 megabytes, so it's a little bit big. If we click into this here, nothing super exciting, you know, it just shows that, that it's there. But now we have our Docker uh, application uh, that we are gonna run in Kubernetes, okay? So we can go, we'll leave this tab open, we'll go back here and uh, we'll start uh, installing Minikube. <laughs> All right, so it's time to go set up Minikube. So what we'll do is go over to the Minikube website. If you just type in Minikube and getting started, it'll have all the instructions here. Just note that you choose the right operating system. So we'll go over to Linux. Um, X6, X8664 is the type of architecture we're using. Um, those there's binary, Debian, RPM. We're using Amazon Linux, which is based off of CentOS, but we don't have that option there. So we're gonna have to do a binary download, which is not a big deal. And we can copy it over here on the left-hand side. I'm gonna do each line at a time because sometimes when you do multiple lines, it just acts kind of funny. doesn't matter what tab. We'll go to the first tab maybe. We'll just CD back here for a second. So we're at our top level here and we'll go ahead and paste that on in here and hit enter. Okay, and so that has been downloaded and then the next line is going to, now it's, now it's downloaded the binary. We can see that it's right here, but we need to, I guess, extract it out and then put it in a executable location. So we'll go back over to here and notice that this says sudo install and it's going to install it into user local bin, which is where we always put things on Linux when we're installing binaries. And so now I should be able to type in Minikube. Good, and so you can see there's a bunch of commands here. Um, you know, you can pretty much follow through this, but I, I, we're not gonna do exactly this, but I know all the commands now since I've done this a few times. So let's say Minikube start. And what that will do is it will start up a, a cluster for us. It'll do all the work for us. Notice that it detected that we're running on Amazon Linux 2. So it's that smart that it even knows about Amazon Linux distribution. 
It's starting up a control plane. It's pulling that base image. Notice we didn't have to specify. It's going to probably be using Docker as the driver. Uh, normally that's something you'd have to specify is like the driver and the base image, but we didn't have to deal with that. We didn't have to install Docker. So we're saving us some trouble, but this would have been the, the base image that we would have specified as like a flag to it. Um, it does take a little bit of time to start up, but it's not a big deal. Things that are really nice about Minikube is that you can actually use it to run uh, not just a single cluster, but multiple clusters. So if you want to run more than uh, one uh, Kubernetes cluster, you just have to specify a different port number, okay? So we'll give that a moment to start here. And this is taking a tiny bit of time. It's not going to take forever, but we'll give it a little bit of time here. Great, and it's done. So here it says kubectl not found. If you need it, try mini kube, uh, kube, kubectl. So kubectl is what we use to interact with Kubernetes. Um, it's a CLI interface. And so you can install it independently. I've been finding that it's been causing some troubles in some cases, so I don't always install it, but we can try to install it. But I'll just show you here the fact that if you run mini kube, uh, kubectl, it will install it within the context of mini kube. So we can type in mini kube kubectl and do hyphen hyphen get pods, okay? Notice that it's installing kubectl for us, but it'll always only work when we type in mini kubectl. We have no pods running. If we do hyphen a, it shows all possible pods. So technically there are pods running because we have kube system namespace where we're running things like core DNS, Etsy or etcd, API server, control manager, the kube proxy, the scheduler, storage provi provisioner. If you don't know them now, don't worry. Throughout this course, we're going to learn about all these components. So if you come back into this tutorial uh, later on, it'll, it'll totally make sense. But anyway, um, so this is running and we can see all of them there. It might be kind of a pain to keep on running mini kube kubectl. So I suppose we can try to install it. So we'll type in kubectl install. And we'll see if we can just quickly install. If we can't, that's totally fine. We'll just kind of uh, dial that back there. But it says download the latest uh, uh, binary here. So we'll go here. And it really depends on the version that you're using. So this is stable, and I'm hoping that it's the same version. I don't know how to Minikube how to check what version of Kubernetes we're using. I've, if we scroll up, maybe we might have seen it somewhere here. So I have no idea what version it is. I'm going to assume that it's using the latest, and we're just going to luck out and have both here. If it doesn't, you can always uh, fall back to that mini kube kubectl. So if I do ls, here's kubectl. So it's a binary. And so, and I'm just going to make sure that we did it for the right environment. So yeah, Linux. Okay. And we go back here. We need to make it executable. So we type in chmod. Chmod, I can't remember what it stands for. Man, chmod here. It is change file mode bits. Okay. Because just because you download a file doesn't mean that you can start using it. You have to say that it's allowed to be executable so that it's safe to use. So use in the context of user, a plus X is for it to be executable, um, as, as far as how I remembered anyway. And we'll hit enter. And so now uh, it should be executable. So if we type in, um, is it shown? I just can't remember now. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's just ls hyphen la. If we type in ls hyphen la, notice here that there's these things here, and whether it's executable or not will flip. I thought it was just, ah, it's the X over here. Because there's three different user groups. There's everybody, there is um, a particular user or something. It's broken up into three, that, if you see that. But the X's here mean that it is executable. But we don't want to leave it here, because then we'd have to always type this, like kubectl, get pods, which is kind of annoying, like this, because we can't just do this, right? So what we'll do is we'll move it into our user local bin directory, which is the standard place of putting things. We'll need sudo because you need, uh, you need sudo permissions in order to move kubec, uh, like a binary into that directory. So we'll type in uh, cube, or sorry, move, sudo move, kubectl user local bin, okay? And now if we type kubectl, it's everywhere, okay? So that's going to make things easier for us. So now we don't have to do that whole mini cube uh, hyphen hyphen thing, which is kind of annoying, okay? Um, but anyway, we'll just clear that out there and we'll type in kubectl get pods. As you can see, there are no pods running. So that's what we want to do. We want to deploy that. And so Sinatra is kind of like a Ruby on Rails app. So I'm just going to go to Google and we're going to type in Ruby on Rails uh, Kubernetes tutorial. And I think Honey Badger has an okay one. And they, they make it complicated because they have like all these different kinds of files. So they have um, 
like they show you how to start the cluster and they have a config map and a migrate job. We just want to deploy it. So what I'll do is I'll copy the deployment file they have here. And by the way, everything I'm doing here will end up in a repository anyway. So at some point I will point us to that. I'm just doing it on the fly here. So bear with me here. And so we have that deployment file and I want to just put it somewhere. So I'll make a new folder here. Um, I'll call this one K8s. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Uh, new file, I'm going to say deployments. The reason I'm getting confused is because normally I would call it app, but I made that for the actual app itself. And so this is for the Kubernetes files, but we'll go in here, we'll paste that in. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. So if we go to the top here, specifies API version, and this is for a deployment. Now we could call this a pod, right? But generally in Kubernetes, you don't deploy pods directly, which we will do in this course to show you, but you always do deployment so that it can set up pods for you. So you have an additional layer of stuff and then you will have a bunch of metadata. So it's not, you don't have to have this metadata, but um, generally Kubernetes recommends like they have recommended labels. So if we go recommended labels for Kubernetes, they have a bunch here and they are actually supposed to have all of these here, right? Like this insane amount here. But um, uh, for our purposes, we'll leave the name in because we will need some kind of label to do selection. We'll delete out the process one because we don't need that. We're going to just call this Sinatra. 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 And then we need the name of the actual deployment. So the name of the deployment will be Sinatra. Okay, so you can do this to make it a little bit clearer. And um, this should be Sinatra as well. And then we have our Docker image, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So the idea here is that you have a deployment is called Sinatra. We're going to provide it a label as recommended by Kubernetes so that if we need to select things or uh, isolate or group things based on labels, we have that. Then we define our spec. So that's spec is specifically for pod spec files. So we're specifying the template for our pod spec file. We have a selector. So selectors are required in order for this to work because we have a deployment. We need to select the correct um, template. And so this is a bit redundant, but you have to have it. I think it's like selecting from here to here. We talk about selectors in the course, so don't worry about it too much. But the idea is we will need that. Then spec is actually where we define our containers. We only have one container to define. This one wants to run on port 3000, which is the default port for Ruby, Ruby on Rails. We're going to change it to 4567 because that's what we decided to make ours. Uh, this is for config map. We're not using config map. That is for configuration uh, environment variables. We need our image. And so for our image, we'll go back to ECR and we're just gonna grab the image URI. So it takes basically these kind of URIs here. We can paste that in and we'll take that. You can use that for Docker Hub or all other kinds of ones. This one, it's public, so we don't have to worry about trying to authenticate to a private repository. I don't even know how to do this. I've done it before, but I don't remember off the top of my head, but I'm sure it's a pain in the butt. So we'll skip that. We have this image poll policy. So image poll policy means every time this pod is deployed, or do you pull the image every single time or only if we never have deployed it before, pull it once. I'm gonna set it to always just because, just in case we have to change it, it's just gonna make it a pain if we have, uh, if not present, okay? Then we have our name here, we'll call this Sinatra, okay? And then we have our ports. So container port is going to be port 4567, because again, we said that that's what we're running it on. And then we have a readiness probe. So we'll learn about readiness probes within the course, but readiness probe just says like, uh, it determines whether this is running or not. So if for whatever reason, our, our application decides to not run, like it's broken or something, and the readiness probe can't reach it. So it's sending out a, um, an HTTP request to this path and it doesn't return it a uh, status 200, then it will fail, okay? So we'll do four, five, six, seven. We could not have readiness probe, but I like to have them in there. So we'll leave them in there uh, just because it was already there for us. And so we have our first deployment YAML file, okay? Super exciting. Again, don't worry if you don't remember all this stuff, even for this, uh, course, it might be, or sorry, for the certification course, the KCNA, it might be a bit overkill, but, um, you know, the more we do, the better, the better we'll be prepared. Okay. So now that we have our deployment file, we are ready to do a deployment. So we'll do kubectl apply hyphen F. And it doesn't matter if this is a deployment file, a config set file or anything, you're always going to do this apply hyphen F thing, like apply and specify the file because Kubernetes just has one way of, uh, of setting up stuff. And it's always through this way here. So we'll do app deployment. 
oh, sorry, it's K8's, right? K8's deployment here. We'll hit enter. And here it says, the deployment Sinatra is invalid. Spec template YAML invalid. Selector does not match the template labels. And this has happened to me before. So let's just quickly, carefully look at what's going on here. Um, hmm, how did I fix this last time? So the deployment Sinatra is invalid. Spec template labels spec template metadata label. So spec template metadata labels. Hmm. I don't see the problem here because spec template, ah, metadata labels, invalid value, map string Kubernetes. So it's saying this is invalid. Okay, um, what if we just delete it and see what happens? Okay, I don't remember if I needed it or not. Spec template metadata labels. All right, so I can't remember what's wrong with it, but the great thing is I already have a repository for this because I already done this ahead of time. And so I'm gonna go pull up our example repository. This won't be the repository that I will share for the course, but it is just, one I created temporarily as I was going through this. So I'm just typing off on the side here to get to it, okay? And so it is this one here. It's basically the same app. Um, actually, no, it's not here. So one second, I got it on my other computer. So I'm gonna pull up my other computer and I'm gonna just quickly take a look at what the difference is. Because I can't even tell here. Okay, so I'm just gonna look here, starting at the top here, this is fine. And then under spec selector, it has this, so this is fine. Oh, it's a spelling mistake. And you were probably staring at this the entire time being like, hey, Andrew, you have an obvious spelling mistake. I'm dyslexic, I'm very sorry, I cannot notice those mistakes. So we'll go there, but it was clear, it's just saying spec template metadata labels, and clearly that was the problem there. So we'll go ahead and hit enter. And it says that it's created. So what we can do now, if we want to see this, is type in kubectl get deployments. Okay. Once you start using a little bit of the CTL, it's very, very easy to use. And we do cover in the course how this, the, the patterns of the CTL, but it's like, if you want to know pods, you type in get pods, right? It's very straightforward. So here we can see we have a deployment. It says zero out of one is ready. We'll go back to pods and we'll say that it is running. It says zero out of one that it's ready. Um, I don't know if we can do probes. We can try probes. Probe. See, I, I don't know. I just I was just trying there. Um, but what we'll do is we'll type in deployment, and we're just waiting for the probe to determine that it is working. So now it says one out of one, so it definitely is working. And remember that is running on port um, uh, four, five, six, seven. Now I don't know how to look up the ports here, but I do know um, that we can try to just kind of like ping it there. So what we'll do is type in um, curl localhost 8080, or sorry, 4567, and we'll see if we can reach it, okay? Okay, so it says failed to connect to the port. All right, and that's totally fine because just because we set up a pod doesn't mean that the pod is immediately available. In order to access that, we need some kind of service, okay? So that's what we're gonna have to do next. Um, or we might be able to just do port forwarding, but we'll figure that out in a moment. I'll be back in a second, okay? Okay, I'm back. So, all right, it was what I thought it was, but what we were doing was we were doing port forwarding. So when you have a pod running Kubernetes, you uh, by default, it is not available, like it's uh, externally. Uh, the pod has a dynamic IP address, and so normally what you'll do is you will attach a service to expose the pod or have a way of getting to the pod, right? So there is node port and... Uh, load balancer and, th uh, and things like that. But a very easy way without even having to use a service is to just use uh, port forwarding. So there's a command, if you type in kubectl and we type in hyphen hyphen port forward, or sorry, not we don't need the hyphen hyphen, that was when we we're doing minikube. So we type in port forward and then we can specify that we want this deployment called Sinatra, um, which is our deployment file. Yeah, it's called that there here. And what we can do is say forward port um, I'm just trying to think, like usually port 8080 is what you have to use with Cloud9 if you want to expose it to the internet. So we'll do 8080 and we'll say 4567. 
and we'll do address space 0, 0.0.0.0. You have to bind to 0, 0.0.0.0, .0 or we can't see it outside of um, this Cloud9 environment, like into the web browser. So we'll hit enter. And so that is forwarding, for, forwarding um, that port, okay? I know it looks backwards because you'd think like 4567 would point to 8080, but that's just how they showed, okay? So now what we can do is go back over here. And if we do a curl, uh, we'll just say localhost 8080. Now let's say hello world. I think if we do um, hyphen L, it might show us more information. No, okay. I was trying to see if we could see like HTML as well, but I guess it really is just text. But let's say we wanna see this in our web browser. So for cloud nine, um, we need to expose port 8080. So because by default, the security group is not open on the EC2 instance. So we go back to our EC2. Again, if you don't know where that is, type in EC2 at the top. Here is that Cloud9 environment. We're gonna go over to security, inbound rules. And this is all that we have is we can S or SSH in, which is not very useful. So what we'll do is click onto the security group and we're gonna go ahead and edit the inbound rules. And we're gonna add a new rule and this is going to open on port 8080. Now, Cloud9 can only run on, like, in the open on port 8080 and 8081. So we couldn't make this 4567 if we wanted to or 8000, okay? So here I'm just going to say my IP. So the idea is that only this computer that I'm on right now can access this. That's a very secure way of doing that. And we'll just say Andrew's computer. For some reason, you can't put hyphens in here and, and exclamation marks, but we'll hit save that rule. And so now that port is open. So what we can do is go back to EC2, however you want to get there, click on instances. And what we need is the, a public IP address of this. So we go to the networking tab and there's that public IP address. And we'll go to the top here. We'll paste it in here and we'll do 8080. And so there it is, it's exposed to the internet. Now this is obviously not what you do in production, but this is just a very easy way uh, to do that. So we didn't cover services, which is fine. We'll cover that later. Cause right now we're just focused on learning how to use uh, you know, uh, like launching a cluster and stuff like that. There's one other thing I want to show you with Minikube, and um, that is the ability to run a dashboard, okay? So um, there's a thing in Kubernetes called the Kubernetes dashboard. Kubernetes dashboard, okay? And it's like a plugin. I'm just trying to find it here. Okay, see this? And it's not specific to Minikube. It's just, it, it can run as a pod, and then you can access this, and it's just kind of like a nice way, a visual way of seeing the stuff that is running in your Kubernetes cluster. And so, uh, you know, we have figured out how to do that. It was quite the pain <laughs> to figure out how to get this exposed um, on um, Cloud9, but I do know how to do it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to stop our cluster, okay? So I'm gonna type in kubectl, or sorry, um, minikube, stop because we need to start this uh, and make sure that it's listening on 0.0.0.0 remember i told you if you're not listening on that things can't reach outside cloud nine it's just uh, it's a very common um thing that you need to do is bind on port 0000, 000, 000. even when you're deploying a real world web application you have to do that so what we'll do is type in mini cube start hyphen hyphen listen address and then here we're going to do equals 0, 0.0.0. If you're wondering like, how do I know all these commands? I just go and type in mini cube, mini cube start commands. And then here, this is how we figured it out. We just went here into the docs. Uh, nope, that's not it. Uh, maybe it's this one here. Here it is. And it just tells you what all these flags did. So we went through this and said, there must be some way to bind, right? And so that's how we found out that you could do the uh, bind that way, okay? So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and hit enter. And so that will make it so that our, um, that we're binding on there. Notice that it is restarting everything, pulling the image. I don't, I think that since we stopped our cluster, our deployment might be gone. So we'll have to wait for that to start there. But once that starts, we'll have to also uh, set up a proxy, a Kubernetes uh, proxy. So, and make sure that that address is also, um, uh, on 0, 0.0.0, 0, 0, and then also disable filtering because there's just so many preventative measures and proxying that we have to do. So it is running, I believe. So we'll type in cube, cube CTL, uh, get pods. Okay, notice that our, our app is gone, which is totally fine. So what I want to do now is I want to start up um, a proxy. So I'll type in cube CTL proxy, oops, 
address equals 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0, and then we'll disable the filter. We'll say true, all right? And so that's gonna start up a proxy and it's gonna allow us to be able to um, get things out of the cluster, all right? Because if we don't do that, we're not gonna be able to do much there. Um, and so now what we can do is we should be able to start in another tab, um, the dashboard. So we type in minikube dashboard URL. And by the way, like if you had a regular Kubernetes cluster, you'd have to install it, but this is just like a shortcut that Kubernetes does for you. I'm doing having having URL because if I don't, it would try to open it up in the browser right away, which it can't do from cloud nine. So we just want the URL. And so here it's going to um, expose, expose that address. And so we have this address and it's really funny looking, which is totally fine. Um, I think actually we can open up port 8001, 8000, I think again in the 8000 range, we can open up on cloud nine. So what I'm gonna do is go back to uh, EC2. Uh, we actually already have a tab open here. So I'll use that one here. And I wanna go back to our security groups. And I'm gonna edit inbound rules. I'm gonna add a new one here and it's gonna be for 8001. And this is for, um, technically this is the web app, uh, Sinatra app, might make more sense. I wrote Andrew because sometimes when you're working with multiple people, you're wondering what this IP address is for, right? And then this one is gonna be for K8 dashboard. We'll save that rule there. And so I think what we can do here is copy this, go up here, change this to 8001, assuming that's what uh, we specified everywhere else. I think that's what the, everything defaulted to. We paste that in there, fingers crossed, and there it is. Don't explain to me, like, don't ask me like how these uh, ports and all these things work. I'm not very good at networking. I know enough uh, to get around, but uh, uh, I just have the instructions that we figured out that works. But here we can see all of our stuff. So we can go to cron jobs and stuff uh, or pods and see what is working and what is not. So what I'm gonna do now is go back to this environment here and this tab is taken up and this tab is taken up. So we'll go here and make a new terminal tab. And here we'll type in kubectl and we're gonna to deploy our app again, okay? So we'll say deployment YAML and we'll go ahead and create that. And what we can do is go back to our dashboard here and look, we have a pod, we have a deployment, one out of one, it started really fast. Okay, so this is kind of nice as a visual, we can click into it. Uh, we can get some uh, some kind of data with here, which is really nice, okay? And so with that running now, um, it should, oh, we don't have port forwarding. So if we went back to this here, right? Okay, and we tried 80, uh, 80, 80. Okay, we're not gonna see anything. So we'd have to go back and forward that port. So we'll go ahead and make a new terminal tab. Cube CTL uh, port forward. I'm trying to do based on my memory here. Um, address actually would be, we have to specify it. So deployments, Sinatra, and it would be address uh, 0, .0, 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0, and then it's 80, 80 to 4567. Okay, um, we'll just hit up till we get the right command. So what did I get wrong? kubectl port. Oh, I forgot the R, I always forget that. And the flag is over here. I don't think it really matters what side it's on. We'll hit enter. We'll go back over here and there we go. So that is Minikube, okay? So nothing super complicated there. And what I'll do is I'll go back here and we will just stop this and we'll type in kubectl. I don't know if it's still running. Let's go back here. Is it still running? Did that stop, the, did that stop it? kubectl uh, get pods. Okay, so it still is running. So we'll type in mini cube, stop. And that'll power that down there. Just stop these other tabs here. We'll close them for now, close. And we'll close and we'll close. Okay. And so that's mini cube. And so we'll move on to uh, doing kind next, okay? <laughs> All right, welcome back. And so this time we're gonna go ahead and use Kind. So Kind seems very similar uh, to uh, Minikube. So it'll just be up to you what you decide that you want to use for your local development. Um, but what I'll do is just to make things a little bit easier, I'll just close some of the tabs we have here. Let's just do a little bit of cleanup here. 
We don't need Minikube open up here. And so we'll take a look at Kind. Then we'll close some of these tabs here. So Kind is a tool for running local Kubernetes clusters using Docker container nodes, primarily designed for testing Kubernetes itself, but uh, may be used for local development and CI. A lot of people like it because it's like a later version of Minikube and can be very, very fast. Though uh, Minikube can be uh, very robust and useful in a lot of cases. It just depends on what you need and how small you want to go here. So um, to install it, we'll go over to the user guide here. And uh, I believe the way I installed it was from a binary, but we'll go to installation here. We'll take a look here. So notice we'll see package managers like Brew, that's for Mac, OS, Choco, uh, which chocolate, which is like Brew, but for Windows, Mac ports, which is an alternative. And then for Linux, it's just gonna have to be a binary, which is not a big deal. So we'll be copying these lines here. So we'll go back over to Cloud9 here. Uh, oops, I forgot to copy the lines here, but we'll go and copy one at a time. So we'll first curl. And make sure we're in the environment directory there. You might have to CD back there to do that. I'm gonna just type clear again. We're having some funny business where it's just showing that top line. There we go. Which is fine, I guess. Uh, but we'll paste that in there. And we'll go back to the quick start and we'll do Chaman, notice it's plus X. You could do U, U plus X. That's just what I'm used to doing, but it doesn't really matter. And then notice it's going to say some kind of directory but the directory we want that to be in is gonna be the user local bin. So we'll go here and we'll type in user local bin. And this is not gonna work unless we do this, okay? And so I should be able to type kind and there it is, okay? And so now that it is installed, we'll go back to quick start. And we need to create our cluster. So creating our cluster is very straightforward. It should be a kind create cluster. We can even name our cluster if we want, but we'll just go ahead and do that. So we'll say kind create cluster. And we'll give it a moment there and it should start up a cluster. Now remember we have kubectl already installed, so it should be pretty easy. But I think if we did, we could probably do kind kubectl as well. Um, but anyway, this is supposed to be faster than Minikube. Um, and we'll give it a moment here. It's not feeling much faster, but when I was using it before, I felt it, it felt really blazing fast, but I'm not sure what's going on. It is taking some time to create that control plane, which is totally fine. Um, oh, there we go. So installing C C and I storage class, things like that. So set kubectl context to kind kind. Um, oh, it did. So, okay, so you can now use the cluster uh, within here. So cube cluster info to get some information. So we'll do that. So it says Kubernetes control plane is running here. Core DNS is running here. Uh, to further debug and diagnose cluster problems, use kubectl cluster info dump. So if we type in kubectl and we were to type in um, uh, get pods, we can see there's no pods. We can do hyphen A. Notice that it has, looks like a different amount of pods. So we have core DNS and then we have uh, maybe this is a proxy, I'm not sure here. Uh, we have a control plane running. Uh, we have kind net. We have API server, control manager, proxy, scheduler, path provisioner, local path provisioner, not sure what that is. Oh, I guess, oh, storage path, okay. And so, you know, you can just see like, it's not one-to-one -one with Minikube, right? So there's gonna be a different amount of pods doing uh, uh, slightly different things. But uh, now that we have it, let's just go ahead and deploy our application like we did before. So what we'll do is we'll type in um, cube CTL, and that's in our K8 directory. So we'll say, K, uh, oops, apply hyphen F K8 deployment, right? And so that should go ahead and deploy that. And now if we want to see that, we can type in cube CTL uh, get deployment. And if a deployment ever messes up, what you can do is you can type in describe to get more detailed information. And you can type in something like Sinatra works with pods, works with everything. And sometimes you get a lot more information. So here it'll be saying like scaled up the replica. It'll say what it's up to and a lot of additional information. So if you ever have a failure, always try to describe to help yourself out. But we'll say deployment and we're just waiting for it to get ready. And it is now ready. Um, so that is started. If we do a curl localhost 8080, um, notice there's a connection refused. So there's has to be some way for us to access that. Um, I'm trying to remember, kubectl is a command that, yeah, it's not specific to, uh, to kind or minikube, so we can probably do that as well. So we'll type in kubectl, port forward. Don't forget the R there, I always forget it. Deployment, Sinatra, 
4567 because that's what it actually runs on. And then we'll have to bind it to uh, 000. So 0000, enter. And so now if that's all set up, we should be able to open a new tab here, terminal, and we'll type in curl localhost 8080, Andrew Brown, there we go. Um, I never tried to set up kind for a dashboard, so I'm not even sure how to do it. We solved it for Minikube and it was really hard to solve just because we're running it in a virtual machine to expose it. Um, so I'm not sure if we need to do anything beyond that, but that's just kind there. So it's not super difficult. I'm gonna take a look here to see if I can figure out the dashboard. I'll be back in a second, okay? All right, so I looked it up and it actually is a bit involved. So Minikube de definitely makes it super easy, but like here is just a Medium article where they go through that process. And so they say, okay, we create a kind cluster, then we are gonna use Helm. Helm is a way of packaging uh, applications together. So that could make our life a lot easier if we tried to use Helm, uh, but that's a little bit farther in the course. I don't know if I really want to uh, dig into that, but the idea is that you would add a repository like this GitHub dashboard. So Kubernetes GitHub is a repository, like the dashboard is if we go like Kubernetes dashboard, dashboard uh, GitHub, it should probably have one here. So it's pointing to this basically. Right, and in here there probably is a Helm package somewhere here, and but anyway, so the idea is that you do that, and then you do Helm install dashboard Kubernetes dashboard Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, so it looks like we it also creates a new namespace, and then you'd have to set up a proxy, and we had a proxy before, and then you'd have this uh, link, and then you'd have to authenticate because you can't just log in; you have to have a token or something, and so then to log in the dashboard. They're creating um, a service account. So that's like a type of role, like permissions, that's R RBAC. And I would imagine that, I mean, they didn't activate it, but they might have to activate RBAC. So you can see it gets really, really involved, right? So I think that, um, I mean, this would be good to do, but maybe not right now because it's very complicated. This is more like CKAD or CKA uh, kind of material, but I just wanted to show you uh, the effort would be to go uh, get that there. So maybe that's one advantage of using Minikube and probably we'll stick to using Minikube. But for Kind, we pretty much did what we wanted to do with it just to see that we can install it and it was easy to use. So I'm gonna type in Kind uh, Delete Cluster. I think that's probably what it is. I'm just guessing and it still works, that's great. And so Kind is solved. And the last one I wanna do is Micro K8S. Okay, so that's what we'll do next, okay? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take a look at how to uh, run micro K8S. And I found this one, uh, like it was very fast. I like how it's modular, but I found it the hardest one to use, to be honest. I mean, they're all generally pretty easy, but the complexity comes because we're running in a virtual machine, like a developer cloud developer environment in the cloud. So there's additional stuff that you have to consider. Um, and so, you know, if we want to install micro K8S, we'll go to the docs and uh, we will go and look for, I thought it was like on the homepage they explained even how to install. Yeah, you go to Linux and right away they go snap. Use snap. If you don't have snap, get snap installed. I'm not installing snap. Uh, that's like a package manager. I'm not installing it for our Amazon Linux 2 instance. That sounds like a nightmare. But what I will do is go to our dashboard and I'll spin up a new instance. So um, we don't need this one right now. I'm gonna leave it open. And so I'm gonna go ahead and create myself a new environment. This is gonna be micro uh, K8 uh, ENV, uh, this uh, de uh, cloud developer environment, ENV, just to save us some trouble, is specifically for micro K8S. And we'll see if we have a little bit uh, less problems. Ubuntu is great, it's just sometimes I run into problems with it. So it takes the least amount of resources, but still I'm gonna run it on a T3 medium because I just don't wanna have to deal with any kind of, like having to delete it, recreate it, and run any issues. So here we have Ubuntu server 18.04 LTS. So this one will have Snap. Snap was introduced in like 14. It's like a replacement of uh, get install or app, app install, whatever you want to call it. So we'll shut after after 30 minutes. That seems fine to me, leaving that on the default there. And we'll go ahead and create ourselves another Cloud9 environment. Again, I would love to do this in Gitpod, but unfortunately can't run Kubernetes clusters there right now. But we'll take a look here and see what is being suggested. So it says sudo snap install micro k hyphen hyphen classic. So if there's something that's not classic, I'd love to know but um, I don't know much about Snap. 
So we'll give it a moment to start up here, and then we'll end up copying this command, doing that command. But notice here, like turn on the services that you want. Notice with the other ones that we didn't have to turn anything on. Like we didn't turn on the dashboard. We just said start the dashboard and maybe it wasn't installed. It just pulled it at the time of when we needed it. But with Micro K8S, you can't turn on the dashboard unless you enable it, right? So everything has to get enabled. So when we start this up, it doesn't even have anything, right? And maybe we'll see that when we look at the pods, okay? So we'll just wait here for Cloud9 to start. Another way we can observe this is we go over to EC2, we go to our instances, we can see them here. And it gets kind of confusing because um, it doesn't show like the uh, what it is, but like we have to go based on the name. So like, I don't think it'll say here like Ubuntu anywhere, right? So if we go to our AMI or Amazon machine image, that's the thing that's running it. Oh, down here it says Cloud9 Ubuntu. So we do have an idea what it is, okay. But generally, sometimes you can't tell what it is if it's not in the name, like they didn't write it in the name. Go back over to Cloud9, it is ready. Everything is nice and big, which is nice. This pop-up is driving me crazy. We'll close that here. We'll copy this and we'll go over to our new environment and we'll paste in sudo snap install micro K8's classic. Now this is an Amazon Linux 2, so it's slightly different. This is kind of nice, I like this experience with snap and it will install good I, I think like when you install it it actually starts the cluster up right away because so it says check the status of the Kubernetes service so you don't have to say start it just as it's installing and it starts at the same time so I'm surprised I would think that it would just like install it and then you'd start it separately but I guess that was their decisions there And while it's waiting, we'll just take a look here, see if there's anything else interesting. I don't think I dug too deep into the docs for micro -Kades. I'm mostly familiar with um, Minikube, and I think that's what we're gonna be sticking with throughout uh, this project. Nothing super exciting here. We'll go back over to micro k And it's still taking time. So once this is done, I will see you back here in a moment, okay? So after a short little wait, it looks like it is installed. So we'll go back over to the homepage and look at the instructions here. So we have microcates status, wait ready. So wait until it says it's ready. And it says insu insu insufficient permissions to access it. I like how they're like sudo here, but sudo not here. Okay, so we gotta go hit up. Actually, it has some instructions. You can either try again with sudo or add the user Ubuntu to the microcates group. I'd rather do this. I did this before and I did not have much luck, but I'm gonna to try to follow through with it. Okay, it says, after this, reload the user group either via a reboot or running new grep, new group micro K8s. Okay, so we'll type in clear. This is what I was talking about where I started having issues with sudo. Uh, it was more than just this, but we'll see what happens here. So it is running and then it tells us um, what add-ons are enabled, right? So this is very add-on based, as you can tell. So high availability, it's it's no, so it's obviously it's running on one node, so that makes sense. What's enabled? An HA cluster, high availability cluster, which is interesting because it's not highly available. And then what's disabled right now? So we don't have Ambassador, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Silim, C-I Lilim. The dashboard's not enabled, DNS is not enabled. We got nothing. We don't have Linkerd, we have nothing, okay? Um, interesting that we can see some stuff. So like Kubeflow, we talked about doing machine learning. So it's really nice if you want to install Kubeflow, you could just enable that if you want Knative, which is for kind of like, it like set, does a lot of stuff for you, like scale down to zero. It's the kind of serverless stuff. You want an open source framework. So it really is good as, as long as you can deal with Ubuntu. If I spend more time with it, I think we'd be using this as opposed to Minikube, but I just want things to be easy, okay? So anyway, what we'll do is we'll go back to here and we'll take a look here. So it says, turn on the services that you want. So right now, I'm not gonna turn on any services and I wanna see if we run into any friction without having to turn anything on because obviously there's nothing. But if we type in kubectl, actually that's not even installed in this machine. So here it says sudo snap install kubectl. Sure, why not? So this revision of kubectl was published using classic and thus may perform arbitrary system outside, etc. If you understand want to proceed, run classic. Okay, I mean, uh, micro K8s was classic, so it must be fine to do this. Okay, so we'll type in kubectl. Okay, it works great. Uh, last time I did this, I, had n I could not get kubectl to work, but uh, we'll type in kubectl get pods. 
Uh, the connection to the server, localhost 8080, was refused. Did you specify the right host or port? Ha, huh, interesting. It's not working yet. I wonder why. So I think the reason why is because we don't have anything installed. We don't even have a DNS installed, right? So like DNS is the way that uh, outside traffic can communicate or just like traffic in general can communicate within a cluster. So I bet we have to enable that. So we'll go over here and we will only enable, we'll only enable DNS. So I I, I don't have micro uh, K8 down to a T here. So I'm copying and pasting it. We'll type in enable. DNS, okay? We'll probably need a DNS. And we'll give it a moment here. Notice that it's, say, look what it's creating. A service account, a config map. These are all Kubernetes components, deployment, service. You learn about all this stuff in the course. Um, core DNS, uh, role-based access stuff, restarting kubelet, uh, and DNS is enabled. So now we'll get get pods, and it's still saying this. Okay, I remember this before. What if we type in micro k8s hold on here okay so i i think this is what i remember i remember i installed kubectl i got this error i have no idea why i was getting that error so then i just i defaulted to micro k8s kubectl and then i was having less problems so i'm not sure we had to have dns to do anything there but it's really hard to do anything without a dns in kubernetes so we probably had to enable it anyway let's do hyphen a and let's see what we have look there's only three pods there's nothing here. Remember how much there was when we did kind and um, uh, the other one, like um, uh, Minikube? So there's literally nothing. We have Cal Calico Cube controllers, Core DNS, and Calico. We'll learn about uh, Core DNS. Core DNS is what Kubernetes use. It's the DNS service here. It is covered in the course. We'll learn about it. Calico is um, a very popular... Um, Calico, yeah, it's a cat. I used to have a Calico cat a long time ago. But um, Calico Kubernetes is a project by uh, Tigra, Tiger, I don't know what you call it, but they are what is used for, um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, CNI, it's in the course. <laughs> it's for, it's for, um, it's for something. I can't remember, proxy or something? I'm, I'm just, I'm blanking here. But anyway, there's only three things here. So there's not a whole lot. So let's see what happens. If we go and notice some things are pending and some things are running. So let's go ahead and deploy our application. So we'll go here to the left and we'll go to deployment. And we'll have to copy this over here. And we will create ourselves a new folder, K8S. Don't need a folder, but I'm just making one for fun. We'll say deployment.yaml. We'll double click this. We'll go ahead and paste that in there. We will save it, scroll on down. And so now we should be able to do mini cube, or sorry, saying mini cube, micro K8S kubectl apply hyphen S K8S application, whoops, deployment YAML. I created it. So now we can hit up, because I just can't type micro K8, so I can't remember how to type it. Get pods, okay. Remember we do hyphen A, it shows us all the pods, right? And I'm just waiting for that to become available. We can try deployments as well. See if it was successful. I'm waiting. And we might be waiting on the, the probe here. So the probe is what's doing the business, right? It's the one that's saying, Hey, after you checked a few times, then we can determine it's ready. If we didn't have the probe, it would probably start up a lot faster. But I don't know if we're missing another component, right? Still pending. So one thing we can do if we're looking at this, we could probably put the name in here like this. Maybe we'll get some additional information. Uh, describe instead. Describe is your friend. Okay, so we'll scroll up. Aha. So we see something here. Zero out of one nodes are available. Has taint. Node Kubernetes, disk pressure, the pod didn't tolerate. If you look this up, it might say like, hey, you're trying to deploy into a node that's not supposed to be there. Or the other issue is that there's we're running out of storage. So let's see where it says disk pressure, like the disk is under pressure. It means the disk is out of space probably. So if we do DH hyphen F, oh, it's not even installed. Oh, sorry, DF hyphen H, I spelled it wrong. 
Um, we can see that we have most of it used up. So that's our problem here. So it's that problem from before that we had no biggie. We'll go over here, micro K8s, that's the one we want. We'll go to storage, we'll go to our volume, we'll select our volume, and we will modify our volume and we'll bump that up to 40. We probably don't need 40, but I just want it to work. And it says it's in use, so I think we're in good shape here. And if we hit up, does it auto expand? Elastic, it's called like elastic something, I can't remember the term, 99% use. So we're gonna have to reconnect, reboot this server here. By the way, if you do have to like stop and come back to this, you can always just stop these, by the way. You can always just hit stop, and as long as you don't terminate, you can always start it back up, and we can always pick up for where we last left off, or just let the um, it shut down after a certain amount of time. Like if you go back to the Cloud9 interface, you know, if you go here, if you close these tabs, you can always just go back to Cloud9 and open them there, and they will auto shut down, right? But anyway, um, we need to restart this. So we'll go here, sorry, reboot, and we'll reboot that. Rebooting is super fast, so hopefully we don't have to close this. But when it does reboot, um, the cluster might not be started, but I guess we'll see. So I don't know if we'll have to, because like remember, we didn't have we didn't start the cluster, we just installed it. But if it's smart, it might always do it. You know what I mean? So it is reconnecting. Go back over to EC2. We'll just check check the status here. Yeah, it is running. If Cloud9 has a hard time reconnecting, you just close the tab. We'll go back to Cloud9. We'll just do it this way. It happens sometimes. And uh, we'll go over to micro K8s. And I'll probably instantly open and have no issues. If we're lucky, I suppose. It's having some real trouble here. Go back over to EC2. I'm just gonna check the volume. Maybe, maybe the volume is not ready. I think the volume is ready, attached. Doesn't seem like there's any issues here. Okay, so I'm not sure what the problem is, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a break. I'm just gonna close this tab. I'm gonna take a break and then I'm gonna come back to Cloud9. I'm gonna launch it and it should probably work, okay? If you ever run into problems like that, sometimes it's just worth taking a break there, um, but I'll be back here in a bit, okay? All right, I was gone for like three minutes. I went in here, pressed this button, it launched instantly. So we're back in business here. Um, now, is the cluster still running? I don't know. So we'll go back over here. We'll say micro K8 status because I don't know if it's just gonna start up when we restart the machine. Um, and uh, that is K8s, so we want this one, right? Micro K8s, so hit enter. And we'll see if it's ready. It is running, okay, great, so we're fine. Um, I don't think our stuff is still there. So if we type in micro K8s, uh, cube CTL, get pods. Oh, it's still running. Okay, cool. Well, that's cool. Like when we, when we, uh, I don't know if we did it in this, but I know that when I restarted um, like kind or mini cube, the stuff did not persist, right? They were lost. So it's really cool that it just, everything went back up. I think that's actually one of the benefits of Okay, so high availability, low ops, minimal. Pro uh, so there's something about the features they say, like that, you know, yeah, autonomic, uh, automatic, autonomous, and self healing, right? So basically, you know, if you restart the machine, everything's back in the, in the shape that you want it to be, which is great. Um, like the entire cluster, like that's, that's awesome. Um, so now that that's running, the question is, okay, can we access that? Of course, if we do curl, localhost, 8080, we're not gonna see stuff here. So this is where we're gonna do our usual um, port forward. So port forward, I'm trying to do this from memory. So deployments, forward slash Sinatra, um, 8080, 4567, 
and then we'll say address address 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 0 0 .0, enter and I forgot the R always forgetting the R on that one eh we'll hit enter and so that port is being forward and so now if we open a new terminal and we type in curl localhost 8080 there it is okay so it's the same thing as before it'd be nice to see if we get the dashboard working um i'm not sure if that'll be easy but we can give it a go and see see what happens here so what we'll do is go back to the home page here and yeah, i think it's just because they had a couple lines here where is it where'd it go <laughs> whoops that is not what I wanted. Oh, Linux. We gotta click on Linux. Um, so we definitely need to have the dashboard installed. We don't need to register our, our Istio. So I'm gonna go back here. Oops, for second tab here. And we don't want to turn off our port forwarding, but we're gonna type in micro K8s enable dashboard. Now, if the dashboard is just accessible, then maybe we'll just stick with micro -Kates. I really do like micro -Kates out of all of these, um, but you know, we'll, we'll just see what goes here. Um, lots of stuff about role-based access. If RBAC is not enabled, the dashboard using default token retrieved with this. In RBAC enabled, you need to create a user with restricted permissions shown in, etc. So we'll see what happens here. Um, So this is going to assign it to something. Uh, what if I just paste that in there? Okay, so we have a token now that I think we use to log in, but let's see if we can actually get into the dashboard very easily. I'm not sure if this is gonna be hard. So we'll go and type in the dashboard proxy. So that probably launches the dashboard or something here. Checking if dashboard is running. Ah, and I didn't get to show this earlier, but what I wanted to show was the fact that uh, the dashboard is just a pod. So if we go to micro K8s cube CTL get pods, and we do hyphen A, we should see the dashboard here. So the dashboard is probably metric server. Like when I ran it um, for um, Kubernetes over here, I, I, maybe we're still running the dashboard, I'm not even sure. No, because we stopped uh, Minikube, so it's not running. But um, uh, there was two pods. One was the dashboard and one was the metrics, but I'm pretty sure the metrics one here is the actual dashboard, even though it's not showing properly here. Um, but we did start this here. I'm just trying to find um, the dashboard. Ah, so micro Kate's dashboard. Wave the dashboard. The dashboard will be available here. At this port number, use the following token to log in. Okay, so even though we have this on port 10443, I don't know if we can open that port. We'll try it for fun. We'll see if we can just open that port up, but I don't think it's going to work. I think there's going to be a lot more work there. And honestly, to get the dashboard working, I, I needed a lot of help. I had to pull in my co-founder who knows Linux not working a lot better for me to figure out. So um, we will give it a go here, but I don't think I'm going to solve it. We're just going to try to open up the port. So we'll go here into micro K8s. We'll go to networking. And we will choose, oh, did I say networking? I'm at security. We'll click on the security group. And we'll edit the inbound uh, rules here. We'll add this and we'll go and put in this port number here. We'll say uh, K8s dashboard. And we'll make it my IP so we don't have to worry about anyone else trying to get into this thing. And we'll save it. And so now we'll go back to EC2. And what we need here is the actual uh, IP address. So we'll go to details, public IP address. We will paste it over up on top of kind. And then I need the uh, port, which is here. Client send HTTP, uh, TPRS to an HTTPS server. Okay, so it has to be HTTPS. I, I will try to do this. We'll advance, it's totally fine. Oh, this is so much easier. Okay, great. Because like 
but Minikube, it was so hard to figure out how to uh, get that address to listen on that, that port number. But here's this token or uh, cube config. So we can go back over to our micro K8 environment here. We'll go ahead and copy this. And I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in there and we'll hit sign in. And there we go. So we're in. We can go to our pods. We can see that our pod is running here, the usage and stuff. This looks, I don't know if this looks any different. Is this the same as the other one? It seems like there's a lot more going on here. Um, I can't tell because they're not both pulled up side by side, but maybe we'll stick with micro K8s. Maybe we'll use Minikube, but the idea is that we have both our environments set up. Um, and that's all I really want to cover for now. So to shut these down, what we'll do is go ahead and um, just close these. And I'll go over to EC2 and we will go ahead and just turn these off. So stop the instance, don't terminate them, stop them. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna be having to do a lot of extra work here. And so we have two developer environments that we can use for the rest of this course. So that should be fun. Hopefully that gives you kind of an introduction into Kubernetes. Uh, just obviously a lot going on there, but we will unravel it piece by piece throughout this course. Uh, and there you go, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and what I have here is kind of an amendment to our lab. So I did a bunch of labs where um, I'm typing constantly micro K8s as kubectl because I couldn't figure out how to get kubectl configured properly. So when I'd run this, like get pods, I would get this error saying localhost 8080 refuse, and I'd look it up and they'd say, you have to configure your cube uh, config file, but I could not find, uh, like the examples they were showing did not work. And so eventually I did figure it out, but I shot a bunch of labs where I'm typing micro K8s cube CTL. And just to save you some pain, I just wanna show you what you can do uh, to fix that problem. Uh, and so you just do this later on when you're doing a lab so you don't have to deal with this, but I'm gonna type in um, micro K8s, micro K8s config, uh, and then right angled bracket, and then uh, tilde, forward slash um, uh, dot cube forward slash config. Just gonna double check to make sure I spelled that right. There we go, and we'll hit enter. And so now if I type in cube CTL get pods, we're all in good shape. So um, I realize that, you know, depending on when you're watching this video, you might not know much about Kubernetes, but just when you start seeing me type micro K's cube CTL, you just wanna save yourself the trouble of typing that a hundred times run this and then you can just write kubectl and that'll be a lot easier, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, we're gonna take a look at a variety of ways that we can expose our pods via uh, Kubernetes service. And we're gonna continue on using the environments we set up earlier in other follow alongs in our Cloud9 environment. Uh, and just looking at the cost here, it's we're only at $3, so we're doing pretty good for this account here. Uh, but what I'm going to do is make my way over to Cloud9. So just type in Cloud9 at the top here. And if you uh, turned off, not not terminated, but turned off those environments, shut them down, they should still be here. And so we have that K8 environment with both Kind and Minikube and then Micro K8's environment. I'm preferring the Micro K8's environment. So I'm going to go ahead and open that one up just because I'm finding that one to be uh, pretty easy to use. And we'll just give a moment for this to launch here, okay? All right, so our environment has launched here. I'm just waiting for our terminal to appear. There we are, everything is nice and big. Uh, and so we had deployed something prior. So micro k is really great because if you had something running prior and you shut it down and start the machine up, it should still remain. So I'm gonna type in micro k8, uh, k8, 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 Kubernetes or kubectl. And we're gonna say uh, get pods. And it would be really nice to use kubectl directly. I tried looking up the solution for it. It has to do something with the config file, but I couldn't figure it out. So I'm just gonna keep typing micro it's kubectl. It's not a big deal for me. And so there's that Sinatra application and it should end up um, deploying. So there we go. So now it's running again. So we don't have to worry about deploying uh, that Sinatra app again. I'm gonna see what services. I don't think we have any, but we'll just double check. So I'm gonna type in kubectl get services. You can also type in SVC, which is the shortcut, but I'm going to stick to typing things uh, full out here. But on the exam, you might actually see uh, initializations, which is kind of frustrating because they really should just always use the full names for people learning. But here you can see that uh, we do have a service here, which is for Kubernetes and it's a cluster IP. This is the system one that always uh, shows up here. So we're not going to touch this one, but just showing you that it does exist. 
And before we actually even go ahead and launch a service, let's talk about pod communication. So if we go back here and type in get pod, we should see all the pods that are running. And so we only have one, which is Sinatra, uh, but this actually has an IP address. And so what we can do is type in O, uh, which stands for output hyphen O, which is a flag, and type the word wide, and we'll get additional information. So here we can get the IP address. Um, there's the, uh, the node that it is running on, things like that. So every time a pod is terminated or, or stopped or whatever, it will have a new IP address and because dynamic IP addresses make it really hard to make microservices because if your IP addresses are changing all the time, it's gonna be really hard to communicate. Uh, and so that's the purpose of services is that it can have a static IP. That's one reason to have it, but let's kind of observe what happens if we were to um, uh, terminate this pod, okay? So what I'll do is I will copy the name of the pod here and we will uh, put in micro K8S cube CTL and I'm going to say delete pod Sinatra, okay? And what we'll do is just go to the top here uh, and I want the wide and notice that even though the pod is destroyed because there's a deployment, it's going to always launch a new one because it expects there to be one pod. But notice that we have a new IP address. So it's not the same one. The old one was 10.1.22.9. The new one's 10.1.22.13. So that's an example of that dynamicism happening there. Now, if we wanted to communicate with that, um, uh, like right now, the IP address is here, but we are not within the node. Um, and so if we were to try to type in, if we go up here for a second, and we were to try to take this IP address, and we were to write something like uh, curl localhost uh, 8080, okay, it says connection refused because, you know, these are internal, uh, internal traffic within the cluster, we're not inside the cluster. So how could we communicate that without a service? So one thing that we could do is we could um, uh, basically uh, a remote login into a pod, and that's something that you can do in Kubernetes. And so uh, one thing we can do is uh, launch a new pod. And so what I'm gonna do is just type in service debugging Kubernetes because the commands that we want are there. And so if I pull up uh, the documentation here, uh, they have a couple commands So we have uh, this one where it says, um, if you want to run a pod, you can run this one called BusyBox. And if you've never heard of BusyBox, we do cover it in the course, and we might have already covered it before this uh, tutorial. But BusyBox is basically a, um, it's a, a container, and it already contains a bunch of utility libraries that we can use, right? And so it's just a really easy way to get started. So if we go back over here and we look at this, what it's doing is saying, create a new pod, Never ever uh, restart this. So if we if we terminate, if we're like we exit the command line, it will or uh, the shell, it will delete and use the image from here. So it's on um, the Google's uh, container repository here called BusyBox, and it's going to launch Bash, so we can interact with it. So what I'll do is go ahead and copy this, we'll go back here, and we'll type in clear, and we will launch that. And so what it will do is we'll launch up a new pod. Oh, sorry, we got to type in micro K8s in the front here but it's going to launch up a new pod and it's gonna enter us into bash. And so if we go over here, we can now type in um, micro K8 test. If you don't have a new tab, just go here and open a new one here. And we'll type in cube CTL get pods. And so we can see busy box is running. All right. And we could have written our own deployment file or pod file in order to provision it. It's just a lot easier to just write it at this one line because as soon as we terminate this, it's going to, whoops, we'll type exit. It will then kill the pod. We don't have to worry about it. So if I go back to here, okay, see the pod is gone. But what I'll do is go hit up on my keyboard to bring back that command. And it's going to enter us back, not, not just launch the pod, but enter us into the pod so we can execute commands. So we are within a pod. And so technically pods can talk to other pods because now we're inside the cluster. And so if we were to type in, let's say the other, the other one runs on 456. So if we typed in localhost 4567, let's see if that works. Okay, so we'll say localhost 4567 and we will do curl here. And so, oh, curl's not on here. So we'd have to type in wget. Okay, so wget and that same thing as curl. And so it says connection periods. Because remember pods communicate, sorry, containers within a pod all com uh, communicate on localhost, but uh, pods have their own IP address. So let's go back here and type in O uh, wide. 
and we can see there's an IP address here. So if we were to copy this IP address, okay, paste it in here, put W again in the front, and then do uh, 8080, um, oh, sorry, 4567, right? 4567, uh, it's able to access that index HTML. So if I just do ls, which lists out all the files, there it is, and we'll check the contents of it by typing cat index HTML, and there it is. So we were able from one pod uh, to communicate with other pod by using its dynamic IP address. Okay, but you know if it if we kill that pod or it gets replaced, uh, you know that IP address is going to change, and that's where that pain comes from. So that is uh, what I want to show you with pods. So next we'll move on to our first um, service, which will be cluster IP. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is take a look at uh, launching our first service. So a service allows you to attach a static IP address and also can do load balancing to multiple pods that it selects. And so what I'm gonna do here is go to the top and we'll type in service uh, Kubernetes because most of the code is here. We can just tweak it. Um, and it's, I always like to show you where I'm grabbing the code from. So here's defining a service. And so this is an example of one. Uh, but we want cluster IP, if we scroll on down here, um, I mean, th that one up there is cluster IP, but I'm just trying to see if they actually have a very specific one for cluster IP. No, okay, so that one up there is cluster IP. Okay, so we'll go back to the top. I'm gonna go ahead and grab on this one here, and we'll go back over here, and I'm going to create in our folder here a new file. I'm gonna call this one service cluster IP.yaml double click into this and we'll go ahead and paste that on in there. And so one thing is that we uh, will need metadata. So the, the, the metadata name will be the name that shows up when we do uh, get services. So I'm just gonna type in service um, cluster IP and then we need our selector. So uh, I'm actually going to leave the selector incorrect. So I'm gonna go here and do Sinatra uh, I'm gonna go over here and see what this is called. So this one is called uh, Sinatra, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna call it Sinatra. And then down below we have the port. So TCP is great. Uh, port 80 is the port that we want to access within the cluster. Uh, so we'll say 8080. And the target port is 4567. So very similar to when we were doing port forwarding, right? Which technically probably was creating a service and also proxy at the same time. Um, and then down below here, are we still in this environment? I'm just type exit if, we're, if we didn't exit busy box there, and we'll just type in clear. And so a few too many tabs here, I'll close the first one. Um, I don't care about that tab. But uh, so the idea here is that we will um, uh, provision or deploy the service. And so we should be, if we're within the cluster, access that port 80, uh, the, um, the pod via port 8080. So what we'll do here is type in micro K8S and we'll type in cube CTL, and then we will type in um, uh, apply hyphen F K8S service cluster IP address. Now, notice I didn't actually specify a kind, and I just kind of want to point that out before we proceed forward, because notice these ones have, uh, there's like a kind option here. And so normally you're supposed to do, oh, maybe it's not there, let's go down to uh, node port, will be an example that shows us here. I'm just trying to find the code example. So under type for spec, it would be here. Okay, so if we go under here and we set cluster IP, okay, that's how you know it's cluster IP. But if you don't specify, it will automatically be cluster IP. So even if we don't have this here, we delete it out, it's still cluster IP. And this should be two tabs, two space tabs. Otherwise, we're gonna have a lot of trouble here. Um, and what we'll do is hit enter, okay? And so it created the service. And so we can type in micro K8S um get or sorry cube ctl get uh svc services and so notice here that we have our service cluster ip it's showing us its cluster ip type and it has a cluster ip address so this service now has a static ip address of 10 152 183 and 8 and any um any uh, pods that are associated with this like that are linked through them is going to be accessed through this static IP address that's never going to change, okay? We can terminate pods all day and they will be the same. And so you can see that it's for port 8080, okay? So that's the uh, the port that we're gonna need it on. But the question is, did we properly 
uh, select the pods. And so one way we can tell is if we were to go ahead and type in details. So if we go micro uh, K8, or sorry, describe, and then go service, and then put the service name here, we can get some additional information. Uh, that was describe. It is describe, I'm probably spelling it wrong. Describe, maybe services. Oh, you know what, I'm forgetting kubectl here. kubectl. Okay, and so we get some information. So it's in the default namespace. Notice it shows labels none, uh, annotations none, selectors name Sinatra, cluster IP, single stack, IPv4. That's its IP address. But notice down below here, it says endpoints none. So in the course, we'd say that endpoints is the way a service links to pod or pods. And if there are no endpoints, then that's an indicator that this service is not selecting the proper pods. And so there's probably a mistake with our selector, which there is, I purposely did that because I wanted to show you uh, that endpoint. Now, what I want to do is I want to now go back to our busy box example that we had earlier. So I'm just heading up to grab that. And if you want to find it again, you just type in service uh, debug um, Kubernetes and get that link. And so we'll enter in here, whoops. Uh, did you specify the right host report? Um, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> micro k it's in the front again. So we'll go ahead and enter here. And so theoretically, what we should be able to do is use the cluster IP address, right? And type in wget and do um, 8080, and it should be able to download that page. But notice it says can't connect to remote hosts because it's not linking to anything, okay? So we'll go ahead here and type exit. We'll type clear just to clean things up here. And what I need to do is I need to um, update this because this is incorrect. So there's a couple ways that we can update this. We can just change this and do an apply, um, or we can use the, ooh, I'm trying to remember the name of the command. Um, Cause usually I'll just, I'll just update it and apply it, but it's, oh, I can't remember. Let's go take a look here. So we say kubectl commands. It's in the course. Um, we got viewing, updating, not replace, patching. So probably with a patch, we could probably do it. So I, I rarely ever run patches, but let's give it a go and see if that works. If not, we'll just update it the old way um, or the way that I like to do it. But what we'll do here is type in micro k 8 um, cube CTL patch, and then probably the service name. So we'll say service. And then it's called service cluster IP. Just to make sure I'm gonna go here and type in SVC so I can see the name. Yeah, it's service cluster IP. If I just made a spelling mistake, I'm just double checking. We'll hit enter. And it says must specify patch or patch file containing. So we'll just say patch. Okay, that didn't work as I thought. That shows you how often I do patches here, but Oh, here goes hyphen P. Okay, so basically patch, what you can do is kind of change the value here. So to do hyphen P and then provide JSON. Um, I, I guess we could do it that way. It's not as clean as I'd like, but I guess we'll see here. So, I mean, the other way is probably edits, mm, but it's not great to edit things on the fly. I'll try patch for fun, okay. So just to make this a bit easier, what I'm gonna do is go over here and this is the actual proper selector that we need. Now, you know, it's too much work. We're just gonna do an apply because I'll do this in another video where I'll show you how to do patch properly just because it's kind of a pain. So I'll do hyphen F and we'll do K8 service cluster IP. It says it's unchanged. Oh, because we never updated anything. Okay, so what we'll do is copy this because this is actually the way we're going to uh, select it. And we'll go back here and then paste this on here, oops, in here. And so now we will then go apply that. And if we go back over to here and we do get C CVS, okay. And then we go uh, describe CVS service cluster IP. I gotta spell it right if we want it to work. We can now see that there is an endpoint. All right, and so that should suggest that it's now pointing to the correct pod. Let's go take a look at the pods and see if there's any new information there. So get pods um, uh, O hyphen wide. 
And so notice that it says that the IP address is 10.1.22.13. So if we go up here and look at the cluster IP, its IP address is 10.1.22.8. Um, uh, 183.8, but notice that this is the endpoint. So this one is going to point to this endpoint, okay? So it doesn't matter that this IP address is not the same as the cluster IP, because it, it will be, because it'll, it'll just forward this when we access it through the service. So what we'll do is go back over to here, and we'll hit up until we hit micro K, it's kubectl, and we start our busy box. And so this time, what we'll do is go ahead and grab the cluster IP address, which is this one here. And we'll go ahead and paste this in. We'll do uh, 8080, we'll do wget. And notice to download the page, and so we'll just do cat index HTML. Okay, and so, you know, that's showing that we're, we're able to access that, um, that pod through the service cluster, okay? So that allows other pods to be able to communicate with a static IP address, which is really useful. So we'll type in exit, I will type in clear. And so that's pretty much uh, all there is for the cluster IP. Now I do want to show you expose because expose is a uh, easier way uh, or just a like one liner of being able to uh, launch a service. So I'll type in kubectl uh, service command and we'll see if we can get some kind of examples here. And type in uh, expose. And so create a service for, this is replicated nginx and it should be easier than that. Um, yeah, replicate, that's for replication. So we should be able to do it for deploy. So let's see if we can kind of do this, uh, running this one command here. Because that's what a service is doing, is exposing pods by giving a static IP and giving it a point of entry. So what we'll do is go back over here, and I'm going to hit up until we get to our SVCs. And all I want to do is go ahead and destroy this or delete this. So we'll type in micro k 8 kubectl, um, uh, delete SVC, uh, paste, and then we'll go back up here, make sure that it's gone. It is gone. And I wanna try this micro K8 um, cube CTL expose. So it's gonna be expose. And we're gonna, what do we wanna expose? We wanna exploit a deployment. And so we'll need to know what de our deployment's called. It's actually just called Sinatra. So I can just type in Sinatra. Sinatra. And um, looking at our cheat sheet here. Okay, so it's gonna be whatever it is. So this is a, um, a replication controller or set or whatever. And so then it's the name and so the port and the target port, that's what we want to uh, adjust here. So we'll paste that in. And so our port is the port that we want it to be on the cluster. And then it is the port that we're listening to for the container or the pod, which is four, five, six, seven. So if we hit enter and we go back up here and hit up, we will see now that we have um, a service called Sinatra. So it didn't change the name. It probably is a flag for name. I'm not sure what it would be. Um, but the idea here is that it has a service here with a cluster IP here. And so we should be able to access our um, our pod the same way. So we'll go back over to this one on the left-hand side. We'll go back and launch our busy box. And what we'll do is go ahead and grab this IP address here. And actually, before we do that, let's go and do a describe on this. I'm just heading up to find it from before and we'll type in Sinatra. And notice that it's pointing the endpoint to 10.1.22.13. Um, and its IP address is this. And so we'll go take a look at our pod again, or pods with the hyphen O wide. And notice that is the IP address over here. So it definitely is working properly. But just for fun in our um, busy box, we'll just uh, triple check here to make sure. So I'm grabbing the IP address of the um, service and we'll type in wget paste and we'll do 8080. Notice that it downloads. If we cat it, index HTML, it shows the contents of that file. So we'll type in clear, we'll exit busy box. And so that's just another way. And so expose can be done uh, you know, with any other one. So if you want to do node port as well, I think you just put the, the flag um, kind hyphen hyphen kind, but I prefer to uh, do it always through the YAML files because then we can take that code and commit it to our repository and have infrastructure as a code or what have you there, which I think is just a lot easier to do. Um, but anyway, we'll go back to our services here and I just want to go ahead and delete this one here. So we will type in micro K8s cube CTL um, 
delete SVC Sinatra. And I've seen some people where they literally just have been typing Q, uh, K and then, you know, delete SVC. But, you know, just for us, we're just going to be typing it over and over again. But that's okay because then you will know it uh, by heart and you'll pass your exam no problem by being able to remember all these commands. But anyway, um, so that was cluster IP. And I guess we'll move on to node port next. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we are back, and this time we are going to have a service, but this time it's going to be a node port. So what I want you to do is go to the top here. We'll leave our cheat sheet open just in case we need it. And I want you to type in service Kubernetes. We'll go back to the documentation here, and I'll scroll on down, and I'm looking for uh, one for node port. So we sc scroll on down, keep going here, and we have multi-port service, which shows that you can have more than one port, which is great. Uh, and we'll make our way over to node port. So here is our node port example. And so I'll go ahead and copy that. And we will make a new file here and we will call this service um, node port YAML. Okay, and we'll double click into it and we'll paste the contents of it. And I will just bring this down here for a moment so we can see what we're doing. And so this one's gonna be called service node port. And the type is node port, which is fine. And then the selector needs to be uh, this label here so it actually can match. And uh, that's the cluster IP one, so we'll close it. And so we will paste that on in there. And then here for containers, it specifies the environment variable port 4567. Uh, we don't need to pass any environment variables, so I'm pretty sure we can, can we safely delete this? There's a lot of stuff. I, I always look at this and wonder if the indentation is incorrect. Oh, whoops, you know what? Um, we are in the wrong file. I was modifying this one by accident here, just making sure I didn't mess up our deployment file. Sorry, we, we actually wanna to go to this one here. Okay, so um, service node port, type node port, selector app my app, and I was going over to deployment because I just wanted to copy the contents over here. So we'll go here, they're all the same, so it doesn't matter which we pull from, from there. We'll go ahead and paste that on in there. And notice that we have, um, three port numbers. Okay, so these are confusing the text here. So I'm going to delete these out and we will write our own descriptions here. So the port is the port that you want it to be for uh, in cluster. So the in cluster port. So, or we could say the port number that um, uh, resources within the cluster we'll use to communicate, okay? And then you have the target port. So the target port is um, the port that we are targeting. So that would be, so this would be probably 8080 is what we'd want. And this would be 4567, right? So uh, the port number, the container uh, is listening on, right? Because we told Sinatra to start on 4567. And then the node port is uh, the external uh, external port uh, to uh, connect to the node, all right? So I'm just gonna make it 3,000, 30,001, all right? So hopefully that makes sense, but it'll make sense here in a moment when we actually put it into action. I really wish this would default to two spaces. There probably is a way here, because the thing with the YAML files is they're highly sensitive to indentation and they're supposed to be two space by default. So just to make sure we don't have any more problems here, I'm gonna just double check here and see if I can find um, the indentation levels. I'm just trying to think about where that would be. We'll go to user settings, uh, interface maybe, uh, indents, indentation, uh, indent, uh, cloud nine setting. That's not useful. I just can't remember where it is, honestly. Oh, well, anyway, we'll just have to be careful about that. It's not a big deal. I just don't want to spend all day on screen scrolling here or stop the video just to try to find that option. It's really not that big of a deal. But anyway, so the idea here is we want to be able to, without even launching BusyBox, we want to be able to do, uh, sorry, curl. Wget is very similar, but curl is just easier to use. And we want to be able to do localhost 
8080, or sorry, uh, 3001, right? 3001. And so that's the idea here is that we don't have to, we can access the service outside of the cluster, right? Okay. So what we're going to do here is go ahead and launch our new node port service. So we'll type in micro K8, uh, cube CTL, uh, apply hyphen F service. Oh, I'll have to type it by hand here. I was trying to hit um, tab to auto complete it. And we'll hit enter. And I forgot to type the folder name here, k8s forward slash, notice there's a folder. We'll hit enter and created the service. So we'll type in micro k8s, uh, cube ctl, get svc for service. And there it is. Notice we have a cluster IP address. And so that is assigned right now. There is no external IP address. So I guess we'll have to take a look at that in a moment here. Um, well, I guess we don't, yeah, because we're, we don't have an external IP address. So external IP address would be for if we set up a load bouncer, because we need an external IP address for an external load bouncer to uh, forward its, or like to uh, find the actual uh, service. So that makes sense why we don't have an external IP address. But let's see if we can just get more information on this um, particular service to see if there's anything new here. I'm not expecting anything, but let's just take a look here and see if anything is different. So, whoops, we'll hit up here. And did I type it wrong? Micro KDS, kubectl, describe SVC service. Oh, I typed it wrong, yeah. All right, and so we'll take a look here and see what information we have. So. Default, none, none, that's totally fine. It's targeting this, so the selector looks correct here. It's node port, single stack. That is its IP address, uh, the port here. And then here it tells us the node port. We can see that the endpoint is working, so it is going to something. All right, and so now what we should be able to do is type in curl. Uh, we'll try localhost here, and we'll do the port number here. Okay, and notice uh, that we're able to access it outside of the cluster, all right? So that was what was uh, very impressive, okay? Um, and so the next thing uh, that we can do here is just check the cluster IP, like just as we did before. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead here and launch up a micro -case cube CTL with the busy box, and we will go and just test this cluster. So we'll go grab its IP address, and we'll type in wget, and then we'll do 8080, and we can see that we can access that file again, okay? So that is node port, all right? And so now that we did node port, I guess the next thing to do would be to do um, the load balancer one. But before we do that, let's go ahead and just make sure we get rid of that service. So we'll say get SVC. I'm gonna copy the name so I don't have to figure it out. We'll hit up, we'll type in delete, and we'll paste that on in there. And then we'll go back and hit up again and see that it's gone. And so now we're ready for load balancer. All right, welcome back. Uh, so we are going to do a service and this time we are going to use the load balancer type. So what I want you to do is create a new file here. We'll just type service load balancer. And I wanna tell you that we're not actually gonna be able to complete uh, this service type here, at least we might do it in another follow along if it is easy, um, because we might launch uh, EKS. And if we do, then it'll be an opportunity for us to use a load balancer. I'm having a really hard time typing this balancer dot YAML. Okay. And so we'll go over here. And again, if you don't know how to get there, we'll type in Kubernetes service to go to the official documentation and see if we can grab some code to work from. And so I'm going to just type in load balancer. So I just want an example of one. Maybe we can click through here. And so here's an example. We'll go ahead and copy it. And we will paste it in to the file here. And we'll change the name. So service load balancer. And we need the selector to match our actual application here. So we'll go back here and paste it on in. Whoops. We'll try that one more time. If that doesn't work. You know, it was just right click copy, right click paste gives us less trouble here. And so there's a few things here. We have the ports, 
So again, it's like, what port is it running on? So this would be port 8080 for our service. Target port would be 4567. Um, notice that it's specifying a cluster IP address, and then we have a type load balancer, and then we have status load balancer ingress IP address 192.0.2.127. So what is going on here? Well, the thing with service load balancer, it's used for connecting to an external load balancer. So the idea is that you do something like um, an AWS would be Elastic or ELB. So if we go here, those are the load balancers for AWS. So if I go here and create a load balancer, we're not gonna do this right now because it's not gonna work uh, if we do it this way. But the idea is that AWS has load balancers. Um, there's Nginx, right? Nginx has their own called Nginx Plus, all right? So that is a load balancer that we could use. Or if you're using Azure, it has a load balancer. If you're using Google, it has a load balancer. And the idea is that you can um, have the load balancer from the service provider be used to distribute traffic and make sure your application is highly available, which is recommended for production use case. And if you were to use one, you'd be using the network load balancer because I don't think you can use the application load balancer in this way. You always have to use a, a like a T3 or sorry, um, level three slash four load balancer. Um, because application load balancer is a bit more tricky. But the idea is that when you launch uh, this here, right? And if you like, if we, if we were using EKS, right? So we'd launched up an EKS cluster, which is a managed Kubernetes service. And we were to launch this load balancer, it would automatically provision us a network load balancer and would connect it, okay? And so this configuration is gonna vary based on your provider. So if we go back over to here and look at load balancers, notice down below, um, it tells you that if you go here and like you look at GCP AWS, there are some very particular configurations or for if you want logging or stuff like that. So um, we're not exactly going to be able to be able to do this here, but we could try running this. I don't know what we'd have to do for the cluster IP here. Um, I mean, I guess it's the cluster's IP. So if we go to our cheat sheet, maybe we can get some information here. I don't know if there's like cluster commands. Maybe we can do kubectl cluster info and see what there is. So I'll go here and type in micro k8s. Okay, and so, I mean, it's running at 127.0.0.1. I don't know much about this because I haven't really done this yet, but maybe we'll know more when we go th uh, through here. But I figured we'd just try something here. I don't think we always need this value here, so I'll go ahead and delete this, and we'll just see if we can actually run it. If it doesn't work, I don't care, um, but I just wanted to give it an attempt here to show you, but hopefully you understand the idea behind the service load balancer that it's for connecting to an external load balancer service. We'll type in kubectl. I'm gonna type in apply hyphen F. We'll type in k8s uh, service load balancer YAML, and we'll scroll up here. And so what we can see here is that it says um, the service is invalid cluster IPs, invalid value, fail to allocate this value, the provided value is not in the range. Okay, so what if we just go back and put this value in? Again, I'm not a networking expert, so I'm not sure what we can put in here. But I'm gonna try it one more time and just see if it even works. Okay, so we can't do that. So I'm not sure what to set for this right now, but if we do get EKS set up, we'll give this a go. But I just wanted to show you the service load balancer, or just make an attempt here and explain why we're not gonna be able to do this locally. Now, technically we could probably set up Nginx Plus because it is open source and you can deploy it. So if we did like Nginx Plus um, Kubernetes uh, load balancer service, there is a tutorial for it on Nginx, right? So we could do this but it's a lot of work. I just want to show you kind of the diagram they here have here. So um, you can see that you have Nginx plus load balancer going to the controller, going to the pod, and uh, I guess the SVC somewhere here. That's not a very good diagram. But if we go down here, it should have all the instructions. Nope, this is not the right one. Maybe it's this one here. I have the link on my other computer. I'm just trying to find it very quickly here just to kind of show you how many instructions there were. Maybe try this one here. They're not making it easy for me. So I'm just gonna pop on my other computer here just so I can see what the link was that I was looking at. And um, let's 
So I'm just going to double check here. Engine X plus load balancing Kubernetes service. I'm going to just see if I can find the link here. I think it's this one. Yeah, this is the one. So if you were to follow this, I think this is how we could actually uh, install a load balancer to test it out, but it's a lot of work and it's out of the scope of this course. So I just kind of want to show you this article, show them what they're doing. So here they say, okay, we have some uh, nodes here. And actually that's something that we haven't even done is ever ran this command. So let's go back over here and take a look at the nodes we have. Um, oh, sorry, micro K8S. Okay, so we have one there, which is kind of interesting. And then down below, we've actually never ran API resources, might be fun to run. Again, micro K8S, we need that in the front. This is a command that does show up on the um, uh, exam, and so I probably will make a separate follow along and show this more, but this shows us all the, I guess, API endpoints that are available and things like that. If we go back over to here, uh, first, we choose the first node and add a label to it, so they label it. Here they're using replication controllers, which I think are old. I don't think you're supposed to use replication controllers anymore in Kubernetes. They are replaced with replica sets, which is what we cover in the course. Okay, so they t basically make a replica set. Uh, and what that is doing is launching Nginx Plus as a pod in your cluster, okay? And I guess you label it because maybe you're targeting a very particular node for it to run on. And then you, what you're doing is you're grabbing the Docker image. So you're saving it. I guess they're loading it. Um, they're configuring Nginx because you probably have to configure uh, information. So you'd put the stuff in there. Um, you go ahead and uh, create the replication set. Um, it's a replication controller. I'm going to say replication set. You can see that the pod is running so that you have a uh, load balancer then you are getting the node information. So you're getting the external IP address of it, and then you're able to access it. Um, and so I guess here they're creating the, uh, the service. So this one, I guess, would be the load balancer one. I don't see the type. So this is a cluster IP address because we don't see the type there. Um, this is I, cluster IP none, so that makes it a headless one. I'm just looking to see if they do load balancer here. Okay, so this is definitely not an external load balancer because if it was, they would use load balancer. But I guess load balancer can, well, I mean, I guess it is, but I guess load balancer can only be used with public cloud service providers, like the ones that are defined over here. If we go back up to the list, right? So we don't see Nginx Plus in the list here. So I think that Nginx Plus is a load balancer that you can use. Um, but I guess that would technically be an internal load balancer because these are all external ones. So just to confirm, uh, I guess I was wrong with the Nginx Plus, but it is interesting to see that there. But uh, yeah, so the service is really only intended to be, the, the load balancer type is only intended to be used with external ones there. But that's all we need to do for that one. And there's one more type for Kubernetes, which is external name. And I guess we'll give that a go next, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and we are looking still at service, but for the last type, which is external name. So what I want you to do is create a new file here. We'll type in service external name, YAML, okay? And we'll open up that file and make our way over back to our service Kubernetes page that I hopefully you still have open, and we'll type in external name at the top. You can just search it, Command F to do that. And here is that example there. So we'll go ahead and copy that code in. And so the idea behind external name is is that you have a service that is able to communicate or talk to something outside of your cluster. So maybe you have a database that you're using, like you're using on uh, AWS RDS, which is a relational database. And so if you had spun up a relational database, it takes forever to spin one up, so I'm not gonna do it, but it would have like a host name, like a domain name that you could use because you can't, um, you can't uh, get a, an IP address from RDS. It'll only give you a host name, like a domain name. And so uh, this allows you to say, okay, uh, I'll have my database here. And so whenever the service is hit, uh, always send it over to that database, okay? So what I'm gonna do is maybe we can try it with a virtual machine because that might be a little bit easier. It will have a host name. I don't know if it'll work, but let's try anyway, okay? 
And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create myself a new EC2 instance. And so we'll go ahead and launch an instance and we'll give it a moment here. We'll say launch instance here. I don't know why it didn't take. And so the idea is I want to launch a new machine. So let's say Amazon X2. And I notice that we're doing it with the old experience just in case it's the future and you don't have the old view. I'm gonna do the new view, even though this might change. But the idea is that we need a web server. So I'm gonna call this Apache uh, web server. And we want it to be Amazon X2. I really do not like this, but this is how it is. And it's gonna be Amazon X2 instance. It's gonna be 64 bit architecture, x86. Uh, T2 micro is totally fine. We do not need to log into the server. So proceed without a key pair. And we need to have, um, let's see here, allow SSH traffic. We do not care about SSH traffic, but we do want HTTP. So that's totally fine because we want it to be open on port uh, 80. And then down below the storage is fine. And then we've got to go to our advanced details. And this is where we are going to uh, go all the way to the bottom. This is all new to me too, so I'm a bit confused. And this is where we're gonna enter our user data. So what I want to do is install a Apache server. I've done this a lot of times, but I, I can't remember. So what I'm gonna do is just go to a GitHub and go to exam pro co, because I probably have an example because I've done it so many times. We'll go here and I'm just gonna search, um, probably in Terraform I've done it. Like there's an Avis Apache example. So this actually, this example probably would have it. Uh, if we go to the user data YAML, those are the two commands we want. Okay, so I'm gonna copy these over and technically this is a bash script. So we're gonna just take this out here. Whoops. Um, I don't know if I have confidence in that. I'm gonna go back and maybe we've done it in the solutions architect. Uh, solution free the free I have a bunch of free repos here that should show up so let's take a look at uh, we'll open the developer I know it's somewhere in here maybe it's in the cloud practitioner the cloud practitioner is I think pretty much updated here um, we'll try VPC follow along is it in here no and we have this one that one's I don't see it in here maybe it's in the developer I'm just looking for that file. I know I have it somewhere here. User data.sh. Yeah, that looks kind of right to me. Yeah, this, this one's right. So this one, what this will do is it will, um, we don't need the EC2 user here, but it's gonna install Apache, which is called HTTPD. I know it's confusing. And here it can actually create a custom file and then start it up. So this is at the free AWS developer associate. I do have a repository for uh, the project we're working on. So it will be in there as well. So if we go back over to exam pro here, um, I'm just updating as I make the course here, so it's not completely uh, completed here, but I have this repository here. I don't know why it's blank <laughs> because I definitely uh, committed code to this the other day, but that's fine. This will get filled out and we'll have examples there, okay? But for the time being, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab this on in here and we'll paste this in and I don't need all this content. All I want here is to, um, I need this line so that it knows that it's doing bash. Okay, and so we have sudo yum install Apache, sudo yum, or sorry, sudo uh, systemctl, so start up Apache. And if the server needs to be restarted, make sure that it's there. And so that should be enough to do it. And so what I'll do is go ahead and launch this instance. And we'll just wait for that to work there, okay? And so we'll go view all instances. And so I'm waiting for this to be running. And so the idea is that we have this, we have the public IPv4 address, but that's not what I want. I want the the DNS name, okay? So like this is the idea where it's like kind of like a name, domain name or something. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and copy this and go back to our micro K8s here. I'm gonna just paste that on in here. And I'm gonna call this um, service Apache. And here they have a namespace. I'm gonna take that out because I want it to be in the default namespace. I don't want that to go anywhere strange. And down below here, we have something funny, so I'm just gonna type in clear. And we'll go back over to our EC2 instance. We're gonna refresh here and see that it is running. I'm gonna grab the public IPv4 and just make sure that it works. Okay, so see how it's hanging? If it's hanging, it's either Apache's not running or the port is not open. Oh no, it works. Okay, we're, we just had to wait for it to pass. So when you have an EC2 instance, 
it has to be running and then the status checks have to pass. If we refresh here, well, it, it's working, but usually you wait till the, you get two out of two, but we're impatient here and we're just getting ahead of ourselves. So it does work at this address. And so the idea is um, we are gonna, we pasted that into here. And so I'm hoping that this will have an IP address or something, and then we will just curl it or wget it, and hopefully we'll get the contents of this page. So now that we have this um, external service, we're gonna type in micro K8s, cube CTL, apply hyphen F, K8S, uh, service uh, external name YAML, okay? And then we will type in micro K8S, cube CTL, uh, get SVC to see what services we have here. And notice that this one actually has an external IP address. Now, if we got the load balancer to work in the last one, which was uh, not ready for that yet, it would have had an external IP address where it would have showed that address so that, you know, um, for the load balancer to connect to. But here we can see that this external name uh, doesn't have a cluster IP address, but it points to external IP. So I guess my thought is like, okay, I guess the other services would just resolve to this one if it knew how. So I'm just trying to think here because it is external. So what I'm going to do is I want to log into the, the, the our BusyBox pod here just to see what we can see. Okay, so we'll say wget uh, clear. And I just want to do like a wget on Google here.com. Yeah, that's external. So I'm not really sure. I mean, I understand why we have one, but I don't understand the use case. So I'll be back here in a moment. I just want to try to find the reason why, okay? Um, like, like, what can we test to make sure that this is working as expected? Because I know if we do a wget here, this, this is going to work, right? We do wget. Oh, this is 403 or forbidden. Um, is the port not open? Oh, it actually is forbidden. Yeah, so... I wonder why we're getting a 403 on that. Hmm. Type an exit here. What if I do a curl on this? No, that works here. Huh. So we got a 403 forbidden. Okay. Well, I'll look into it and I'll be back in a moment, okay? All right. So I did a little bit of reading and it says when looking up the host name, so whatever it's called, the cluster DNS service returns a CNAME record with the value to that. So it sounds like that we will have a um, an address here. And so what we'll do is we will go here and type in micro K8S cube CTL. Um, and we'll say describe SVC. And this one's called service external name. And maybe we'll be able to see that information because that's what I don't know. Um, and so I must be, must be typing this wrong. So we'll type in uh, get SVC for services. Oh, it's called Service Apache. I'll we'll see if we get some more information here. And so if we scroll on up here, we have this here. So what I'm trying to understand is how do we get this? So when looking up the host, because I don't know if this is always just based on this pattern here. Okay. So we have my service prod. So I assume that this is the namespace. So we're in the default namespace. And our service is called service dot Apache or hyphen Apache SVC because it's a service. It's in our cluster. It's local. And so this is what I want to know. So we do curl could not resolve. So I mean, I understand what it's saying here, but I don't know uh, what to do with this. OK, so that's what I'm going to find out next. OK. All right. So after a little bit of digging on Kubernetes, we have debugging DNS resolution. So I think this would be the way that we would figure it out. But there are a few things here that it says that might not work well. So you have to have a Kubernetes cluster, a kubectl, is recommended to run this uh, with at least two nodes and that you're not acting as the control plane host. So if you do not already have a cluster, you can create one by using Minikube. So the thing is, is that there is only a single node. So I'm not sure if we can just spin up another node. Um, and everything I think is just one node because we're not running multi nodes. It's a single, it's a single one there. So. I guess what we can do is we can try to launch this pod here. So this is a DNS utility. And so what they're doing is they're using this and then they're doing an NS lookup, 
right? And so I don't know if I can do that from the C2 instance, but um, this is what I would give as an attempt. Even if this doesn't work, that's totally fine. Uh, it's, we're kind of going way out of the scope uh, for the actual KCNA, but if this if we can't get this to work, I figured it doesn't hurt to try, right? So what we'll do is we'll go back over here and uh, this is DNS utils. So I'm gonna go back over to this here and we'll make a new file here. I'll call it dnsutils.yaml. And I'm gonna go ahead and copy the contents here. And we'll go ahead and paste this in. So it will launch a pod, so it's not a deployment, it's just a pod. DS new tills, um, and here it's pulling a very specific image. So it says e, uh, end to end test image, Jesse, I don't know who Jesse is, but thank you, Jesse, DNS utils 1.3. And then it has a sleep and 3,600. So the first thing it does when it launches is it sleeps, pull if not present, so pull once, restart policy. So always restart this pod, okay? So we'll go back to the debugging here. And here we can see that it gets deployed. In fact, it looks like we don't even need to have this file here. We could just hold on here. We haven't we haven't done an external file, so I'm going to go and delete this here. Whoops. And we'll just actually copy this if because if it does that, that's even easier, right? And I'm going to type in clear. And what we'll do is go over here, hit enter. Actually, the server was refused. Um, micro K8s. We'll be doing that all day here. So it's created that DNS util. And so if we go back over to this here, we should be able to do a lookup. So I'm gonna leave whatever the default is. Actually, we'll look up the pod first to make sure that it does exist and get some descriptions here. I'm not sure if we'll find any inf uh, interesting information about the pod, but let's just do it because they're doing it too. Right, so there's the pod. We know that it's working. And if we go back over to uh, the debug page here, we're gonna go ahead and copy this. Now this is for Kubernetes default, so this should show us something, right? That's not for the service that we're looking for, but we'll go ahead and paste that on in there. Uh, again, micro K8S in the front there. If you're wondering how like I'm jumping to the front there, I'm actually hitting control A. Okay, so control E. Oh, well, it's not doing what I want, but control A would jump to the, the, the back, control E would jump to the front, but control E is overridden by this file command here. So we'll type in micro K8s, hit enter. And so notice that it is resolving here. So we have the server and it's going there. All right, so now what I wanna do is I want to delete this out. And we have this. So this is what I'm gonna try. See if this resolves anywhere. Aha, uh -huh. and it does. And look what it returns. Our EC2, 52, 201, 234, 50, compute one, amazonadbus.com. And there's the IP address. So that looks like that is our server. Um, so the core DNS, the DNS uh, thing that is uh, part of the control plane is definitely resolving to there. So that is absolutely working. How that works in the app, like how we would use that within the app, I don't know but that's great to see that that works. So I just wanted to make sure that we had a way to validate there. So what we'll do is go back to our EC2 instance and shut this down. So we'll terminate this one here. Okay. And we do not need um, uh, the that service running anymore for debugging. So I'm gonna go and type in micro K8s cube CTL get pods, cause I can't remember the name. And we'll just hit up here. We'll say delete pod DNS utils, and that pod will vanish because there is no deployment, so there's nothing that will persist it there. And so I think we pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover with um, the service types, because there's the four types, and if we have an opportunity to test load balancer later, we will do that. Um, but we're definitely going above and beyond, and I'm hoping that this really uh, solidifies your knowledge of Kubernetes, um, and I'll see you in the next follow along, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And in this fall along, we're gonna learn how to uh, set up a Kubernetes uh, ingress object. So ingress, as we covered in the course, is for um, exposing pods externally 
And so it's an alternative to use uh, from using a service load balancer and actually uh, generally recommended to use. Um, but, you know, getting one set up is a little bit tricky. Uh, so hopefully we'll figure that out here. So I just launched my micro K8s environment uh, because uh, micro K8s is going to make it really, really easy for us to do. Whereas if we use something else, uh, I can't say for certain if it's that easy. So we have our environment um, uh, here. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take a look at what we have running. So we'll say micro K8s, uh, kubectl, uh, get pods. We'll see if our Sinatra pod is running, and it is. And then we will look if we have a deployment here, and we do. So let's take a look at what we can find about Kubernetes ingress. I'm going to tell you the documentation, the main page, not very good uh, for helping you get set up. So they do have this thing here. Uh, and I guess technically it is correct. So that's for the Nginx. But the thing is, is that ingress also requires you to have an ingress controller. And so you don't have one by default, you have to set one up. So if we go to ingress controllers here, you can see there are a lot of kinds. So we have AWS, GCE, Nginx, and then there's a, a whole bunch down below here. All right, and so we could probably figure out a way to hook up uh, the AWS one, but that might be a little bit too hard for our developer environment. It'd be a lot easier if we were already using EKS. It doesn't say that we have to use EKS with this, but I would imagine that it'd probably be a lot easier. And so there's Nginx, which is an open source one. And you can see there's a lot of different ones that we uh, could use, but uh, this is probably what we'll end up using, which is the Nginx one here. So we'll go over here. Uh, I'm just trying to find the page that has the documentation. Uh, yeah, this looks like it. So um, if you're doing Nginx, um, they have a bunch of different ways that you can do it uh, based on your provider. So we have micro K8s. S, and so, um, you know, I showed you all the lightweight distributions, but I didn't tell you that you could actually use Docker desktop or a, a Rancher desktop in order to run your developer environment without using a cloud developer environment. Um, but I'm going to tell you, Docker Desktop is such a pain, like an incredible pain to set up um, an Ingress controller because you have to use, I guess it's not that hard, but you have this very complex template here. I'm just going to show you this. And uh, we don't need all of this here. I'm just going to take that out. And so this is what is required. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here in order to deploy our Ingress controller. So to kind of sift through that and make sense of it would be very hard. Uh, but the great thing is since we're using micro K8s, if we just go up here for a moment, we click on the micro K8s, it's as simple as enabling it. And basically that script I just showed you that was for the Docker desktop basically does the same thing, but does it in one line. And uh, we know that it's going to work. We could take a look at maybe like what Minikube does. So Minikube also has an add-on, so that's nice to see. I'm not sure what there is for Kind, or if they even have Kind listed here. If we go to AWS, that might be interesting to see. So the NLB to expose the Nginx controller behind a service load balancer type. So something more interesting going on there. But what we're going to do is stick to our uh, micro K8s because it's super easy. So I'll go ahead and copy that command. We'll go over here, paste it on in, and we'll enable Ingress. And so that will uh, install our Ingress controller. So you can see it's doing a bunch of stuff. And so I bet if we looked at the contents of that desktop um, Docker file where we saw that YAML file, I bet it was installing all these things. So we have a namespace for ingress. It made a service account. It made a cluster role, RBAC, role-based access control uh, there. So we have a role, uh, a role binding, role binding, config map, and a daemon set. So a lot of stuff is being created there, but you can see we didn't have to uh, worry about it. I just get like... Uh, uh, worrisome when we have those external scripts and we run them because there's so many moving parts. Uh, but this way, it's all set up pretty easy. So now that we have our ingress controller, what we need to do is set up our uh, ingress resource. So if we go back to um, uh, the tutorial here, actually, this looks like the up to date version. So this is the one we are looking for. Sometimes you might come across one that is older. Uh, but this one definitely looks correct to me. So I'll go ahead and copy this. And we'll go back over to our environment. I'm going to just make a new file here. And we're going to call this um, ingress.yaml. We'll go ahead and uh, paste that in here. So we'll just say paste. And we'll just take a look at what we need to change. So up above, we have the ingress type. Uh, minimal ingress, that'll be its name. This annotation thing. So sometimes um, annotation is just a type of metadata that is sometimes used by uh, tools or providers. So this one is particular to Nginx. Uh, as you can see, this is Nginx Ingress Kubernetes IO. So it does something with rewriting. So you're specifying the root path there. Um, then there's the Ingress class name. So we'll leave that alone. That's totally fine. 
Then we have our rules. So here, what we can do is type in Sinatra and the path type is prefix, which is totally fine. And then we're saying, where's the backend? So we are specifying something. So here it's targeting a service. So if that's the case, we will need a service. I'm just gonna double check if we can target a deployment. I'm pretty sure it always has to be a service because uh, if we go up to the diagram, yeah, it always goes to here. So we will need a service. So I have another tab open here. And let's see if we actually already have something running. So we'll type in micro K8s, um, cube CTL, and we'll type in get SVC. And we do, we have a uh, service Apache, but that is an external name one, which we're not using anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that one just to kind of clean up what we have here. If you have it, you can go ahead and delete it too, delete SVC. Um, but what we'll do is, whoops, um, cube CTL, micro, okay, it's, must be spelling it wrong today, micro K8s, there we go. And so what we'll do is use that expose command to just quickly create a, um, a, um, uh, a cluster IP service. So we'll have expose, uh, deploy, and we need the name of it, so it's called Sinatra. And then we need the port. So the port will be 8080. And then the target port is going to be 80, or sorry, 4567. Okay. And so it'll say here, still typing micro K8s wrong. Micro K8s. There we go. And so now what I'll do is type in micro K8s cube CTL get SVC. We can see that it's there. I'm just gonna describe it. I just wanna see that the endpoints are there so we don't have any problems. There is an endpoint, so it must be going to the correct pod. So we are in A-OK -okay shape. And we'll just go back up there and just type in get again there. So it's called Sinatra. So if we go back to our ingress, we're gonna target the uh, Sinatra. And uh, the port it operates on is 8080, right? And so what we'll do now is just save that. And we'll go ahead and deploy our ingress. So going back over here to the other tab here, it doesn't matter what tab we do it on, it just, that's the tab I'm on. So we want micro K8s cube CTL, um, apply hyphen F. And by the way, we've been doing apply this entire time. We could probably use create. So apply is just does create and modify. And so create is just, if you only want to create, um, you know, like if you ran it twice, it would create two resources where uh, modify, if it already had the same name, it would uh, it wouldn't uh, do it twice. Um, but I guess we can try that for fun just because I haven't been using that at all. And so here it says that it's created the minimal ingress. And so we will now type in micro K8s cube CTL get um, ingress. And so here we have our ingress here and maybe we can describe it a bit more and see if there's any additional information that might be interesting to look at. And so if we just scroll up, actually we don't even have to scroll up at all, but here it's launched the, the default namespace Default backend, port 80, endpoints, default HTTP backend not found, um, which might not be a problem. I don't know if this error actually matters. Um, and then we have forward slash Sinatra. And here you can see it's pointing to the backend. Sinatra's service name, port 8080. So let's take a look and see if it works. So this should be all exposed on the local host. And so I think it'll be on port 80 or just local host in general. So I think that we can just type in is curl local host. And notice it says not found. And so Nginx is working. It is going to the um, ingress controller, which is Nginx. But let's now go and type in forward slash Sinatra. Sinatra. Okay, and that didn't work. So we'll type in now 8080 Sinatra. Okay, Sinatra. So it looks right to me. I'm just gonna go double check what I wrote. Oh, you know what it was? I think what we need, we might need the protocol in here because it's not going to know what protocol, if it's HTTP or HTTPS. So I'm just going to try this. And it's not giving us what I want. Localhost sin notra. I'm going to double check, making sure I'm not spelling anything wrong here. Sin notra. Okay, hold on, hold on. Hmm. What did I do wrong here? Because <laughs> I definitely definitely have had this working uh, when I tested before. So maybe there's an issue with our cluster. Let's just double check to make sure our cluster is working. So we'll say SVC. This is a cluster IP here, external IP. That looks fine. 
Um, so I know we have our busy box that we were doing before. I'm gonna see if I can find that here. We'll say uh, debug service Kubernetes. And we'll go ahead and grab our one liner here. And we'll go on back here. We'll paste that on in. And it says connection refused. That's totally fine. We'll type in micro K8s. And we'll do w get. Oh, I don't know what the. Um... Oh, yeah, we do know. It's right here. Okay. So what we'll do is just type in w get 8080. Okay. So it does work. Cat index HTML. So maybe if we go back up to here. Maybe this has something to do with it. Okay, default is to be backend 80 endpoints, default is to be backend not found. All right, so I'll be back here in a moment and see if I can solve it, okay? All right, I'm back. And so one thing I noticed is that this one sets an ingress class name. And when I compared my uh, other code that I found somewhere else, it didn't have this field at all and it defaulted to public. So I'm thinking that if we change this to public, then that will go to the 127.0.0.1. I'll be able to use it that way. So that's what I'm gonna try here. So we'll try to update this. So we'll say uh, kubectl apply hyphen f k8s ingress, and we'll see if that will take. Um, so here it says missing the kubectl last apply configuration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't like it for whatever reason. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that line for a second. Okay, it says it's configured, but did it change it? No, it did not. So I think in this case, what we'll do because I'm just, I'm just curious if we set this to public, if it will do what we think it will do, but maybe what we'll do is just delete the um, the ingress controller and that might fix our issue here. So we'll just say ingress, I think it's short for ing, if we wanted to do that. So we'll say delete ing ingress, okay. Uh, this is all called minimal ingress. All right, and then we'll just go ahead and reapply this. And then we will take a look here. So the class is now public, but it's not assigning the IP address. So what I'll do is just remove this here, just because I noticed my other one does not have it. And we will go ahead and just delete it because maybe it's doing more than just that if you specify the class. Okay. And still no IP address, interesting. But even though it is a public class, let's go ahead and just try it anyway for fun. Localhost Sinatra. Oh, it works. There we go. Okay, so I'm not sure why the IP address is not showing up here, 127.0.0.1, but I think that class has something to do with it. There's another thing where you can set the class in the annotation. Uh, so you can see there's some variation there. Um, notice, like, we can do curl, we can do, um, you can put HTTP in front of here if you'd like. This is running on port 80. So we didn't specify port 80, but that is just, if it's public, I suppose that's where it would go by default. And we have rules for HTTP. And so that is port 80, uh, which is what we'd be using by default here. Um, so that's ingress for you. So hopefully that wasn't too hard, but uh, we did get through it and we're all good. Okay. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this fall along, what we're going to be taking a look at is jobs and cron jobs. So what I want you to do is go to the top here and type in Kubernetes uh, jobs, and this should bring us to um, hopefully the jobs page here. Maybe we can take a look at this one as well. Uh, and so we have some example jobs. Okay, this one's a little bit more complicated, which is fine, but we'll also go to the cube CTL cheat sheet. Okay, because in the... Um, in the course, I do use uh, to the samples from here. We just type in job. And so here we have one where it says create a job which prints the word hello, create a cron job that prints a hello world every minute. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and copy this first one here. And you can see it's cube, CTL, create job, hello. Maybe we'll just type it for fun, uh, just so that we get better at remembering what is what. So we'll type in micro K8s. Uh, cube CTL create job and we could do apply I suppose but jobs they run and then they, they die so I don't think you'd really be updating them maybe you'd be updating this one and using apply so they have a name called hello 
So we'll just copy the rest there to make our lives a bit easier. Okay, hello, hyphen, hyphen, image equals busy box. So that should resolve. You probably go to Docker Hub and there's one called Biz a busy box. So a lot of times we were using the one that was sourcing Google, but I think we could just do that as well. And so it will run the echo command and it should work. So we'll hit enter and it says job.batch hello created. Notice we don't see where the output is. I'm not really sure where we would observe that, but let's just take a look here and maybe type in describe. Okay, but you can see here it says job completed, completed, and it ran the command echo hello world. Of course, we didn't see it, but we can see that it did pass that in as the initial command. So it definitely did operate that. Um, now the next question would be to take a look at, um, let's just take a look at all of our jobs here for a moment, but to run the one on a schedule. So here it says, hello, one out of one, duration two and age. So go back over here, very similar, um, but we have this very interesting looking thing and that's a cron job. So cron job cheat sheet. I wonder if there's something that we can just show you really quickly here. So if you've never seen a cron, so cron is part of Linux. So the idea is that it's a, it's a, um, a thing called cron tab. And uh, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, run this on a schedule. And there's this thing where uh, you specify the time in minutes, hours, days, month, uh, Monday, <laughs> month, month and weekday, right? So if you have the value zero here, which is uh, minutes, um, I guess that's, wait, hold on. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So this says every hour. Uh, so zero, I guess, is one. <laughs> that's interesting. You'd think it'd be like, if you put a one, that'd be every hour, but I guess it's zero uh, based on how the numbers are. I'm not sure if it shows all the information. In how oh yeah, here we go. Uh, zero, so minutes zero to, you'd really think this would be one because it says hours. Why is this every hour? Okay, whatever. Uh, so then we have this one here. It says uh, uh, forward slash 15, so every 15 minutes. Uh, then you have zero, whatever. So you kind of get the idea here. I don't fully understand the logic here. I've done this for years, but I always have to look it up. Um, but just to show you if you want to uh, read that yourself, but we'll go back to the cheat sheet here. If we read this, they say every minute. So I guess that makes sense because if you took uh, an hour and divided it by one and you get that, well, anyway, that's what it says it does. But you know, this is not so important to know for the exam, but just to understand that that's where that logic comes from. And if you wanna learn it on your own, you can totally do that. So what we'll do is hit enter. And, oh, we have to type in micro K8s. All right, and then we'll hit, uh, does that look right? Micro K8s, yeah, enter. And so what we can do now is t get the jobs. Oh, uh, maybe we have to do cron job for this. We do, so there it is. And so it says last scheduled, it is active. I assume it's active, um, but I guess we'll just wait here a little while and see when it, does trigger while that is going on. Let's take a look at what it looks like to create a cron job file. So you use batch version one, you have a job, metadata, you specify your container, image, name, command, whether it should restart or not, and back off the limit. So, you know, if it fails, then it will retry after a certain amount of time. It probably does exponential back off. I'm not sure if it's uh, every few seconds or whatever. So in that sense, you can make a job that is reoccurring in, in some sense there. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all there really is uh, to jobs, but we just want to observe that this thing works. Okay, and notice that the one minute's gonna come up here in a moment. Ah, so it just ran. So it says one active last scheduled. So let's see if we can get a describe. Since there's only one, it should pull the first one there. Notice we haven't been specifying the name at all. Okay because usually you'd write the name, whatever it is, right? Um, and I don't know what the name is. It is called hello. So we'd say like, hello, right? And let's just take a look at what we have here. So namespace is default, no labels, no annotations. That's our schedule. Con concurrency policy, allow, uh, suspend, false. Nothing super exciting here. You can see what the pod is. Last schedule time, so last time it ran, whether there's a job that's active right now. And then we have events here. So it says create a job, saw uh, completed job. I would think that if this runs multiple times, we will see this kind of like a list. But um, what we'll do is just go back to get. So it'll probably trigger very soon. 
Uh, so when it's actually active, it's one. And then when it's not active, it's zero. So this doesn't count up like to say, oh, it's ran four or five times. It's just uh, true or false, zero or one, right? Um, so what we'll do is just hit up here. We'll go back to describe because it might have already ran again. Yeah, so here it is. You can see that it's starting to um, pile on there. I'm just curious, like uh, time to cron, uh, cron expression. Just wondering if there is a tool there that we can use. Ah, okay, so let's say we wanted it to be every single, um, every second. Is it changing in real time? Ah, okay, so it'd be this. Okay, cool. Let's say you wanna do every minute. See, so you wanna do every hour. Okay, so I'm not saying I can make sense of this. At one point, I did know how these uh, cron expressions work, but I'm sure if you really wanted to know, yeah, here they all are, uh, you could uh, look up and try to understand the syntax there. But again, out of the scope of this, and we understand how to run a job in a cron job, I think what we'll want to do is just uh, destroy that cron job so it's not constantly running. So we'll just say delete cron job hello. I'm not worried about the job one because it ran and then it stopped. So uh, that's okay there. And um, I guess that's it for jobs, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are back uh, with another follow along. And this time we're looking at replica sets. So technically we've probably been using replica sets. If we go back to our deployment file originally here, again, we are in the micro -Kates environment. I don't know if we'll ever be using Minikube or Kind now that micro -Kates works so great. But um, here it's not specifying the uh, replicas account, but generally if you were just to add a value, I think right here, like replicas, you could then say, okay, create a replica set underneath. And that's how you would create a replica. But let's go take a look at replica sets, um, Kubernetes here, and see if we can specify one manually. Now you never would do this in practice. You'd always use a deployment, but just to show you that you can do it, right? So if we go ahead, and copy the contents here of this one here, and we'll make a new one and we'll call this a new file replica set YAML. Okay, and we go ahead and paste that in there. We can kind of read it and see what's going on here. So we have some metadata. Um, so we have labels like names, like let's say name, Sinatra RC, and we'll just say Sinatra RC. And here we can say how many we want to run. And then we, I guess we need to have a selector. Um, and so I'm just trying to think here, match labels, template. Oh uh, yeah, probably they just, these probably just have to match the template like this. Okay. And then we can go to our deployment and just grab our container image here. And I think that should work. So that should launch us three pods in a replica set that are managed. Okay, so we'll type in micro K8s kubectl um, get, or sorry, uh, apply hyphen F K8s replica set YAML, and we'll see if that works. It looks like it worked no problem there. And so we'll type in micro K8s kubectl get uh, RC for replica sets, or maybe it's RS. There we go. And so here's the one that's for the deployment, right? And then here's the one for RC. So even though we never specified replicas originally here, it did set up a replica set uh, for one to one. And then here you can see the replica set or is set to, I wrote RC, I should have wrote RS. But we have the desired current and ready. So generally desired means like go back to, that's generally what you want to be running. So um, again, we don't really want to be doing it this way. So I just want to show you that you could do it that way. So we'll just say kubectl delete uh, rs and delete that replica set. And just so this is less confusing, if we ever go back to this file, we'll type in rs. I think the reason I wrote R rc because the old one was called replication controller. So at the top here, um, maybe not here, but notice here this replication controller. This was replaced with replica set, and that's probably why I wrote RC. But R, uh, RS is the new way of doing it. So now let's take a look at how we would um, 
modify this file here. So if we go over here, and we already changed to two, so I'll just save that file. And if we were to type in micro k8s uh, kubectl update, or no, sorry, apply hyphen f, because that will do a modify and update essentially. Uh, and then we'll do our deployment here. And that should update our replica set to now have two. So see the desired is two. And so if we go check our pods, we should now have a second one trying to run, and it is. Okay. All right, and so that's pretty much all I really want to cover about replica sets right now. Of course, there's more to it, um, and we will see that when we look at uh, scaling, okay. <laughs>Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are doing a follow along. And this time, it's all about scaling and also uh, using HPA, the horizontal pod auto scaler. So uh, just make sure you launch your micro K8s environment that we've been using uh, this entire time. I'm just going to type clear here. And so what we'll do is look up the scale command Kubernetes. And so I haven't been showing this uh, throughout this, but there is. Um, like a cube CTL commands reference. Let's see if we can find it here. And so this is really useful if we ever want to just kind of see examples. And so there is a scale command and then there's an auto scale command. So if we look at scale down below, set a new size of the deployment replica set, replication control, or stateful set. So you know when we did it uh, in the last, um, like the last fall with the replica sets that we, ch we changed this to replica set or replicas two? and then did apply. So this basically does the same thing, um, except it doesn't update this file, of course, our original file, but it will um, update what's in the cluster. So if we go here, we type in micro K8s kubectl scale, and then we'll go over to our reference here and take a look at how it works. Um, here we can see hyphen hyphen replicas. So we can just specify the new amount replicas and maybe we'd say four and then i'm just trying to look so i'm assuming it's going to be whatever the resource is forward slash the name so we probably type deploy or deployment and then it's going to be sinatra and so it says that it has scaled all right and so if we go take a look i don't think you can uh yeah hold on here we'll we'll go uh get deploy and see what it says here. So notice it says two out of four are ready. So it is working on deploying the rest of those. It says two out of four ready for up to date, two available. Ah, there we go. Just had to take some time. And then we'll say get pods. Right. And so we see there are four pods. And then we can go get SVC. And then from there, we could um, take a look. Oh, sorry. I wanted to look at the. Uh, uh, replica set and there's four out of four and if maybe we would just describe it for fun replica set okay and uh you can see some information here that it says replication controller under so i guess oh sorry replica set controller sorry i almost got confused with replica replication controller there so nothing super interesting here but um you know that's all great so that's scale. Uh, one thing I'd like to show you is what happens when you have an SVC that has multiple um, pods, uh, just to show you that we have all our endpoints here, okay? Because when we looked at it before, we saw one, but if we have four pods, one, two, three, four, we should see four, and we do, which is great. Uh, so we looked at scale, now let's take a look at auto scale. So if we go up here, So auto scale is going to create us um, a horizontal pod auto scaler. So let's type in HPA Kubernetes here and see if we can find an example. That's a resource. Don't see one here, one moment. Let's see if there's one in the walkthrough. So here they have a deployment and a service. So I want to show you the code. Ah, here it is. Okay. So here's an example of a horizontal pod autoscaler. So the idea is you're setting the scale target reference. 
you are saying you're targeting the deployment for it. You're setting the min replicas, the max replicas, and then you can uh, say, all right, you should scale up if the utilization exceeds whatever it is beyond 50, right? And so that's an example there. I thought I had more like a streamlined example here. I'm just gonna go double check my other computer to see what I have. And I didn't save it, but I know it's generally this, okay? So uh, this is something we can write out, but there is an easier way, which is using the auto scale. It's basically gonna just create uh, uh, this file here. Um, so what we'll do is do a cube, uh, cube CTL auto scale. So we'll go back over here. Um, and actually we didn't scale down our pod. So what we'll do is go back to our scale that we did here a moment ago. And I wanna just put this to one, okay? And then we'll go and make sure that it's scaled down. So we'll say describe deployment, um, describe deployment Sinatra. <laughs> or I guess we'll just do get because it's a bit easier to see that. Okay, so we have one and one. So now let's say we wanted to set up auto scale. So that's gonna be uh, micro K8s, cube CTL, um, auto scale, and then we'll need to figure out all the other options here. So if we scroll up, it probably shows us a very simple example. Oh yeah, the name, right? What do we want to auto scale? So we'll say deployment, uh, replica, or sorry, uh, Sinatra. And then here we'll base it off the CPU uh, percent. And then we can set our min or our max, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it to two so that it'll automatically scale up to two because it'll expect there to be at least two. And we'll hit enter. And notice that it created created an autoscaler. So um, what we can do is type in micro K8s, uh, cube CTL, HPA for horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, or I maybe get in front of it first. And so here it says unknown targets because it's still trying to figure out the targets, I suppose. Two mins, max pods, replicas. We can see that it is going to the right place. Okay, if we know that this is working, we can just go get pods and see how many pods are running. So notice there are two pods. I'm not sure why the target is unknown. I don't know if we have to have something additionally installed for it to know, or there's just, it needs to collect more information over a period of time, but we can see that this works. So it's as simple as that. Um, if we were to try to flood traffic towards those um, containers or pods, I should say, then it should spin up another one. We're not gonna do that because it is a bit complex uh, to do that and it's kind of out of scope here. Uh, and so what we'll do is just get rid of this um, HPA that we created here. Actually, before we do that, I just wanna show you the edit command, which we haven't really been using much. So if we do edit HPA Sinatra, this will open in a local editor. So it's, I think using Vim, is this Vim? Yeah, it's Vim. And it looks very similar to our definition file, but this is actually basically the definition file and active data here. So you're gonna see additional information uh, here. And so you can actually edit this, uh, like you, I could change the value here, maybe change um, the minimum to three. And I think that it will take effect, right? So I edited it. And if I go HPA, notice that the min pods is now three. So generally you don't need to edit things on the fly like that, but it is possible for you to do that. If I go over back to our pods, get pods, we should see that there is now three running. So what we'll do is go ahead and delete HPA Sinatra. Okay, and then it should go back to the right amount of pods. Let's see if it'll actually do that. I wonder if we have to scale it down. Okay, uh, and I think the reason why is because if we go to our deployment and we describe it, again, we only have one, so we don't have to specify the name. I think it has like a min and a max in here. Three desired, three updated, three total, three available. Maybe because we scaled it to three from before. I'm not, I can't remember why. So what I'm gonna do here is just scale it back down to uh, one. So we'll type in scale. Uh, deploy forward slash Sinatra. 
and we'll just say replicas equals one. And then we'll go back to our pods. And now we only have one pod. So, you know, hopefully that uh, gives you a clear idea how horizontal pod autoscalers work. Uh, they can get quite complex because there is more logic that can be implemented with uh, auto pod scalers. Uh, I don't know if we'll do a vertical pod scaler. I'm not sure if that's really that necessary. Uh, I haven't decided yet, but anyway, you can see there's a lot more fancier rules that you can uh, implement for horizontal pod scaling. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown. And in this follow along, we're gonna be taking a look at how to use config maps. So just make sure you're in micro K8 environment. And so I am in mine here. And I think I'm gonna actually need to use the K8 environment as well, because that's where we created our original uh, Docker file. We might need to do an update there. But the idea is um, config maps allow you to pass data into multiple pods. So you have consistent data across your containers. So what we're gonna do here is just type in config map Kubernetes. And we'll go here and we'll take a look here. And so here's an example of a config map. So we'll just copy the contents here. We'll go over here and we'll say uh, new file configmap.yaml. And we will go ahead, whoops, uh, reload. And we'll just paste this content in here. So this looks a bit confusing, but the idea is that you have your data and then you can have a key and a value but then you have some values that are a little bit more complex. And the reason why is that um, these will turn into like JSON or YAML file formats, not super important for the scope of what we're doing. So I'm just gonna simplify this so it's not as complicated. And what I'm gonna do here, well, we might leave actually it in because I don't think it's gonna hurt anything if we do leave it in, hold on here. And I'm just going to go ahead and just do, uh, leave it in. Maybe we can uh, view it as YAML, but I want to uh, set a message here and we'll just say, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, like, how do you say, how do you say hello in bar soon? Okay. So hello. Okay. So uh, if you don't know bar soon, bar soon is the, uh, Mars books. I think it's bar soon. That's how you pronounce it. And so we'll say bar soon. And that's basically saying like, hello, Mars. Okay. Um, and so the idea is that we will update our original file to consume that environment variable. So if um, we'll say like hello message maybe is a better name here. And actually just to make things a bit easier for me so I don't have to kind of guess what it is, I'm just gonna type it in all caps, hello message. And so what we'll do is go back to our original K environment and this is where, yeah, we created our app. And so in our Ruby app, what we can do is do something slightly different. I'm gonna do env, um, oops, single quotations here, it's being a little bit silly. And so if there is an environment variable, it will use that. Otherwise, use hello world. I'm gonna just put an extra exclamation mark here so that we know that it is working. And so that shouldn't cause any issues. So we'll double check, make sure this works. We'll cd into that directory here. We'll do a bundle uh, install, shouldn't, shouldn't need to, but we'll just do it for fun. Um, Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, could not find bundler. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, RVM list. So RVM used uh, 3.1.0. Remember I couldn't default it before. I just didn't want to look it up because I figured we weren't going to be going back here too often. And now we'll do a bundle install, make sure everything's fine. And then I'll do bundle exec Ruby Sinatra just to make sure that it, it or sorry, uh, server just to make sure that it's working correctly. And then on a new tab here, I'm just gonna make a new file tab here. I think this is running on port 8080. Yes, so we'll just do a curl, whoops. That's a file, I want a terminal. We'll do a curl localhost 8080 and it says hello world with the double exclamation mark, okay? Now, if we were to pass an environment variable, we'll just double check to make sure that works. So what we can do is go to the front of it and type in hello message equals uh, new message, okay, maybe double quotations here. I'm not sure if it'll take double or singles. And we'll go back over here and we will hit up, make sure that our app works. It's not taking it one second here. Uh, maybe we don't need the semicolon. Maybe we'll just take that out like that. There we go. All right, so 
it is accepting um, environment variables. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, repackage that Docker file. So I think we might have wrote it in here. No, we did not. It just came with it. And so I'm going to write um, bundle Docker, <laughs> or sorry, Docker build hyphen T, or sorry, period hyphen T. Um, we called it Sinatra. I, yeah, I don't exactly remember. So what I'm going to do is just go over to the console here, open a new tab. And we'll go over and go grab it from ECR, just because if I make a typo here, it's always a big pain to fix. So we'll go to our container registry here. And we will go into our app here. We'll view the push commands. We'll take a look here. And this is the one I want. So that way I'm not making any mistake, OK? And I'll make sure I'm in the K8 environment here. And we'll go ahead and just erase that out there, hit Enter. And that's going to build that new one. And then what we can do is then copy these next lines here and have a really easy time. So go ahead and paste that in. And we'll go ahead and paste this in. OK, and so now we have our your authorization tire has uh, expired. That is totally fine. If that happens, we just go back to the top here and we paste that on in. OK, I'm going to hit up, up to go to the last one there. And now it's just pushing the, the updated version there. So now that that's all updated, what I want to do here is I want to double check my deployment file and see if it's set to always. Yeah, always pull the public image. And so what we can do, and again, we're back in the micro K8s. We're going to go ahead and just delete our deployment. So we'll say micro K8s, um, kubectl, delete, deploy, Sinatra. And then what we'll do is say kubectl, um, apply, hyphen F, K8s. Uh, deployment. And so that should pull the latest image. It didn't seem like it did, though. Usually it would say like downloading or something. Maybe it is pulling it. Um, but what we'll do here is just uh, get our pods and wait for it to run. So maybe it is pulling because it is taking some time. So let's say describe deployment, see what's happening. I don't know if we can see the, the images here, Docker images. No, it doesn't show them. OK. Um, also, maybe this has changed. So that's something that we should just double check. OK, so if I go into here. Oh, yeah, that's way different. <laughs> OK, so what we'll have to do is just paste that on in there. Does that say latest? It doesn't say latest. Maybe we just click into the latest there. Yeah, OK, so it should take it. I just want to double check to make sure. I think because like that was a very particular version, and I, I didn't click into that. We paste that in there. Yeah, it is the same thing. So um, I mean, we should be in good shape. So let's just double check here and say get pods. I just can't believe it pulled that fast, right? Like I figured we would see like a message like pulling the image or something. Um, so the way we're going to know is if we uh, kind of expose this and take a look here. Do we still have our ingress controller running? Ingress? Oh, we do. Nice. OK, so if that's the case, then what I'm going to do here is just do um, uh, curl local host forward slash Sinatra. Ah, and we have our double exclamation mark. So it is definitely uh, using the latest image. So now we are set up. And so the idea with our config map is we're going to create this. And then we want to get this message to show up here. Um, this will just be like config map data here. Name that there. And so what we'll do is type in um, micro K8s, kubectl, apply, hyphen f, K8s, config map. We'll say, OK, so that created that config map there. And um, I'm just looking off screen here because I want to see if there's a way we can visualize it as a YAML file. Um, I'm just looking here. Yeah, there's like a way like output. So uh, what we can do is type in cube CTL get config map to, to look at it for a moment here. Oh, maybe we should say oh, micro K it's in front here. OK, and so we have this one, which is the certification root thing, and then we have config map. So we'll say get config map config map. Maybe not a great name for it. She probably called it Sinatra, but whatever. And so um, that doesn't tell us much, but if we go hyphen O YAML. 
Now it shows us in the format of a YAML file. So we can kind of look at that data and see what it looks like. So we have hello world equals that, game properties equals this. Kind of see what the structure is, I suppose. I'm not sure if there's like a nicer way to look at it. I'm just double checking here. No, that's pretty much it. Okay, so now that we have that, we need to now associate that to our pod or a deployment. So if you deployed a pod, you could specify it there, but we're doing it through our deployment. And so we can either mount it as a volume or we can pass it along as environment variables. And so I think what we wanna do is do nvar here. So we'll go over back to our uh, reference file here and we'll just say nvar. And I'm just off screen here, but with like this one, because I know I've seen it somewhere here. Environment variables. Maybe it's in this ultimate guide here to config maps. Because there's one where you can map. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. N N N E N V from. Okay. So you think they'd have that in the main docs? <laughs> It's always a lot of work to figure stuff out here. So what we'll do is go back to our deployment. And so this one is showing with a pod, but I'm gonna assume that I can do that with a deployment because why not? And so I think it would probably go in line here. Oh, we have ENV up here. So we could say ENV from, see, I don't think we need to set this. Yeah, so like here we could probably override it first. Let's just do this as a test before we bring in our config map. And so we'll just say, um, Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye moon, okay? And then what we'll do is do an apply. Before we do our config map, we'll just see if this works. Uh, deployment, K8 deployment, great. And then we will just want to do our curl here to see if it would take it. Uh, and it didn't take it, hello message. I'm just wondering here. I'm just looking at our server file here. Yeah, it's called hello message. So it should load that instead. All right, so well, that's totally fine. What I'm gonna do here is I'm still going to specify um, N N N nvar or nfrom. And I think the reason why I see this as confusing is because it's indented here, but it's actually on the same line here. So this didn't work, but we will just delete this out. Or actually, we'll just change this to nfrom. And then we need to figure out how to map it. So we'll say config map ref colon space space name example, or sorry, whatever the config map is called. So it's called config map. And so I think that's how we sh should be able to map it. Again, I'm just trying this. I haven't done it before. So I'm just hoping that it works first time. And what we'll do here, let's go ahead and do a deploy here and we'll see if we get an error. So, um, and from unknown field called name. All right, so that didn't work as expected. So we'll have to go here and look up some stuff. So config map for deployment, Kubernetes. So this again, this one's for pod. That is frustrating. <laughs> it should it should be able to go in here. It just says name though. Oh, did maybe I put a hyphen in front of it? So I made an array and that messed it up. Which by the way, um, no, actually the other the other resource was fine. No, I did it correctly. Let's just make sure that we've done this right. I'm just copying off screen the contents here, making sure I typed it right. Looks right to me. Just double check here, we'll paste it in. Paste. Um, making sure I'm getting the indentation correct here. Yeah, that's indented. And we'll try one more time. Maybe, maybe it's too far indented there. There we go. And so we'll try this again. Okay, so it says unknown field name V1 ENV, EMV from source if you choose to ignore these errors. Hmm. Unknown field. Okay, so I'll be back here in a second and figure out what's wrong, okay? 
All right, so uh, staring at it for a little while here, I think that the issue is that this needs to be indented, so we'll try that first. Because I just found a Stack Overflow that just said, hey, your indentation's wrong. And they have an example here where this shows more indented from this one, and this one is more indented from that one. So uh, we'll just do both of that. So this one from, from the E, that's where we have to look. Maybe we'll just do that as a sanity. Check. Ah, there we go. So it looks like it has now been configured. So, oh, but it's the wrong name. <laughs> so we'll have to type in config map because that's not going to work if we do that. Okay, we'll try this again. And so it says now it's now configured. So we'll go back to our deployment here and just see if there's anything observable that's interesting here. So you say describe deployment. Since there's only one, it's going to select the first one. I know I said that a hundred times, but just so you know. And here it says um, environment variables from config map, config map, optional false. I'm not sure what the optional false is, but it looks like it must be associated. And so I'm just hoping that if we do a uh, local host, it's going to work. Now, I don't know if we have to restart the pods or if it would restart the pods. So I'm just looking here. So 12 seconds ago, scale down, scale up. So I think it did turn off and turn back on the pods. So if we go here and do our um, curl local host Sinatra, I'm hoping that it will show Barsoon. Oh, it does, there we go. So for whatever reason, when we set an environment variable, it didn't work. Maybe it was indentation or something, but here it's definitely accepting the environment variable uh, for a configuration set there. So that is really nice. Now there's another way to uh, use or to, to pass them along and that's by mounting it as a volume, which is kind of interesting. Let's see if we can do that really quickly here. So uh, volume. Okay, and so what you can do is specify a volume mount. And this is on a pod. I assume it works the same way. You just have it with the containers. And then we specify a volume. So I think what we would need is a volume mount here. I don't know if that would be enough for it to work. So go back to our micro K8s here and we'll just scroll on down here, hit enter, paste that on in and making sure that is right. We it didn't grab it all, did it? Oh, it's right here, okay. And so I think that it would need to be the same level indentation here. And so we'll indent here and we'll, uh, now that indentation's fine. And so we have name config, which seems fine. Uh, we'll just type in config map. We'll go to config. Actually, I think we would have to associate. So we have a, a volume mount and then we'd have to actually have the volume to associate with. So we'll have to go back to here and then the, this is the volume. So we'll go and go here and then paste that on in. And here it looks like it's just doing it in line. So set the volumes at the pod level, then mount into the containers inside the pod, provide the name of the config map you want to route, an array of keys from the uh, config map to create as files. Oh, okay, cool. So now going back to this, it kind of makes sense that when you have this, this would be isolate files, and we have all those in there for our example, so we can give that a go. Uh, in terms of indentation level, we need to figure that out. So this one is at the same level as containers. So we will go up here and hit back and follow the line. So it has to be here. There, okay. And we'll go down. And I think that's okay. Sometimes like when it's like this, you have to have it the same line. The indentation's kind of weird. And so it says here, so this one's called config map, an array of items, array of keys from the config map to create as files. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna comment out our old one here. So I kinda wanna leave it in just in case we want to pull it back up. I'm just gonna put image, right? I'll put a name at the top here. Okay. And then I'll just comment this out. And then I'm gonna go over to our config map. Well, we'd have to update our config map for this to work. So what I'm gonna do here is go exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And then what I want to do here is um, yeah, this all looks fine. So I don't know if this is gonna work because we don't have, we didn't specify this as a file. So this says an array of keys from the config map to create as files. So I'm gonna assume that it's gonna default back to hello world, okay? So now that we have this and assuming we had got this all right, 
Um, we'll go ahead and deploy this and see what happens. So we'll type in micro K8s cube CTL apply hyphen F K8s and um, deployment.yaml. And so that's going to update it. And then we will do our curl. It still, it still says um, Karor Barsoon because of course we did not push this. So that's why that's not updated. And I don't know if it would actually restart the pods for that if it mounted the volumes or maybe it's still doing it. So let's go and look at what it's doing. So we'll describe it. And here it says, nothing fancy. I'm just taking a look here. Ah, so it does mount to config, which is great. And we have config map here. Okay. And so I don't think it's um, the other original config map I don't believe is there anymore. So it shouldn't be saying that. So I'm guessing that it didn't restart the pods. Let's just try again. Oh, there we go. So it probably was just shutting down the pods, right? So it restarted. So it definitely is uh, loading the other one and it doesn't have that environment variable. So now what I'd like to do is see if we can get into this uh, machine and be able to um, view that mounted directory. So we'll look it up like uh, Kubernetes pod SSH. All right, and it's not SSH, it's more like, it's like execute here. So this is the line that we want execute we look over here, you can see what it does. So execute, execute a command in a container. And so the command that we're executing is saying, uh, get us into the actual instance here. And I'm assuming shell demo needs to be a particular container. I'll just double check here. So verify the container is running. So get pod shell demo, get a shell to the running container. So uh, probably one of the running containers, which will be Sinatra here. So go ahead and paste that in and we'll just swap this out for Sinatra. And it was refused because we didn't have micro K8s in the front as per usual. And I didn't type it right probably. So we will, oh, and I'm in the wrong environment. That's why. So just be careful about this one. And I don't need this anymore because we've already updated uh, that. And so we'll paste that on in here. Whoops. We'll type in micro K8s. Uh, says Sinatra pod not found. Maybe we called it Sinatra example or something. So we'll say micro K8s, kubectl, get pods. Okay, yeah, they're very, uh, they're very unique. Okay, so then we'll have to actually give it the pod name here, right? And so now that we're here, we'll do ls and we'll go to cd to the root and we have a config directory. We'll go inside of there and notice we have game.properties, user interface.properties. So if we really did want hello world to be propagated over there, we would have to write in um, that file, you know, hello world, and then it's path, okay? And if we go into game properties, is that, oh, that's a file. So we can go cat game properties and see its content. And so there we can see the files. So yeah, that's pretty much config map, uh, two different ways to access it, very uh, cool. Um, and yeah, that's it. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at secrets. So we did config map, which uh, are uh, completely not encrypted in any way whatsoever. And so secrets is a great way for us to pass our sensitive information into our pods or containers. Uh, so what we'll do is pull up the Kubernetes secrets. Now, by default, by default, uh, they're stored in unencrypted API, API. So in order to do that, we'd have to enable encryption at rest for secrets, RBAC rules, all these other things. I'm not sure what we'd have to do for that. I mean, like for the KCNA, it's a bit out of scope, but let's just take a look at micro K, uh, KDS and type in status and see if, um, if there is any kind of like extension just to turn that stuff on to configure it. Micro K8S status, micro K8S. Am I crazy today? Am I not typing it right? Oh, you know what? It's because I didn't type exit. I was still in, um, and uh, in our pod from before. So micro K8S status. I'm just curious what we can see here in terms of options. So we don't have RBAC turned on, so I'm not sure if I'll have to turn it on to use it, but there's RBAC. And I don't see anything in particular for secret. So, you know, there might be some things we need to configure, but 
Uh, I don't particularly care if they're secured. I just want to uh, go through the motions with you to see how it would be done. So there are different types of secrets that you can set. So opay is what generally is for user-defined stuff. And then we have a variety of other ones here. I would imagine that maybe the encryption is different or something. I'm not really sure. Um, but, you know, we'll go through the motions of setting up our own secret. So it's very similar to doing a config map. So uh, here's an example of some data. So we'll go ahead and grab this secret here and make our way back here. And we'll create a new file called secret.yaml. You can also ingest them from a file. So even though we are placing uh, the data right in here, you can include additional key value pairs. Uh, okay, so you can pass the data in just like that. Um, say like username, password, Andrew Brown, testing one, two, three. And notice here it says service account token. So if we go back here and we look at the types, we can change it. So maybe basic auth would usually have a username and password. Okay, so we'll go ahead and paste that on in here. And then there's annotations for the service account name. That's with role-based access controls. I don't know if we need this right now. Uh, I have a feeling that we probably do, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete it out and see what happens. So we'll just say basic auth say Sinatra basic auth as the metadata name. And so we'll see if we can actually uh, create this here. So we'll type in micro K8S kubectl apply hyphen F uh, K8S secret, okay? So it says error when creating secret in version one uh, cannot be handled as a secret illegal base64 data as the input. Okay, so I guess it expects us to do something with it. So we'll take a look here. Um, oh, they actually have an example right here. Oh, string data. Okay, so we'll change this over here. So I guess it's gonna vary based on what you're doing. So this is data. This one says string data, because that's technically what it is. I guess if it was base64, we'd have to just encode it, but we'll go switch that over like that. Hit enter, and it created it. So now we can type in micro K8. S, kubectl, uh, get secret, secrets, micro, there we go. Um, maybe we get some details, so let's say uh, describe secrets Sinatra basic auth. All right, and so notice that we cannot see the contents of it, so it's 10 bytes and 11 bytes. Um, so we didn't go through all those motions of setting up these other things. So I'm just hoping micro K8s did it for us. Cause I don't know if like we didn't set up secrets as it said uh, above here with all these options, if it would show plain or show just in bytes, but at least it looks like it's obscuring from us. So that's really great. Um, if we want to go fetch that secret, that's a good question. So we'll go back here and see if it allows us or shows us how to fetch that data. It is not we can edit it using secrets. I just want to see how we can see it. Okay, so I know, uh, let's see, this is secrets. And th this is on Kubernetes as well. This is managing secrets using a configuration file. I'm just looking for the kubectl command so we can view it. So we scroll on down here. So verify, decode. Ah, so maybe that's what we want. So kubectl get secret. Mm. Yeah, this one shows bytes. Oh, did they do something similar to us, like basic auth? Well, let's give a go and see what happens if we run this, but this we're not following this tutorial, so I can't expect this to work the same way, but we will try for fun. And we will say here uh, the proper name, which is this, paste that in. And we'll type in micro K8S. micro k8s oh it does okay great so that did work so we have this output json pass so i guess what we're saying is get the secret and then we specified get us the data even though it's a string data i think it's just saying like the data is being inputted as a string but we want to grab the data and so that is one way for us to access our data using kubectl but how do you get it within a pod that's the question so it's no different than what we were doing we can i think we can mount it as a volume i think we can do that so we go over here, um, back over to this, and we say volume. I know we can do it with a volume. Whoops. Volume. 
as a file value mounted. So it's going to be the same process as we did with config map, as you can see here. So nothing super exciting. We're not going to go through all that, but we will look at how to do it for um, uh, just how, like we did the environment variable. So we can do a secret. Um, what's the one we set that we commented out up here? Config map ref. It would be like secret ref. Secret ref. Yes. So if we wanted to do it, uh, like pass it this way here, we could do secret ref here. And if we wanted to update this, maybe we could try like hello, uh, hello message. Let's say like secret message. I don't know if this will work, but we'll try it for fun. And I'm going to go here and type in clear, and then we will go ahead and apply this if we can find it here. And so now we'll make sure that we actually have that data. Yeah, it is here. So notice that it is uh, encrypted. And so I'm hoping that we can just pull that information out. So this is just called secret base basic auth, even though basic auth would only be using a password, that's totally fine. I don't care. Um, just copying that, paste that in there. That looks okay. And so what we'll do is we will update, apply F, we'll update our deployment and see if that takes. And I got to type kubectl in there. Okay. And then we need to wait for our containers to, or pods to spin down and spin back up. And by the way, as we've been doing all this, we actually haven't been using the um, dashboard, which surprised we haven't been. Uh, it might be fun to go take a look at that. Just because uh, we've been adding all these things and we haven't uh, used it at all. So I think the easiest way is to go to the homepage here, go to Linux, scroll on down, go to Micro 8's uh, proxy, dashboard proxy. And I'm going to make a new tab, terminal here tab. Hit enter. And this is the token we want. So I want to go and find the EC2 instance and get its IP address because I don't know what it is. And here it is. So we'll go ahead and grab that. We will override this one and I need the IP address here. So we'll go grab the or, uh, port number there. And it says, uh, cannot find the request, HTTP colon. Hmm. 10443. Client sent HTTP request to an HTTPS server. Yeah, okay. It should be colon. Oh, sorry. We'll just put the S in and then we'll advance because we don't have a certificate attached. And then we need the token. So we'll go back here. Hopefully we've grabbed it in time. I don't know if it's going like to expire or something. And we'll sign in. And now it's just fun to kind of look at this. So we had a config map here below. You can see it was created over here. Um, can we edit these in place? Oh, that's cool. So yeah, if we wanted to just edit this, that'd be really cool to do. Um, we don't have any persistent volume claims. Do we have, or we have our ingress service, just poking around for fun here. We'll look at our uh, deployments. So I'm, what I'm curious about is like, did our pods change? So available, progressing, new replica set available. So nothing super new here. This happened a minute ago. So I think it did happen one minute ago. It did replace our, um, our pods there. So that means that we should be uh, okay to do a curl local host and do Sinatra. Ah, and there we go. So it worked. Um, so yeah, that's secrets. Okay, so there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are doing another follow along. And this time we're dealing with volumes and, and specifically with uh, persistent volumes. So uh, we have our two environments and we're gonna use our micro uh, environment here. And so what I want you to do is make your way back over to uh, here. And within um, micro k uh, we need to enable storage. So if we type in micro k uh, status, um, there is an option to uh, have a storage here. And so all this storage thing does is um i'm just trying to find it here here it is so it will create us a storage class uh and the reason why we're doing this is because when you usually have a storage class you generally are 
uh, linking to something external. So it could be like um, AWS EBS or Azure Disk or something like that. And just to make this easy for development, uh, Microcades has this storage class that is locally on the machine. Uh, so we're not gonna learn how to create a storage class because it's gonna create one for us, but we are gonna use it. Uh, and it's just gonna make learning um, persistent volumes and persistent volume claims a lot easier. So we'll type in micro K8s uh, and we'll type in enable and then storage and that will enable our storage. So it's just gonna go ahead and create us a storage class there. Okay, and so here it says it created an RBC authorization. So a cluster role, cluster role binding, service account, storage class, stuff like that. It says it'll be available soon. So now what we'll do is type in uh, kubectl and uh, we'll say get um, maybe sc for storage classes. Yep, there it is. And so this is the name, it's called micro k8 host path. And so the idea is that on this node, uh, we will have um, our volume or our, our something mounted to our directory here, okay? And so now that uh, we have that out of the way, I'm just pulling up the instructions I wrote earlier. And so what we'll need to do is create a persistent, uh, persistent volume. So a persistent volume is basically, uh, it's saying, okay, this is the volume and it uses this type of storage class, all right? And so that's what we're gonna be doing there. And ignore my stream deck. I really hate how it always pops up, but I'm just gonna uh, say, remind me later. Okay, I usually don't get pop-ups in my, in my videos, but there's one there. So what we'll do is go and type in persistent volume and see if we can just pull some code from the Kubernetes website to start with, okay? So we'll just load that up here and I'll just scroll on down and I'm just looking for persistent volume. Example of persistent volume. So we have, a, uh, here's one, okay. So what we'll do is just basically kind of grab this one. This is clearly not enough. Uh, but I do have my code off screen here that we will uh, bring in here to make it a bit easier. And so I'm gonna make a new file here and we're gonna call this pv.yaml. All right, and then we'll go ahead and paste that on in there. And uh, so we'll just take a look at what we have. So uh, the first thing is we'll need metadata. I'm gonna call this uh, my PV. I really don't like when people type foo. And we're gonna apply labels type local. I don't know if we need to have the label there, but that's the example that they are using uh, for micro K8. So if we typed in micro K8 um, storage, they might show an example there. Let's see if there's an example here. Uh, no, uh, but we might type, type in like tutorial. Mm, it's the same page here. And it could be this one. No, but that's okay. Like I just have it off screen. I just like to show you where I'm grabbing the code from. So you get very good at Googling too, because really with Kubernetes, you have to spend a lot of time looking for stuff because the main docs is always uh, kind of uh, not that great. So the storage class name is gonna be the storage class that we want it to be. So this is gonna be micro K8s. So I'm gonna copy and paste it so I don't uh, type it wrong here. And so we have kubectlsc and we'll go grab its name from down below and paste it in the storage class here. And then we need to specify the capacity. So how much we're going to reserve of space for this. And so I'm gonna do capacity storage, and we'll say one gigabyte, okay? Making sure I spell capacity right. And then we might wanna specify our access mode. So the access mode is like, can you read and or write, okay? And make sure you set those to two spaces over there. Um, and so we'll say access modes. And I think this is an array, so we'll do hyphen there. We'll say read, write once. Um, claim reference, we don't need that. Um, but what we do need is to set the host path. And so we're gonna actually say for this um, storage volume, where is it going to be accessible on our node or our local machine here? And so I'm gonna say mount data. And so that means uh, not within uh, the pod, but here in our, our developer environment, our virtual machine on the forward slash mount data, that is what will be will be shared to our uh, pods, okay? So this looks okay to me, uh, but I did type a lot by hand, so hopefully it is all correct. And so what we'll do is go ahead and deploy this, okay? And so we'll type in K8s, PV, YAML, and it's created our volume there. And so what I'll do is go ahead 
and we will uh, go view the contents of it. So we'll say cube CTL uh, PV, or sorry, uh, get PV. I got to spell it right. Okay, so what we see is the name, the capacity, the access mode, uh, whether to retain it, is it available? But notice there is no claim. So technically it's not linked to anything right now. Uh, and so that will be what we'll do next with the PVC, the persistent volume claim. Let's get a bit more of a description here to see if there's anything interesting. Um, and so we'll just expand that up. And it's pretty much, you know, same information, nothing super exciting. So now what we need is a persistent volume claim. Okay. And so what we'll do is just go back over here and see if we have an example. And there is one. So what we'll do is go back over here and say new file. We'll say pvc.yaml. And we'll go ahead and paste that. And we need our metadata. I'm going to call this my PVC. Uh, we don't care about namespace. We'll put in the default here. And we do need to specify a storage class. So that one will be the same as the other one. So I'll just go over here. Okay. And we'll paste that on in there. And we'll delete that. And then we need to specify the resources. I don't care about the volume name. We don't have to write that in there. It will just set it to my PVC, I think. And so we'll say resources and we'll tab in, we'll say requests. And then we'll say storage. So we're saying how much we want to request. So I'm going to set it the same value. And this is not going to work because if this is one gigabytes and this is one gigabytes, it's just taking up too much of the space. And you have to be less than that. But I just want to show you what happens if we match it one to one. OK, so what we'll do is type in clear. And I'm going to do cube CTL uh, apply hyphen uh, F. And then we'll specify K8 uh, PVC YAML. And notice this is my PVC is invalid access mode required at least one access mode. So maybe my indentation is the wrong levels or I deleted it out. Oh, no, I didn't even specify it. So we'll go here. These darn spaces. Um, two. <laughs> maybe this little cog will let me set it. Nope. Nope. I just don't feel like looking it up. Okay. So we'll go here and type in storage class name, colon, and then, oops, no, 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 no. We already have that. What we want is our access modes. And it's going to be the same thing because what it's trying to do is say, uh, um, uh, PVC is saying like, tell me what you want. Like, this is what we want. And then the PV, uh, the persistent volume is this is what we have. And if, and if it matches up, then they will uh, match up via a claim, okay? So we'll go here and paste that in. And I'll go back and hit up. And so it created the PVC. And so now what we'll do is type in kubectl uh, get PVC. Um, I'm going to type that right. There we go. And so it says status is bound. And we'll type in PV. And it's bound and it's claimed. OK, so it did match up. So I don't know. When I was doing this and I had it the, the wrong size, or one one to one, it didn't work. But I guess like if we were to set this to be like two, then I would expect this not to work. So let's just go and change that to do. Because clearly that's too large, right? And here it says forbidden only dynamically provisioned PVCs can be resized. Okay, well, we don't really want to resize it. So what we'll do is delete it first. So we'll say cube CTL um, delete PVC my PVC. Okay, we'll type in clear. We'll go take a look at the PVC, make sure there's nothing claimed. Not sure how it's claimed when it's not there anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just delete the PV here. And we'll just run them again, okay? Okay, so we'll type clear. And then I'm just going to hit up because I want to run uh, PV. And then I want to see that it is not claimed. And then what we'll do is do PVC. OK, and then we'll go back to get PV. I'm just going to stretch this a bit larger here. Clear. 
And uh, notice here, I don't know why it's so hard to read. I don't remember seeing this many columns here, but we have the name. I'm just gonna try to expand this a bit more and run this again. Maybe I'll just bump down the font here to make it a little bit easier because I can't see what's going on here with this font this big. So go back to our terminal here. Terminal, 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 where are you? There we go. And we'll just bump this down a little bit. So there we go. That's a lot more manageable. So here we can see my PV and this one is not claimed. And um, it's I guess it's showing up the PVC that we have here. But notice that it's not matching up because it's it's too large, right? So what I'll do here is I'll change this back to one. And I'm gonna see if I can actually change it. I know it said like before we can't resize it, but maybe we can if it's not claimed yet. And so we'll run that. Field cannot be less than the previous value. So notice here, okay, so I guess you can expand it, but not shrink it. So that's fine. So what we'll do is just go ahead and kubectl um, delete PVC. We'll say my PVC and we'll type clear. Okay, and so now what we'll do is we will go and then run it again. And actually, before we do that, I just want to shrink it so it's smaller. I'll say 200 megabytes. There we go. And then we'll go back there. Just trying to figure out the bounds of this stuff. So it's claimed, it's bound. Um, so now the only thing that we need to do is we need to actually have a deployment that has a volume attached. So what we'll do is go back to the Kubernetes page here and see if it actually shows an example with the deploy. I think it shows like with a pod maybe here. Keep scrolling down here. Yeah, and so this is pretty much it. So it says pod, but we can do this with a deploy. And so what we're gonna do is go back over here to our deploy up here. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. So I'm just gonna go copy the contents here, make a new file and call this deployment with um, PV or storage. And we'll paste that. And we do have some old stuff here that I do not want. So first we will delete uh, and make sure you put the YAML part on the end of it or it's not gonna work properly. It's not for coloring. So obviously we've done a volume mount with um, a config map, but here we have Sinatra. So I'm gonna say Sinatra with volume or storage. Okay. And we're just gonna keep up with that, maybe just say PV, like with PV. Just try not to type a hundred things here. Oh, we have our container name. Sure, we'll just update that as well. And this all looks fine. We don't need environment variables. Ports are fine, the readiness probe is fine. So that's what we would have if we had our minimal one for before. And so what we need to do is make it so that we attach a volume to it. So we'll go back over to here and notice that we need to do a volume mount. So we'll go ahead and copy paste that in. That needs to be aligned with the name image within the containers. The indentation is a little bit tricky, but we'll figure it out. So I'll go ahead and paste that on in there. And we'll just fix our indentation. I'm noticing this is all four spaces. Okay, and so this should be, I would say like that, that looks okay to me. And then what we need is the volumes part. So we'll copy that. That's gonna be aligned with containers. And we probably can just paste it even above to make our lives a bit easier. Okay, and so we have the, we gotta see what we need to match this up with. So for the volumes part, we'll give it a name like my PVC. And then what we're putting here is my PVC. So we're matching what volume claim we want to be attached or like associated with this actual um, pod. Okay, and then under the container itself, this is what we want to define as the mounting directory. So I'm gonna just call this mount uh, local 
data here. And then uh, underneath here, we just want the name. So I'm going to say my PVC. All right. And so uh, this should be the mount directory on the actual uh, container. OK. And so now what we'll do is go ahead and deploy that. So I'll type in kubectl um, apply f deployment or k8s deployment with storage. And I got to spell kubectl correctly. And so that's deployed. And so what we'll do is just type in clear. And then I'll just say um, kubectl get pods. So we can see all of our pods. And then I want to describe the one with storage. Notice that we have two of them. Maybe we had replicas on two here. Yeah, we do. And so I only want a one. So I'm going to scale that down so I don't have to deal with uh, two. Or actually, we can just probably apply it. To set up there, update the value there. Get pods. There we go. And we'll just wait for that to connect. While it's waiting, we can just go ahead and describe it. Um, so this will be for the deploy. Or we can describe the pod as well. Um, we'll describe the deploy first. No, no, we'll do pod. We'll do pod, and then we'll just copy the name here. And just see like what kind of volume information we can see, if any. Um, so it says, persistent volume claim, my PVC not found. So that's an error, and that's why it's not proceeding forward. So we must have spelled something incorrectly. Uh, so we'll go back over here to my or our PVC here, and it says, my PVC. So that seems like that should be the name. We'll type in kubectl get pvc. And there it is, my pvc. Persisting volume claim not found. Hmm. Well, let me just take a look at my instructions. Well, it looks like it's totally fine. Let's just hit up and see if anything's changed. No, it still can't find that volume. So let's take a look at the uh, PVC volume itself and describe it and see if there's any issues. So it has a volume, it is bound. Hmm. And we'll go PV. And that looks okay as well. So all I can think of is there's something wrong with my script here. So I'll be back here in a moment and just compare my uh, my old script with this one, okay? All right, I'm back. And so I just carefully stared and I can see what the problem is. This is MV and it should be MY. So that's probably what our problem was. And so what we'll do is just type clear and redeploy that. And hopefully it takes effect, good. And then we'll hit up until we can get to our pod. The pod's gonna have a different name. So we'll have to go get PVC or sorry, get pod. And then from there, we still have two. One is running, one is probably gonna stop. And if there's two deployments, I'm just gonna double check here. Nope, we only have one. There we go. And so I'm just gonna grab that pod name and we'll just say kubectl get pod here. And we'll just describe it, make sure there are no issues. Well, <laughs> Got to type it in the right place. We can't do get describe. That makes no sense. Okay, and so here we can see um, there are no issues. I'm just trying to see if there is the claim. Here it is. Read only, false, persistent volume. So it's all in good shape. So that's good to see. Let's go take a look at what it looks like for the actual um, deploy. So we'll say deploy, and it's called Sinatra with storage. And there we can see the volume claim information again. Okay, so now the next question is, can we see if our volume is actually working? So what we'll do is we'll go to that directory. So I told you it was local here, mount data. Remember this? If we go back to our PV here, we specified it's here. So we actually have a mount a data directory there and I can just make a new file. So I'll say touch and we'll just say hello.txt. 
and we'll do a sudo on that because it just doesn't like it if we don't do sudo. So now that we created the file, what we should do is SSH, or I guess um, I say SSH, but we're actually just remotely connecting to the shell. So we'll type in cube uh, uh, execute hyphen IT, and then we need the name of a container, and then we'll have to have bin bash. Notice before we did like SH, we probably do SH as well. It's basically the same thing. Um, in a new tab, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab uh, the pod name. So we'll say cube CTL get pods. And that is the name of our pod. Just double checking there. Yep. And then we'll go ahead and paste that in here. Oh, sorry, cube CTL. And so we're within our actual container now. And so we mounted this at mount, it's being kind of silly here. We mounted this at mount M8, M8, MNT local data. So I'm just gonna do LS on here. I don't I don't know why this uh, this is kind of being a bit glitchy here. If you notice I'm typing, it's kind of going weird. So I'll have to type it out by hand, no problem. And notice we have hello TXT and that's within our container. So that's pretty much all we need to know for our persistent volumes. I'm not gonna clean this stuff up. I think it's totally fine. It's not gonna eat up a lot of our resources here. Uh, but yeah, that's it for storage. So just note that you always have to have a persistent volume claim um, in order to attach a volume. There there might be an edge case where you can attach a pers persistent volume to like static resources with a persistent volume claim, but you always have to have a PVC with a PV with a storage class, okay? <music> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, we're gonna be taking a look at net policy. So again, I want you to launch your micro K8 environment that we set up earlier in the course. And what we're gonna do here is just type in clear and um, get started here. So in order for us to use net policies, we're gonna to have to have some kind of CNI, so um, uh, CNI plugin, right? And so there's a variety of different kinds, but for kubectl, they don't have a whole lot of options. We just have of Cilium, so I'm not sure if that's the proper way to pronounce it, but that's how I'm gonna pronounce it here. We're gonna type in kubectl status, or sorry, micro K8 status. And give it a moment here to load. And so there might be other options here, but the only one that I recognize here is called Cilium or Cilium. And so that's gonna allow us to have uh, full network policies, all right? So we'll go down below here and we're just going to type in micro K8s enable and then uh, put in Cilium. And then once that's in there, what we're going to need, this <laughs> is taking a second here, uh, what we're going to need is to have some namespaces. So with network policies, we can um, isolate based on, or like control traffic based at the pod level or at the namespace level. Um, I'm gonna do it at the namespace level for this example, because we don't need to go too super deep into net policies. We just need to get something working and I'll just pull up while that's going, we'll type in net policies, Kubernetes and see what the documentation gives us. All right, and so here we are. If we just scroll on down. So here is a general network policy. Ours is gonna be a lot simpler than this. This has ingress and egress and uh, it's quite, quite fancy. Um, so what we'll do is go back here and see if it's ready. It's not yet, but um, I already kind of know what we need to do. So. What we'll do is we will create three different namespaces and we'll launch um, a server or a, a, um, a deployment into each of them. And the idea is that we'll have uh, one namespace that we'll try to talk to and one will um, uh, be blocked and one will not be, okay? So what we'll do is create our namespaces. So we'll type in kubectl uh, ns for short for namespace. You can type namespace if you want, but ns and we'll have one called fire. And um, Oh, sorry, create. And then we'll have fire, ice, and wind. And so those will be our three namespaces that we'll be using. Then we'll have to launch some uh, pods. I don't feel like launching our Sinatra app, so I'm just going to deploy um, Nginx. All right, and so we'll just put the image in here and say Nginx, and we'll make sure the namespace is uh, for fire. And so we'll hit up here, and then what we'll do one is for ice. And then we'll do one for wind. Okay, and so now we should have all our pods. So we'll just type in cube, CTL, get pods and ice wide. 
hit up again. Um, no resources found in the ice namespace. What if I just type in pods here? Huh. I guess the deploys are still happening. Let's just get deploys. Maybe just without the there. Okay, and so we see that they're ready, but they're not doing anything here. So I wonder if we've like used up all of our resources on the machine. So what we'll do is get deploy. We'll say describe deploy hyphen and ice. And we'll say ice engine X and we'll see what it's complaining about. There's no errors, so maybe it's just taking time. I mean, we are doing all this stuff over here, so I'm not sure if that was uh, conflicting with it. We are seeing a connection refused issue, so it looks like this probably didn't install properly. Okay. And we'll go back here and do a get pods. Okay, yeah, so it just took some time here. Now this didn't work out. I've never seen that happen before. I'm just checking here, created. Because when I, when I did this, I never failed, eh? So we'll try one more time and see if we need to do that. So this is already enabled. So I'm not sure about all these errors. I don't know if this is gonna uh, run us into an issue, but if we create our network policy and it doesn't work, we'll know that we don't have it properly installed, but maybe we have enough installed <laughs> and we'll be lucky, okay? So looks like all of our pods are running and stuff like that. So what we're gonna need to do is basically ping a pod from one other pod. And so what we'll uh, do, I'm just going to uh, write out a command here. So we'll I'll have to do kubectl hyphen n, choose um, a namespace, so I'm gonna do fire. Then we're gonna have our pod name, and then we're gonna curl a IP address uh, to somewhere. And maybe, I guess the idea is like, this IP address is gonna be like what we want to access. So we'd say, okay, from, from, uh, from an ice, from an ice um, pod, hit this fire IP address, okay? That's what we're gonna do. So what I'll do is just type in clear, and the first thing we need is that pod name. So uh, we'll go and type in kubectl, get pods and ice. We'll go ahead and grab that name on there. I'm gonna just move back there. And then what we'll do is get fire hyphen o wide because we're gonna need its IP address. So there is its IP address. Okay, and then we'll go to the right here and paste that on in. And it's complaining about this because maybe we forgot a word like exec. There we go. Great, and so the idea is Nginx is running an Nginx page if you hit this. And so uh, we can access the fire server from the ice server, okay? And just to show for um, the wind one, so we'll do wind here, and then we'll go ahead and grab uh, wind. Okay. We'll go ahead and delete this out. Great. So right now we don't have network policy in place, so it makes sense that they're able to communicate. So now what we'll do is create ourselves a network policy. I can call it netpol uh, fire yaml. And what we'll need to do is grab us some code. So go to the network policy page we have up here. This is a little, uh, way too much. We don't need this much code, uh, but we'll go here. And I don't feel like dealing with egress. So egress means leaving the pod. Ingress would be incoming from the pod or container. So we'll delete out the egress here. And I'm just going to take a look off screen here to the policy that I created. Okay. And we're going to rename this. So it says net Paul fire to ice. So that's what it's going to be. So we're going to allow communication from fire to ice, or I, I should say ice to fire. Ice can communicate with fire. Okay. But wind won't be able to communicate with fire, but it's all about fire. So we'll just call it net pull fire here. And then what we'll need is a pod selector. So what we're saying is this is going to apply for our fire engine X, right? So select all those pods and then we need a policy type. So we only want ingress. So we'll just take that out for now. 
And then from here, they have like a from, and they're doing IP block. Uh, notice there's a namespace selector, a pod selector. They're just showing a lot more information than we need. This is gonna be on port 80, because that's gonna be how we're doing the curl is just on a um, port 80 HTTP there. And so uh, we're not gonna do pod selector. We're just gonna do namespace selector. So anything from that namespace will be able to communicate and so what we'll do here is just change this. Um, we'll need to figure out what the label is. We're not gonna do IP, so we don't care about that. But what we'll do is uh, figure out what kind of label we can apply here, because that's what we're gonna need. So uh, what we'll do is type in uh, kubectl, get namespace, wind. Actually, we want describe probably here and see what kind of or labels we have. So this is a label. So what we'll do is just grab this part here and paste that on in. And then this part is gonna be wind. All right, and so that should work. Uh, we have to specify this is the fire namespace because it's definitely not in the default namespace. And double checking, looks okay to me. All right, so let's go ahead and give it a deploy. So we'll type in apply F K 8 S net pull fire.yaml. It's created the file, so hopefully it works. Um, we'll type in kubectl get net pull. Oh, hyphen and fire. And we'll describe its contents just to see what there is here. And so it's saying um, pod selector is for fire, allowing ingress traffic to port 80. So traffic into port 80 to fire, but only from wind, okay? So ice should not work and wind should work. So now if we just hit up, we already set this up before, and we'll just hit up until we find the commands we want. So we'll try wind first, and wind was able to download the page, no problem. And then we will go over to ice, and it's working. So if they're both working and the policy's in place, that means that uh, Cilium is definitely not installed properly. So what I'm gonna do here is type in micro KS, disable Cilium. See, now when I ran this, it was smooth as butter. I just uh, enabled it, had no problems. So I'm not sure why we're having problems here, but we'll disable it and then maybe we'll re-enable it and hopefully it works. But if the network policy is not in place, then that's why it would not be working, okay? All right, and so now we'll enable it again and we'll hopefully it'll just work because maybe when we uh, were installing it, there was just like network connectivity issues, not relating to our environment, but just uh, what we were downloading it from. And so I'll see you back here in a moment when this is done downloading, okay? And hopefully it installs properly. All right, so it looks like we're still having this here. Now, again, I did this uh, same environment, just a different account and had no problems with it. So I just don't trust this environment. I feel like there's something wrong with it. So what I'm gonna do is just type in, uh, I'm gonna make a new volume. So this will be micro K8s of Netpal ENV. And so this will be our environment specifically dedicated for testing this example here. So I'm gonna go back here. Again, you might not have this problem. It might work perfectly for you and you'll just proceed forward with no problems. But what I'm gonna do is go ahead and set up a new um, pod here. So we'll go ahead, or sorry, uh, uh, environment. So I'm gonna spin up this new environment. I'm gonna make my way over to the AWS console, right? And from there, I want to go to EC2. And I'm gonna just see if there's any new machines here. I'm not sure why it's not spinning up another machine. Not having much luck here today. We'll go back to EC2. Normally EC2 instances show up uh, pretty fast, so I'm kind of just surprised. There it is, okay. And so we'll go to our net, uh, network policy environment just for this uh, case. And we'll go ahead and go over to our volumes. And I'm gonna click into the storage. I'm going to modify it. We're going to set it to 40 gigabytes so we don't have any problems here. 
And then I'm just going to wait for this environment to start up. Uh, here, then we want to install micro K8. So we'll go micro, I mean, it's just snap. So, well, we'll go to the website, micro K8s. I just quickly reinstall micro K8s on this environment because it was so easy since last time we did it. So we'll paste that on in there. And it looks like our volume has resized. It shouldn't be a problem here. Probably shouldn't be running commands unless uh, we know it's been resized, but you know, I just want to get it done. And so micro Kate's there, we'll have cube CTL. And then we learned from our fix that we can do uh, micro K8s config and then do uh, cube config. Maybe we'll have to touch that file first. Just make an empty file. Well, maybe we type in kubectl and maybe it'll generate out that uh, directory for us. All right, I remember we have to type these things in. So we'll go and paste that on in. Then we'll paste that on in. Then we'll paste that on in. Then we'll type in micro kates cube CTL, get pods, and then it'll download. Oh no, it didn't have to download it, great. And so maybe we'll hit up now to um, that line we have here. There we go, and so now it did that. So now I can do cube CTL get pods. Good, and now I'm gonna just make sure I have enough uh, space on this drive here. And I'm just looking for the drive, usually it's 10, but we set it to 40 gigabytes. So looking for it here, it's still at basically 10. So we'll go over to our EC2 instance back to it. And I'm just going to go ahead and reboot it. And we'll give that a moment to reconnect. And so if this works, that'll be great. If it doesn't, that would suck, but uh, I hope it does. Worst case scenario, I could always just open my other environment and show it there, but it's just kind of frustrating uh, if, <laughs> if I can't replicate it here. And if it, this hangs too long, you can just hit refresh. Sometimes that helps here too, when it's doing a reconnect here. Or if it does that, another thing I do is just go um, back to the Cloud9 uh, interface here. And then I would open up Netpool. And if it is rebooting, we can go back here and just double check. So it's two out of two. I guess whenever it decides to connect, I'll be back here in a moment, okay? All right, so I did a few refreshing and then finally it let me back in here. So it's not always perfect when reconnecting. So we'll type in micro K8 status to see what we have installed because this is now completely fresh here. Micro K8s, micro K8s status. There we go. We had to wait for it to get uh, running there again. I'm going to scroll up here. And so all we have is the HA cluster. So we'll want DNS for sure. So we'll go here and say enable DNS. And then um, we want uh, Cilium, right? So we'll go here and grab Cilium. And so I expect DNS to install without issue, but I'm hoping Cilium just works with a fresh, 
fresh, fresh, fresh environment. So this will take a little bit of time, but I will wait until it's done here and I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so look, it actually worked no problem this time. So for whatever reason, the old environment's just kind of bust, at least uh, for that particular use case. So we will have to uh, uh, backpedal here and redo a lot of the stuff we just did, which is not a big deal. It's not gonna take too long to do. So I guess we'll just go ahead and do it again. And uh, practice makes perfect, right? So we need our namespaces. So we'll say create NS fire, create ice, create wind, and then we need to create um, a deployment. So deploy fire engine X, image engine X, uh, hyphen N fire, and then we got ice. Okay, and then we got wind. Great, and so then from here, what we'll do is we'll create ourselves a new um, file, which will be our netpaul fire YAML. And we'll go back to our original environment here that we were running. And I'm gonna go ahead and just grab this file here. We'll go ahead and paste that on in. Okay, and that looks what we were using before, so it's totally fine. And so we'll type in kubectl apply hyphen f. Actually, before we do, um, let's go make sure we can communicate between our nodes. So um, I'll, let's remember what that command is. So it's kubectl, whoops, kubectl hyphen n fire exec. And then we need our pods here. So we'll say new terminal. So say kubectl get pause and fire, or sorry, ice. And then we'll say wind. And then for fire, we need hyphen O wide. And so we'll go ahead and grab our IP address here. Paste that on in. We'll go ahead and grab this one here. And this is actually gonna be for, I think it was wind here a moment ago. Already kind of forgot. And I believe it goes here. Oh, the first one is ice. Wind, oh, sorry, yeah, it says ice here. So change that to ice. And I believe it was uh, hyphen hyphen curl and then localhost, or I guess uh, whatever the IP address is. Yeah, there we go, okay, great. So this one's set up and then I'm just gonna quickly do the wind. We'll do wind and then that one wind. Okay, great. So that works, no problem. Now let's go ahead and deploy our network policy. So we'll do kubectl apply hyphen f net pull fire YAML. And so it created it. And so now what we can do is go hit up, try out wind, it works fine. Try out ice, it works fine. Okay, so one of those should have hung, like it should have not worked, but it didn't. Um, so maybe there's something wrong with our selectors. It does say roll up here, which doesn't seem right to me. So let me go back over here. Now, like Cilium definitely did not install properly. So I don't think our network policy was their problem. I do believe that uh, it wasn't installed correctly, but let's just take a look at the actual selector name. So we'll say uh, describe uh, pods and fire, because I think it's just app by default. Yeah, so it is. So we'll change this to app, okay. And then we'll have to redeploy our fire policy. We'll type clear.
I'm just trying to find our commands that we type below. Maybe it's in this screen here. There we go. So does ice work? Notice that ice is hanging. Look, it can't connect, right? Because we said that wind is allowed to have access and not, um, not ice. And so we go to wind and there we go. So that's all there was to it. Uh, unfortunately, we had to take a, a bunch of detours there. Um, but you know, that's the learning experience and that's the hard parts that you're looking to watch. So um, that's pretty much it. And you can delete this environment because we're done with it. So what we'll do is close the network policy environment and we'll go back over to our environments here. I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this one because we are done with it. Okay, there you go. And I'll see you in the next one. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this fall along, we're gonna be looking at Knative, which is a serverless or serverless-like um, uh, uh, platform or tool uh, for Kubernetes. And so because this is such a heavy duty tool on top of Kubernetes, I don't want to pollute our existing micro K8s environment. So I'm gonna create a new environment here and we're gonna call this K or micro K8s K native. So it is a bit work to set up, um, but in this case, it makes sense to do it. Okay, so we'll do ENV. I'm gonna go ahead next. We are gonna choose a T3 medium just so that we have sufficient space and or uh, memory and here we'll choose ubuntu and we'll go next steps and we'll go ahead and create that i really really wish aws would let us choose the storage size i'm just going to check if there's any additional options no they really should let you do that because it's such a pain that you have to go resize stuff we'll go ahead and create this environment and while that is creating i'm going to go over to a new tab we'll type in console.aws.amazon.com we'll make our way over to ec2 and we are looking for this new environment because we need to increase that volume size as per usual. So we'll give it a refresh here. And is it here? Yeah, it's right there. So we'll go into here. We'll go over to storage. We will choose the volume and I will go to actions. And is the volume ready yet? Oh, we have to choose it. Modify the volume and we'll change this to 40 gigabytes. We'll hit modify, we'll hit modify. We'll go back to EC2, and even though it is running, we are going to restart it, reboot it, just to save us some trouble here. And so now we just have to wait till this connects. And then from there, oh, did it, did it really re reconnect that fast? Nope, it's reconnecting, okay, great. And so we just need to wait for that reconnection to happen as that's going, let's go take a look at Knative. So Knative, here is enterprise grade serverless on your own terms. So it says Kubernetes based platform to deploy and manage modern service serverless workloads. If you're wondering what Knative is compared to OpenFOSS or other serverless frameworks, strongly recommend reading this article like versus OpenFOSS. It is an article on the CNSF blog and it's very, very good at explaining this stuff. I like to the point that I actually grabbed uh, this quote here and put it in the course so we could understand the difference between the two. But if you get an opportunity to read this whole thing, and it doesn't just talk about those two, it talks about all the types of uh, open source frameworks, serverless frameworks for um, Kubernetes. But coming back over here, the idea is Kubernetes, and just going actually to this article because it does outline it pretty well, um, but Knative already uses um, components that we're familiar with like Istio, um, and it uses K uh, Kubernetes underneath, of course, um, but there's three components to it, building, eventing, and serving. And so eventing and serving is where we're spending most of our time, but the idea is serving is the ability to quickly serve stuff that will automatically scale from scratch, have routing and networking. So the idea is that um, when we are utilizing Kubernetes, we have to uh, provision all these things like services and pods and deployments. And so the idea with uh, Knative is that you just have one line and it does all the stuff for you. You don't have to set up, you don't have to set up horizontal pod auto scale or anything. It just all works for you, does snapshots. It, 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 uh, it has revisions for your code. And then the, on top of that, it has eventing. So the idea is that not only does it make it easy to just uh, provision um, uh, things and have all those uh, nice services around it, but eventing allows you to uh, trigger uh, when these, um, uh, functions should run based on a bunch of stuff. And so uh, there's a whole ecosystem with that. I'm not sure why the redirecting is kind of messing up here. So yeah, down below, uh, they had it on the website before. I'm not sure why I can't seem to find it right now, 
but on the K Native page here, they had a good description out oh, here serving. And so they talked about um, the integrations they had. I can't seem to find it right now, but the idea is that you can trigger stuff for that to happen. So, oh, we're under serving. I wanted a venting. That makes sense now. Uh, so the idea is that you have triggers, channels, descriptions. There's all sorts of way to uh, trigger your K Native events. But now this environment's ready. What we'll do is get micro K8s installed. So we'll do the classic here. Okay, and while that is going, I'm going to install kubectl just to save myself some time. We'll just do kubectl. Uh, I think I might have just accidentally canceled that out there. Okay, so kubectl is installed. Microkates is almost installed here. And then we'll have to wait for the server to spin up. As that is going, we'll go back over here and look at the tutorial to get uh, getting started here. Look at the quick start here. Uh, we'll have to also install um, KN. So KN is the um, K native utility library. So we'll have to go grab the binary as well. Um, so the easiest way to do this is to go to the release page here. And then what we need to do is download um, the one that we need. So AMD 64 is x64 uh, architecture x86 sorry and so that is the file that we need and I'll need to show that in finder and it's just downloading there as well while this oh now that we have micro -kates installed type in micro -kates, DNS and also Knative uh, enable assuming the uh, Microcades is ready. Oh, right, we need to run these two lines here. So we'll run this one, and we will run this one, and then we'll run this line here, and then we'll go back up and we will enable DNS and Knative, and those both will install, assuming that the cluster is ready. And I'm still waiting for this to download. Okay, this is now done. And so the idea here, just trying to hide some things uh, in my screen here. But here is the file, so I have it downloaded here. And I'm just going to quickly rename this to KN because it is a binary, right? And then the next thing we need to do is upload it to Cloud9. So if we go to File, Upload Local Files, I'm just dragging that KN file. It's just that file here, right, that we just renamed. And it's going to be there, so we'll go ahead and close that. It uploaded pretty darn fast. Oh, it's still uploading right here. You can see the percentage. So we're just gonna wait for that to finish. As that is going, I'm gonna go here and um, make it so that we can use kubectl. So we'll type in micro k8s uh, config, uh, tilde, q, uh, period cube, config. Um, maybe we'll close this tab here and reopen a new tab, close. And open a new terminal and hit up again. We already did this, so I'm not sure why I have to do this twice. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I forgot the S on there. Okay, and then we'll go back there. Oh, you know, I forgot to put the um, right angle bracket. And so now we should be able to do cube, CTL, get pods, clear. We'll go over here and it looks like installation is still going. And while that's going, we should move KN into the correct directory. So we'll go back over to Knative and we'll have to chmod it. So go over here and we'll chmod. And then we want to move that into a location like user local bin. So we'll say sudo move KN to user local bin. Great. So KN is now ready to go there. And if we go back here, we're just waiting for Knative to finish. Just gonna double check to make sure that it's anything else there. We might check the version afterwards, which might be okay to do. So we'll go over here, check our version. Cannot execute binary file, exec format error. Hmm. I wonder if it's actually a binary. Let me just double check. Oh, did I download the AMD? Did I download the wrong one? That's probably what it is. All right, well, we'll go back over here <laughs> and uh, 
No, AMD is right. Yeah, that's the one that we want. Oh, but I downloaded Darwin. I needed Linux, for frick's sakes. Darwin is for Mac OS, I'm sorry. So we'll download that one, and I guess we'll have to go ahead and delete this other one here. So we'll say remove, um, sudo remove user local bin kn. And now that it's uh, done downloading, I'm gonna go ahead and go grab that one. So I'm just gonna delete the other one here. And we will open up our file upload here. So file, upload local files, drag that on over. We'll rename this to KN. We'll drag that back on in there. We'll have to wait for that to upload, which shouldn't take too long. We'll go over here and the Knative should be installed. Uh, we'll do kubectl get pods and we'll just take a look at what was installed. Because so everything's pods, right? So here you can see we have Istio. So Istio was installed for it. Um, we have cave native serving, cave at, uh, native eventing, just to kind of show you what's going on here. And we're just waiting for this to download and then we can proceed generally forward. Uh, but maybe I'll just take a look and see what kind of code I have here. Yeah, we need to wait for KN. So once we have KN installed, we will then go towards serving our first service. So here they have a hello world go example. And notice we just do KN service create and it will do a bunch of stuff for us, okay? So that is now uploaded. So now we'll just hit up and do the same thing we did before. So we'll chamod our KN. I'm just gonna close this so it's out of the way. And then we will move our stuff into the correct directory. Okay, KN version. Great. So I think we're a-okay. Um, so we'll go back over to here. We'll go ahead and grab this. Now they do have YAML notes that's using Knative Dev, so the specification is different, but looks pretty similar to what we normally see. So we're gonna go ahead and create this. Hit enter. And it's gonna go ahead and create the sample. Now, I think that when I created this, I remember that this hung for a long time, even though it did create the service. So if this takes too long, I might just uh, cancel or kill it out, okay? So I'm just gonna type clear here. And as this is going, I'm just gonna go back up here and type in pods and just see if that spins up. So yeah, it is creating the container. And maybe we can just kind of inspect what that pod's doing. So we'll say, um, I was gonna type um, kubectl get pods, paste that in there, and then maybe describe it. And we can just kind of read what it was doing. So down below, it's successfully creating the image, it's pulling the image, it's creating a proxy, things like that. And I'll just hit up here again. Okay, so that pod is there. So we'll go back here. And the idea is that when we run this, we're expecting this output to happen, which seems like it's never going to occur anytime soon. But we did just describe the service. Well, hold on here. So, okay, I know that's never gonna finish, but I know that it's ran. So what we'll do is we'll just proceed forward. So I know we didn't have this. And so I had to go look up, kind of see what the command is. So if we type in KN service list, we can see all the services we deployed. So there is hello. Don't worry that it says it's not ready because it totally did, def it did definitely work. And we'll type describe hello. And as you can see here, it says, hello, default one, revisions, okay type, age, reason. So it definitely is working, but I don't know why it hangs like this. All right, so, but we did install Knative. We did run through the basis of the tutorial. So technically, you know, <laughs> we, we did use Knative. Uh, in terms of the KCNA, it's not like you really need to know how to do this. I'm just kind of showing you so you get more domain knowledge on this kind of stuff and kind of show the experience of where you might hit friction there. But I'm just gonna stop there. And that's all I really wanted to show you for Knative. So we are done. And what I'm gonna do is go back to our, um, uh, like our Cloud9 stuff, just cause we have so many darn environments. I just wanna go ahead and delete this one so you are not having spend. We'll type in delete and that's it for Knative, okay? <laughs> 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and I showed you Knative. Now let's go take a look at OpenFOSS, and let's go set that up. And we will have to set up a new environment. I know this is a pain, but it's better to set these up in Islip just because um, it is quite the large install. So what we'll do is create ourselves a new environment. We're going to type OpenFOSS, F-A-A-S, uh, E-N-V, maybe just put micro K8 so we remember that it's micro K8s. And we'll go ahead and hit next step. We will choose T3 Medium. Then we'll choose Ubuntu, we'll scroll down and we'll hit next step. We'll create that environment and we'll give that a little bit of time to create. As that's going, we'll type in console, AWS, amazon.com, make our way over to EC2. And I'm just waiting for that new one to spin up. As that's going, we have this nice article, which is OpenFOSS, Knative and more. Just to kind of show the architecture. So. Uh, with OpenFOSS, it uses Docker, and it could either use Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. It has Prometheus, Function Watchdog, API Gateway. It has a lot of stuff compared to Knative. Um, and this article explains like that OpenFOSS is easier to use than Knative, but uh, you might have some issues moving from one provider to another. Uh, so that is one concern there, but you'd have to read the whole thing to fully understand it. Uh, but what we're going to do is go to the OpenFOSS website. And I think they kind of have a tutorial here that we might be able to kind of follow. Maybe getting started here, deployment, Kubernetes. Ah, here we are, micro K8s. Nope, that's no help. I do have the link here off screen that I was using. Let me just go take a look. Um, I think it's like first Python function, that's what we want. So we'll type in open FOSS, first Python function. That was definitely what I want to use here. Okay, and we will have to install the fast CLI. Well, actually we don't because it's part of um, micro K8. So this environment is starting to run. And so what we'll do is hit refresh here and we need to resource our drive as per usual. So we'll go here to storage volumes and we'll go ahead and modify our volume and we'll change this to 40 gigabytes and hit modify. And while that's going, we'll install micro K8. So we'll just go to micro K website. I think by now I have this memorized, but I do not. We'll go sudo snap install micro K8s classic. We'll make a new terminal here, and then we will do the same thing for kubectl. Okay. And we'll wait for that to install. We'll check on our volume. Our volume is probably resized, but we'll have to wait for uh, MicroKates uh, to finish installing before we do our uh, reboot here. There we go. And then we will type in MicroKates kubectl, and then it'll spit out the stuff here that it wants us to do. So we will paste that on in there. We'll do new groups micro k8s okay and then we'll do micro k8s cube c or uh, config forward slash cube config and see if that works i forgot the um arrow micro k8s uh cube ctl get pods up again. Notice that it works now, no problem. Okay, and so we'll go back to our EC2 instance and we'll just reboot it. So we'll say reboot, reboot, and that will have to reconnect. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not super tricky. We don't have to install uh, Fast CLI like we did uh, KN because Micro K8 has it already and it's kind of a pain to install. So I'd rather not do it this way. Um, yeah, I think we could do micro -kates. I can't remember actually now. No, you know what? I think, uh, I think we actually do have to install it. <laughs> okay. So we will install, I'm just trying to remember, right? So 
I guess we can try when this is reconnected. We'll type in micro um, and we'll see if it actually works. But I think actually for this that I it is there, but I ended up installing OpenFast CLI because if we didn't, I ran into an issue later on in this follow along and that's the reason for it. But we have to wait for this to reconnect, okay? So I'll see you back here when this is reconnected. All right, so after waiting a short little while here, it is ready again. So uh, we are in good shape. So I'm gonna type in micro k 8 DNS, and then we're gonna do open FOSS. And I have to probably write the word enable in front of it so that it actually works. And so that's gonna go ahead and start to install open FOSS for us. Um, we also need to install the CLI here. So we'll copy this line from where we ever found it here on the first Python page. And so it's saying running with sufficient per per uh, permissions to attempt to move fast CLI. So we are okay, a okay for shape. If I type fast CLI, it does show up. That is good. And OpenFOSS is installing, so it'll take a bit of time. After it's installed, we do need to verify it. Uh, I'm gonna close the micro -Kids page so it stops popping up and driving me crazy. I'm just gonna double check what we need to do for the next steps because we do need to verify the installation. And I'm just double checking here to see if it's here. I think um, micro -Kids is gonna prompt us to tell us, hey, run this so you know that it's running. Yes, it does. And so what we'll do is grab this line to see if it works. And the next thing is we need this password to actually use it. So we'll hit enter and we'll get this nice little password. So I'm just gonna drop it in here. I'm gonna clear this out. And then I'm just gonna grab this password for the time being and save it here because we'll need it for authenticating to open FOSS. And now what we need to do is actually go ahead and build our function. So We'll go back over here and they have one here. So they make a directory called functions and they put all these, these files in here and stuff. So let's scaffold a new Python function using the CLI. Sure, why not? So we'll go ahead and do this and paste that in. And here it's uh, provisioned us a new folder and hello Python. Wow, that's a lot easier than typing it all in by hand. So if we open it up, we can see the content. So it says open FOSS, it's saying where it is. Here is the function. It's going to, uh, the handler is gonna to point to this directory, which is gonna open this handler.py file. If you have ever deployed an AWS Lambda function or anything serverless, this is looking very familiar, right? Like a handler file. And so here is our fancy handler file. You have your requirements.txt for anything you want to install. So what I'm gonna do is go back here and take a look at the next step here. And so it's just telling us to update the file with this print hello. So we'll get back over here and replace the contents of this file as such. And we will save that. We'll go back over here. And I think that this stuff is showing up because it thinks that this is a Lambda function, which it is not, it's an open FOSS function. And then it's just saying, look at the contents of that file. It looks like it's correct because it set it up all for us, which is great. And then down below, we can just build it as such. So we'll go here and we'll type in FOSS CLI build hyphen F. It's gonna prepare our function. Okay. And I think that the image is being stored locally, so it's not going out to uh, because we didn't we don't have a remote repository. I guess it's I guess it's building it here on the machine. Never mind. So the image is built. And by the way, while we're at it, we should do get pods hyphen a and just look at all the pods that OpenFast added. So we have Prometheus, Basic Auth, Alert Manager, Nats. Um, queue worker gateway and stuff like that. And the gateway is something that we're gonna have to use next because we have to have a way to connect to that pod. So I'm just scrolling on down here and seeing how we can see the pod next. Because we wanna deploy it, right? So we built it and then we want to actually deploy it. So I'm looking for deploy. Ah, here it is. Okay. So now that we've built it, the built the image, let's go deploy it. So we actually run the function and notice that we get an error. It says connection refused, failed to deploy with status 500. 
And so for this, I know that we will have to do port forwarding because I looked up another tutorial on getting started with OpenFast and what they had to do here was to port forward OpenFast and specifically for the uh, the service called Gateway. We do 8080 colon 8080. And so now that we have port forwarding, I have to go over to our other tab here. And then what we can do is try to deploy again. And we don't have it in the context of this bash file. So we'll just go ahead and copy this line here, paste it on in. It says unauthorized access. So we have to log in first. So we'll go ahead and do fast CLI login. And so now it wants the password. So we'll have to do hyphen hyphen password. And then we'll have to provide the password that we have it here. Okay, and now we can go ahead and deploy. And it says, hello, Python. So there you go. That's how you deploy a serverless function uh, with OpenFast. So we're all done here. And what we can do is go back to Cloud9 and shut down this environment. We'll go over here to OpenFast MicroKate's environment. We'll delete. We'll delete. And there you go. Again, it's not needed to know this stuff for the exam. Um, well, there are serverless questions, but just to kind of like really cement uh, what these things are just by going through the motions of it, okay? Hey everybody, this is Andrew Brown and welcome back to another follow along. And this time we're gonna learn about Helm. So what I'm gonna do is go to Google and type in Helm. And here we go to the Helm uh, website. So Helm is a way of uh, packaging your various scripts, like your manifest files, into a single package that people can use to quickly uh, set up projects here. And so I'm just waiting for the Helm page to load. I'm not sure why it's so slow here today, but we'll click it again. Maybe they knew I was up to something and that's why it's slow. But here it is, the package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, so yeah, just think of anything like Ruby or Python or Node.js, like NPM install. So you're installing basically a program, but it's installing it uh, like those uh, files into your cluster. So above here we have charts and I'm not gonna show you how to package um, a, a Helm project because that gets pretty complicated, but we will install a project and take a look at the contents of one. So Helm has this artifact hub where you can uh, view or browse a bunch of different Kubernetes projects. But I'm gonna go up here and just type in Postgres. And um, I just wanna see one that actually has a bunch of code so that we can just kind of look at uh, what would be in a Helm uh, directory. There's one for Azure that is pretty good. So I'll type that one in here and it's Bitnami for Azure, okay? So uh, we'll go here and here is a project. And if we go to the GitHub repository, they're almost always hosted on GitHub, but I'm just looking for the templates. If we click into templates here, it shows us all the files that are uh, involved. And notice that we have these like handlebar stuff here. So you can see that, you know, you might have a template like a config map, but then you have these pragmatic stuff where you can pass in values to Helm and it will change that stuff, but let's go find the repository if we can here. That's what I'm looking for. Um, where are you? I know it's here somewhere. So, I mean, there's the that's the Azure uh, 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 container repository. So I'm not sure if it'll show us that. Let's go ahead and grab that. I actually never go to the Azure container repository. There we go. So we can't see it there. So maybe this one is not a great example, which is totally fine. But here it says, this is the repo. Okay, it is on GitHub. There we go. So here it says Postgres HA, so high availability, I assume. And the idea here is you have templates. And in your templates, you can start to see we have a variety of different files. You have Postgres, PG pool. Again, I'm not gonna get super deep into how this actually works, but just to show you that the files are there. Then there's this values.yaml thing. This defines the type of parameters that can be passed into the template. So there's a lot there. I would imagine that when you use Helm, you, you'd you have a command flag like a hyphen hyphen values and you pass the values you want, or you could specify a file most likely. But anyway, that's the contents of a file, but let's take a look at how we go ahead and install one. So I'm just gonna open up my off screen here, my, um, my Helm instructions when I was trying to find something out. And I'm just trying to find an example of something that was um, that worked uh, very well. And actually, you know what? I used Juicebox from OWASP and that was actually really easy to use. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna browse all packages 
And I think what I did is I went to like security or maybe I went to web applications. That's probably what I did. And if we go here, we'll probably see the juice box app. So it is here, our juice shop, sorry. And so if we scroll on down, you have some instructions here, but the real instructions, you can see there's all the values um, configured here. But if you go to the install, it gives you the two steps. So here it is but we'll need Helm first installed on our micro K8s environment. So launch your micro K8s environment. And then once you're in there, we're gonna do an LS. We're going to need to install Helm. So if you do micro K8s status, what you'll see here is that they do have a Helm uh, uh, plugin add-on, whatever you wanna call it, uh, module uh, right here. Oh, it is enabled on this cluster, great. So, um, but anyway, the thing is, is like we want to use Helm Three. There is Helm 2 in here, so if you were to do micro creates um, enable Helm, that would give us two, and the problem with that is that it uses a tiller server, it's like this additional thing that's really complicated, and so we'd want to activate Helm 3. Now, it looks like it got activated for another reason. We could have been using something else and it had to be activated, so I think we typed in like micro K8's, micro K8's Helm 3, that's how we would probably access it, yeah. But I'm gonna actually go and directly install um, the uh, Helm um, CLI without having to do it through micro -Kates. And we can just do that on Ubuntu by doing sudo snap install Helm. I'm not sure if it will ask us to do classic. Yeah, it asks us to do classic. I don't really understand this whole classic thing, but we'll go ahead and hit enter and it's gonna go ahead and install Helm. And so now we can just type in Helm. Okay, and so if we go back to our juice shop, we're gonna copy uh, the first line here because we need to add the repo to know where this is stored, all right? So that could be on GitHub, it could be on uh, Elastic Container Repository, Azure's Container Repository, Docker Hub maybe. I guess not Docker Hub because that wouldn't make any sense, but some kind of repository, right? And so um, I'm losing where I am, here we are. So we'll go ahead and paste that in there yeah, I guess ECR and Azure, uh, might not make sense because that's for Docker containers. But um, anyway, so if you add the repository, we'll go back here and we'll go grab our install chart. And if we go back and paste that in, it will uh, go basically set up that application. So if we read it here, it says um, default namespace deployed, get the application URL by running these commands. And so this is the command we can run. So all it's doing is doing a port forward because it's already running. So if we do kubectl um, get pods, I bet we can probably see it running there. So there is the my juice shop. I'm not sure what else it installed, but uh, I guess if we wanted to know, we would just probably go to the repo and take a look here. So where is that repo? Where are you? Uh, source code here on GitHub. And so this is the, I think the, the one that uh, we're using here. And if we go to templates, so it deployed a config map, a deployment, an ingress, a service. So it deployed a bunch of stuff. And um, what we'll do is go back here. I really wish I had deployed that in a namespace so we could easily delete it, but that's totally fine. I don't think we're gonna run into a lack of space here, but what we'll do is paste this line in here. That's the one they suggested. But one addition, I'm gonna do address 0.0.0.0 so we can access this outside of our cluster. And I'm going to uh, change the port here from 3000 to like 8081, something like that maybe. But clearly the app is running on port, whoops, uh, is running on port 3000. So almost like a Ruby on Rails app. It's probably PHP though. Uh, when you talk about vulnerable apps, PHP is usually the one to go with. So anyway, this is now running and I don't know if the ports are open on that. So what we'll do is go over to EC2 and um, maybe just open all the TCP ports for our IP address. So we don't have to worry about opening individual ports because this is just for development. So we'll go to security, we'll go to security groups. And yeah, so we only opened up that port, but I'm just going to go ahead and say all port, all TCP ports. Okay, and that'll just save us a lot of trouble there. So we'll save that rule. And then what we'll do is get the IP address of the CC2 instance that's running our environment here. So if we go up here to details, we're gonna grab that public IP address. We said it's on 8081. I'm just hoping that it works, 8081. Fingers crossed, there it is. And here's the OWASP juice shop. If you've never heard of OWASP, it's, um, it's for security. So it stands for Open Web Application Security Project, but really it's a organization that has, um, uh, I think it's nonprofit. Yeah, nonprofit organization that has not just one project, but a lot of different projects and resources and stuff um, to help you secure applications. 
And they have like chapters, like user groups, meetups all around the world. Um, and so, I mean, this is one of their apps or projects that helps you learn how to better secure an app. So it's purposely insecure, but that is the OWASP app. Okay, so maybe we'll just kill the OWASP app, uh, maybe by killing the deploy there, just so it's not uh, running here, but we'll do kubectl get pods, and I'm just gonna kill it. So let's say kubectl delete, um, delete pods, this one. Okay, and those other resources are still there, but because it is an app that's designed to be vulnerable, I know it's only accessed by our IP address, I figured we should just kill it just in case. But yeah, that's all I wanted to show you with Helm. It wasn't that hard. There you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, we are going to set up a service mesh using Linkerd. Now, I did do this um, lab ahead of time, but I'm gonna tell you that I just couldn't get it 100% working, at least in Cloud9, because when you wanted to uh, see the Viz dashboard, you have to have an ingress controller and that has to run on port 80. And if we are running in a Cloud9 environment, we can't run on port 80. We're just not allowed to open up on that port. So, um, I mean, we can do it in Cloud9 and kind of get an incomplete tutorial, but I figured well, let's try to do it in EC2 and Hopefully there we will be able to see the dashboard. Now, if that doesn't work, it's totally fine because we can see everything in the um, buoyant dashboard, but um, we'll give it a go and do our best here. Uh, for the KCNA, you're not expected to know how to set up a service mesh, but I just want to go through the motions with it with you so you can kind of see and be able to really understand the purpose of a service mesh. So I'm gonna go over to EC2 and instances. We're gonna launch a new instance. And it's gonna to go to the old wizard. We're gonna to go to the new wizard, even though I don't like it. And we're gonna type in here K8 or micro K8 um, linker D, okay? Linker D. And we need to choose Ubuntu. And it's gonna be on 20, which is totally fine. 64 bit architecture. Here we want to have a T3 medium, or we can have T2, but we'll just do T3 because we've been doing that this entire time. T3 medium. We'll scroll on down here and we will allow SSH traffic. That's totally fine. We're gonna allow HTTP traffic from the internet. That's gonna be totally fine. And we're gonna to want to have 40 gigabytes here. And we'll go to advanced details. And I'm just gonna look through here to see if there's anything else we want. I wanna set a role, but where the heck do they put it? This is a totally new interface, so I don't know, because I don't wanna have a key pair. I'm gonna say no key pair here. And what I wanna have is attach a role. Where the heck did they put it? I'm looking for I am role. Role, where are you? AWS is always changing this stuff on me like crazy. Shut down, stop, terminate, detailed, elastic, credits, capacity. Is it just gone? Host name, oh, it's right here. Oh, for frick's sakes. And so we're gonna need to create a new IAM Pulse uh, profile. Again, new interface, I'm not used to where things are. And I probably already have one for SSM role, but we'll just make a new one. So we'll go here, create a new role because we wanna use Sessions Manager to connect to stuff. And this is new too. They just won't stop changing things on me. So um, they used to have like nice little icons so you could see what you're looking at. So we are creating an AWS service account. It is for EC2. Oh my goodness, what is going on here? Introducing the new experience. What do you, what do you think? It's terrible. <laughs> like, no, it's like the, the dropout, the, the drop down is terrible. It used to be very clear what to click, okay? Whoever is doing their designs, I don't know. They gotta send back the uh, the intern, okay? Because it's you can't even revert to the old experience, and it's weird because it's still like using old elements. But anyway, so what we would need to do is choose um, the use case for the service. So we are doing the EC2. I guess this is clear. I just I'm getting confused. We'll go ahead and hit next, and so I want SSM role. So we'll hit SSM, and we are looking for. Uh, the proper one. I'm just checking here because this one says this is deprecated, use this one. So that's the real one I want to look for. And that's going to allow us to use Sessions Manager. 
So we don't have to SSH and do anything super complicated. So I'll just check box those there. Where is it? Okay, we'll type in SSM again. It is being super glitchy today. And I want, is it this one? I'm gonna double check here. Amazon SSM manage instance core. I'll type core instead. There it is. Okay, so we'll go ahead and hit next. And we'll just say uh, micro K8s linkerd role SSM, just so we know what it is. Click create role. And there it is. Okay, so we'll go back here and now we'll type in linkerd. There it is. And so now we can use sessions manager. We'll go ahead and launch this instance. A lot of work, tons and tons of work to get this going here. And now that that instance is launched, we can go view it. And the experience is not going to be as nice. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be as nice as using Cloud9. Um, but we are going to get through it and you will learn how to use a virtual machine without a nice environment. So we'll refresh here. Because so I'm waiting for these two status checks to pass. We don't necessarily need to wait for it. I'm going to hit connect and if it works, it's fine. So we see we have four options here. EC2 Instance Connect, Sessions Manager, SSH uh, Client, EC2 Serial Console. They just won't stop creating new connection types. We're going to go with Sessions Manager here, which is going to be totally fine. We'll give it a moment here to launch. And hopefully we don't have to spend drivers or anything else with micro -Kates, but I guess we'll find out here in a moment. Um, so it's connecting. Actually, I was just thinking this is an Ubuntu instance, so I, I don't even know who I am. So we'll type, who am I? SSM user. Um, good question. I usually do this Amazon X2. So we'll type in sessions manager, uh, Ubuntu user. Cause I don't know what the user is called. Like who's the default user? Okay. So AWS. Ubuntu default user. It says, okay, so for Amazon Linux 2, it's EC2 user and it's Ubuntu because we need to be the right user when we do this. It always logs us as the SSM one, which is silly. We'll type in sudo su hyphen and then we'll type Ubuntu and we'll become the user that we want to be. There we go. We'll type in clear. Notice that this is a lot more limited and uh, you'll just have to live with it. It's not a big deal. And so what we'll want to do is go install micro K8s. And hopefully we don't run into any serious problems, but we'll go here and hit paste. We'll try again, copy, and then paste. There we go, hit enter, and that will install it. Close that off there, and we'll wait a little bit of time here. Shouldn't take too long to install. Actually, while it's going, let's go take a look at Linkerd. So, I mean, there's Istio, there's Linkerd. Um, we're doing Linkerd just because that's what I did the lab with. Uh, we could have done Istio, but it's just what it is. So Linkerd is a service mesh. It gives you all this cool functionality on top of it. And it makes it really clear once you start to see the dashboard. So if we type in like Linkerd, Linkerd uh, viz here. I'm just trying to show you what it looks like here. If I can find a screenshot, maybe type dashboard. The idea is once we get it running, we're going to get all this kind of rich information about our network and stuff like that. And that's really useful um, when you have a lot of pods and you're just trying to figure out what's going on, like where are requests coming from? What's the latency? All sorts of information that's within Prometheus. Okay, and then there's Buoyant, which uh, we might use here. So let's go back here and see if it's installed. It is installed, so now we'll install kubectl. And now we will see if our um, microks is running. So we'll say get pods, see if it works. That's okay, we'll type in microk8s in the front of it. 
and we'll run these lines as per usual as it likes. So it's a bit tricky here, so you might have to right click, go paste. And then we'll grab this here. If the font is too small, I'll try to bump it up here. There we go. And we'll go back here and now we'll type micro K8 um, config, or actually we'll type in kubectl first, get pods. We don't expect to find anything good. And then from here, we'll type in config, uh, less than arrow uh, tilde, and then cube config. We'll put sudo in front of that. Oh, it's really not liking it, eh? Permission denied. Okay, well, what if we get the contents of that file? Because that's all we need, really. Um, hmm. kubectl get pods. Nope. Because all that's doing is it's probably piping this information into here. So maybe we can just copy the contents like this. And I'm gonna type in vi tilde cube config. It's in vi, so vi every key matters. So hit I to go to insert mode, right click, paste. Okay, and just make sure it's not cut off at the top. I hit escape to go back to Visual mode, notice when I hit I, it goes to insert mode. I hit escape, I'm out of here. And so now what I want you to do is type in colon WQ, exit, type clear, then we'll type kubectl, um, get pods. Okay, so now kubectl is working as expected. So now we'll go and type in micro K8s, DNS, and then linkerd, linkerd. And we'll have to type enable in the front there. So that's gonna go install a bunch of stuff. It's gonna create its own namespaces and stuff. So you can see it's creating service count, config maps, deployments, all sorts of fun stuff. While it's going, let's go look up Linkerd tutorial here, getting started. I'm just gonna see if this is the thing that I use to go through it. Yeah, generally I think. So we'll have to do Linkerd check here. Okay, we'll go back over here. The only uh, unfortunate part is that we don't have multiple tabs, right? So uh, when we're running things here, it's gonna be a little bit hard. Hopefully we don't need to have more than one tab for this to work. I'll see you back here when this stops. I don't know if this is just gonna happen for a very long time or if it'll finish after a while, but I'll see you back here if and when this is done, okay? All right, welcome back. So it did it did finish installing and it installed a lot of stuff, like tons and tons of stuff. Let's just take a look at what we have. Um, so we'll type in kubectl get pods hyphen A. And you can see that we have a Linkerd namespace, a Linkerd viz namespace, Identity, destination, proxy injector, Grafana, Prometheus, web, all this sorts of stuff. Um, just to understand the architecture better, we'll type in Linkerd architecture. I don't know if this is gonna help much, but we'll take a look at it anyway, because they have this architectural diagram. So the idea is that it created a control plane and a data plane, right? So, and these are, um, well, I guess this is your usual stuff, right? This is your stuff, but it created its own control plane uh, in the Linkerd namespace. And here it has an identity, a destination proxy, stuff like that. But what we'll need to do is we will need to um, run a program and then inject um, the sidecar into the pod so that um, Linkerd can monitor it. And we could be using our deployment YAML file with our Sinatra app, but because we're in this very constrained environment, we'll just use the one that they have, okay? So they have one here for uh, Emoji Voto. And so we'll go ahead and copy this one. And so it looks like um, they have their own YAML file. So we'll go ahead here back to Sessions Manager, and we will go and paste this in below, and hit Enter. And it looks like we have an app deployed. So then we will go back over to here. And then it says, oh, we have port forward, so we can uh, do some port forwarding here to 
this. Unable to port for it because it's not running. So I guess we're waiting for the pods to run. So we'll go back here to pods. Maybe to deploy, maybe it's still deploying. Did this deploy in a particular namespace? I'm just gonna double check. Yeah, it does have its own namespace. So we'll go here and then say um, n emoji photo. And they're ready now. So we'll go back here and we'll do some port forwarding. Okay, so that's on port 8080. Um, oh, sorry, so, mm, yeah, I think it's forwarding to port 8080, which is totally fine. I don't know if we need to, yeah, it's going from 127.0 to 0, 0 0.0, 0, like anywhere. Do we need port forwarding? I guess we do. I'm gonna double check here. What did it create? Because we don't have an ingress controller, so it must be internal. It's, it's probably not exposed in any way. So we'll go back to our instances, and from here, we need to find our IP address. Everything's kind of big because I expanded it for this page here, so it's gonna keep bumping down like that. We'll go in here. We'll grab our public IP address and we'll paste this in here. And it shouldn't work because we need to open up that security group. So we'll go here to our security groups and we'll go to security groups again and we'll edit the inbound rules and we will open up port 8080. So we'll say all TCP custom, or actually not all TCP. Yeah, we'll do it for us because I don't care. I don't wanna to have to open all the individual ports. Let's say Andrew's computer. That's our IP address so no one else can see it. And now when we go here to port 8080, we should see their app. Give it a moment here. I think it's just loading. I think it is working. If it's not, we'll do HTTP colon slash slash. Sometimes the protocol matters. Um, says it should work. My thought is that it's not binding to uh, the address, eh? It's on localhost. And I'm gonna bump this up here. So we have port forwarding here, but it's not creating a proxy per se. Um, I'm gonna look at how we did this earlier because we obviously did it earlier in our like mini cube and cube CTL stuff. I just don't remember. how we did it. So just give me a moment here. You know what? Yeah, we need to bind on the address. So it's address and then we'll say 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Okay, and then we'll go back here, hit enter. Cool, we can vote for emojis. Um, I always use upside down and it isn't an option. So I guess that's how it is. We'll view the leaderboard. Cool, that's a nice little app they have there. All right, so our app is running and we will go back over to Linkerd. And uh, if you click around, you might notice that it's a bit broken. For example, if you try to vote for donut, you'll get a 404. Sure, let's give it a go. Where's the donut? Let's try taco. Nope, that's fine. Vote on your favorite donut. Ah, 404, okay. So we get a 404 there. These errors are intentional, so we can identify the problem. So with emoji installed running, we need to add a mesh to it. So we are basically injecting it. So when it says kubectl get emoji deploy, it's going to then do linkerd inject. Um, and so linkerd inject is going to inject that data into there. So this is what's going to install it, like the sidecar, so that we can track it. Okay, so we'll go back here. I'm going to kill this. We'll paste that, whoops, we'll paste that in there. Hit enter. Uh, command not found linkerd. I think it's because we'll have to do micro k8s like this, micro k8s. Hit enter. There we go, so now it's been injected, so technically linkerd should be tracking it. Um, it explains it, that's totally fine. And so then congratulations, you now add Linkerd. Just as the control plane is possible to verify everything is working the way it should, check your data plane with Linkerd. Proxy check. So we'll copy that line. We'll go back here, paste it on in, hit enter. We'll have to do micro K8s in front of it. 
And we're getting a bunch of checkboxes. So I'm assuming, yeah, we're waiting for the data plane to be good. It says everything is A-OK. -okay, so um, it looks like it's been installed properly. I'm kind of curious if we take a look at, we say um, the pods. So we say kubectl get pods and what's the thing called emoji vote. We'll do kubectl get uh, ns. It's actually emoji voto. And then I just want to take a look at the app because all of these have been injected, right? So I'm just curious if we'd see anything in the describe. I don't think we will, but just for sanity, I'm just going to check. Okay, describe pod, paste the pod name in here. Pods. Well, the pod is right there, so I'm not sure what it's talking about. Did I make a mistake? Emoji? No, it looks right. Hmm. All right. Well, whatever. Oh, you know what? It's because we need the namespace. Emoji Voto. There we go. Uh, I'm just trying to see if like we can see anything because the idea with like linker D is that it's it shouldn't touch the code or anything here, but we are seeing stuff in here. So we can see things like linker D proxy. So there's some volumes that are mounted to our thing. And then there's a bunch of this stuff. So linker D proxy. So yeah, I guess you can see stuff. So I just wanted to see if that was the case. We'll go back over to here and we'll explore linker D. So we want to install a viz. And so viz is an, is an extension that allows us to see metrics. So we'll go here and install that. All Linkerd install is doing, if you do viz install, what it will do is output. I'll just run it without the other one just so you can see what it does. So we'll paste that in there, paste micro K8s. And all it's going to do is print out code. So this is actually what it's going to run. So when you see it piping here, it's actually going to do an apply by taking that content. So we'll go back here, paste the full line in here and run it. We have to put micro K8s S in the front here every single time. And so now it is installed viz metrics. And then down below here, it says to install Buoyant. And so we don't have to install Buoyant right away because that is a third party cloud services. This is them being tricky to try to get you to sign up for um, services. So Buoyant is a cloud provider that um, tracks a bunch of stuff and it's optional. And I might uh, do it in this tutorial here, but I just like the fact that they did that without telling us what was going on here. But now that we have that running, we want to be able to see the dashboard. So I'm just looking up how do we do that um, to, to actually visualize that dashboard here. I'm just looking at my instructions when I was going through it. Um, we type in micro K8s linker D viz dashboard okay and so now we have the dashboard running on port 50750 it's not bound to address 0, .0, 0, 0.0.0.0 so i don't know how that's going to work but we'll give it a go anyway and i think that's where i ran into an issue where i needed an ingress controller so that we could actually see it uh, I'm just trying to find where, oh yeah, here we are. So if we do this, notice that it's not resolving, right? So the problem is, is that we are running the dashboard, but the dashboard needs to be um, exposed somehow. And so I think the way I did it um, was setting up an ingress. So we'll type in expose viz dashboard linker D. This is the part that I was saying that I wasn't sure if I'd be able to show you. Because I, I literally didn't test this in the EC2. I just said, hey, let's do this tutorial. <laughs> okay. And so here they're saying, like, instead of using Linkerd viz dashboard every time you'd like to see the dashboard, make an ingress controller. But we need one because we need to run it on port 80 for it to work. Because I, I Googled as well, like other stuff. And it says, like, if you expose it on an ingress controller, it's not on port 80, it, it'll mess up. 
I couldn't, you can't set an ingress controller, anything besides HTTP, HTTPS, which is 80 and 443, and that's where we ran into an issue. So down below here, it says Nginx. Uh, that's what we were using before, so we probably should just use it. And um, I guess what we'll do is we'll do what we did before, which is uh, enable um, the ingress controller from our ingress tutorial. So we're gonna leverage that knowledge. I'm just trying to find where we are here. So I'm gonna type in micro k 8s status. And we are going to need ingress. So we'll go up here and type in uh, micro k s ingress. Notice it has like traffic ingress controller. I don't know how to use that one. And I only know how to use the um, Nginx one, so I don't want to learn something new right now. So we'll go back up here and type in uh, enable. And while that's going on, I'm gonna go take a look at our ingress tutorial to try to get a refresher here on how do we set this stuff up. So yeah, we install ingress. Oh, it already does Nginx. So it is installing Nginx. And so I guess all we need to do is now create an ingress YAML file. So what we'll do here is, it's kind of a pain to write it out. So what I'm gonna do is go over here back to our Cloud9 environment, because we should still have that file in our micro KS environment. I'm just gonna go uh, control zero to go back to normal size here. And we'll launch this here and we'll go grab that and then tweak it just so that it's a bit easier. And so, I mean, we probably could use the one that they have here, but I, I just don't know about it. I guess we could try. It also needs a password so that it authenticates it, pass, passes it to basic auth. Um, it's also using secret. I don't think we need to enable that. I don't think we need R, RBAC. This says it's on port 8084. Dashboard, uh, I think this is fine. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and copy the contents here. I know we're launching this, but if, if uh, we'll try to yeah, give this a go first. So uh, I'm just double checking here the host. Does the host name matter? This exposes the dashboard, uh, dashboardexample.com and protects it with basic auth. Hmm. I don't know if we need to have a host name. So we'll just say Cube CTL, or sorry, um, linker D expose dashboard stack overflow. Because I feel like we might see an example that's not using that. Because this person probably wanted to do it on a particular port. And see, they're using the same code here. Notice that they took out host name because we don't want to have that host name. And they say, it's never going to be a path like that. It needs to serve on the root of the URL, so change the root here. And so that's what I remember I was reading here. Um, this is correct. I've only added using the rewrite target there. So looking at this one here, I'm going to go copy this content. We're going to go over to our micro environment. I'm just going to make a new one here, new file called linkerd um, ingress yaml. If this doesn't work, it's totally fine, but I just want to try if we can. And so I'm just going to see what they did. We can put anything we want in here. I think that's what it'll take. And so I don't see the annotation on this. Oh, I guess this is the secret. So it'd be down below here. Oh yeah, so Nginx. We've got a bunch of headers here. This is this looks fine, I guess. 884, that's totally fine. So I think what it's saying is you can't do this. You can't have linker D on that. So I'm gonna delete that out of there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and copy all this here. I'm gonna right click copy. Go back to our environment here. I'm gonna bump up the font. I'm just doing control plus to do that. And I'm going to touch a new file called ingress.yaml. And I'm gonna do vi ingress.yaml. And this is vim, so remember every key matters, so hit I and then right click paste, and then just uh, hit escape. And then what I'm doing is I'm hitting um, K on my keyboard, K goes up. So hit K all the way up. I'm making sure nothing's cut off and then hit J all the way down, J, 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 J. And that looks fine. So I'll do colon, W, Q, right and quit. 
And so I have this ingress file. And so I'm going to try and deploy this. So we'll say kubectl apply hyphen f ingress yaml. And it says no matches for kind ingress in version beta one. So I'm going to hit up again. We'll hit vi ingress yaml. And then uh, we'll hit k to go all the way up. Down, we'll hit uh, j to go down. Okay. I'm trying to get to this beta. So if I hit h and l, H moves me left, L moves me right. I'm sorry for all the Vim stuff. And so what I want you to do is move over to the V using the L button, and then hit C for change, and then W for word. And now it's in insert mode, okay? So now the keyboard acts like a normal keyboard, and we're gonna type V1, okay? Because that code is just old, and hit escape, and then colon WQ. All right, and then we'll hit up again, and then we'll try to apply the ingress controller. So it says no match ingress type. So I'll go over, oh, you know what? It's even more wrong than I think it is. We go hit up here again. Sorry for more vi. So we'll hit H to go to the left, all the way to extensions and hit CW when you're on the E, C for change, W for the word. Notice that it's in insert mode. So now we're typing normally and it's actually networking dot K8S dot IO. And then hit escape and then colon WQ, hit up. We'll try to apply it again. Oh, it just doesn't want to work. Okay, so error validating ingress YAML. Um, validation unknown field service port in IOK8's API networking. If you choose to ignore these errors, turn validation off. I think the reason why is the syntax change as well. So hit up again. I'm so sorry for this. And then hit J to go down, 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 down. And this syntax has changed. So instead of it being service name back end like this, it's actually, if you go over here to the colon, or sorry, go to this line here and hit, or actually go to this line here to, to sorry, the back end here colon and hit O. Okay, it inserts mode, goes to the next line and then hit escape and then hit I and then hit tab to indent and then tab again. It's not indenting right. So I'll hit I and I'll just backspace till we're in the right space. And we'll type in service colon escape. We'll hit J to go down, DD, DD. Okay, and then hit enter, or sorry, O, <laughs> sorry, uh, I, okay, indent. I know this is a big old mess. Name. You know what? I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm just going to hit colon WQ quit here. I'm going to remove this ingress file. We're going to just make a new one. We'll just do it over here because I don't mean to give you all this Vim nonsense. And I'm just trying to get back to normal size. I'm going to go back to this tab here. Control O. You can't do it over here. And so the problem here is this is just all old. So this should be... Uh, we'll, we'll open up our other one as a comparison here. You can tell how tired I am because this is so darn complicated. We'll go copy. Again, if you just want to watch, you can just watch me do this. All it's important is that you see how it works. So the back end here should be service and this should be port. Okay, and so we'll copy the contents there. Go back over to our virtual machine. I'm gonna bump up the font because it's too darn small. It's not letting me bump it up. Here we go, oh, hit plus, that's why. And I went too large now. Okay, there we go. And so we'll take touch, ingress, YAML, vi, ingress, YAML, I to go insert mode, right click, paste, so we don't have any mistakes, hit escape, go colon, WQ, right to quit. And then we will hit up to try to run this again. And hopefully we have all the right syntax. We still have a darn error. Okay, so um, unknown field port for ingress backend. Oh, I made a mistake. Remove ingress YAML. We'll go back over here. We'll return to normal size. I gotta go off to another screen because it can't do control zero there. Go to the bottom here. And what I forgot to do was do number. This is on spaces four. We need this on spaces two. This should be number like this, indent. And that is the right syntax. So we'll go ahead, copy this again. Touch, ingress, YAML. 
we have to spell that correctly. I'll bump up the font so you can see what I'm doing. And we will do Vi ingress again. We'll hit I to go insert mode, right click paste, hit escape, colon WQ, right quit, hit up. Okay, it looks a bit better. So error validating ingress validation data, unknown field port for ingress backend. What are they talking about? It definitely is a thing. So go back over here and we'll just take a look at this. Backend service port port definitely exists for sure. I know that it definitely exists. Is there something else that I'm doing that's wrong here? I'm just gonna keep looking. It looks right to me. I'm just reading it here. Invalid type got string expected map. Oh, I know what it is. If it's a map, it's expecting. Well, that's kind of confusing. I mean, I guess you could do this because that would be a map, right? Hmm. Let's just see what we do. Ingress Kubernetes. Just see if we can see an example there. Uh, no, we are doing it correctly. Everything looks fine. I'll be back in a moment here and I'll come back with the answer, okay? All right, so it looks like we've hit a dead end. So I tried launching Linkerd in the background and doing port forwarding. So by that, I mean like I did an ampersand on the end here. And so now it's running in the background. I don't know how to shut it off. And I could run on another port and I tried also an address. So I ran on an address and you can do that, but then it said, hey, you have to do DNS binding. And it's just like almost impossible. So I think for the scope of this, we don't really need to do more. I could show you Buoyant, but I just don't care about Buoyant Cloud. I'm not here to try to sell third-party provider, but let's just take a look at Linkerd, uh, Linkerd um, uh, Viz dashboard. And just so we can kind of maybe see what it's supposed to do. But holy smokes, it is super hard to get that set up. And it's just because, you know, we don't have in the community that content that's just like available to copy paste in there. I'd have to spend hours to figure that out or stuff like that. But anyway, for the KCNA, totally out of scope. But I just wanted to show you that like the idea is that if we were, if we were there, we would see our Grafana uh, dashboard that's powered by Prometheus. And we get all these fun, cool graphs, okay? So, you know, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to look at Prometheus if I figure it out. Um, uh, if we attempt the managed service, it might be a bit easier. But uh, yeah, that is Linkerd, at least uh, service mesh, how you'd set it up with micro K8s, with the exception of not being able to solve that last part there. But again, not super important for the KCNA, just going through the motions to see the components, okay? Also, I guess we should shut down that environment so you're not spending money. So go over to EC2, and this one's a bit easier. We're just gonna terminate that one. So we'll go over there. Um, and we'll look for our micro 8 K8 linker D and we will um, terminate that, okay? So there we go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, I'm gonna show you how to set up uh, Kubernetes on a managed service like Google Cloud Platform. We're actually gonna look at a bunch of them, GCP, uh, AWS, Azure, Sivo, DigitalOcean, um, just so you get an idea of what it's like actually setting these up for production. Um, you know, they're not going to exactly be on the exam because the exam is more focused on Kubernetes uh, Cloud Dave itself, though you should know about managed services. But I'm going through this with you because in practicality, this is where you'd actually deploy Kubernetes. And if you get to see what it's like on all the different providers, even if you can't do what I'm doing and just watch through it, you can understand the differences between the offerings, how easy it is to do it, but it's, uh, measuring my frustration level as I work through it. Uh, and just kind of get a bit of a difference. So we're starting with GCP because it's the easiest. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to start off with something really nice and light. So what we'll do here is make sure you have a Google Cloud account. I'm not going to show you how to do that. But uh, once you do have your account and your, your full access account there, I'm going to go ahead and create a new project. You can see I was doing one earlier here and it did not delete. But we'll say new project and I'll say GKE example two. And I'm going to go ahead and go and hit create. So that's gonna create our project. And then uh, they usually create pretty darn quick. Notice it's still going there, so we might have to wait a little bit. 
There it is, it's ready. We'll click over to our GKE example two. And from here at the top, we'll type in GKE. Now, if we don't wanna do that, we could also go on the left-hand side here. If you click that button and go down below and go to Kubernetes engine. But I'm gonna type in GKE. And Google makes it super, 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 super easy to run Kubernetes, which is no surprise because they originally created Kubernetes and then gave it to the CNCF, right? So if they didn't have the easiest platform, I would be uh, surprised. I'll go ahead and enable that. And while that's going, let's look up G uh, GKE prices because it's actually pretty in line with AWS. Now, I used to say that GKE had a free control plane, but it looks like they don't anymore. The control plane is 10 cent per hour, regardless if it's autopilot mode or standard mode. So you're always paying for that control plane, all right? Difference between autopilot mode and standard mode. Well, standard mode is just like how AWS runs with EC2 instances. It's just running on virtual machines. Um, and then autopilot mode is running on uh, 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 cloud run. So cloud run is like it was Fargate. It's just a way of running serverless containers. So this one, you pay for what you use. This one, you pay for the underlying uh, virtual machines that you spin up. Same thing. Um, there are some nice things about um, uh, Google Cloud where they have a service called Anthos. So Anthos is a way of Google Cloud Anthos is a way of um, having a GKE cluster, but you can actually have um, nodes running on different environments like AWS on your environment, stuff like that, and manage it from a central location. So there's an additional cost for that. I don't really know the use case for this because I just can't really think about it. But um, one nice thing about Anthos is that it has Anthos migrate. So you go migrate um, uh, to GKE. For some reason, like if you want to do it, it's always under that. And what it can do is it can actually import a virtual machine from anywhere like AWS and it will turn it into a container and then run it on GKE. So it's like this really easy way to get your um, uh, containers or your applications into containers. Like it will generate out a Docker file. Sorry, I'm just drinking water here. But um, the, the advantage there is that if you had a VM and you use that tool, then you get the Docker file, you wouldn't have to write it yourself. So that's kind of one advantage that I like about that. But anyway, we're over here, we typed in GKE, we're on our cluster, and so we have an option with Quick Start, which is not bad, but I'm gonna just do it the old fashioned way, create. We have two options, standard autopilot. Standard is where you manage the nodes, so uh, virtual machines underneath. This is using Google or uh, Run Cloud underneath, right? Serverless containers. So we'll choose GKE standard. And we'll need to name our cluster, so I'll say GKE example. And it has to be lowercase, of course. Zonal or regional, we just don't want to run it as a zone. We'll let it choose whatever zone it wants. Uh, for the control plane, we'll have it release channel. We don't care about SAG version. We'll let it stay up to date. And we'll go next and hit create. Now there was a bunch of other options, but I didn't click them. <laughs> and maybe I'll go back there. I don't even know if I ever looked at them when I went there. Uh, standard mode, configure here. Default pool. Yeah, so I never even looked at this. So it's gonna launch up three nodes. We really don't need three nodes. We could have made it two, which is too late now. If you're watching this, maybe before you launch this, maybe you might wanna make it two, because it's, it's more, like think about it, every node that you run is gonna cost money, right? So we don't want these running too long. Here it's using E2, E2 medium. Notice like when I launched up my um, uh, Cloud9 environment, I chose four gigabytes of memory because that's what I find it at. Like they say you can run it on two, run it on a less, but I would never run it on less than four gigabytes, the, the nodes, 100 gigabytes. So, you know, I run it at 40, but like this is kind of more for a production use case. I'm gonna go here to security, that looks fine. Metadata, that looks fine. Automation options, networking options. I'm just seeing if there's anything interesting here. Yeah, the only thing I would have done is I probably would have made it two nodes, okay? Or even one, like I only need one additional node there, but we're running three nodes, which is fine. Uh, for you, I, I'd probably reduce it just to save money, but for me, it's fine because we're not gonna keep this up for long. And so we are just waiting for this to provision. And so it says it takes about five minutes. It is like the fastest at provisioning. I know that like, DigitalOcean says there's four minutes, but honestly, GKE are uh, uh, like provisions clusters so darn fast. It's really awesome. But I'll see you back here in a moment when it's done. It's at 67%. I'll see you then, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are back with GKE. 
And so uh, again, I'm telling you this, this one's the easiest one to use. All we got to do is click connect at the top. And what it's going to do is show the command line that we use with G Cloud in order to authenticate to the cluster. Uh, and then kubectl will work, but it's even easier than that. We just hit run in Cloud Shell. It's going to launch Cloud Shell. It's going to establish that connection, and then we can do kubectl right away. And as this is working, I'm just going to maximize this window so we can see what we're doing. And notice that it has a line here, so now we just have to hit enter. And then we'll say authorize. You're gonna be so disappointed when we see uh, the Azure's uh, Cloud Shell because it's so painful. And so if we type in Q, whoops. <laughs> if we type in, I was just typing there, I don't know why I, don't know why I did that, but uh, if we type in kubectl get pods, give it a moment here to think. So there, it is connecting. If we do hyphen A, we can kind of see all the interesting things that it has here. So Fluent Bit, GKE metrics, connectivity agent, DNS, all this fun kind of stuff, metric server. And so now what I want to do is just deploy something. So let's say kubectl, um, create, deploy, nginx, image, equals nginx, because I just want to expose something so that we can see something. Um, and I think we need a double hyphen. Notice like when you're doing this, when I'm typing, it's a bit delayed. It might be delayed for you because it is a remote shell. Okay, so it's created that now. Now what's interesting here is if we go to, I don't know why it's not in our GKA thing, but we'll go back to our engine, maybe because I expanded it. We can actually see uh, our cluster. If we go to our workloads, we can see it in here. Okay, we can click into here. We can see uh, stats and stuff. It's all hooked up and given us rich information. If we go back to workloads, even notice like we can hit deploy here and specify information. So I, I didn't have to do it through here. I could just went here and said new container image and just specify the repository and stuff like that. So it does really add uh, a very nice additional layer if like you're really not great at the, the scripting here. This makes things so much easier. And uh, not not for everything though, like, uh, and by the way, we can go here and we can edit these live too. So if we wanna edit this server, or like this, sorry, this resource, it'll pull up the YAML and we can edit it in line here, which is really nice. But if we go over to the service or uh, service ingress, we can't create a service. We can create ingress if we already have a service created. So not everything is great in Google Cloud World, but it's still extremely good uh, and one of the best, okay? So I'm gonna do uh, kubectl expose because we want to have a service so that we can connect it to ingress so that we can uh, uh, see what we built here. So we're doing nginx port equals port 80, okay, hyphen hyphen target port equals 80. And then we want to do type equals node port because it has to be either a load balancer or node port for it to work. You can't use cluster IP in order to hook up the ingress to uh, get a, a load balancer with Kubernetes. We'll go ahead and hit enter. That is now exposed. We can go up to our uh, services here and then we can see the services there. And now if we want to add ingress, we can just checkbox it here and say create ingress. And what it's gonna do is set up an external load balancer, at a Google Cloud load balancer. So that is fine. Uh, we'll go down here and choose Nginx. We can't change either of these right there. That's fine. HTTP protocol is fine. We can preview uh, uh, the ingress here. So this is what it's gonna do. Very simple, right? So nothing complicated. We'll go ahead and create. And remember how painful it was when we were doing ingress. <laughs> like what were we doing it with? Uh, service mesh, right? So it's so nice that this is super easy to do because that is the honestly the well, the biggest pain for this stuff is um, I'm gonna do K8 ingress. I don't know if it's, that's gonna be the name of the ingress. Oh, it is, okay. Um, because that is usually the largest pain is just doing uh, dealing with the ingress. And so Google knows that. And so they make it super easy. So now what it's gonna do is it's going to spin up a, um, a load balancer, right? So it's creating ingress and it says external HTTP LB. And this does take quite a bit of time. So I'll see you back here in a bit, okay? All right, so we are back. It wasn't a long wait, but just know that you should hit the refresh button because I was sitting here and it just looked like it wasn't done, but it was done for a long time, but I was fine because I was doing another follow along. But if you're sitting here, don't sit here for a hundred years, hit the refresh button, make sure that it is done or not done. 
So it is done. And uh, what it's done is it's actually set up a load balancer for us in this case. So no, if you scroll on down below, it says load balancing resources. We can click through those and you can see it actually set up a load balancer. Right here it is. We have an IP address. We have um, probably a, like a DNS record something somewhere here, but we have load balancer. We click back here. We can see it made a load balancer for us. All right. So now um, if we want to access this, I'm just trying to remember how, or I'll just look up in my instructions that I wrote. Um, I, I didn't write it, write it down, but you know what? We'll just type in kubectl um, uh, cause it's an ingress controller. So we type in get ingress and there's its IP address. It probably is the same. Yeah, it's the same one as here. And so if I copy this, whoops. If I copy this and we go to new tab here and we paste it in, ta-da, our Nginx page works, okay? One other thing uh, I wanted to show you is that it has a code editor. If you hit open editor, we didn't have a need for it, but if we did need to use one, um, just to give it a second to launch. The reason I'm showing it to you here is because it is really, really awesome. It's basically uh, all uh, Visual Studio code. We could have technically done um, instead of using AWS Cloud9, we could have technically used this. Uh, but the only thing is that it only has a single context. At least I don't know how to change the context. Uh, and so the reason I went with Cloud9 is because you can spin up multiple virtual machines and uh, uh, stuff like that. And, and Cloud Shell is more like tied to a single uh, virtual machine. And I don't know how to flip between them, okay? Um, but it is, it's fine. It runs really fast. And Google Cloud is very easy to use, but uh, I was more comfortable with Cloud9. And that's why I used it. But I just wanted to show it to you because when we go to use um, Azure, I just want to compare it to how awful their shell is, like as their code editor. And it makes no sense because they make Visual Studio code and it's terrible. But anyway, we've accomplished our goal here. And so in order to get rid of all this stuff, uh, what we're going to do is go ahead and delete our cluster. So I'll go ahead here and I'm going to go and delete our cluster. And now it did create a load balancer. So I'm really hoping that it tears down the load balancer with it. Um, right, so we go to load balancers. I don't wanna kind of delete it and, and cause an issue here. Oh, it did vanish right away. So I guess it does tear it down right away. Uh, and if you really, really wanna make sure that everything is gone, we can go ahead and delete the project or like the, the yeah, the project that we created. So we go to manage resources and then you'll see GKE2 example. We'll go here, hit delete, and then we'll put the name in and it will shut down. So no, we're not getting billed for anything in that project anymore. Uh, it will, it's scheduled for delete for March 18th, but we don't have to worry about it anymore, okay? So we are done Google Cloud. We'll move over to Azure. Then we'll do the really hard one, AWS, and then we'll do some bonus ones, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, I'm gonna show you how to provision um, a Kubernetes cluster on Microsoft Azure or Azure. I like to say Azure, it's more fun to say. Uh, and so uh, their service is called AKS or Kubernetes Service, Azure Kubernetes Service. And you might have to enable this somewhere in there. That's not what I'm gonna show you there. It looks like they got some free training, which is kind of cool. Um, but I just know the way that I know how to do it. So what we'll do is type in Kubernetes at the top. We're gonna go to Kubernetes Service. Notice that they have something called Azure Arc. Remember how we talked about Anthos? Well, Azure, Azure Arc is like, Azure's um, multi-cloud service where you can manage uh, nodes on other providers and on-premise in one place. So kind of a competing service, but works a bit different. And so what we'll do is create a new cluster. And from here, we will have our subscription and we'll create a new resource group because it'll make it really easy to clean this up afterwards. So we'll just say um, K8's example. So we know what to do there. Everything's gonna be put in there. And the nice thing is they have some options. So we are doing this for dev tests, so we want this to be nice and cheap. I'm gonna say AKS uh, example here. Hopefully it lets me name it that way. Yes, it's fine. The region's fine. I don't care about availability zones. Uh, the version is fine. The one thing about like different providers is that they might have different versions available and some might be more progressive than others. I would imagine, I would imagine that uh, Google is the best at keeping that up to date. And the only difference between like some of these tiers it's like the availability. So we, we want less availability because we just don't care uh, for, for dev and test. 
down below. Notice it's giving us uh, standard B4s, 16 gigabytes. That's quite a bit. That is insane, but that's what they're recommending. I'm not gonna leave that up for long. I guess we could change it. I'm gonna leave it alone. I just don't want it to break, okay? So, cause I, I ran it on this, um, but to be honest, it's kind of expensive. I'm gonna go with one node cause I don't want a bunch of them because I don't know how expensive this thing is. And at 16 gigabytes of memory, that could be kind of expensive. Maybe look up the cost of this standard price. Usually they show you in the menu, eh? So if we go here to pricing, oh, I don't know, I'm not gonna worry about it. But you know, it's, yeah, sometimes they'll tell you right here, if you open this up, they'll tell you the cost, $155 a month. Again, we're not running this for long, so, you know, uh, I guess we could try, I just don't want it to break. We'll go with B2s, okay? I just don't know if that's what's gonna be on for the cluster, right? But I would imagine that's all the nodes. For production workloads, at least three nodes are recommended, but we only want one. So we'll say next. And it's gonna run the system on a B2. Yeah, that should be fine. Everything will be fine. Uh, I just don't know if it's using like Windows servers underneath, because if it's using Windows servers, those always need a lot of memory. Okay, so enable virtual nodes. Um, nope, we don't need that. Enable scale sets, sure, we can turn uh, have that uh, left on. We have authentication, it's gonna have system assigned managed identity, that's just how it in integrates with uh, Azure. Uh, Role-based access controls, we'll have it enabled. Uh, could we do Azure Active Directory? Sure, but I'm not gonna turn that on. We have the option between KubeNet and Azure CNI. If you choose that, you have a lot more options, but we're gonna stick with Cube, uh, Cube CNI, and we can't use Azure option unless we're using Azure CNI. Uh, notice we can use uh, Calico, but we're not doing any network policy, so it does not matter here today. Um, we probably want routing, but we're not gonna do it that way. Uh, we don't care about container registry right now. We don't care about Azure policies. Uh, we don't need to worry about uh, encrypting the secret store. That's kind of similar to KMS, so Azure Key Vault would be the way to secure your secrets in a more secure way. And we'll go ahead and review and create. And so this will take a bit of time. It takes longer than Google cl uh, Cloud, but way faster than uh, AWS, okay? So we'll go ahead and create this and we'll wait a while and I'll see you back here in a bit. I'm just waiting for the next screen to make sure that it is working correctly. There we go. And so we'll wait till this is done, okay? So see you then. All right, so we are back. Uh, didn't have to wait super long. I don't know if it tells us the time here, but um, again, not super long to wait, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but down below it says connect to cluster and that's the first thing we want to do. So let's click that and we get a bunch of instructions. So that's kind of nice. And so here it says open cloud shell and run these two commands. So if we press this here, it actually runs the first two for us, which is nice. And uh, from the Google Cloud one, you remember we had a shell. So Azure has a shell, it's not as nice, okay? <laughs> Um, it does have a code editor, but like, and I don't know if we showed the Google Cloud run code editor. I'll probably show it now because I'm actually jumping between all of them right now, even though for you, it doesn't seem that way. Um, but it has a code editor and it is a terrible code editor. Just awful. And it's weird because like Microsoft makes Visual Studio Code and you think that they would do a much better job here for it. But notice that it ran uh, these two commands here. So it ran them for us. So we're in there. And so now all we have to do is kind of run the stuff kind of here. Uh, but looking through here, this stuff isn't very particularly useful. Um, so I'm just trying to think here, what did I do? I'm gonna go look at my instructions because I think they had a sample app and that's what I ended up using is their uh, the app that they provide there. Yeah, so I looked up, I think what I did is I looked up Ingress because it was getting pretty confusing how to do it. Because when I went over to uh, micro, Microsoft here, and by the way, let's just test kubectl to see if it's working. Sorry for the small font. I don't know if there's much I can do about that. Not really. Font size, large, ugh. <laughs> Cube, get pods, so we'll say get pods here. All right, and we'll do hyphen A. And we'll just expand this so we can at least see what's going on here. Okay, and so a lot less is running here than what we see for uh, Google Cloud, but you see Core DNS, um, CSI, Azure Disk, so it's 
that's how the disk is being persisted with uh, persistent volumes, metric server, tunnel front. Okay, so what we'll do is minimize this for a second. Uh, is it still here? Is this it? Uh, what'd you do, Azure? <laughs> Azure's interface is so janky. Uh, but I, oh yeah, we just can click it again, we can reopen it. I just wanted to make sure we could find it. So here uh, is our Kubernetes cluster. So like, they're very good about showing us the latest stuff. So if you go there, you can see it and go, click into it. And um, it's similar to Google Cloud. So we can see namespaces, we can add namespaces. We actually see a little bit more information. So we see workloads. These are all the system ones. And I don't remember in Google Cloud is them really showing us those. At least they filter them out. So we have uh, deployments, pods, replica sets, stateful sets, daemons, uh, JSON, cron jobs. And you can add stuff, but it's not as nice. So you go add with YAML, right? <laughs> it's not like a nice big old interface. Though there is like with quick start applications, but these are like applications. So you would choose deploy an application voter sample application. Yeah, so that's the sample app that you can deploy. So like we could deploy that, but I'd rather just kind of go through the steps ourselves so we actually learn something and not just press a bunch of buttons and have it do it for us. But no, it's like service ingress. It's not gonna be as nice as a Google Cloud, just period. Uh, then we got our node pools and stuff down below here, but you can integrate like GitOps into it. So I, it's whatever like GitHub actions or whatever Azure uses. But um, what I wanna do here is bring back up our terminal here and we are going to look up ingress Kubernetes Azure or Azure um, or AKS. Now, the one thing about Microsoft is sometimes their services are clunky, like like they're either really good or they're just like, there's nothing there, but they're always really good about being able to copy paste and get things done via the uh, terminal. So I know the first thing we need to do is do a basic configuration. So we need to have um, an ingress controller. And so this one's gonna be the NGX, N, NGINX ingress controller that we're gonna use. So we're gonna copy the contents of this and we're gonna go back over to here. And we're gonna go ahead and just paste that on in. And it's gonna use Helm. It's going to install the ingress controller. Like AWS has their own, but for whatever reason, Kubernetes is using NGINX. But you can configure whatever you want. So they have a more customized, complicated one, which we're not going to do. But once our ingress controller is created, um, we are going to then uh, build out these demos. So go back over here and it is running. Okay, great. So now the next thing is we need to get these two files because this is the app they have. They have, I guess we don't need both. Um, Cause when I ran it, I just did both because they said to do both. We'll do both because they might have routes for both and I don't feel like copy and pasting them out. So what we'll do is we'll need to create two files. We'll have to do touch app, uh, app one YAML and we'll say touch app two YAML. And then here we'll type in code app one YAML to open up in the, uh, the editor here. Uh, and I have the code here from prior. So I'll, what I'll do here, I'm just gonna remove my old ones so that you can go through the pain that I went through getting these going here. Okay, and so just type clear here. We refresh that, they're gone, good. This this file's not actually here, just pretend that it's not here. Uh, so I'll do touch app one YAML and we'll say code app one YAML here. Okay, it's empty, right? So then we'll go over here, we will copy the contents, paste it on in. Did I get it? Yeah, okay, uh, right click paste, where's paste? Control V, I can't right click paste, but I can go control V, whatever. <laughs> and uh, we'll go to the top right corner, save. Code app to YAML. Okay, down here, copy. Uh, control V, yeah. this is what I'm talking about. Their editor is terrible, makes no sense. And then we'll say uh, code routes.yaml because we need to set up um, is it ingress? Yeah, it's ingress. And they have a pretty compl complex routing for us. So we'll copy that and we will control V and save it. And uh, so now we have our three. Now I wanna get this code editor out of the way if it'll let me, I guess is the best I can do. And we'll need to run these. Now, here's the thing. They say to run these like this, but I'll show you what happens. 
Makes no sense what happens here. So I'm just going to paste that on in. Notice I have to right click paste there and I can't control V there. It just makes no sense. Uh, so if I do app one, it does, it goes, cannot find the file. And I, I don't know why, because if you go LS, it's right there. So what I did is for when we were doing our service mesh, we learned that there was a way to pipe the contents of a file uh, there. And so I tried that and that works. So instead of doing that, we do cat app one. Yeah, I'm just gonna show you that dumps the dumps the content there, but we can make a pipe and then say kubectl apply hyphen f. Uh, and so the contents will be this hyphen here. Don't ask me how it works. I just know how it works. Ingress basic, because this is the namespace that this, this stuff is all being provisioned to, if you noticed. I didn't point that out, but... Uh, well, we uh, the, uh, the controller is in there. Anyway, so if we hit uh, enter here. That'll be one. I hit up. I hit control A. And I move over to two. And that's two. And then we do our routes. Can't always trust written tutorials. You have to learn. Okay, and so now we have all that stuff set up. So now what I want to do is just see uh, our ingress here. So kubectl get, actually we can do all for fun. Uh, get all uh, hyphen all, we learned that in our namespaces tutorial and do hyphen and ingress basic and just see what we have here. Um, No, oh, maybe we don't need the hyphen hyphen all. That's probably for deleting. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so here we can see a bunch of stuff. We have our pods, our services, our deployments, our replica sets, but it's not showing us ingress. And that's actually what we want to see. So we'll go ing. And I think it's working. Usually what I'm looking for is if it has an address, because if it has an address, then ingress is working, right? If there is no address there, then we have a problem. And I know because I spent so much time doing this the wrong way and being like, where's the darn address? So if you got this wrong, just shut everything down, start over, because it's super hard to debug. Um, but if we copy this, we should be able to go up here and just like paste it on in. And there it is, okay? Another way we could see this is if we um, were here and we go to our workloads, and nope, sorry, ingress. And you go over here and we can see the IP address there. So normally when you set up something, it's going to have a load balancer, but for whatever reason, it doesn't with this one, doesn't set up a load balancer. So I don't know why, so, but that's fine. Like it, there is a load balancer, but I just mean like a managed load balancer. Like if we used whatever there's a called application gateway, um, the load balancers in Kubernetes or sorry, uh, Azure are a little bit funny names. Like there's one called, like they call them gateways a lot, like application gateway and stuff like that. They don't call them load balancers, but it doesn't set up one, but uh, we're all done here. We accomplished our goal. So in order to shut this down, what I'm gonna do is go uh, um, uh, look up resources because it's all a resource group. So it should be easy for us to shut down. We go to resource groups and I call this one Kate's example. So we click into that and there's our cluster and we're gonna go ahead and delete the resource group. And then we say Kate's example, we go ahead, we hit delete. And that's it. And just make sure that it deletes. Azure is a bit buggy, okay? You really don't want this running uh, and causing you money, but I'm shutting my down. Just make sure to refresh, double check. Um, Azure is notorious for like being delayed in terms of updating. So just come back after 30 minutes, an hour. And just make sure that resource group is gone. Hit the refresh, triple check, just be sure, okay? Uh, but that's it. We finished um, our Kubernetes cluster for Azure. Hurrah. <laughs>
Um, and it, uh, for me, I can do it because I really know AWS inside and out, but like if somebody was new to it, it's super, super painful. But what we'll do is we'll go to the top here and type in EKS. Of course, you'll need an AWS account. And so we'll go over here. And the first thing we are going to do when it goes here is we're going to add a cluster. We'll go and create ourselves a cluster. I'm gonna call mine EKS example, all right? And it lets us choose the Kubernetes version. We're gonna need a cluster service role. Um, I'm not sure, select and I wonder if it'll just let us make one. I, I remember oh, my other account, I already had one, so I must have created one uh, prior, but I guess what we'll need is we'll need that cluster role. And so there's a couple ways we can do it. So here it gives you the instructions to do it, or what we can do is use this CloudFormation template. So I am going to use this CloudFormation template. You think they'd have a link just to launch it prior to 2020, et cetera, et cetera, uh, whatever. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll copy the contents here. I'll tell you, AWS does not make it easy. Uh, and we'll go to CloudFormation. It's almost like they want you to use their managed uh, container services. <laughs> but uh, we'll go over to CloudFormation. This is an infrastructure as a service tool for setting stuff up. Uh, notice like our Cloud9 environments are over here. So that all got set up here. We'll create a new stack. And um, we want to provide the template. So template is ready. I just want to, uh, I guess I'll have to save it. So what we'll need to do is open up any kind of editor. So I have a VS Code on my local computer. So I'm just going to go grab that. If it will open here, there we go. It's opening off screen here. I'll, I'll show it to you in a moment. Okay, so I have, I'm just saving the file over here. You can see I have a bunch of other cool scripts there. We're gonna go save that to our desktop. Okay, I'm gonna go to my desktop here. I'm just not sure what's on my desktop, so that's why I'm just not uh, uh, sharing it very clearly. And I'm just gonna call this um, application.yaml. Okay, just notice over here it says application.yaml, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And so now what I'll do is go back to CloudFormation and I guess we'll just upload the template here on our desktop. There it is, we'll say open. And we'll say next. Um, cluster or EKS cluster IAM rule. It's so silly that it's like this. I wish it was a managed rule. It looked like they're saying that it was at one point. Just create it. Just make it for me here, AWS. Please acknowledge, yeah, 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 yeah. All these warnings for a role. Um, prior to 2020, had an entry with the uh, service link role, the policy is no longer required. Okay, well anyway, uh, we'll let that create there for a moment. It should not take much time at all because it's a role. Roles should be super, super fast. And we'll just keep hitting refresh till it works. And there, it's created. So if we go to Stack Info, we can see that it's completed as well. We'll go back over here and we'll refresh. And there is our role. So we'll scroll on down. Notice we can encrypt our, um, we can use, uh, encrypt our secrets using KMS. So that is AWS's key management service. So that's a great way to encrypt your secrets. Then we have all these subnets. And um, I already know that's gonna tell us to like pare this down. It's not gonna like them all, but, um, what we'll do is we will scroll on past there. We can see, we can choose IPv4, IPv6. I'm gonna leave it IPv4. Public, public, private, private, we'll leave it public. There's some advanced settings. We're not gonna to touch that. Um, notice that it's using VPN CNI. So Amazon has its own, I guess, uh, plugin and it's going to automatically install that for us, The uh, for that. Then we can choose a particular version uh, for this. So it'll be whatever version there. We'll have core DNS, we choose a version there. We can choose our cube proxy version. We'll go next. Uh, this is nice. We can actually get all logging into CloudWatch logs, but I don't care about any of this. So I'm just gonna say next. And then here we have our tags, our networking, stuff like that. And I'm expecting it will complain. Okay, we'll hit create. Because usually it doesn't work because it will say, cannot create the cluster because there's not a sufficient capacity to support the cluster. So it could be based on AWS not having enough resources or that's probably what it is. So what I do is I just like take off the last three and then I hope that it works. Just double checking there and we'll go next, next, create. And there we go. Now, here's the part that's crazy. This is gonna take 
at least 30 minutes to spin up, all right? It takes the longest, I have no idea why, but um, I literally am doing this uh, uh, and, and I'm gonna be doing other follow-alongs while I'm waiting for this to spin up. And so I'm gonna stop the video here. I'll be back in a moment, but just go take a break, watch your favorite episode of a show. And also if you are spinning this up, we probably should talk about cost. So if we go uh, AWS EKS pricing, Right, because if you don't have a lot of money, you might not want to be doing this. But if you go to, <laughs> I might already told you this, but it's going to be ten cents per hour just for the um, control plane node. So that's going to be the one that controls all of our nodes, and then we spin up other ones there. And EKS can actually run either on EC2, so you can run EC2 instances. So you just spin up those nodes, and they're always running. Or it can use a Fargate. So Fargate is serverless containers, meaning that. Uh, you only pay for what you use, so you don't pay for servers running all the time, but that means that there will be cold starts. You can even deploy this on Outpost. So Outpost is like a, a server rack that could be put in uh, a data center and runs AWS specific stuff. So if you want to deploy there as well, you can do that. But um, that's all we're talking about for that for now. And I'll see you back here in a bit. All right, so after a really, 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 really long wait, the longest wait you'll ever have to wait for a cluster, EKS is ready. Uh, just beware, hit that uh, refresh because sometimes it's ready, it'll just not update and you have to hit that button once in a while, okay? Uh, so uh, if you go here, we have compute. Uh, we'll have to create some node groups. We have networking, we have add-ons, authentication, logging. Uh, it's a little bit more bare bones. They're not really giving you a whole lot here. We can see our workloads here if we click into them, but you don't get the same kind of controls we saw in Azure Kubernetes service and um, Google Cloud Kubernetes service, like where we could launch things and stuff like that. So really it is CLI driven. Again, EKS is the hardest to set up, but it is pretty powerful, but not from like an easy to use kind of uh, perspective, but we are gonna need some uh, nodes. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up my instructions uh, off screen here because it is super hard, <laughs> super hard uh, to set this stuff up, okay? And so um, the first thing I think we'll need is we'll need to open up Cloud Shell. So I'm gonna open up Cloud Shell here at the top there. Oh, it goes to a whole new page. You think like the other ones like they load in place, but nope, not AWS, it launches in a new one. They were, the, they were the third provider in the first tier providers to get a Cloud Shell. So no surprise there. I guess theirs is a bit clunky, that's fine. Uh, and it doesn't have like a code editor built in, but like you don't need it because you got Cloud9, so it's not a big deal. So we'll pull up uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service again here, just so we have it on this tab over here. And um, we're gonna have to really rely on a tutorial for this. So um, uh, we'll just say Cloud Shell EKS, because AWS does not have good instructions here. The, this person here, great instructions, okay? So I'm gonna go here and what I'll do is I'll just first make a bin directory, waiting for that Cloud Shell environment. It's also the slowest to start, okay? And the font is like super small. So we'll go here and we'll just go a little extra large. Okay, and we are in better shape. So I'll go ahead and paste those commands in. Good. So it's gonna create a bin directory for us. We're gonna install kubectl. Okay. We are going to um, update config. This, this allows kubectl to talk to our cluster. All right, hit enter on this one. Sometimes when you paste it in, the last command doesn't get executed. You have to hit enter, so just be careful there. The name here, I, I believe we call it EKS example. I'm just gonna double check. Yeah, it is, okay. Um, and then we want to install EKS CTL. So EKS CTL is the, um, is AWS's CLI for EKS and it's, a way of making it a lot easier to, uh, way of working with EKS. We could have even provisioned um, our cluster this way, but that's not how I did it, okay? So what we'll do is copy this contents here, paste it on in, hit paste, enter. And we'll go back over here to our instructions and Helm, because we will need Helm because that is what we will need to install the um, the ingress controller. So remember when we were doing, or whatever it's called, the uh, controller, yeah. When we were doing the uh, Azure one, we used Helm to install. I, I went through very quickly, but we used Helm to install it. And so it's gonna be the same for AWS. 
So now that we have it, we need to um, actually create a node and or nodes, and those are managed with node groups. So back in our cluster, we'll go to workloads or configuration, I guess, and we'll go to compute and we'll add a node group and we'll say my node group. And then what we'll need is an IAM rule. So it's a little bit silly because we have to go to IAM console and make our own now. And we also have to look up how to make one. So we have the IAM cluster node. We looked that up earlier, but if you're still have that link open, you go under there, there's the node IAM rule. And they don't give you a cloud formation template for whatever reason, um, but we can just create it in the CLI. But um, I'm just looking here. I did it this way. I went through the management console because it was easier. So here we'll click on, uh, or we already have it open up here and I'm gonna create a new role. I'm gonna follow these instructions. The thing is AWS has great documentation, but it's very easy to like glance over the most important information because it's so text heavy, not broken up in a way that's easy. But what we'll do is we will create one for, I think it's for EC2. Yeah, so we'll choose EC2. The reason it changes this interface, I do not like it. Why is it so light and gray? It looks like it uh, doesn't work. And then this interface is still little, doesn't make any sense, but we need this one, this one, and this one. So we will copy that name and we need that policy. We'll hit enter, we'll grab that, then clear the filters. It's still selected, see that? That means that there's a, a policy selected even though we don't see it. We'll hit enter on that one. We'll select that one. So now we have two and uh, we'll go back up here and then it says, you probably want this one. I go, okay, great. And then we select that. So we have our three, we'll go next, make sure you have the three that are there and we'll go back and then it has a nice name for us. Doesn't matter what we name it, but I'm gonna stick with the name that they have here. Paste it on in, go to the bottom, create the role and our role is created. So we can close that tab, go back over here, refresh. If you didn't know AWS and you weren't like used to doing this, like for some services, this would be super painful for me. It wasn't too hard, but I can imagine hard. We don't need a launch template. That's totally fine. Labels, taints, tags, don't care. Ebs on links too. Notice it's using the T3 medium, just like what we were using on cloud nine. So that four gigabytes is a good option. 20 uh, disk size, I like to do higher, like 30. Well, um, we'll leave it at 20. We'll leave it at 20 because when we're running it on cloud nine, it's sharing both the control plane and the worker node, like all the, uh, the data plane. So the idea is that 20 is probably enough for our nodes. I'm gonna put one minimum to maximum desired is one and one so that we are saving money here. Not like when we were doing it with uh, Google Cloud <laughs> or Azure in particular. Uh, so there are three subnets, so those are fine. We'll hit next. This all looks fine. We'll hit create. And now we have to wait for those nodes to spin up. While that is going, let's go find our instructions for um, ingress. So what I'm gonna do is type in ingress EKS. Click the first one here, and this is the right one. And so when I first did this, I did not wanna read all this. And so I kind of skipped through it and then I found out I had to do all these steps. So these are some things that we're gonna to have to do. So there's a bunch of prerequisites. So the idea is that we are gonna be using application load balancer. So that's AWS's load balancer. And then we're gonna use ingress uh, in order to um, uh, get to our app. And they all even have a fun example app that we're going to be using. But before we can do that, we're going to have to do a bunch of stuff. The first thing is to install the application load ba uh, balancer controller, okay? And so here we will right click and we'll have to do a bunch of stuff. So the first thing is we'll need to create an IAM policy. So we'll go ahead and the nice thing is they just have raw data here. So we can just hit copy. We don't have to do a crazy amount of work. We'll go back to our cloud shell, paste this on in here. We'll go back to our instructions. So we've uh, downloaded, we just download the file and so now we'll end up creating it. So this is the same thing as if we went through the, the IAM policy and did it all manually. So we'll hit paste, hit enter. And now we have the policy created. That's one step. And we installed EKS uh, a CTL because we need to um, install the IAM service. And actually when I ran this, I forgot to replace the my cluster part here. So I'm gonna make sure I don't forget to do that. 
And I'm going to copy this here. And I'm going to paste. And if you right click paste, it usually always pops up like that. So we'll say EKS cluster. Make sure you don't spell that wrong. It's a pain to fix. Okay. Uh, or sorry, EKS example. See, I'm already going, I'm already doing it wrong. So 100% make sure that's right because it's such a pain to fix. Um, and then we need our IP, uh, our um, account ID. So on another tab here, if you could drop down, there's the account ID as well. So I'm going to paste that on in there. Okay. And so that should be all good. Notice the namespace is going to be cube, cube system. So it's launching in the, uh, the systems namespace. You usually don't do that, but for this case you do. And we'll hit paste. And that will create a service account. And it says unable to create IAM count without an IAM uh, OCID provider. So it says EKS CTL utils run this first. So it's just that EKS, we haven't ran EKS uh, um, CTL. And so we just have to basically kind of authenticate. And it goes here and says, hey, if you want to run this, you have to hit, you have to run approve, okay? Because that was just a dry run. So we do this. Okay, and that worked. And then what we need to do is go back and run this. I'm hitting up, making sure that name is correct, making sure that account ID number is right. Again, it's a big pain to fix. Run that. And it's gonna go ahead and create us a service account. waiting for CloudFormation stack. So it's actually spinning up a, a CloudFormation stack. So I think when we delete our cluster, then we can just like tear all this stuff down, which makes it a lot easier, eh? So we are gonna wait on that there for a bit. We'll go back to EKS and also see if our nodes are ready. So I don't see our nodes yet. We refresh here. Oh, we just had to refresh, there it is. And these, I probably show up on EC2. So if we go over to EC2, We should see, there it is, okay? Um, so that is our EC2 instance running. We do not see the control plane. AWS is managing it. We can't touch it, okay? So we'll go back over here. This one has finished. Our node is ready so we can deploy stuff to it, but we're still installing this thing here. So we'll go back over here. And so now we're gonna use a Helm chart to actually install the application, the AWS load balancer now that we have our permissions. So we grab this first line here, we paste it on in, we hit enter. Oh, it says it doesn't know what Helm is. What are you talking about? Because <laughs> we definitely installed it. So let's go back to this instructions here. Did I not copy and paste this? Maybe we didn't run the last line. So we'll hit enter here, paste, enter, Helm. Okay, there we go. We'll hit enter. Okay, so EKS has been added. So now uh, we'll make sure that it's up to date, the repo or whatever, whatever it wants there, repo update. And then the next thing is to actually uh, install it. So we'll scroll past this stuff is saying uh, different use cases. So we'll grab this one where it's actually installing it. We will right click paste, paste it in, hit enter, enter. Oh, stop, 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 stop. This is where I messed up. I, I, I put the wrong name in here. Okay, so I wanna paste this in again like this. And this is where I ran this issue where I didn't have the right name. So I'm gonna type in EKS example. So sorry about that. And I'm gonna make sure this is spelled the same way. Capital E, it's case sensitive. I really should have just made it all lowercase for us. This looks fine, we'll hit paste. Cannot reuse a name that is still in use. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a pain. Um, now I don't know because we messed it up. So maybe we can uninstall it. I don't know, like Helm uninstall. Helm uninstall. Uninstall a release. So it is possible to do that. So I'm really hoping that we can uninstall whatever mess I made there. I should have just let it run and then corrected it. I don't know if we need um, the second part here, but I'll just do this. Not found. Oh, 
I know it's going to the cube system CTL, so we'll do, um, dang it. <laughs> it's not gonna let me do it again, is it? Let's try this again, hit enter. Cannot reuse a name that is still in use. Huh, okay. So we'll do kubectl, get pods. Uh, we'll say cube system. You're never supposed to really touch cube system. That's that's the idea here. Uh, yeah, cube system. I've got to put an N on this. So I don't see anything there that's important. I guess we'll have to look at the Helm chart and see what it's actually installing. So we'll type in, um, this is where this is where the pain was. And this is actually where I messed it up and it became really hard. And uh, I mean, like I made it even worse than before. So what we'll do, it's not all lost. It's just that we have to deter, have a little bit of a detour now. Hopefully you don't have to do this and uh, you don't make that mistake and you just carefully watch the video. But there is this thing here that's on Helm. So if I type this in, We go a Helm chart. It should be an artifact here. And so the idea is that if we open this, we'll see the contents of it, right? Which we learned in our Helm tutorial. So just going through here. I'm looking for the actual contents of the repo. What does it install? Templates. Installs a deployment, ingress class. A bunch of things. Okay. Uh, but what are they called though? Because maybe you'll have like the default name in here in the values. Anyway, I'm going to be back. I'm going to try to figure this out, but I really wish I didn't do that. All right, so one other thing I might try here is by doing, an, uh, I think they say an upgrade. Was it? Uh, I'm just on Stack Overflow on the right-hand side. So use an upgrade and then do uh, hyphen I flag in, uh, install the release if it doesn't exist. So we'll, what we'll do is we're going to copy this and I'm just going to see if this works as a fix, right? If you installed and you didn't make the mistake, then you are fine. But for me, whoops, we don't want to change the system, uh, the that there, but this is just kind of painful. So what we'll do is say EKS example here, make sure that is right. And then we will go ahead and hit paste, hit enter. Well, it's only gonna work if I type it right, you know, so upgrade. EKS, example, paste. Oh, nice, okay. So we are super, super lucky that we're back in business here. Um, so we'll go back over to our tutorial and here we can verify whether it's working. So we'll go over here, paste it in. Okay, that looks fine. And then uh, we'll go back over here and that's all there is to that part. Next part is we need to do this tagging for our subnets because if we don't do it, it doesn't know where to use the load balancer. So what we need to do is go back to EKS. If we go to details, it should show us the um, subnets here. So I'm gonna open one, two, and three, and then we're gonna have to add tags. So we'll give it a moment there. And so there, this one is. We'll checkbox it, go to tags. I told you, AWS is a lot of work. Um, and so we need, I'm just going to open all three. So I don't have to like figure this stuff out here, manage tags, manage tags. And okay. So the first one is this. So we grab this, paste it in, and this is going to be EKS example shared. Okay. I'm just going to copy that. So I don't have to keep typing it. 
shared, shared. And we don't just need one tag, we need two tags. So go here and then they say you need this one as well. So we'll go here and then the value here is one and then here and then the value here is one and then we go here and the value here is one and then we'll go save, save and save. Okay. Oh, you know what? This is for private. It's supposed to be this one. For, oh, for frick's sakes. No biggie. We'll just go and edit those. You can just tell, like, EKS just crushes my spirit. Okay, we'll just go back over here. Copy that. Why won't it paste? Oh, I can't actually remove it. Okay. So stupid that interface is. Um, we'll go over to here, remove, and then one, and hit save, and then go back to here, and then we'll uh, add this here, and then remove that one, and hit save. Great, so those are all updated. So now we meet all of our requirements. So the next thing that we want to do is run the fun app that comes along here. So they have a sample app, and they are using Fargate, but we are not using Fargate, so we'll skip that, and we'll just go ahead and grab this, it's going to launch right into our node. And so we'll paste this in and we'll hit enter. And it says that it's created the app. Um, and if we want to see the contents of that file, like we can just paste the link up here. And if we just take this out, we can actually see what's here. So we have a service, ingress, a deployment, and a namespace. Okay. And the game is uh, 2048. You might have heard of this game before. And I think that's it, but I'll double check the instructions, see if there's anything additional here. Uh, no, but it will say, oh, I guess we downloaded the file. We actually have to run it. <laughs> okay, so we will, oh, no, no, I think we did. Yeah, we ran it. Okay, the instructions are really weird how they just kind of have weird iterations there of the same thing. But uh, if we do go down below here and we do the get ingress, right? If we check our ingress, Right, and it, if it has an address, that's how you always know if this stuff is working. So if we copy this and go anywhere up here, it says cannot be reached. Okay, uh, but it has a port. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just double check to make sure everything's working correctly. I'm gonna go over to um, EC2 here because that's where uh, our load balancers are because it created an ALB, right? And if I go to the load balancer here, I was just hoping that it worked. And so there is our load balancer. And I'm just going to make sure that it can be reached. It's also possible that the node is still starting and there's nothing wrong uh, with it. And so this would normally have a target. This is an ALB, right? So this should, oh, we actually have to go to target groups to see. If we go to target groups here and select, uh, it says healthy. Targets, it has targets. It says initial, target registration is in progress. So it's still making like uh, determining whether they're healthy. Okay, so now it's healthy. If we go back here and try it, does it work? There we go, cool. And so we have a game. So join the two numbers to get started. Uh, uh, okay, use your arrow keys, oh, okay. Somebody in the bus had too much time on their hands. They're like, okay, what excuse can I have to make a game? <laughs> they probably worked in like the Kubernetes department or EKS. But anyway, that's a fun game and it's cool that we get to deploy that. So now we are all done. That was the hardest one. That was super hard. And so what we'll do is go over to EKS and we'll go ahead and delete it. Uh, to confirm, type in my node group, sorry. So just notice we are not deleting the cluster first. Go to EKS, carefully you don't click on ECS, otherwise you go somewhere weird. But we have to de destroy the node group first. I know this because it will complain if we don't. So we call this my node group. That's what it's telling us to type in. And then once that is gone, then we can go ahead and delete the cluster. I can try this right now, but I don't know if it'll take it until the node group's gone. It's, it hasn't finished attaching yet, so. I'll be back here in a little bit. It takes a little bit of time to delete. All right, so now that our node group has been deleted, we can go ahead and delete our cluster. So we'll go to the top here, delete our cluster, 
um, and type in EKS example. Now, AWS is not like um, Azure and GCP where they have uh, resource groups or projects. So you gotta be really careful about what is lingering here. So just make sure, double check to make sure these things are deleted after it's deleted. Uh, we did create a load balancer, um, but it was created through Kubernetes. So I'm hoping that it just deletes itself. But if it doesn't, you should double check because uh, a load balancer is gonna cost you 15 bucks a month if you forget to delete it. If you go to the left-hand side uh, to EC2 and go to load balancers, you know, it should be deleting or something like that. And, uh, you know, CloudFormation, some of these things were spun up there. So sometimes that's a good indicator if they're all getting torn down. So I'm gonna go over here and just double check. And so we have the cluster rule. Ah, the load bouncer is here. Okay. And so if I go to resources, it's just a roll. So there's no load balancer here. So I'm really hoping that it tears it down. So what I'll do is I will, I guess I'll just have to make sure. I'll just, uh, I'll have a, I'll check back in here with you and just make sure that it's gone. Well, here, this one's gone. So let's go check the EC2 instance. I didn't think it would delete the cluster that fast because it takes so long to create clusters. If we go to our load balancer, it's still here. So, Tricky, tricky AWS. So we'll go ahead and delete it. And that should be that. I'm gonna just double check, is there any auto scaling groups? There shouldn't be. Nope, we're fine. So that was the only thing I was really worried about was that auto or that uh, application load balancer because that costs you 15 bucks a month if you forget about it. But uh, now you're A-OK -okay, and we did the hardest one. So uh, uh, feel proud uh, that you've uh, tackled uh, some of the hardest uh, managed providers and uh, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, we're gonna look at how to utilize uh, IBM's uh, offering for Kubernetes. So here I have an IBM account, you'll have to go create one. And I'm gonna go ahead and log in uh, to my account. And they do have a very sleek UI, I have to say, for um, uh, a cloud provider. And so we'll give a moment to log in here. Now I did already launch a cluster and the reason why is just it takes so long to launch them. And I really don't want to have to launch one and wait. So what I'll do is I'll kind of piecemeal this in the sense that I will uh, show you kind of the creation process, but I won't hit the create button and then we'll go to the active cluster and we'll see if we can kind of do stuff there. So what I want to do is just make sure uh, my running cluster is already there. So I'm just kind of trying to remember, I don't use IBM Cloud too much, so I'm not sure uh, the interface too much, but if I go to Kubernetes here, I should have a cluster already running because it did take a long time for it to spin up. Like, longer than AWS. So I, I think uh, Kubernetes or uh, IBM wins the longest time to revision control plane award. Uh, if there is ever a award, not a good award to, to win, but the idea here is you'll go to IBM Cloud on the left-hand side and you're gonna go to Kubernetes. And then from there, you're gonna create a new cluster. So I'll hit, I guess I can't right click that, but we click it and they have uh, two plans and don't get shocked here. I know this says $2,500 and that is a bit crazy. Okay, but they do have a free plan and that could be the reason why it takes so long to provision, maybe it's slower. So you, they have a free plan that lasts for uh, a cluster that will last for their days and then it'll automatically delete. It's for uh, just tinkering around and doing things with. So notice that it is free, but there can be some additional charges. But let's take a look at the standard to understand the cost of Kubernetes on IBM Cloud. So down below we have I, uh, uh, Classic and VPC, and then uh, you can choose your resource group. Um, for whatever, and then it just shows you geography, availability, metro, so metro is just, I guess, the town or whatever. Uh, and then notice down below, this is basically the cost here that's driving up is the amount of nodes. But if we scroll past it for a second, there's these integrations that they have, which is nice, activity tracking, logging, monitoring. And so these technically add a cost, but if you check the box them off, it actually doesn't really lower the cost there. So it's not a true cost, but if we go up here, maybe the problem is our instance is too large, so it's a 16 gigabytes. We know that um, the minimum should probably be something like four. So if we switch over to uh, four here, and I'm just looking which one's cheaper, this one's the cheaper one. And so we will uh, choose that one, so save per tool, uh, tool. And now it's down to $982, still really, really expensive. So let's go down to one node and Look, it's $340. So for whatever reason, I don't know the logic behind it, uh, but it's extremely, extremely expensive. But hold on here, let's take a look here. So this is 15 cents here. 
It still says three workers. Three zones. Ah, okay, so that's the reason why it's so darn expensive. So if we were to reduce the amount of zones, there we go. Okay, so that looks a lot more reasonable. So this says $100, and I guess that actually is pretty cost effective. So like if we had a two v, uh, C, uh, uh, vCPUs and four memory, let's go take a look here. So if we go, as a comparison, we'll use EWS for pricing here. Uh, and so we were using a T3 medium. So if we go to a T3 medium and we look at the cost, it says 0336 and theirs is 015 cents for something comparable. At least that's what I, it looks comparable to me. And we go 730, so it'd be $24. But like with the control plane, it pretty much is the same cost, but overall the worker nodes are more expensive. So if you had to scale up for whatever reason, IBM Cloud is super, 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 super expensive. Uh, all I can think of is that maybe there's something I don't understand about um, this VM. So I'm just trying to look if there's something maybe more cost effective. So like if we went virtual shared, I'm just trying to find the lowest cost here. No. So I guess they're just generally expensive. <laughs> uh, okay. So, but anyway, the idea is you'd go free and then you'd uh, uh, create the cluster. I can't make more than one free cluster, but you create it. And then what it will do is it will start to uh, provision, like it'll get it ready to go. And I'm gonna tell you, it takes forever. So it'll start the control plane and then it has to start the nodes. So you will see it, um, if we go over here to the IBM Cloud, yeah, um, you'll see like here, it'll be like progress, 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 progress. And then when that finishes, it'll say available. And you'll go to the worker nodes and this will be like progress, 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 progress. But they do have a really nice interface. So it's not showing up here, but it was showing me instructions before if I click help. Yeah, there it is. And so it popped up and it was like, here's your instructions. And I really liked that. Uh, and another thing is it has the Kubernetes dashboard. So you press it. And I mean, I, I haven't seen it work yet, but I'll click it and we should be able to get our dashboard. So that's really nice. I don't see any of the providers doing that. And I don't know why they don't do that because it's super, super nice. Um, yeah, I like that. But uh, let's see if we can connect, never done it before. So IBM has their own cloud shell. So we'll click on that and add that there. We'll see if we can get like an ingress controller connection. We might not be able to do it on the free tier, but let's see what we can accomplish. And while that's going, I'm just pulling up some instructions here to see if I have some um, reusable ones here. There we go. So this one's up. I'm not sure if there's a way for me to increase the font here. Um, I don't see an option. I can try Control Plus, which is kind of uh, a weird way of doing it, but it will work. And so we'll go back over here. This will be all over, uh, too large. And we'll copy this line here. That's to connect to the cluster. So we'll paste that on in. We'll hit enter. And we'll type in kubectl get pods hyphen a just to kind of look at what there is. And they got Calico, Core DNS, uh, Dashboard Metrics. Hopefully every time I do this with their providers, you kind of see that everything's a little bit different and uh, we'll carry that information forward. Uh, there's OLM operator, I don't know what that is, but yeah, we have some nodes. So I guess we can go ahead and start launching stuff. So we'll do what we normally do. So we'll do um, kubectl um, create, deploy, nginx, image equals nginx. Um, and I think that is it. Yeah, okay, and we'll hit enter. So we have our deployment. I'm looking here, deploy your app. So set up an image repository, you deploy your app. We already did that. Expose your app. Test access your apps. Create a node port to test your app. Well, if we click this, where does it go? I'm just curious if they like have anything built in. I was thinking maybe we'd go like to the worker nodes or something and, and uh, you know, like how we saw GCP. No, it's just instructions. Okay, so if we go into worker node over here, uh, can we click into this or configure it? No, if we go to the worker pools, um, nothing super exciting. They have this DevOps, which is, I guess, like GitOps. It's probably way like do continuous delivery. So I guess that's kind of nice, but I'm not really seeing any kind of like easy to use interface. So I think like basically it's just 
a cluster with no uh, additional uh, fluff. Now, what's interesting is they do have a bunch of these add-ons here, so you can press it and it will automatically install, so that's kind of nice. Um, but I'm just trying to look around here because I really haven't poked around. It's still add-ons. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So what we'll do is we'll try to, uh, we'll make a service, I guess. So we'll need a note port service. Let's see what they say here. So I guess they're suggesting to make a node port. Get a public IP address worker node in the cluster. If you want to access the worker node from private, get the private IP. What I'm wondering about is like ingress. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Let's say uh, IBM Cloud Ingress Kubernetes. So here we have a service that's being exposed. Uh, then there's IBM provider domain. So yeah, I'm not sure. I guess I could spend more time with it. It looks like this is kind of the ingress here. I wonder if we could just use this. Show more. Oh, it does say Nginx. Um, hmm. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, let's let's try it. Okay, so we'll say uh, kubectl um, expose. Sorry, I'll bump this font up here. I think I went too big here. Deploy. Um, Nginx. Port 80. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Target port 80. That's the way I learn. I, I have to try to like recall from memory and get it right. And then we have the type, right? And we'll say node port. Cool. Um, and so then we need ingress. So we'll go over here to this. And I mean, we've done lots of different um, ingress here. And so um, I don't think there's like an editor per se, no. But uh, what I'll do, I'm just gonna do ls. I'm gonna say vi, I'm gonna say ingress yaml. And this is vi, so everything's hard. So I'm gonna hit i for insert, and then I'm gonna right click and paste. Uh-oh, <laughs> it didn't like that. So I'm gonna hit colon control q. It's all the way over here. Uh, q, q, q quit. So I'm gonna try this again. Control V maybe? Oh, sorry. I control V. Huh. So I don't I can't seem to really paste this in here. So I think we're pretty much bust here because otherwise we in order to get this file in here, we, we either have to connect kubectl on my local computer or something else. So I would say we're pretty much bust here. And I'm not really that worried about trying to get IBM uh, cloud to work, but just more show to show you the interface. We've seen a lot of times how this stuff works. Um, but there is a little bit of trouble here. So I think that's all I can really do here for IBM Cloud. But hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of what it looks like um, for IBM Cloud. But I was hoping what would happen is if we deployed that ingress that maybe it would just work. But then down below, uh, exposing the ALB to your Kubernetes ingress cluster. So there might be like some ALB stuff. So I would think that either maybe you'd have to like enable ALB, but like since we're doing this in the free tier, I don't even know if they give us that. So that's why I, I don't have confidence that we can expose it, but we would need ingress, eh? So I think we're pretty much done here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click in here and we're gonna delete this cluster and we'll, I guess we gotta type it again here. And there we go. And just make sure it is deleting. I'm just gonna refresh here. There we go, and I'll see you later, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, we are gonna learn how to launch a, a Kubernetes cluster on DigitalOcean. So uh, if you've never used DigitalOcean, there 
kind of like a cloud service provider. I call them a third tier cloud, cloud service provider because they were traditionally a VPS, a vir virtual private server, basically just virtual machines. And they've expanded to have a bunch of other stuff such as Kubernetes. So I actually already launched a cluster on here, um, but I am gonna show you how to create one. So uh, DigitalOcean is known for being really, really, really easy to use. So if we go here and create a cluster, and we'll give a moment here. The idea here is we'll select our Kubernetes version. So they have recommended version and then your, your location. So maybe I want Toronto. We have our VPC network. We'll have our node pool name. And then here it's gonna say how many nodes you want. We're gonna go down to one because we wanna save money. And notice that it's making the recommendation of about um, four gigabytes. It says 2.5 of gig, uh, RAM usable. So I guess that's fine. Um, you know, like I, I aim for like two to four uh, gigabytes for for uh, worker nodes like if it's a single node like we're doing with micro k8s on cloud nine then it makes sense to have four gigabytes but here two two will do fine okay so anyway twenty dollars a month very 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 cost effective i don't even know if the control plane costs anything digital ocean kubernetes but here's the thing is like google made it free and then they took it away later on. So even if the control plane is free, I, I, like they might take it away later. Um, I mean, I don't know Kubernetes pricing that well, so I can't say for certain, so I shouldn't say that absolutely, but I can't seem to find the pricing, but I think the, the control plane tier is free, I think. Um, unless one of the nodes is actually the whatever node. So anyway, um, friend downtime that makes sense so we'll have our name here whatever we want to call it and then we go ahead and create the cluster and so we'll wait here a moment and so here it will start to spin up and it says it'll take about four minutes to create usually it has a message there yeah and this is what i like about DigitalOcean is that they give you all the information you need right in place so thank you for using Oh, thank you. Thank you for using managed Kubernetes. Your Kubernetes cluster is being provisioned. Provisioning usually is complete within four minutes. You can configure the cluster as you wait, and then you can go through these steps and it tells you like, how do you connect and all that kind of stuff. So that's really, really nice of them. And they have one click installs, just like how we saw with IBM Cloud. Um, I don't think we saw this for other providers, but like, um, I mean, like Google Cloud had that marketplace. So I guess they do. Um, and I guess Azure, I didn't know, I don't know if we saw a marketplace for Azure, but it's nice if you want to just install a controller. And if we want to do anything, we probably would need an ingress controller if we could figure out how to use it. Um, and so it's pretty clear. Okay. So I already have one running, <laughs> save us time. Cause I don't want to wait a, a hundred years for it to spin up or stop the video and come back here. Uh, so I'm going to go into here. And notice I already spent a dollar after a day, so it's not too bad. Um, but if we go to resources here, we can see our node pool uh, and we can see the two nodes, I guess, underneath. Um, and then there's a load balancer attached. So load balancers and volume should be managed, etc. cetera. Uh, we have uh, any insights here, just waiting for the load. So we get some metrics, so that's nice of them. And there are some settings, uh, but, and they also have a button for Kubernetes dashboard. So that's cool. I didn't notice that before. Only other provider I saw that did that was IBM Cloud, so I like that. So I like having that button there. But anyway, if we scroll on down, um, we might want to go install the Ingress controller. So, because we, if we want to reach the internet, right? So just press that button and it does take some time. And again, that's why I did this ahead of time, just so I don't have to be clicking a thousand things here. But what we want to connect, um, the idea here is we need to install the doctl Kubernetes cluster config thing, this thing here. So in order to do this, we're going to need an environment. So I'm going to go back to my AWS account. We're going to do it via Cloud9, OK? We probably could even do it. Um, uh, oh, sorry, wrong account. Uh, this is developers, uh, Andrew Brown. <laughs> I should already be logged in here, but I'm not. Just give me a moment here. And I think this is the right password. So we'll just paste that on in there. Is it the right account? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. I have more than one account here. And, oh, it's this one. I have a lot of AWS accounts. So we'll get in here and what we'll do is we'll go back to Cloud9. 
We could probably do this in the shell, but just in case we need an editor. Could have went over to GCP, but we haven't done much in GCP, so I don't want to um, force you to be over there, okay? So we'll launch our micro -kates environment, and then what we'll need to do is install the, the, uh, the Docker uh, CTL, right? So they have a guide on that. And DigitalOcean is known for having really, 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 really good guides. They're just known for it. And so they have a snap install, so that's pretty nice. So once it spins up, the idea is we're going to run this line and then using Docker TL integration, kubectl requires uh, kube config. So I guess that would mess with our configuration with micro K8s. Um, hmm. I'm just trying to decide here because you know what? I actually want a fresh environment. I don't want to mess with a micro K8. So we'll just say Docker uh, ENV environment. Unless Docker has its own cloud shell. I don't think it does. It really should get one. That would be really smart. That's a record. Docker, if you're watching, or sorry, not Docker, uh, DigitalOcean, if you're watching, go get your own, like, um, like Git pods, you know? You can also do this in Git pods, but I don't want to switch right now. So this, we don't really need anything large because we're not actually, um, we're not actually running Kubernetes on it. So I'm just going to create this environment and then we'll spin that up. And as that's waiting, we're going to just take a look at what our next steps are. So it says sudo snap install um, that. And I believe I choose Ubuntu, hopefully. And then using this integrations, but we could probably go over here and just run the next line. But we probably have to install kubectl as well, right? Snap runs it in complete isolation. You need to be grant permissions to interact with your systems. Some doc requires this. Requires kube uh, Okay, well, we'll figure it out. I'm sure it's not that hard, but we'll wait for this to spin up. Uh, while we're waiting, we might as well just poke around here. So I guess we already kind of looked at all this. There's nothing really new to look at. Come on, Cloud9. So we're going to have to download this config file for sure. So I'm just going to go ahead and download that now. And, oh, is it almost there? It's connecting. Okay. So now that we're in, uh, we'll have to do sudo snap install kubectl uh, and classic. So I'm starting to remember the, the sudo snap commands. And then for this one, it'll probably just be doctl. Okay. I guess it's DigitalOcean CTL is what it stands for there. And I guess we could probably do this, even though I'm not really 100% sure on it. Because I know when I tested it, I didn't, I didn't do that. I just, I had kubectl and doctl, I ran the one line. Actually, I'm going to run this one because it says I all have to do is this. Access token is required. Okay. Docctl auth init. And so I need an access token. So from here, what we do is we go to the API. And from here, you can see I have a bunch. So I'm just going to delete these. And from here, we're going to say cube, and we'll create it. And this key is going to be temporary, so I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to end up deleting this, so uh, it's not going to be a big deal. So I'm going to paste that in there, hit enter, and it says permission denied. So I'm going to do sudo in the front of there, and then paste it again. And that's fine. So now if I do subtpl get pods, let's see if I get an environment. Connection was refused. Did you specify the host or path? Um, 
Oh, you know what? It's because we didn't run that other line. So let's run this because I think this is just an alternate way. So I think the documentation, didn't we just do that? What if we do sudo on this? Nope. What if we try this again, the auth? Token is valid. Grant. Oh, so doctl config. Maybe we do have to run that other line. This one here. Okay. Paste. And then we'll hit up. Maybe we'll take out the sudo. Maybe it's getting confused because there's sudo there. Huh. Now I did this on my local host and it was like super easy. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, oh, you know what? Um, are we in the right cluster? Hold on. Let me just double check here. Go back to our Kubernetes cluster. I wanna make sure it's the, um, the one that already is running, uh, which is, I wanna do the one that's one day old here. Okay. And we will copy that again. And I will paste that in again. Okay, and I will run docctl auth init again. And I will go grab, oh, <laughs> this is so frustrating. It's probably, you know, my fault there. We'll just generate a new token. Oh, look, there's tokens here. Maybe it created these tokens, tokens you have generated with the API. Oh, I'm confused. Okay, what if we do docctl, whoops. Let's do docctl. Um, kubectl. Is that something we could do? I don't know. I'll be back here in a moment, okay? All right, so every time we try to run docctl auth in it, we get, uh, even though I have an API key here, right? I copy and we paste it here. We get this silly error. So uh, maybe we could just do mkdir home ubuntu. Is there a config directory? There isn't. So I'm just gonna make one. Is that the one it wanted? Okay, and now what if we run it again? Maybe that's the problem. Okay, so doc uh, CTL auth and it worked that time. I'm not seeing any weird additional keys there. We're gonna try this again. Using docctl to snap, grant it via the docctl kubeconfig plug to use this command. So sudo snap this, so we'll try this now. Okay, and I wonder if this, nope, I'm just gonna refresh here because there was things popping up here and I don't know how they should up in the API. Yeah, so there's this now here. I think this just was created when we ran that uh, connect. Okay, and uh, so we'll hit enter again. And for this, it says permission de de uh, denied. So I'm just gonna make it manually. I'm trying to copy it. One second, maybe just copy that. And we'll try this again. There we go. kubectl get pods. There we go. Okay, great. So now um, let's launch ourselves a uh, deploy. So what we'll do here is type in kubectl deploy or uh, create deploy nginx image equals nginx. And then, oh, it already exists. Uh, so maybe I made it prior. kubectl get pods. All right. Uh, we'll do kubectl um, get svc because I've already, I might have already um, created a nginx cluster IP. So I'm just gonna delete those because I was doing that pre, uh, pro, uh, previously and I didn't um, get rid of them. So delete SVC Nginx. Um, kubectl get ingress. I'm just wondering if I have anything there. So I did make one before. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it, okay? Okay, 
So the first thing we want to do, no, so we have our um, pod, right? So we'll do kubectl get or um, create, or sorry, it's expose, expose deploy nginx um, port 80, target port 80. So no, sometimes I do equals and sometimes I don't. You don't, you can do it either way, it doesn't matter. And then the port or the type or kind, or is it type? I think it's type, is node port. And then we'll just do kubectl um, get svc, because I want to make sure that is a node port. There we go. I don't know if it has to be a node port, but that's the one I made. And so the next thing you do is install that uh, nginx ingress, ingress controller. Okay, and so then we need an ingress. So I'm just wondering if we can look this up on the docs here. So Kubernetes, uh, um, I keep on saying Docker, but it's DigitalOcean, DigitalOcean ingress. Okay, so here they have a service um, and this one's just cluster IP, it's not even node port. And then they have a deployment here, which is fine. And then they do a second one for some reason. Okay. They install the Nginx controller. So that's something that we did. So the Nginx controller consists of a pod and a service. Um, the service is the type load balancer, etc. So I don't think we need to do this because we press the button and that's basically the same thing. Okay. And so then we need an ingress controller. And the reason I'm looking it up here is because maybe there is a specific configuration to um, DigitalOcean, but it looks like just a standard one here. So what I'll do here, and I don't know if there's anything about this domain name stuff that we need to figure out. I think that's where I kind of ran into some issues where I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, I'm gonna scroll up here. Is there anything about the domain name? A fully registered domain name is available. I don't really want one. I just want to deploy one without one. So what we'll do is we'll just copy the contents here and we're gonna go over here. It's no different than any ingress controller for Nginx, I think. Okay, and we'll paste that on in there. And we're just gonna take a look here. So one thing I don't want is I don't want the host. So what we'll do is take this out here. And then here for the service, I'm gonna type Nginx. The path is fine there, this all looks fine. And so what we'll do is type in kubectl, um, apply hyphen f ingress. Okay, and if this works, what we're expecting to see is an address here, but I don't see one. And this was the problem I was running into where I, it wasn't resolving, okay? So it says endpoints default HTTP backend not found. I don't think that matters. And it is pointing to the Nginx instance. I just don't know why we don't have, so like ingress address empty DigitalOcean. So notice that they're not using host. So they're saying it's empty as well. If you are using Nginx controller, you don't need to see the ingress address. Okay. When you install ingress controller to the cluster, it creates a load balancer to handle all your incoming requests. Make sure the below uh, part com uh, is completed. So let's copy this because we could have installed it via Helm or hit that button. And so this will just confirm that it's installed. I'm pretty sure it is installed. I'm trying to make our way back to DigitalOcean. So we hit this. And so it is there. We can see the load balancer. Uh, I'm actually curious because I think that uh, load balancers are in DigitalOcean. I don't use DigitalOcean on a regular basis, so I'm not sure. If we go to load balancers, did it create one? So it did create a load balancer for us. I'm just curious, does it have an IP address or a DNS host name? Um, so maybe it made one for each one and they, there are IP addresses, which is great. And so down below here, it says, you should see an external IP address corresponding to the IP address of DigitalOcean load balancer. Okay. 
And so there's one there and one there, but we're gonna look at what there is here. So this one has 10, 24, oh, sorry, external. 157, 230, 70, 53. Is that the one we're looking for? Neither of those match the load balancer. They're all 68. Okay. Well, even if it is, let's just go grab this one and see if that works. Because let's, uh, it says Ingress Nginx. I'm just going to double check that. This is Ingress uh, Nginx controller. It's not the same thing. SVC. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's there, so it does work. Um, and it is routing to Nginx. So it does work even though we don't have the address. It's just a lack of confidence because I just kind of expected the address to be there. But DigitalOcean wasn't too bad. Um, so we'll go here and we'll go ahead and delete this. And hit destroy. And we'll put the name in here. Oh, we want the load bouncer. I didn't checkbox the load bouncer. <laughs> but uh, when we go destroy here, we'll hit destroy. That other one didn't have any resources because that was the one that I just spun up to show you. And so because I didn't checkbox that thing, I'm going to go to networking here and just make sure I remove those because this probably costs something, I would think. So we'll hit destroy. We'll copy the name there and hit destroy. I don't know if there's any, like, any volumes lingering around, so I'm just going to double check. Nope. There's no droplets or anything. So, uh, yeah, that's all there is to it. Um, and there you go. That's it. Hey everybody, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this fall along, I'm going to show you how to launch a Kubernetes cluster on SIBO. So over here, you can see I have a credit balance of $250. When you first sign up, you get uh, $250 for free uh, for uh, a month. And so you can see that I have a 0 0.3 spend because I launched one cluster. SIBO uh, actually has a lot of great uh, educational content for Kubernetes. Um, so they cover a lot of stuff here. Uh, and so, you know, it's just, if you need more stuff, this is it. Mine is more uh, certification focused where there's this general knowledge. So maybe there's some places where you can fill the gaps in here by using their academy. Uh, they also have docs here. I haven't really gone through their docs, so I'm not sure um, uh, the quality of them, but I do know their academy is, is A-OK. -okay. Uh, and you notice that they have Kubernetes, but it looks like they have virtual machines, load balancers, volumes, and some networking things. So what we'll do is go to Kubernetes at the top here. I'm going to create myself a cluster. And here I'm just going to call this cluster uh, SIBO cluster for fun. Uh, we can choose how many instances. I just want one. We can choose the default network. Um, we can choose an existing firewall and go default, default, whatever they have there. Whatever that means. I'm not sure what firewalls are on SIBO. Um, and then there's a different sizes. So notice that, I mean, like if it was me, I would go straight to medium. And so if you go to extra, then it goes, hey, you should probably choose a medium. So I'm like, okay, cool. I know I know what size of Kubernetes clusters I should be using. So we go back here and it's $20, uh, $20 a month. Now I do know that the control plane for SIBO is free. So that is something that's really great. I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure if they'll be able to do that forever, but that is one of their positions. When you go to SIBO pricing, SIBO pricing here, that is um, their advantage where they go, look, uh, you are playing for the control plane and all these other providers. And for us, uh, the control plane is 100% free, okay? So and, uh, obviously these costs are, are, are quite large, but um, uh, but yeah, so that is an advantage with SIBO. Now what we'll do is go ahead and launch a new cluster. Oh, sorry, I was already launching one, wasn't I? <laughs> Uh, so we'll go back to this tab here. We have our medium. You can see monthly or hourly. You're not going to get charged like immediately $20. It's going to be whatever it is per cent. And then we have some stuff in the marketplace. So just like everything, there are marketplaces. Might just want to poke around here to see what they have. So pretty pretty standard stuff. I like how like the CICDs are here. I didn't notice them on the other ones, but maybe I just never noticed. But anyway, we'll go ahead and create this cluster. And so we'll have to wait for it to create. And it has this countdown here saying how long it's going to take. Um, and it's relatively pretty quick. I think we'd say like a few minutes. And so um, I'll see you back here when it's done, okay?
All right, so after waiting a little while, our cluster is running. So we'll have to take a look at how to uh, get working with this. And the way it works is you'll need to have a cube uh, config and just download that and use that. So what I'm gonna do is make my way back over to AWS because we're gonna use our Cloud9 environment. And um, I have one provision from um, before, the DigitalOcean one. I'm actually just gonna go delete that and make a new one right now. Okay. And then what I'll do here is create a new environment and we'll just say Sivo ENV, just so we have a way of interacting with it. I'm gonna stay with Ubuntu just because um, I usually go with Amazon Linux, but it's, since it's so easy to do that sudo snap install for that kubectl, I figured we'll stick with it. We'll do a T2 micro because we don't need anything else than that. We'll go ahead and spin that up. So while we're waiting there, I guess the question is, is like, how do we do ingress? Because I didn't really do much uh, uh, with Sivo. So maybe what we can do is go take a look at their docs and see if they have instructions for that. So I'm gonna go here. I just wanna see um, how we can do ingress. So, cause that's always the questions like, how do you do ingress? How do you do load balancing, right? So ingress controller with your own TLS certificate. Um, I want to know, let's look at load balancing here. So creating a load balancer relies on the SIBO control, uh, con uh, cloud control manager sending the appropriate request to the SIBO API to do load balancing. And so then down below, uh, the load balancing algorithm is provided in the round robin, here's the annotation. I imagine this is the annotation that we expect to see in our ingress controller or something like that. Uh, external traffic policy, session affinity, firewall, like yada, yada, yada. But what I really just want is I just want to know how to do it. <laughs> Like what are the step-by-step -step instructions um, for us to uh, deploy? So I'm not 100% sure, okay? And this kind of just says like how easy it is to uh, utilize this stuff. And that's always the question that I have here. So here they have ingress and it looks like this, but it's using TLS. I don't really care about TLS. All right, so we'll go back here and this environment's ready and we will do our sudo snap uh, install kubectl classic to get that going there. And then for SIVO, we definitely have to download the config, uh, kube config. So we'll download the kube config. And um, I have to spell kubectl correctly or it's not gonna work. And then what we need to do is we need to upload this file. So I'm just showing this in my uh, folders off screen here. We're gonna go to file um, upload local files. And then here I'm just dragging on in that file here. And then we're going to hit close. And did it upload? Yep, so that's the contents of the file. And so what I'll do is I'll say move to cube config. And we need to put the name of what we're actually moving. So SIVO, this. Uh, sure, we'll say touch or make directory cube. And then we'll move that into the right place and then we'll see if we can do this cube CTL get pods. Great. And then I'll just do cube CTL uh, create deploy um, nginx hyphen hyphen image nginx and we'll hit enter. And so that creates that there. We'll go back to SIBO and see if there's any way we can kind of like view our load. Like what kind of interface or stuff does it give us or is it really bare bones? And it's fine if it's bare bones, uh, but let's just see what we can see. So we're going here and we'll go into our cluster. Okay. And um, we'll go to install applications. Marketplace, so uh, I guess this one doesn't really show you anything and that's totally fine. Um, but uh, I guess the question is, is like, how are we going to network this? So I'll be back here in a moment and I'll figure it out and I'll see you here soon, okay? All right, so I'm not sure if this is gonna work, but because this one is specifically with your own TLS certificate, but I'm gonna just try to maybe follow through the instructions here. So we already created our Nginx thing. And then the next thing we need to do is expose it. So what I'm gonna do is go back over to Cloud9 We'll type in kubectl. And by the way, Sivo has their own um, uh, like tool, like to create stuff. So 
I mean, that could be useful, but I didn't install it. So I guess we'll just uh, do what we can here. We'll type in expose deploy nginx. And sometimes you'll see people do this and this is totally valid as well. But I just like to have with no space or like uh, no hy uh, hyphen or forward slash there. We'll do 80 and then we'll do target port equals 80. And then we'll say um, uh, kind or no, it's type. And we'll say node port because that's just what I've been used to doing. And so now we have a service and the next thing we'll need is an ingress controller. So I'll type in ingress YAML and then we'll go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Close tab because yeah, we deleted that one there. And we'll go here and we will copy the contents here. And we'll modify it a bit. So replace with your cluster DNS name. So we probably need that. I don't care about TLS. This is going to go to Nginx. We're going to leave the path normal. We're going to go to port 80. And it's fine if the path prefix, it just looks slightly different because usually when we do ingress, they look a little bit different here. And we'll just type in ingress here. And so what we'll do is grab our cluster DNS name, which is here. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and post that. We usually don't do a host, but um, for this, since they're doing it, let's give it a try. And we'll do kubectl apply hyphen f ingress yaml. Great. And so now we can do is kubectl get ingress. And it has an address. So we'll go grab that. Whoops. Did not work as expected. 404 not found. But at least um, it's doing something, you know what I mean? So we'll go back here, HTTP colon slash slash. Okay, what if we try with the uh, the host? And we'll advance, oops. Um, can I advance? You cannot visit right now because the website uses HSTS. Network errors and attack usually temporary with this page will probably work later. So usually like if we have that, we just advance, right? It's not a big deal. What if I just try HTTP? Can I do that? Or does it always forward? No, it does. Okay, um, so that's not going to work. Hmm. So maybe we do need a TLS, but it does say like, Bring your own TLS certificates, so maybe we can just gener generate one in place. Um, so save the cluster in the desired configuration. So three node cluster, Greenstone. Create certificates. So here they have a line to create a certificate. Okay. And we'll go to the next place here. And it says waiting. Okay, so generated it out. And then it says create a secret. Okay. Because maybe the requirements for SIVO is you have to have uh, TLS or uh, some kind of secure thing to connect. I'm, I'm not sure, but that is kind of my guess there. Maybe we should just follow through their tutorial here because they might have other things configured that I'm not aware of. So let's just go all the way down the list and follow their instructions. Uh, so we'll do this. And then we'll go down and then we'll copy the contents here. Um, I'm just gonna rename this to And then we'll just gut the content here. Well, I, I don't wanna have to get that cluster IP or DNS again. So I'm just gonna paste that there and we'll scroll up and we'll just grab this value here, cut. And then we will paste this here and we will paste this here. And then we'll delete the old one. If we can find where it starts, which is here, I believe. Good. And so then we'll do um, kubectl apply hyphen F ingress to. And then we'll do ingress and we'll have two there, which is totally fine. We can even delete the old one, I guess. 
that's the one I made. So cube CTL delete uh, ingress or um, ing ingress clear. And then check if everything works. So there they are doing a curl there, but it looks like that you can also just go to the demo. So maybe what we'll do is just copy this line here, go to our browser, type forward slash demo, cannot be reached. So, I mean, we can also try the curl, right? But I, I don't think that's gonna make a difference because, you know, it's either right or it's wrong, you know? Oh yeah, so it's working, it says it's here. So if that's the case, maybe it's just not resolving yet because it's like new or something. So I'm gonna grab the IP address instead Okay, and then I'm just going to try this instead. 404 not found. So it is 100% working. It could be a firewall thing. So they do have a firewall, as we saw as the default. So let's take a look at what's there. Um, I'm going to just go back to Command Zero here to resize our stuff because they had manage firewalls. Again, I don't know anything about SIBO, so I'm just hoping that's like open a port. So we will go in and the default firewall has all ports open. So if you install everything out of the box, we advise to create custom firewalls. So everything is open, but technically according to, to, uh, to their tutorial, it is working correctly. Now, why I can't access it here, I don't know, okay? But we do know that when we ran this command, for ours, and we could also probably even try with the IP address, maybe. I don't know if that would make it, uh, like if we'd still get the same thing. So here it says 404, which is fine. And we'll try this one again. And here we get a 200 hello world. So it is working. Um, I don't know if I know enough about SIBO to get beyond this point, but it's totally fine. Uh, and I think we are a okay here. So I'll go back to cloud nine and we will go and clean this up. We just do that. Can I get back to Cloud9 easily? Yes, I can. And we will delete our SIBO environment. And we'll go back to our cluster here, Kubernetes, and we will go ahead and delete our cluster. And we are all done. There you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a closer look at namespaces. So we have been using namespaces throughout our labs, but I figured I'd give it a little extra attention here just to talk about uh, a few extra commands I think that we should know. Uh, so, you know, if we want to, and again, I'm in our micro case environment, so just make sure you have that spun up there in Cloud9 so you can follow along here. But uh, uh, what we'll do here is type in kubectl get namespaces, and so we can get a list of our namespaces. Um, the server doesn't have a type namespace, maybe because I got to type it right. All right, and instead of typing uh, namespaces, we can also type ns. You can see we created those ones prior, fire, ice, and wind, depending on when we did the labs. If I want to make a new one, it's just kubectl create ns um, borg. It would be our new namespace there. Okay, and some interesting things is uh, like if you want, let's say we launched a pod. So let's make let's launch a or a deployment into this namespace. So we type in cube CTL, um, create, deploy, uh, hyphen, hyphen, image, nginx, um, n, Borg. Okay, and so what that will do, I really gotta learn how to spell cube CTL right. What that will do is launch it in that namespace. So if we do uh, cube CTL get pods, that always shows for the default namespace, right? It's not going to show us all of our apps. It's going to show what's in the default namespace. All right. So if we want something from another namespace other than default, we have to put the N and then the name. So we do Borg. And I think it's just not there yet because it's still spinning up. So if we were to do uh, deploy here, then we could see it. Oh, did that not work? Exactly one name is required. Okay. So I'm not paying attention here. <laughs> I'm just checked out here. So we will put the word nginx here, 
Great, and so now if we go back here, we can see that uh, we have a pod, but notice that if we uh, do not have that, it should not show up. So, all right, so you need to have that hyphen n, or uh, if you wanna be more verbose, you can do hyphen hyphen namespace. It's important to list like the variance because when I was taking the exam, like when I didn't know there was a difference between deployment and deploy, I couldn't tell if one was just like purposely wrong or there was an abbreviation or a, a shortcut for stuff. So just understand there's a lot of shortcuts um, and I don't think the exam would ever try to trick you by having like fake um, uh, fake abbreviations like that, okay? Um, so if you think it is kind of generally says deployment or deploy, then it's probably the same thing on the exam. So one interesting thing that we could do would be to um, list multiple resources. So, uh, and this is not namespace specific, but what we can do is we can say get all and that will actually list out a bunch of resources. So here we got uh, our pods or deployments or replica sets. And some things won't ever show up there like um, maybe like uh, config maps, secrets, ingress, okay? And so that allows us to bring in a lot more stuff. So not all of these things have stuff, but notice we are getting things listed out. Actually they do, we did get a lot of stuff here. So just realize that that's another way with namespaces. But now can you get multiple namespaces? So if I say get uh, you know, pod, and then I say hyphen hy or hyphen name, um, uh, default and uh, Borg. Just understand that you can only pass it one, which is kind of frustrating. I kind of wish there was a way to do multiples. If there is, I sure don't know how to do it. But one interesting thing is if you want to delete everything in a namespace, we could do delete all. And so remember what all returned, right? So anything that all returned is what it would delete. So I think if we wanted to get all of them, we probably have to do like CM, secrets, ingress, like that right? But uh, I'm just going to do all. And then we would do hyphen n, and then we would just say Borg. It says, uh, uh, no name was specified. Oh, sorry. So it'd be all hyphen hyphen, or sorry, uh, dash dash, or hy hyphen hyphen, all. And so that way you don't have to specify name, you can just say all the names, right? And so it's deleted those resources there. I don't know if the namespace still exists, kubectl get uh, namespaces, and it, that's still there as well. So we'd have to delete that namespace, kubectl delete ns borg. And there you go. So that's all I really wanted to show you was just some of those extra commands, because it's nice to have that delete all ability uh, when you put everything in namespace and you just delete it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this fall along, we're gonna be looking at role-based access controls, also known as RBAC. I'm gonna tell you right now, they're a pain to set up. They're such a pain. Uh, and there's two types. We have uh, cluster roles, like cluster stuff, and then there's uh, just roles, and those are namespace, which we do cover in the course. We're not gonna do both because we just be here all day and we really don't need that for the KCNA, but I do wanna set up one a role uh, for a particular user and then restrict some resources. Okay, so I'm just gonna type in clear here. Make sure you launch that micro -case environment. Uh, and this is a little bit tedious and painful, but we will get through it. Um, and we might have to kind of like piece it together because it was a lot of work for me to uh, get a working solution here. So if you can't get through it, don't worry, just watch along if you do get stuck and just understand all the components that go involved. Uh, but I'll get through it here on video here, so do not worry. But what we'll do is type in micro K8's, uh, K8's status. And we have the ability to enable it. And I just want to note, um, if we do RBAC Kubernetes here, normally what you would do, but we're using micro -cades, but normally what you would do is you would have to specify when you start your cluster, the API server, you'd have to tell it to run in authorization mode of RBAC. Now, we don't have to do that. We just have to enable it here. So just understand that uh, that's abstracted away for us. Um, but if you do see on the exam that uh, flag, just remember you know what it does, okay? Um, and so what I wanna do is just enable RBAC. It's right here, there it is. And we'll go ahead and hit enter and we'll give it a moment to enable. It shouldn't take too long. See, it's reconfiguring the API server. So it's likely adding that authorization mode flag so that it is enabled and there it is. Okay, so um, I'm looking for my super complex instructions for uh, just the role. So the first thing we're gonna need is we're going to need um, a way of identifying our users. And there's a few different ways to do that. If we go to authentication Kubernetes, Kubernetes, don't worry if you can't say it, I can't say it half the time uh, or spell it, but um, we have a few different ways that we can authenticate. 
and it uh, says, it should say here the list. So certifications, bearer tokens, there's three ways. And it's not showing it here. Let me double check. Let's go to the top here. I remember being the two at the top. Um, maybe it's not this page. Maybe it's uh, controls here. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure where the page is, but I can tell you that there are three ways, uh, at least at least three ways of doing it. So one's using a certificate. Another one is having a bearer access token. And there's another way. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to ask you on the exam, so it's not a big deal. Uh, maybe like the security exam, that would be where that would matter. But what we're going to do is we're going to generate out a, a certification because that was the one that I found the easiest to understand, even though there's a lot of steps involved. So what we'll have to do is generate out ourselves a certificate. And so we're going to use OpenSSL to do that. So we'll type in OpenSSL. We're going to type Gen RSA because RSA is the type of um, cryptographic thing that we want to do there. We'll type out to output um, the uh, the thing that we're generating here, uh, the key, and then we'll put the name. So I'm gonna call everything developer just to make things easier. You could put the name like Andrew or something here, but just stick with me here and do developer because it becomes super hard uh, to swap this all out. So uh, 2048, I believe is the length of the key that we want. We hit enter and it generates out our RSA private key. So now that we have our RSA private key, uh, we need to uh, create or generate a client side uh, sign request, a CSR. Don't ask me what that is, I do not remember, but I just know that we need to do it. So we'll type in open SSL REQ new hyphen key uh, developer.key uh, hyphen out developer.csr. That's what we want to generate, a CSR, uh, S-U-B-J. And then we, uh, which stands for subject, and then we have this very special syntax. So CN is going to be the user's name, which is developer. We don't want to make a mistake. And then O, capital O, equals is going to be the group. Because remember, RBACs can have users and groups. We're going to call it developer as well. We could call it developers, but again, for simplicity, we're just going to call it developer. Okay, I'm going to double check to make sure that's okay. And if you're wondering, like, where did I get all these instructions? Uh, oh, also notice we've got this error. So it's possible that this line didn't work. I remember getting this error. So let me look here, because I did have a fix for it. Can't load root R, okay, so I think it's like R and D. Here, let's just look it up and see if we can find it very quickly. So they say, try removing your commenting out Rand line in this thing. Yeah, that was the problem here. So this is maybe a weird problem with Ubuntu. Um, and so I almost didn't catch that error there. I'm gonna do LS, did it generate out that CSR? It shouldn't because it wouldn't have worked. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. And then what we're gonna do, I grabbed that line over here, this one here, and we're gonna have to open this up. Uh, so no, normally we could do like C9 and file name, but unfortunately, like last time I did npm install, I could try it right now and see if it works. npm install uh, this, this would install the C9 client. I should be able to do C9 and then do this but it's not opening up. So I think it's because we're on Ubuntu and not Amazon X2. So I'm just gonna clear that out. And so if, since we can't use Cloud9 to easily open it, we'll have to open up in Vi. And Vi is a big pain because every key matters, okay? So I'm gonna hit enter. And before you touch your keyboard, understand that every single key doesn't act like a normal key. So if I hit J, it goes down. If I hit K, it goes up. If I go L, it goes right. Okay, if I go H, it goes left, all right? Every key is bound to something, so you gotta be very careful. So what we're gonna do is hit J until we get down to this Rand line, and then we're gonna hit I to go to insert mode. Look down below, it says insert mode here, and now your keyboard acts like a normal keyboard. And your cursor, even though it's flex the R, it's actually in front of it, and we're gonna make a pound. Okay, that's gonna comment it out. Now to get out of insert mode, we'll hit escape on our keyboard. Okay, left, and now do colon to execute commands within this, right for W, Q for quit. Um, and the problem is we're in read-only mode, so I had to do sudo there. So what I'll have to do is do colon, Q, exclamation mark, and then hit up, uh, control A to go to the front, sudo, enter, and it brought me back to the same spot. So we'll go I, insert mode, pound, escape. The, notice insert mode's out, so now we're in normal mode colon WQ. I use Vim as my primary um, uh, uh, layout or keyboard layout. So for me, it's normal, but you know, a lot of people aren't. 
and uh, you know just gotta be very careful there. So we've updated the OpenSSL CNF, and so what we'll do, if it generated a key, I don't trust it, so I'm gonna delete it, because I don't wanna see that message there, and we'll hit up until we get back to this one. Okay, notice no errors, we'll hit up. Can we get this one? No errors, good. Now the question is, where am I getting these crazy commands? Well, the only way is to look up tutorials because if you go on the Kubernetes docs, they do not help whatsoever. Um, so at least like the, the Kubernetes docs is good in some places, bad in other places. Um, but I'm just trying to find the article I had. So it'd be like RBAC, RBAC with Kubernetes. Uh, and I think it was like in Minikube that I used. So I had to adopt this. Um, RBAC, probably would spell it right so we can find it easily. Because one of the key skills of, of, of learning Kubernetes is being able to find solutions. And so this is the fellow that made one. I don't know if he has a video, but uh, generally like a lot of these commands are here. Um, yeah, I think he has a video. I didn't watch it. I just kind of like went through and kind of adapted it to, to my needs. Um, but you know, a lot of that stuff, you just got to look for it or understand how this stuff works. So we generated out our CSR. We fixed the RNG problem. And so now the next thing we need to do um, is we need to generate out a CRT, okay? And so that's just another thing we need to generate out. But before we do, we need the CRT. These are cert certificates um, for Kubernetes. So if I type in Kubernetes certifications, or maybe certificates, because it's not certifications per se. Um, and we go maybe here. Nope, that's not it. Maybe here. That's not it. I'm just looking at, the, I got the links here. I'm just trying to uh, Google it so we can find it. Best practice certifications. Okay, so Kubernetes best practices. You can only imagine how much time I spent looking this stuff up. And we go here, and so what we're looking for is where these um, certificates are. So when you install your Kubernetes cluster, it uh, generates out all these uh, different kinds of certificates. So these certificates are used to validate uh, authenticity of things, right? So you say, okay, this is your certificate. We'll uh, bind them together somehow and, and double check and things like that. So we need to have the CRT and the CA key. And so we need to know where these are. Now, if you're using Minikube, they install in a particular place. If you're using uh, Micro K8s, um, they install a particular place, but this is where they are by default. So Micro K8s um, is somewhere else. And so if we wanna know where it is, I think we'd have to look up like Micro K8s um, auth, okay? So if we go to the docs here, I think it might be under service and ports. And if we scroll on down here, it shows you here, var snap, micro eights, current certs. So this is where they are. So what we'll do is copy this directory and we're gonna do ls and then paste it in to see where they are. And we can see we have uh, CSR conf, cube, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, there they are, ca, ca.key, and then cr.cert. So this is where they are. And so now that we have that, we now need to type this big old ugly uh, command here. So open SSL x509, which is a type of certificate or something. I've, I've seen 509, I don't really know what it is. Even though I've seen it for years. We'll say developer.csr, because we're gonna need that. And then we do, hyphen CA, and then we have hyphen CA key, and then we have hyphen CA create serial, and then out um, developer. We didn't type everything in, I'm just kind of just like filling out the the obvious stuff. And then what we'll do is fill in these ones here. So we got to fill in a value here. Okay, we got to fill a value in there. So what we need is, and we'll open up our readme to make this a little bit easier. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete the contents here but I need this address. Actually, just to make this easier, I'm gonna copy this here, because this is such a pain to type. And we'll paste it in here. And then I'm gonna grab the contents here. Just in case we make a mistake and we have to type this like 100 times, or like execute it 100 times. And so here we want uh, CA cert. And here we want, um, uh, this is, 
CA key? Yeah. Okay. And so this is the big old line that we need. So what we'll do, whoops, did I mess that up? <laughs> okay, so we'll copy that line. Just clear this one out. Oops. Again, I'll copy this line again. Yank, paste, looks okay. Hit enter and can't open for reading, no such file or directory. Okay, so I'll double check one more time. Clearly made a mistake. Oops, sorry, ls. Oh, CRT. Sorry, I wrote cert. Uh, here. Okay, so I'm gonna yank that line. Oops, didn't get it. Try one more time. It's a bit hard to copy. I don't wanna wrap the text. There's a way of wrapping it, but it's just like, then I have to unwrap it, so. I'll hit enter. Okay, and it generate out R C R T. Are you lost? <laughs> okay, so let's create a user now. So the way we do that is we're gonna type in cube ctl config set credentials developer hyphen hyphen client certificate um, equals developer.crt hyphen hyphen client hyphen key developer.key. If you hear rumbling, I don't know if you can hear it, but my, my stomach's been like rumbling through a lot of the labs. So if you hear like a rumbling sound, it's probably my stomach. Um, kubectl config set credentials developer. That's the developer that we want. Uh, the client credentials developer CRT, client hyphen key developer.key. We'll hit enter uh, and I typed it wrong. So that would be a problem. Oh boy, it's acting funny. So what I'll do is I'll just copy the contents here. And if we do want to make this easier, I can just do this. So my life is not so painful. This uh, backslash allows you to do multi lines. Okay, so client probably should be spelled right. Paste that in there. It didn't take it. One second. We'll try this again. Clear. Paste it in again. It's not taking it. <laughs> okay, we'll make it one line. All right. I don't know why it's being silly, but whatever so we'll copy this again that or there actually is an error okay i just can't tell if it's a multi-line error here it's missing the y here there we go okay so the developer has been set so now we have created our user and uh, if you want to see the users there's a command it's called kubectl config view hyphen o because like if you do view you get a bunch of this stuff, right? And so this uh, config file uh, shows us things. So we can see admin and developer there. If you wanna be really clever, you can do um, parsing. So if you do hyphen O, you can pass it like JSON path, uh, which is a, I think it's like JQ syntax. There's a name for that syntax. I can't remember what it's called. I covered it in one of my other courses. Asterisk, and then we say dot name here. Okay, and um, did I type that right? No, I forgot the equals here. And so we get the names. But really all it's doing is it's just parsing it through and grabbing out the admin and developer. So we can see that we have um, uh, two users. Whoops. I just wonder if this is actually the same contents as, I'm just type clear again. So type in uh, view again here, one second. So this is that file. But I wonder if this is the same file as our kubectl. So if we type in cat, which just means concatenate, like to print out, and we go cube config. I wonder if it's just the same darn file. Uh, it's similar. So notice like there's some additional stuff here. So we have certificate authority, which is this big old string here, server, micro K8s, and we have context, uh, uh, kind config, user preferences. But notice that when we do config view, um, it's just a shortened version. So, ah, here it is. So look, it says data omitted. So it is the same file. It's just that it's obscuring that just in case for security, because I would assume you do not want to share your certificate authority data. Um, I'm not worried about it because this is locked in on a VM and this will be deleted by the time you get to see it. So I'm not too worried about it. But uh, yeah, so it, all it did was really add it here and then provide those links there. That was that big fancy link that we did with the set credentials there. 
Um, so now the next thing we need is a context. So a context is to say, what user are we right now? So these are the users, possible users, and the, the things that we need to uh, authenticate them with. Notice this one uses um, a token to authenticate, but here are the contexts. So right now we are the micro creates cluster, and uh, like that's, or sorry, that's the context for this cluster, because you could have multiple clusters uh, that you want to connect to. And then this is the user that we are. We're the admin user, okay? And this is for uh, micro K8s. So what we'll do is um, we will, actually we can see our current uh, context by typing current, uh, config current context. It'll just show us who we are, current. Context. So I don't see here. Oh, it's right here, right? Okay. So if we hit that, we are micro K8s right now. That's who we are. Um, and so, yeah, because the name is micro K8s. The context is called micro K8s. Okay. And so now what we can do is we can uh, switch our context. So, or actually, we need to make a new context, sorry, because we don't have a context for our developer yet. So we'll type in kubectl config set context developer hyphen hyphen cluster equals micro k8 uh, cluster and then hyphen hyphen user equals developer okay and so now if we go back and we view you can now see that we have a context here and just make sure the cluster is correct if that's wrong we'll end up with an error so um we haven't switched context yet we are still this context here but um, one thing we'll want to do is we will want to uh, set some permissions here. But before we do, I just want to show you a command to say, what do we have access to? So there's a thing called kubectl auth. And auth, we have this thing that says, can I? And we can say list pods. And so if I say this, it'll tell me whether I'm allowed to list pods. This is a way of checking uh, role-based access controls before we even set them, okay? And if we are a developer, I can say as uh, equals developer, can I right now? Oops say uh, hyphen hyphen as developer. Am I allowed to look at it? It says no. So I created this new user and it's not the admin user. And so it doesn't have any access when we first created it. So if we were to switch over to it, like if we typed in cube CTL, um, I'm trying to remember how we switch here. Oh, it's config use context uh, developer. Really got to learn how to type properly. Um, and so if we type in kubectl get pods, we have no access, this is forbidden, right? You don't have any privileges, uh, you're not allowed to do this, okay? So what we need to do is create some role-based access controls to allow them to have access to those pods. So what we'll do is go back and switch to our back to our micro K8s. We'll just type clear here. And that's where we need to uh, create ourselves a role and a role binding. So what I'll do, I'm just pulling up my example here and then we'll, uh, we'll do is type in role RBAC, or sorry, role Kubernetes and get some example code. So we'll go to using RBAC authorization. We'll scroll on down and here is basically the same example that we want. So I'll make a new one in our case folder here. New file um, role.yaml. We'll paste that on in there. Uh, this one's called pod reader. Sure, we'll leave it as is. That's totally fine. And then we need a um, a role binding. I don't know why they go like role in the role cluster. They really should show you end to end, but this is how they do it. And so if we go down, I'm just looking for one that looks like the one that we need. These ones are all very silly. Role binding. I guess we'll use this one, even though I really don't like it. We'll have to adjust it. Where this is this one here as well. Oh, this is the one I think we wanted. Role binding examples. Okay, so we'll go back here. We'll make a new file. Role binding. YAML. Okay, and um, I'm just going to double check because I might have modified this a bit. Yeah, mine's a lot more easier to read. So we'll just take out these comments here so that we can just see what we're doing. I just don't want any of this stuff in so I can see what's going on just to make sure that it's right. So the idea here is that uh, we have a role binding kind and then we have our metadata, uh, read pods, which is fine. The namespace is fine. So the subject, the kind is gonna be user. The name is going to be developer because that's what we called our developer um, user. And so that's the subject. Now we need to um, 
have the rule reference. And so I think it's called pod reader. So if we go back to the one, looks good to me. And then if we go back, uh, we'll just, yep, that's fine. We'll save it, make sure that little dot is cleared. And so that should be good. So we are good to set these up. So we'll say kubectl apply hyphen f roll.yaml. I wonder if we can do multiple files like this. I don't ever try. Does that work? N nope. That or I typed it wrong. So I'll just hit enter. Oh, you know what? We probably can do it. Oh, let me just try this. Let me just try this to see if this works. All right, well, if there is a way to doing multiple ones, I have no idea how to do it. And then we'll just say rule binding.yaml. There we go. And let's go take a look at what those look like. So we say get uh, kubectl get role. And we'll say describe the role. Okay, so get watch list, pods, all good there. And then we'll say get role binding. Okay, read pods, uh, pod reader. And then we'll say describe it. Whoops. Describe user developer. That's who's allowed to uh, use this role. Um, so now let's go back up. Remember that uh, auth? command we had, here it is. As developer, can they use it? Yes. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll switch context. We'll say kubectl, I um, already forgot what the command is. It is config, use context, uh, developer. I have to type use, and we'll say kubectl, get pods, kubectl get pods. You got to spell it right for it to work. And then we'll try SVC. Oh, our juice app is running again, huh? We, we had destroyed the deploy pr uh, prior, so it shouldn't be running, but I guess it's still running, whatever. Anyway, um, so notice that we get a denied access for uh, services, but we can get it for pods. So it is working as expected. I'm going to just switch back to micro K8 so we're not confused. And that's all I wanted you to learn. There are uh, role based clusters and they're really a pain to set up and it's just really time consuming. But if we go, if you really wanna know how, I know there's a few tutorials. If we say RBAC cluster role, 100 days of Kubernetes, I know that um, um, there is a good example there. I'm just gonna pull it up here. If, you're, if you wanna look at it yourself, if you are on the Xampro platform, uh, all these links are there for you, just so you know. But let me take a look here. I'm trying to find the example. Hmm, can't really find it, but let's say RBAC um, micro K8s tutorial. Roll. Ah, yes. So, Annis, I, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I know her, she's super nice, she's on Twitter. Uh, and so she goes here and I think she's just created a role and a cluster role. She does a cluster role one. And so if we go through here, uh, that's a role, so they create a role. I guess, I guess she does both. But let's just take a look at cluster role here. So for cluster role, you have to create a service account. Um, you'll have to set up verbs, right? So what resources? Uh, oh, yeah, this is where the sticky part was. So in order to, um, I guess it's not hard, but uh, she was using this third party library and I just did not want to use it because then you have to install crew and do that. And so probably there's a way I could figure it out. But, you know, honestly, we don't really need to learn cluster roles. It's not that big of a deal. Um, they're very similar to roles. They're just not namespaced, right? So you won't see a namespace in them and therefore workloads and not necessarily, or sorry, like they're scoped at the cluster cluster roles. But what was interesting was service account because service account isn't a user. It is a, um, like for workloads and stuff like that. But I figured just doing a role and stuff like that is fine for KCNA and just conceptually understanding the other ones is good enough. So what we'll do is close off these other tabs. We'll close this off here this one and this one, and that's all I wanted to show you for RBAC, okay? Hey, 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this follow along, we're just going to be looking at a bunch of uh, random uh, kubectl commands that we just didn't cover through any of the other follow alongs, but could appear on the exam or just help you contextualize a few things. So I'm going to launch my micro K8 environment. And as that is spinning up, what I'm going to do is make my way over to Google on a new tab. We're going to type in kubectl commands. And you know this is the one I usually point you to, but I just also noticed if you click, even if it's the cheat sheet, right here on the left-hand side, you go to kubectl commands, and uh, that's another way to get to it. So there's just some things like API resource, cluster management, that we might want to just take a quick peek at. Um, I didn't even look at top, what's that? The top commands lets you see resource consumption for nodes and or pods, cool. So maybe we'll just play around with a few of these just to see what we can see. So I'm gonna type in kubectl, uh, get pods to see what we have here just to see if anything is running yet um, and uh, we can always just type in micro k8s as well I'm not sure if we have a permissions ah there we go so we are fine there um, I thought we might have a permissions issue there but I'm actually surprised on the server that I don't have um, uh, the kubectl installed because we are on Ubuntu so um, I can't remember what we did for that. I think it was something with the config file, but um, I think it was like kubectl um, config, and then we would just do this dot cube uh, config. Oh, sorry, micro k8s, right? Did not mean to open up that tab. Okay, and so I'll just type in clear, and if I type in kubectl get pods, it's gonna save me some trouble. Oh, Q, get pods. Can I do that? No. So I see a lot of people alias the K command. I'm not sure how that gets done, but um, let's go back over to here and just look at some of them here. So we have cube uh, CTL top, and that might be fun to try. So let's go give that a go and see what that does. Um, cube CTL top. So this top command allows you to, uh, use, uh, to see resources consumption on nodes. So we need to specify something maybe like node. Um, is unavailable to handle requests. Let's try pod. Okay, so <laughs> that didn't work, but uh, maybe just as a test, we can do micro k8s there. Okay, but we are, we have pods, right? All right, so I'm not sure as the reason why that's not working, but I'm not too worried about it because it's not on the exam, but I just saw it there, so I just wanted to give it a go. Uh, API versions is definitely something we might want to try out, so we'll just type in clear, kubectl, API versions versions. And so here it's telling us all the API versions. So if we go back over here, we'll just give it a read, print the support API versions on the server in the form of groups and versions. So I guess the idea is that um, all of these things are APIs. So what I mean by that is like, if we go create a file, any kind of file, like a persistent volume, if you go to the top, uh, maybe that's not the best example, but the idea is you have a group and then you have a version. And so if any of the syntax changes because of the functionality changes, that might be version two, that might be version three, or down below, like see auto scaling, we have one, two, uh, V2 beta one, V2 beta two. And so by copying this and putting this up here into the API version, we'll change the nature of these files. All right, and I don't know if like um, it's you get what you get. So I would imagine that you install a version of Kubernetes and then that's going to support different ones. So as new versions of Kubernetes come out, uh, I imagine they might drop older versions or things like that, or maybe the betas vanish. I really don't know. Um, but I mean, generally, that's the idea behind the API versions. Let's go back over to kubectl reference here. Cluster info might be one that we might want to run here. So go ahead and just type in clear at the bottom. And then we'll paste that on in there and hit enter. So it says the control plane is running. Uh, nothing super exciting. Now this is micro k so I'm not sure if we would get more detailed information if we're doing a managed provider if we self-deployed versus a lightweight distribution like micro k but we get some information there, which is nice. Uh, cordon, drain, those are really for um, managing nodes or spinning them, uh, spinning them down, uncordon as well, taint. Uh, as well. So these are, we're not going to be uh, touching at all. Um, this would be something you would do in the CKA, the administrator. Uh, then we have other ones down below here. I don't even know what alpha is. Uh, these commands correspond to alpha features. Oh, that sounds like fun. Let's see what alpha features we have. So events is ex experimental. So I imagine that maybe 
that can be turned on. Um, so yeah, down below here, so cube, uh, kubectl alpha events might turn it on, I suppose, or something like that, or maybe you just have to put alpha in order to access the events. That's probably what it is, right? Um, then there's API resources. So print the supported API resources on the server. So we'll go ahead and copy this. We'll type in clear and we'll hit enter. And so if we just scroll up here um, and just expand it a bit, not too different from the API versions per se, but like here it's saying, what is the name of the API resource? So like findings, events, pods, things like that. What is its short name? What version is this one currently on? Is it namespaced? Um, and what kind is it, right? So actually uh, saying kind in terms of a component or stuff. And I guess this would be useful if you wanted to know what comp Kubernetes components are namespace and not, right? Because we said that there are certain co uh, components in our namespace section that you can put in namespace that you can't put in namespace. And this may also affect whether you use a cluster role or a role for particular things. Because I would think that if you have a role and then you have a component that isn't that is not allowed to be namespace. You probably have to use a cluster role. Uh, we don't really get that deep into uh, that kind of stuff with RBAC or role-based access controls and, and that kind of level of detail. Because again, at the KCNA level, uh, we're not too worried about that information. Maybe that's the CSK or CKAD or the uh, CKA. Um, config we definitely used, and there's a lot of options under there. Explain. Uh, we have not used, so kubectl explain. Uh, the command describes the fields associated with each supported resource. So that might be fun. Let's try pods over here. Enter. And uh, we typed in that here. So a pod is a collection of containers that run on a host. This resource is uh, created by clients and schedules, API version, kind, metadata. Oh, so it actually explains all the fields within um, within pods, so that's kind of useful, and maybe documentation that might not show up actually on the page, but it's here in the commands. So that's nice, but uh, really all I really wanted to do was show you API resources and API versions, because I definitely, definitely know that those will appear on the exam, and you need to know uh, what they're there for, okay? So API resources show you all the possible supported resources, uh, and then API versions is all the supported API versions, okay?